Yo, 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 what up? It's time for another one of these. That's right, babies and gentlemen. <laughs> it's a Slice of Life podcast. And we're going to start off by talking about, well, I don't know, I'm just going to fucking ramble at you. I'm just going to ramble at you. Yeah, this is what we do here. This is what we do here. I talk, you listen. It goes on for 12 hours straight, no breaks. And then, you know, at the end of the day, you get a, you get, you, 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 I don't know, you get something out of it. Uh, right, where do I start? I just, there's sort of stuff happening in the world. And one of these things is there seems to be a, uh, what, what do I call it? Comeback? Mm, Rehabilitation, that's the word I'm looking for. There's a, there's a, a rehabilitation of 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 Doug Walker, aka the nostalgia critic. He remembers it so you don't have to. No, I just want to point out here that like I have a lot of nostalgia for the nostalgia critic. When I was very young, my friend Young Sai who's been on this channel introduced me to him. He was the first ever like, you know, guy on the internet who I watched regularly. I've been, I, well, I say I've been watching him. I don't watch him anymore. I haven't for years. But I did for much longer than most people. I kept watching Nostalgia Critic for much longer than most people. And what happened was, I, I mean, I was watching for a long time. Long time. I had, I, I, I know I got all sorts of references. I pull out a back credit card. I pull out a big lipped alligator moment. You know, I put up. Uh, you know, Nicolas Cage punching a bear. I got all this shit, right? A lot of people, they the Nicolas Cage jokes on the internet come from Homestuck for them. For me, I'm obsessed with Nicolas Cage because of Nostalgia Critic. And I still am to this day. I got the Nicolas Cage obsession. Even though it's cringe in Reddit and from the 2000s. I don't fucking care. I still love Nicolas Cage. And I do it because of the Nostalgia Critic. And I don't give a fuck. Okay, that's how little I care. But, let's be honest, like, when you're not a a literal child, his videos aren't very funny or good. And especially the more recent ones. They sort of got worse and worse, combined with the fact that I got older and older, and even the stuff that I might have found funny as a kid, I don't find as funny anymore. And, you know, he kind of ran out of bad stuff to talk about in a lot of ways. Like, you know... Is the stuff that happened to all those guys. I don't have to explain the nostalgia critic for you. I'm sure you already know what's going on here. And then there was a double whammy. The first whammy was just the collapse of, of Channel Awesome or whatever the fuck it was called. Because uh, he tried to run it like a business. It got, got out of control. It got much bigger than he would probably expected. He didn't really know what to do. It was probably a really bad place to work. A lot of people left. It completely collapsed. And... Because he was in charge, he shouldered all the blame. Especially there was there was big documents written. It was big call out posts written. It was a, a whole it was a whole event. And out of that, you know, there were two good people on Channel Awesome. There was Lindsay Ellis and there was uh uh Todd in the Shadows, you know, who both well, one of them I don't know. Lindsay Ellis just sort of disappeared off the internet. Well, I guess she's back but only behind a paywall. Like, motherfucker, I'm not paying money to watch mediocre YouTube video essays, okay? You're not gonna get me to do that. It's just not happening. Uh, I like the I like some of the Lindsay Ellis videos, but you're not getting me to pay money to watch someone talk about musical theater for, for an hour on, on a YouTube video essay. It's just simply not happening. Uh, and Tone in the Shadows is great. But Nostalgia Critic, he showed a lot of blame. It was a whole, it was a whole thing. It was a whole thing, but here's the thing. It was a bad working environment, but if you actually go back and read the document, like, it doesn't really seem all that, like, Doug personally did anything all too bad. But when it came out, I think it was just one of those situations where it was, like, perfect timing. Where a lot of people had just been waiting for a reason to dislike this guy, you know? And including me. Like, I'm not, I'm not excusing myself from that conversation. Once it became unpopular... To like Nostalgia Critic. Once this once this thing collapsed, right? Once this once this this whole thing turned against him, it was like suddenly 
that was the little final push I needed to realize that I wasn't even enjoying watching these videos anymore. And I was just doing it because I'd been doing it since I was a kid, just out of habit. And once that clicked with me, it was suddenly like, oh, yeah, these videos aren't actually funny or entertaining in any way. Like, why am I watching this? And so I stopped. And then... Excuse me for being sick. I'm always blowing my nose. You know this by now. You've watched more, more than one of these. Uh, and then there was the double whammy where there was the video about, you know, he made this terrible review of the wall and got torn to shreds in, you know, a, by, a, by <laughs> you all know the, the what happened, right? Now, I don't even like the wall. I'm not a massive Pink Floyd fan. I don't really like the movie, the wall. Uh, I've watched it. It's it's good. I mean, it's it's okay. <laughs> I appreciate it from an, like from a pulled back level. You know, I can appreciate it, but I don't personally get much out of it. It doesn't really connect with me. But you know, I I'm I I enjoy that Dan Olson folding ideas video shitting on nostalgia critic for his terrible review of the wall, and yep, it looks really bad. The music is really bad. It all it all tracks very well. Like, it's a very good narrative. But, now, we're in the Nostalgia Critic Rehabilitation era. Why? Because he just showed up on an episode of Smiling Friends, a show I've never seen. And everyone loves Smiling Friends. It's the new Rick and Morty, which is crazy. I've never seen the Smiling Friends. I don't really intend to watch it until, like, I have, I have this disease. I have this terrible disease where I can't watch anything until years after it's stopped being popular. I don't know why. You know what I just did? I just watched Game of Thrones. <laughs> like, that's... This is just... I don't know what it is. I just have this disease where I can't watch anything while it's, pop, while it's like, popping off. I just have no interest in it. And then, like, four years later, I'll be like, oh, yeah, I should probably watch that. And then I'll just get, like, get down to watching it. I'll talk about Game of Thrones in a little bit because I have opinions, uh, but they're not very strong opinions. I'll just talk about it now, actually. Uh, here's the thing about Game of Thrones. I stopped watching it. I got like halfway through season three and I just got fucking bored because the show's kind of boring. Um, look, I, I, I bet I would like the books. Watching the show just made me think about how I would probably like the books a lot more than the show. Uh, I like the, the problem with Game of Thrones is that like half the characters are really fun and the other half are completely boring and you spend half the time in the show just being like, I want to know what Tyrion's up to. Tyrion Lannister is the coolest character in the show. Show me him doing cool things. I don't fucking care about all of these random people. Yeah. Uh, and then... They don't even let Tyrion do anything cool for ages. <coughs> Which sucks, because he's the best character. Yeah, it seems... Uh, it's okay. There's some, there's some fun stuff in the, in the show. There's some fun stuff in Game of Thrones, I will admit. There's some fun stuff. But there's also... And and to an extent, like, I I normally don't particularly care about this sort of thing. But I do... I did get somewhat engaged in the, like, inter-house politics, you know, Game of Princes stuff. Which is cool. I liked that. I liked that aspect of it. But unfortunately, I don't know. The, the it's just it's it's just kind of boring. Like like, <laughs> there's not really that much to say. There's some stuff that I feel like it only happens because it's like, oh, wouldn't this be grim dark? Wouldn't this be really sad if this happened? And 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 wouldn't this be really messed up and show how messed up the world is? There's some stuff that I feel like that. Or it's like, wouldn't this be like, oh, they're doing sex in a TV show? What they're having sex? So like, yeah, obviously I don't mind any of that. Like, I, I don't have anything. I'm not one of these anti-sex scene people. I, I don't. I don't have a problem with 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 showing as much sex scenes as you want in 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 a TV show. I don't give a fuck. But also, it's like that's kind of all that happens is people talk in rooms. Ninety nine percent of the show is people talking in rooms, and then like nine percent. Okay, let's just split. Let's break it up. Ninety percent of the show, people talking in rooms. 9% of the show, people having sex, or getting naked, or talking in rooms while there's naked booba girls. And then 1% of the show is kind of mid-sword fights. 
that's about where we're at. That's about what the com- composition of it is. And I have nothing against shows that are mostly people talking in rooms. Most anime is just people talking in rooms. I like talking in rooms. It's fine. There's nothing wrong with talking in rooms. But you have to have good characters. And Game of Thrones has such a huge cast that it's really hit or miss with its characters. Some of them are cool. Some of them are mid. Like, I quite liked Daenerys, the dragon lady. I thought she was pretty cool. Um, yeah, I like her her little quest. But then also, I'm like, kind of in the back of my mind this whole time, I'm like, why is everyone, why is everyone thirsting after power? Like, you become king, and you just get, like, assassinated anyway. Like, why would you want, why would you want to become king? You know? Like, I, I it seems really obvious to me that if I was, like, some third son of a, a lord somewhere in Westeros, I'd be like, bro, I'm a fucking lord. Like, I already have land. I don't have to work. I'm a, I'm a literally an aristocrat. Why would I bother to, like, try and become king and take the crown? Like, I don't want, I don't want to put my life in any more danger. I'm quite happy to be a little, you know, some sort of landed guy who just taxes the peasants and, and gets to, you know, live for, live live out happily as long as I, like, what the fuck? Why even bother? Why are they thirsting off to power? They can't, they don't do anything with it anyway. That's something that's a little, dis- it's like, I don't like how the, the, all of the, and I understand that this is probably done on purpose, but it's kind of annoying to me how all of the, essentially the government, right, the, the aristocracy, the, the lords and princes and kings and whatever, they are so completely unconcerned with the lives of the actual people that live in the places that they're governing. And I am sure that that's done on purpose, but also it's like, well, what are you even being king for, (laughs) you know? Like, what does, it seems like all you do with all your power as king is like have Joffrey or whatever, you know, like all you do is like throw parties and buy expensive things. It's like, what about like, pol- I'm, I'm a nerd. Like, I kind of want to know about policy. Am I crazy for that? Like a lot of people, they're like, I'm, I'm the true rightful king. There's a whole bunch of people like that in, 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 in the show. There's, there's five, ten different people. It's a literally Game of Thrones, right? That's the whole point of the show. It's a whole bunch of people that are like, I'm the rightful king. And they all have armies. And it's like, why, though? <laughs> like, why, why, like, how did you convince this group of people to fight for you when you've never mentioned anything that would make their lives better as regular folks, you know? Like, why would they ever fight for you as the one true king? It doesn't make any sense. I guess you're paying them. Like, yeah, sure. But it would be nice. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I'm just a fucking politics nerd. And I know that this is um, this is a, an intentional part of the show in some aspects to be like, look, they live in their own little world where they're only concerned about the, the power struggle between different houses and they don't even see these peasants as real people, which is also like some, somewhat accurate to how it would have been in like a medieval society. You know, I, I appreciate that and I accept that and whatever. It's also not necessarily how it would have been in the medieval society. Post-Norman invasion of, of England, uh, you know, the Normans, they had a very strong sense that uh, the the king has a duty to his people, right? The, 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 in the Norman conception of of king, kingliness, I guess, was that, like... Uh, Essentially, God chooses the king as a manifestation of the people's will, effectively. Like, the king is not... The, the king is the country. It, does this make, it doesn't really make much sense. It's kind of hard to wrap your head around as a modern person. But it's kind of similar to an elected representative, but like how we think about it as like a manifestation of the people's will, even though it does, you know, isn't really, and no one really thinks about it like that. But the it was sort of like... Anyway, what I'm saying is, prior to the Norman invasion of England in 1066, uh, William the Conqueror, he came over, he conquered, that's why he's called that. Prior to that, it was kind of like Game of Thrones. No one really gave a fuck about the peasants. King Short did what they did. And then after that, they at least put on airs (laughs) about caring about the peasants. They at least pretended to care about the peasants. They at least, they, they, they had like, 
highfalutin ideas about like oh well we must give back to the people and whatever even though like how much did that actually manifest it depended and varied so much it and especially like in the difference between how normans versus english were treated during that time like uh you know there was a lot of uh it was it was a very stratified society. Sorry, I've just gone on a rant about medieval England again. Uh, didn't mean to do that. I just meant to talk about fucking Game of Thrones. Yeah, so I I kind of got bored of the show and just stopped watching it. I didn't like I didn't even consciously drop it. It's not like something happened and I thought to myself, okay, that was bullshit. I'm gonna stop watching. Like I just I just kind of st- <laughs> I just kind of woke up one day and just didn't watch the next episode. Uh, <clears throat> I'm now uploading. The previous episode of the Slice of Life podcast to my Neo Cities, uh, which I probably shouldn't do while I'm recording because it's going to distract me. But yeah, I haven't watched Smiling Friends. I only just got around to watching Game of Thrones, which I thought was pretty boring. Um, Doug Walker will be redeemed because, yeah, he made kind of bad sloppy content, but so did like 99% of people on the internet, okay? It's, it's not a crime. And he ran a business really badly. Uh, and, yeah, <laughs> the people who deserved to have careers after that had careers after that, so it's fine, probably, maybe, I don't know. Uh, either way, I'm going to Estonia soon, and I'm pretty nervous about that. I do not like traveling. I really don't like it. I hate airports, my least favorite places. Airports are my least favorite places ever. Uh... They're, they're just the worst. It's like everything bad. And it's all because of fucking 9-11. It's so strange, right? That, like... It's actually very strange to me how little focus from from any, like... There's a lot of people out there, right? They wanna... They wanna give, give people freedoms. They're all about my freedoms. Whether they're lefties, libertarians, you know, whatever. No one, like, so few people complain about how fucked up airports are. Like, every, all of the, the, the weird and fucked up things about airports were made in direct response to 9-11, but they were all supposed to be temporary, right? And then they just aren't, like, they just perma. Like, and we just let them get away with this for some reason? Because, oh, what do you mean? You want to lower the security? And I don't know, I fucking hate it. It's like, it's just, it just feels like like a panopticon i hate being in that environment it's so stressful even though you know i'm a it's it's the worst feeling which is hurry up and wait right it's the worst feeling where you you can't even relax you get there three hours early and then of course it's like you don't even have to bother like there's no reason to even do that because it it it, 99% of the time everything goes smoothly and then you're just sitting there waiting for like two hours but you can't even properly relax while you're waiting because you have to be constantly paying attention to like, oh, is my gate open? Oh, I, got, I fucking hate it, man. I don't want to do it. But I got to do it because I got to go see my, my, my wonderful girlfriend who lives in Estonia. Who's That's going to be for, worth it. Um, but anyway, <clears throat> I got to go. I got to go do that. The things I do for love, eh? Uh, yeah, I don't like airplanes. They're too small and too cramped. And I always get sick after I'm on an airplane. I'm too tall. I'm six foot three. I don't fit on airplanes. Uh, I always have to get the seats near the the emergency exits because otherwise, I made a terrible mistake first time I went to Estonia. I didn't get one of those seats, and uh, it was it was fucked up. It was an incredibly uncomfortable few hours because I was I was very very cramped. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, I'm not looking forward to doing all that traveling in a few days. Also, one thing I'm worried about is that. My ears, because you you might have seen that video where I talked about how my ear was was blocked with earwax. And that happens to me from time to time. But this is the first time ever where it's become fully blocked and then it's unblocked itself. That's never happened before. Every, all the time previously, I've had to get it, like, cleaned out, you know, by, by a, a, a doctor or something. This is the first time it's ever unblocked itself. But, like, that's going to be fucking paranoid. Because like, what if it? What if I'm in the middle of Estonia, and it blocks up again? I don't. I won't have the op, and it doesn't unblock itself this time. Like I don't have the option to just 
I don't know. Maybe I do, but I don't. No one ever wants to have like medical issues overseas, right? It's it seems like a terrible experience. So I gotta like, I don't know. Maybe maybe I should just. <laughs> I don't know. I've got like vague plans to go to a, a a place and get a micro suction. It's probably gonna cost a bunch of money. Speaking of money, you know what's fucking like got me fucked up is is food right now. Like, I can't. I can't shop how I'd normally shop because I'm going to be away for, for months. So I can't, like, buy anything to keep. I can't buy... But I have to buy, like, very small portions of stuff. And that's fucking me up. I'm not used to, to living like that. But more more importantly, it becomes really expensive to, to shop like that. Like, normally you got to buy things in bulk. Make a big stew. Make a big pot of something, right, that you eat over... Like, that's how I normally eat. Because that's just the most efficient way to eat. But, uh, you know, if I, it's fucked up. You gotta spend so much money. It's just like all the extra hidden fees of traveling includes like not buying food like I normally would. And that's bad. I don't like that. Uh, I can't sleep lately. I can't sleep lately. It's all fucked up, really. Everything's fucked up, really. But, hey. In the, oh, and then I gotta decide. This is something else. I gotta figure this out basically today, I think. So, I'm going to Estonia. How do I compute while I'm there? How do I compute? So there is a, there's a desktop computer there. But, there's only one. And, Dotesmite is gonna be using that to play RuneScape often, right? I don't wanna just commandeer that computer. All the time, that would be bad. Uh, so I bring a laptop, right? And last time, first time I went, I brought my Mac and my ThinkPad. And then I kind of ended up just using my Mac, or like mainly using my Mac. So then the second time I went, I brought just my Mac. But then, I didn't like it. I was like, I wish I had my ThinkPad. Um, I don't know. And now I'm like, should I bring my X60? For some reason, this whole time I've been like, I should bring my X60. But now, like, isn't that kind of a stupid idea? Because <laughs> it can barely run anything. I don't know what's going on in my head, man. I don't know. I'm just kind of fucking losing it. Uh, but it, I think I, I genuinely think I might bring my X60 because it's lighter. It's smaller and lighter. And it can play, you know, retro visual novels perfectly fine. Uh, and also, if I bring my X220, that means having to, inst- I, like, I probably want to in- install Linux on it. Because I currently have OpenBSD on it. Which is a great operating system, but I, I'm i like... One thing I want to do is read read Eroge, right? That's that's the situation I'm in. I want to read visual novels. Um, and, you know, that means wine, which doesn't work on OpenBSD. So I have to decide today. Today is the day where I have to decide if I'm, if I'm going to bring my X60 to Estonia or my X220. And then if I'm bringing my... If I decide on the X220, I need to install a proper Linux distro and fuck up my hard drive even more than it's already fucked up and then you know bring over a bunch of put a put a bunch of of eroge on it and and anime and stuff. oh i also need to start looking for stuff to download to watch on the plane i guess this is, that's a good time to to watch my uh to watch some of this this anime that was airing recently because i i have not watched any recently airing anime there's that train one right uh is it is it finished yet? It seems like people started talking about it at the beginning of the season, and no one talks about it anymore. So that's not a good sign. That's normally a situation where that means the show got bad. Yeah, Shumatsu Torenu. Shumatsu Torenu Dokoeku. Yes. Yes. Um, this show. Is it finished yet? I need it to be finished so that I can download the whole fucking thing. Let's find out, shall we? Train to the end of the world. It's on episode nine. Well, I can. I guess I can download everything up to episode nine. When's the next episode? Five days. Okay, so we're gonna be watching up to episode nine. And then there's also Girls Band Cry. It seems like quite a lot of people like Girls Band Cry, right? But but I don't know if I'm particularly interested in Girls Band Cry. I might be. I have no idea. Uh. Yeah, frankly, I've got no fucking clue what's going on with my life right now. I'm stressed. I'm stressed out. I'm hungry. I haven't had breakfast yet. It's, I've been awake for like three hours and I haven't had breakfast. 
I gotta go to the ear place to get my ears placed, replaced. Gotta get my ears replaced. Uh, I gotta get my ears replaced. I gotta download every anime ever made. I gotta get mad because of uh, ranking inflation on my anime list. And then I gotta make a TF2 video. I know, so I'm, I'm really trying not to talk too much about Team Fortress 2 in this podcast. I know I'll give up at some point. But that's another thing, is while I'm in Estonia, like, Dotsmite's mouse pad is fucking tiny. Like, Dotsmite's desk is, is, is atomic. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's molecular. It's fucking minuscule. The, it's impossible to aim. So last time I went to Estonia, I just ended up playing backburner pyro, just just flank pyro the whole time because you don't have to aim. Um, so I don't know what the fuck to do because yeah, I've been really really into playing demo man recently. So I guess that's just a no go. I guess it's just no demo man for me once I'm in Estonia. If I want to play TF two, I'm gonna be playing like maybe I maybe I start playing spy. <laughs> it's pretty cringe. Uh, I don't know. I could play spy. I could. Th- what do I don't don't need to aim? What do I don't need to aim? Like, I can't really play Demo Knight because doing, like, any advanced trimps means having smooth movements, which you can't really do on a time, the high sense. Uh, Pyro seems like the best option, but it gets pretty boring. Uh, Spy, you don't really need to aim if you just use the knife. Play, like, stock, you know? Uh, medic, I guess you'd have to aim crossbows stuff. Uh, yeah. Well, I'll figure something out. I'm sure I'll figure it out. The game, the game is is pretty fun. But the thing I'm worried about is, I need to keep up. I need to keep up my Feast TF2 channel. I want to post very regularly on there, and I've got I've got a bunch of stuff that I've like figured out about the game that I kind of want to talk about. But yeah, I don't know. Like, I kind of want to make a video. So I made I made a video on on this channel where I like just showcased a couple of sticky lineups on Bad Water, and I kind of want to make a video where I'm like about sticky lineups, but no one else has ever no like as far as I can tell I'm the only person that cares about this as a concept, so like I would need to go around and do so much it would take so long, like I'd have to do so much research, I'd have to dive into like every popular map. Sorry, I'm just dropping shit on the fucking computer. Like, I'd have to go into, like, all the popular maps and start figuring out sticky lineups myself in order to make a video where I showcase a bunch of them. But then, not only that, I'd have to, like, gather footage of me actually using them in games, effectively. Which is also kind of luck-based and just takes a lot of time to grind. So I can't really make that video right now because it just would take too long before I have to get to Estonia. Um... But maybe I can make that video when I'm in Estonia. I could just, you know, be, like, generally grabbing footage of that sort of thing while I'm there. It's probably possible. Uh, I don't know how well Dotsmite's computer will work running OBS at the same time. Like, recording and playing at the same time. So, yeah. I guess I guess we'll just have to see. I guess, I, guess uh, I'll, I, I won't know until I'm there. Uh... Let's see, what else? Is there anything else interesting to mention in my life? Uh, yeah, so I, I ideally, I need to think of another quick Fish T... I want to get one more Fish TF2 video out before I, before I head off. Uh, I'm not sure. By the way, if you somehow missed it, Fish TF2 is my new TF2-focused YouTube channel. And I, I want to I post quite regularly on there. Uh, but yeah. Let me see. I, I gotta yeah, I just gotta think of something. I just gotta think of something. But anyway, it's get I gotta I gotta fucking get some breakfast. I gotta figure out breakfast. So here I am watching a YouTube video. I'm watching a YouTube video called One Hundred Thousand Subscribers QA by Oliver Lug. Now Oliver Lug, great YouTuber. Love him. This video about the QA. Great video. It's just a fairly standard QA, but it's fun. If you like the guy yeah, you know, it's a QA video, whatever. But in the video, one of the questions, can you recommend any other YouTubers that you like? And he's like, you know what? Boom, here's a playlist of a bunch of my favorite YouTube videos. And I'm like, oh, I like a bunch of favorite YouTube videos. I like a video. Let me watch some of these. So I scroll by and listen to all the stuff I've already seen, you know? 
the Roblox Oof H Bomber Guy video, the Stand Up Maths video about Dream Speedrun, uh, Harder Drives by Sucker Pinch, The Race to Win Staten Island by CGP Grey, How to Radicalize a Normie by NUND Studio, like, you know, it's a bunch of Lindsay Ellis, 60 Symbols, it's a Jenny Nicholson, Minute Earth, Let Me Know, Bill Watts. Uh, you know, it's a bunch of people that you know. It's the people that you know. And then there's a random Nerd Cubed video in there as well, which is really funny. Uh, line goes up the problem with the NFTs. You know, it's the classics. They're all good videos. I'm not trying to shun any of them. But then there's also some videos in here that I haven't seen before, and some of them were good. But there's one that I hadn't seen, and he actually pointed this one out in specific uh, by this guy called Simon Clark, a YouTuber called Simon Clark, uh, who made a series of three videos uh, about climate change, about the history of climate science, and then the future of climate science. Um, and this video about the future of climate science, it's called Global Warming, the Century We Saved Earth, and it's presented like a history timeline, but going from now to the year 2100. And it's pretty bogus. <laughs> it's pretty bunk. It's pretty biggledy bogus, and I'm pretty disappointed with it. And it just goes to show, in a lot of ways, how uh, the 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 problems we're facing are so fucked because they require interdisciplinary in interdisciplinary intersection research to understand. Like, okay, so let me give you. Let me just give it to you straight. So he basically is like, look, I'm 40 minutes into the video, we're in like 2040 something. And, uh, you know, technology has improved in various ways. We are actually now, finally, like we reached peak CO2 emissions, like we're pumping less CO2 into the atmosphere year by year, but like it's still nowhere close to where we need to be. Um, he talks about, combines like real world stuff, like the Paris Agreement, uh, the... Uh, Inflation Reduction Act with, you know, future stuff like, hey, there'll be a war in Kyrgyzstan uh, over, like, this water source. There'll be political tensions in Egypt because of the Nile and hydroelectricity. Like, it's, uh, pretty interesting stuff and stuff that makes sense. But here's, here's basically this situation, okay? Then he's like, you know, by the end of the video, he's going to get to the point where climate change was solved. It's all, and it's been the lead up it's been all the lead up, 40 minutes into the video, it's all been lead up to like the moment the switch flips and humanity makes the really big decision that, that, that does it. And this is it. So after various, you know, um, China investing heavily in like mines in Africa for lithium and cobalt and all sorts of things like that, which leads to Africa growing as an economic superpower and because they have strong economic ties with China and China has strong nuclear uh, engineering, a lot of the newer cities in Africa become very, uh, you know, heavily nuclear, whatever. I'm trying to summarize this, but the point is there's a bunch of geopolitical stuff that happens like that, which all leads to like, uh, there's new, you know, aviation fuels that are now cheaper, like the biofuel for aviation is now cheaper. There's expansions of alternatives to flying, uh, electric cars, etc. Uh, and it's like, okay, suddenly, uh, oil and gas and, and that sort of thing, it's starting to, to, to not be as in demand as it used to be, you know? We've seen people are using less and less fossil fuels. Uh, you know, the, the amount of CO2 emitted is going down each year up until this point. This is a great video. It's very realistic. It's, it's uh, you know, it is what it is. It's, 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 uh, it's an interesting bit of, 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 I don't know, storytelling with some, some stuff that seems pr pretty plausible. Um, there's a running joke where nuclear fusion is always uh, just around the corner. It's always just a, just a few years away. Every few years, it's just a few years away. Very funny. Um, <clears throat> and because fossil fuels are now worth less and less money, uh, or in, rather in less and less demand, which means, you know, the prices going down, dropping, these fossil fuel companies like Shell and Exxon and whatever, in 2024, there's a cascade where they go, they start to go bust. And that seems a little insane to me because I feel like they would all pop pivot to quote unquote clean energy anyway. But uh, nonetheless, this is the big point. 
he's like they all went bust created a big problem in lots of economies but because of all of these protests the governments of the large economies in the world decided not to bail them out because they're just such good people because there was so much there were large protests everywhere and all these people protested not to bail them out and so they just let them collapse and that's what saved humanity because now there were no fossil fuel giants and the way it's phrased in the video is he's hearkening back to the 2008 financial crash and the bailouts of the banks there as if there were no protests like he seems to just imagine that when you get enough protests then the government they just don't bail they just don't bail these too big to fail companies out that and it's very funny the the lib the lib shit that's going on here like when he's showing protests he's like got mock up posters and they're all the most generic stuff it's getting hot in here so take off all your coal and oil uh and then just save our planet with a drawing of the uh, like this is not how politics work. I just want to remind everyone, okay? There was once a time when the world's largest protest happened. It was in I've 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 mentioned this 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 fact really really blackpilled me, so I just love repeating it and blackpilling more people. It was a protest against the Iraq War in Rome, Italy. It consisted of 3 million people. 3 million strong march. That is insane. like it's the largest protest in history uh at least in one single march right like you can't even imagine that 3 million people i i can't imagine 3 million people in one place or put like it's a, it's an insane number of people it's an insanely large scale protest and obviously it achieved fucking nothing right like it achieved nothing it was completely it it was meaningless because protests don't do it like the idea that i don't know It's a very strange idea that like you get a few people in the street and somehow that changes uh the e- economic interests of the ruling class. Is not how it works. Like this guy he's really going hard into the idea that somehow uh liberalism will solve the climate crisis. It, and it just it all hinges on this fundamental misunderstanding of how government and corporations work that like okay a domino effect happens which leads to the collapse of a few fossil fuel giants seems suspicious but i'll give it i'll give it a, I'll, i'll allow it plausible but then and no one will bail them out no one will bail these giants out even though it will you know worsen an economic collapse and in particular lose the government's a bunch of money because there were a bunch of people standing outside with signs that said save our planet you think that's going to happen i don't think that's going to happen i don't think that's going to happen it just doesn't seem likely to me it also doesn't seem likely to me like just to point this out i haven't finished the video so i don't want to get too far into it but a uh, couple couple of electric cars and trains that's not how you solve the climate crisis man electric cars There's still cars like electric cars are not that great they're not great they're really not great they take a lot of like there's a there's a very very common issue with people who not done any deep ecology is like they solve the demand side problem and then completely ignore the supply side problem so they're like well the you aren't filling your car up with fossil fuels anymore therefore boom fixed without paying any mind to how are we constructing those cars in the first place how are we getting the shit out of the ground to put into the cars how are we powering the factories that assemble the cars etc how are we constructing whatever power plants uh you know be they fossil fuel or renewable how are we constructing those things how are we getting the resources to do that hmm all of that takes a lot of energy and this is the whole trap this is why we're fucked is because it doesn't really matter if you solve if i myself never interact with the fossil fuel that doesn't really matter if i if i as a random consumer you know touch a fossil fuel from time to time it's good enough for the companies that run these things to to slap a label on these things that says they're green or whatever but 
it has absolutely nothing to do with the the central problem, which is there is a shitload of infrastructure that needs to be built to support a uh, renewable energy economy. And building that infrastructure requires a shitload of energy. And presently, there has been almost no effort to transition that side of the economy, the industrial side of the economy, to renewables. Almost all the focus has been on consumer goods, transport, these sorts of things. So we're stuck in a situation where we simply don't have the shit, like we don't have time. We don't have time to mine all the, to, to make all the new resources to create, it's, it's like a loop, you know? Like if you want a renewable mine, which is not possible by the way, like let's just clear that up first of all, all of these things, including your cobalt, your lithium, etc. Yeah, that shit runs out. <laughs> that shit runs out eventually, and then you're fucked. But, like, the oil, the coal, that shit runs out. What happens, pray tell, if that, the, the oil and, and, and gas and coal run out before you've had enough time to use all of that oil and gas and coal to build infrastructure that powers industrial solar panel manufacture or whatever like you just don't you can't do that anymore you're fucked you're you no longer you you are now in energy poor you are now in energy poverty you now no longer have the resources like it's not about when i say runs out like let me be very clear here what i actually mean because i think some people think that it literally is going to run out like no it's just going to be that the only remaining like oil reserves will be so hard to access that the return on investment for actually extracting them is going to get lower and lower and lower, right? Like, your and oil is going to get more and more and more expensive because of this, right? Uh, like, the, the, the more, we've already, we've already used up all of the easy to access oil in the world, pretty much. Um, like, fracking and shale natural gas extraction have extended our ability to live in this energy rich world for a while and you know i'm not going to be a a, a a guy that gets proven wrong and say like but this is the last chance we get because who knows you know there could be more technology like that that comes along and uh there could always be new oil fields to go yeah, who knows although I'm, but it seems like we already reached peak oil in 2019 it's pretty confirmed at this point so at this point uh yeah it just it, do you understand like it's not that you'll literally have no more oil, it's just that it will be more expensive to extract the oil than what people would normally pay for it. So, like, the energy is just going to become more and more scarce. And, uh, you know, we don't have a setup by which we can extract the resources necessary to produce renewable infrastructure without re relying still on the non-renewable infrastructure. Do you understand? Like, we, there's a lot of effort to make electric cars. There's not that much effort to make, like, electric, you know, whatever the fuck they use to mine rocks out of the ground, <laughs> right? There's, there's, I, I'm not aware of any fully net zero <laughs> renewable coal mines in the world, <laughs> or uh, lithium mines in the world, I mean. You know, like, the... That stuff, and, and maybe he's sort of implying that nuclear would fill the gap because it would all happen in China and Africa and China. I don't know. It's very, it's, it's very vague. But, like, that's the important part. Don't be vague about that part. <laughs> you know, I care about that part. That's the real bit where if we fuck that up, we're really fucked. And right now, there's no sign that we're not fucking that up. Like, no one, it, it's, it's kind of a complicated issue to wrap your head around. It's not something that you have to think about in your day-to-day -day life, so... And it's not something like I've ever seen any popular source bring up. Like, have you? Have you ever seen like a YouTube video essay or a news spot or an article bring that up? Like in the popular media? No, no one ever brings that shit up. Even though it's like you think about it for 10 seconds and you're like, oh, yeah, that's how this that's how we all die. <laughs> like, that's the bit that fucks up. Obviously, that's that's the obvious bit that we fuck up. But no one seems to care. Uh, there's no mention of like, oh yeah, you know, droughts will be more harsh or whatever, but where's the mention of fucking soil?
Where's the soil? Where's the desertification? Where's the goddamn... Tell me about agriculture, please. Please tell me how we're going to be growing our food. That's all I care about. Tell me how we're going to be growing our food. This is a very, again, super obvious thing. Everyone's just, they're just like, oh, it's all about carbon in the atmosphere. and Nothing else even exists. Nothing other than carbon in the atmosphere exists, except for methane, but only when it comes from cow farts. We don't care about methane uh, in any other uh, time. In fact, we love methane in other times, because you know what the biggest methane producers in the world are, other than ag animal agriculture? It's swamps, it's wetlands, it's rainforests, it's all the good shit in the world, right? Ah, <sighs> man, I don't want to go on a fucking rant about methane, because I'll be here for 10 years, but methane... Just don't worry about it, okay? You can worry about it. You should you should worry about it. You should worry about methane, but the point being, what I'm worried about, when I think about ecological collapse, I'm like energy sink where we we know like we no longer have the cheap accessible energy to build renewable infrastructure fast enough to keep up and you know you've played if you ever played a resource management game, you've been in this situation. Like, this is how you fail in resource management games, right? Where you, you were like, didn't spot something 10 turns ago, and then you're like, oh, fuck, wait, now I'm just fucked. Like, I can't physically make enough of this stuff that I need to make the next thing before my time runs out on this thing, and so I'm just fucked, and then that's how you lose in resource management. Like, you will, if you've played any sort of, like, resource management game or, or, like, strategy game, you've had an experience like that. Like, that's the thing that's happening. But no one seems to, like, what's, yeah, well, except I seem to have noticed it. And I, other people have noticed it, but it doesn't get communicated very well. Like, it's, it's very strange. Like, it just, this, this thing never ends up in the media for some reason. Uh, I'm not saying I'm special for having noticed it. I just, like, did a bare minimum of research beyond the popular media. And it's like, I feel like everyone should be doing that for everything. But not everyone has time or patience, and I understand that. But the point is, you shouldn't have to, because we all know that, like, we all know a bunch of other stuff about climate change. We all know, like, relatively complex systems, like uh, coal bleaching. That's a relatively complex system. Like, you wouldn't, you, there's no way you would logically imagine, okay, if I, you know, drive my car over on one side of the world, that affects coral populations in the other side of the world, which is actually really important and something I should actually care about and not something just like, who cares, it's just corals, right? You know, the CO2 goes into the atmosphere, it is then dissolved into the ocean, which leads to ocean acidification because it creates carbonic acid and that bleaches the corals, which makes them die. And then the corals act as a natural defense against extreme sea waves and shit. And then those hit the shore and kill people. <clears throat> right like it, it's a pretty complex system but we all kind of know about it because there's been a lot of good media attention about like the great barrier reef in australia and shit like that why isn't there the same thing about hey if you keep growing corn in the same place in america for a hundred years you're not going to have any nutrients in the soil and that soil is going to turn into fucking dust and you can't grow food in dust uh and yeah you can try to keep pumping it full of artificial fertilizers, but to be honest, we're just in the dust bowl again. We're just in, you're, you're just delaying the inevitable. Like, the only way to actually fix this is regenerative agriculture, and outside of a few, it exists, regenerative agriculture exists, and there's actually some really great work being done. In Australia, there's great work being done. In India, there is great work being done. Uh, in the, uh, surrounding the Sahara, there's good work being done. In the permaculture community, like all across the world, there's great work being done. But in the mainstream, no one cares. The government has never even, there's no government other than local governments in India, and that's about it, have ever given a shit. Like, I gotta, I gotta hand it to local governments in southern India. <laughs> to be honest with you, I gotta hand it to local governments in southern India, because they, they're actually on the ball with this. Mainly because it's genuinely a life or death situation for them. They're like running out of food and water. Well, we're going to be in that fucking situation. It's going to be a bit too late for us. <sighs> we got different problems to face. We got too much. In the UK, we have too much water. It's flooding. Crazy flooding. 
it gets reported from time to time. No one ever talks about the solutions because the solutions, well, if you actually start talking about it, then it starts to threaten the profits of Monsanto and other agricultural giants because, hey, maybe we don't need all these artificial fertilizers. I mean, we need them, but maybe, I don't know, it makes a, it makes a whole problem. You start to have to think about reorganizing the economy in certain ways, which is something that Simon Clark has been very careful to avoid. Hey, we don't want to talk about reorganizing the economy in a way that might hurt fossil fuel giants. The existing economic structures, which have so far incentivized governments to prop up corporations very similar to BP and Exxon and so on, will suddenly decide to change their mind and we won't bail them out and they'll collapse and then we'll save the planet. That's how this is going to work. We don't need to make any sort of changes to the underlying economic structure. It's a bit silly. It's a little bit silly. I don't like this video also because it presents a world that is way too hopeful. Like, I think people are going to watch this and they're going to come away thinking, well, I don't have to do anything until 2040. And then in, in like 2043, I'll go to a few protests. I'll hold up a sign that says, save our planet. And then, they, then we're going to win. Like, that's easy. <laughs> you know, it's, I feel like that's kind of the vibe that this video gives me. It's kind of comforting if I didn't know that that's not the case, right? But we're all fucked anyway. Like, that's my, this is my attitude at this point is, look, where I gotta, I gotta go somewhere. There's gotta be somewhere good on Earth. There's gotta be somewhere safe. You don't wanna be in the UK. This country's collapsing, obviously. Like, this country's fucked. You don't wanna be in the US. It's funny, in this video, actually, he does talk about right at the beginning, he's like, oh yeah, the US like basically became a military dictatorship and then isn't relevant for the rest of the story, <laughs> which is really funny. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's something. Uh, it's all about China, India, and Africa. Uh, <clears throat> you know, you don't want to be in the US, you don't want to be in Canada, you don't want to be in the UK, you don't really want to be in most of Europe, to be honest. Nordic countries might be fine. Uh, this is not just for climate change, this is just in general. Northern Europe... Nordic countries, Scandinavian countries, I could see that being okay. I could see them, I could see them pulling through. You know, the Netherlands, yeah, sure, why not? Definitely don't want to be in Germany. Don't want to be anywhere near Germany. If you can get them, good, I don't know if any of you are history buffs. There's a Norm McDonald joke. I don't know if any of you are history buffs, but they tried to invade the world twice. They're getting ready to try it again. You don't want to be anywhere near there. Where do you want to go? You don't want to be in... Eastern Europe, you don't want to be anywhere near Russia, because that's, that's going to get fucked. You don't want to be anywhere near Russia, you know, you don't want to be anywhere else is poor, so you don't want to be there. Uh, if you're not in Europe or the US, you don't want to be in anywhere else, because that's, that's poor. You don't want to be in Australia, because they have a weird relationship, they're, they're fucked. I mean, Australian government is very fucked and not getting any better. Um, you don't want to, you, maybe New Zealand, but New Zealand, that's where every, that's the obvious answer. The obvious answer is New Zealand, so all the billionaires are already moving there. Um, so you're going to be priced out real quick in New Zealand. Uh, <clears throat> you know, the places I'm thinking, where you want to go, only place I can think of, China. You want to be in motherfucking China. You want to be in like Chengdu or something. You want to you be in China. You've got to be inside the belly of the beast. Obviously, you don't want to be in Taiwan, right? That would be bad. But if you're just like in China and you're vibing, I feel like you're fine. Like in a city in China, you know doing something, you're going to be pretty good, right? I think so. Like, China has it pretty good. They got it pretty good. They got it going pretty well over there. I, I think, you know, there's all these memes. China's going to collapse in two weeks. Oh, my God. Xi Jinping is fucked. He's going to collapse in two weeks. Peter Zihan is going to, he's coming out. China, the demographics collapse is going to destroy the, it's going to be the biggest collapse of an economy ever. You know, he's been saying this for, like, 30 years, right? Um... Yeah, China has a demographics problem, but there's no evidence that it's as severe as that guy fucking says it is. Um, yeah. Look, there's problems. China has problems. Every country has problems. But I feel like it's the best. I just feel like it's it, the, 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 the economy's good. It doesn't show really. It's, it's, not, it's not on the up and up and up like it used to be, but it's not exactly crashing. You, you could be... Hmm. I don't know. I don't know. There's not really any... Maybe you just want to be in a... Like, the thing is, it would be nice to be somewhere no one cares about, right? But the problem is that places no one cares about, it means no one cares if, like, someone decides to, like, invade you or something, right? Like, if you went to... I don't fucking know. Somewhere like Thailand. 
or you know somewhere in, in Malaysia, somewhere in Southeast Asia, right? Great place. I I love Southeast Asian culture. I love their food. I love I love everything about Southeast Asia. Great. Too hot. Too fucking hot for me. But very cool. Some of the best food in the world, which is really what's important here. Um, yeah, but then you know you never know. <laughs> like it's, you, people were just probably chilling in Vietnam, and then all of a sudden, boom, everything popped off. You know, you never know what's gonna happen. Some random shithole. I'm not calling them places shitholes, but there's shitholes on Earth, right? You don't want to be in a shithole, but the whole Earth is gonna be a shithole. So there's literally nothing you can do other than just lock yourself in your room and and just masturbate to uh, hentai. There's no way. This guy is annoying, man. He, I, I paused the video and and recorded that rant, which ended up kind of off off topic. I don't know, but. He he was then, as soon as I played it, he was like, actually, the biggest thing that contributed to politicians deciding not to buy, bail out the fossil fuel giants was their children. I, here's a quote from a British finance minister. I looked in my daughter's eyes and I imagined, how could I live with myself for, for doing this to her future? Motherfucker, have you met a politician? Have you ever seen the shit politicians do? You think they have consciences? What the fuck are you talking about? This is politicians we're talking about. This is this is <laughs> what's going on with you. Uh, this is, and even then, his whole argument is just that like public pressure on fossil fuel corporations, just in general, combined with like uh, technological evolution, technological change, alternative uh, sources becoming cheaper and cheaper, is what's going to. Um, you know, ultimately win the battle, which, to be honest, seems like the most realistic, uh, you know, solution if you have trouble imagining any sort of economic system that is, like, even slightly different than our own. I just saw something, and it's a perfect example of a, a principle, which is that somehow, despite the internet having been around for a long-ass time, People still don't understand how to argue on the internet. People just has, still haven't figured it out, which is pretty shocking to me. And this is such a perfect example. The actual content of the argument isn't what's important here. But the form is what's important here. Okay, so some fucking, I don't care, it doesn't matter what the context was, I didn't even look at the context. Someone was responding to someone, responding to someone, quote tweeting someone, who fucking cares, right? The, the point is, someone said, huh hierarchy is obviously natural just look at any animal with an any pack animal with an alpha and then what you see is the responses to that re quote tweeting it whatever saying um the wolf study that was about alpha wolves was debunked by the guy like bro no one cares first of all that guy doesn't give a fuck if that's the case but then he's just gonna switch to be like well look at queen bees and then you, you have to sit there explaining that, like, they might be called queens, but that doesn't mean they literally rule over the hive. Hives are man, you know, hives make decisions collectively. It's just a name. It's just a metaphor. Like, you know, this is a stupid road to go down. You are now playing his game because the game is all he has to do is find one example. He just has to go lobsters or whatever. He just has to point to one thing in nature where... Some animal species hierarchy exists and you're owned, right? Because you've taken the stupid idea of engaging with this argument on its own terms because you saw an easy in. You were like, I remember hearing that that wolf study about wolves having alphas was fake. So I'm going to chip in here. Little do you know that that was stupid. You shouldn't have done that. What you do is you say, well, that if you're referring to wolves, that's fake. But that doesn't matter anyway, because whether something exists in nature or not doesn't determine human actions. Whether other animals do something shouldn't determine human naturals, uh, human actions. That's called the natural naturalism uh, fallacy or something. Naturalist fallacy. Whatever. Uh, naturalists are like people who go on naked. I don't know. But <laughs> it's something like that. The, like... Glasses aren't natural either. No one, there's no animals that construct glasses. Are glasses a, a, a bad thing? Should we stop wearing glasses? Should people just not be able to see? No, obviously. Uh, right? Like, that's the actual answer, is you have to take a look at... People are so bad. Like, why can't you do this? It's such a... Like, okay. 
I just hope that everyone listening to this takes that as an example. The actual content of that particular argument is, is stupid and pointless. It's a stupid argument to have. Don't bother ever having it. Um, and this is basically how you avoid that, right? Is you, you, you need to take a look at the... You can't just nitpick little tiny points in someone's argument. That's a bad way. It's, it's stupid. That's how you end up getting owned on the internet. Because it's so easy to just keep Googling until you find something right? It's so easy. So don't do that. Don't, like, you might win temporarily, but you're losing the war. You need to look at, as well as the individual facts, because if someone's argument hinges on a fact that's obviously fake or provably fake, you know, that's going to own them. But you have to also focus on taking down the form of their argument, looking at the actual premises, looking at the assumptions that are being made, and challenging those. Now, does it of course the point of an argument is not to on the internet there's no point you're not going to convince the other person so the best option is to just ignore it but there you go that's how you argue on the internet you don't go talking about the dog study because no one fucking gives a shit about the wolf study no one cares about bio that's you know now you're just bogged down in the weeds of that nonsense instead Yes, you had simply addressed that, that hey, you, you formulated this argument, but uh, do you really b agree with what you've said? Because I bet that that person will, will, will turn around and say, no, actually, uh, we probably shouldn't uh, look, look to random animal species and start organizing human activity in accordance with that. That's probably a bad idea. Is it a bad idea to start talking about politics this early in the video? Yeah. Yeah, probably, but we're going to do it anyway. I don't give a fuck, okay? <clears throat> we're going to do it anyway. There's often this, this left-right divide, especially on the internet, where it comes down to this dichotomy where both sides willingly participate, where the left is seen as the side which is in favor of empathy and kindness and love love is love you know compassion they throw a lot of those buzzwords out uh and they're very proud of this fact human beings are inherently good that's the side of the thing and then the right wing frame themselves as a sort of like oh that's naive you know humans are inherently greedy and violent and we need to protect ourselves and you can't trust people inherently and so on and while i think that's somewhat accurate for how these people operate in their day-to-day -day lives i think that it's it's quite telling <laughs> it's quite in interesting uh it's quite telling of like how people actually come across their politics that really this is true like it kind of is just based on these emotional reactions for 99 percent of people for right wingers, it's stronger. You know, this is my maybe bias or whatever. But as I see it, as I analyze the situation, basing your so the way that being right wing works is you have some emo. That's the reason it's called reactionary, right? You have some emotional reaction. You see two gay dudes kissing, and you're like, "Ugh, that's gross," and then you backtrack an entire politics to back that up. You see. Uh, a black person on the street and you have an, an, a, an emotional fear reaction and then you make an entire politics to back that up. You see a, a family with, with white children and that gives you a feeling of, of you know, fatherly love or, or, or pride or whatever and then you backtrack an entire politics onto that. It's very base emotional, instinct based. And then there are even... Uh, the This is what's funny about this is the the neocons and and so on will will all try and talk about how this is bad like that that's wrong that's that's stupid you're just blaming us you know we actually have perfectly reasonable economic policy or whatever but all of that economic policy was basically tacked on at the end like it doesn't have anything like deregulation and free markets and and that sort of thing doesn't like <laughs> follow to you know we must protect the future of white children or whatever like there's no there's no actual through line there unlike at least ideally the leftist version where it's like you know the social politics directly follows from the economics 
But anyway, what's interesting about that is that the further right you go, especially these days, to the like slightly more esoteric right wing people, they will start saying, yeah, of course, like this is actually based. Like you should be trusting your gut reactions and not over intellectualizing stuff. This is very trad. There's a very trad way of thinking about it. Like, uh, you know, a right wing thing might be, uh, well, uh, plant weak. If I eat plant, I become weak. Bull, big beef animal, strong. Eat beef, become strong, you know. And <laughs> then they'll do a whole bunch of stuff to back it up. But the people who are really more on the esoteric side will be like, yes, that's based. You should think like that. You are like, that's actually a, a, a form of liberation. That like this over intellectualizing, it might even be some sort of Jewish trick to deconstruct society and make everything fall down. And you shouldn't pay any attention to that. You should pay attention to your base instincts, which uh, is very trad and like that sort of thing, right? And that's, you know, if that doesn't set off immediate alarm bells for you, then you're probably right wing. Uh, but but what's interesting to me is that the leftists are doing this like the the the, the predominant thing that I outlined earlier, where people are just basing everything on on feelings and emotions like empathy and compassion and so on. It's just the same thing, like it's it's the same process. And so, in my opinion, at least, it's kind of going to lead to the same outcome. Uh, like these people are basic basically fascists. Uh, like if you are you know seeing. It's the same thing, right? You see, you see some some refugee who who can't get any any place to stay or whatever, running away from war, and you you're like it fills you with an emo immediate emotional reaction of like I don't know I want to give this person a house and a, and a, a food or whatever. Like it's this it's you gotta. This is where I get this is where I get a bit you know. <laughs> uh, I'm I'm like kind of scared about this right because i tend to that i have to actively fight like fight my my awkward technocratic <laughs> um instincts where i'm like no what we need to do is emotionally detach and examine these issues from a structural level and look at the systems that underlie them set out clear goals and then analyze the systems and decide how to adjust those systems or change or replace them, or destroy them, or whatever, in order to achieve whatever goal we've set out. You set out some goal, uh, and then you try and achieve that goal by organizing society in a particular way. You know, and maybe some of it's based on emotional reaction at the end of the day. It definitely is. I'm, 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 everyone is an emotional creature. Uh, but in my opinion, at least as far as I'm concerned, that's a, like, you, sh you shouldn't let that necessarily come into to play when you're trying to theorize and stuff, you know, that sort of thing, uh, that sort of emotional reaction, and then trying to backtrack an entire politics onto it, is, is often how you end up, you know, with, with, with the beliefs that don't necessarily mesh together, with, with a whole bunch of uh, nonsense, let's just put it that way. Now, I'm not saying that, I'm not trying to imply that, like, refugee acceptance is nonsense that was a i just i know those two ideas juxtaposed kind of made it seem like i was saying that but that's not what i was saying uh but either way in my opinion if the delineation is very simple there's one side that bases their principles off of emotional reactions and then there's another side who uh like has answers to structural problems that's this like it's not very complicated would you rather live under a right-wing authoritarian dictatorship or anything else? <laughs> it's pretty fucking simple. Like, there's this one way to organize society, and it's really bad, and it's failed horrifically every single time. No one's ever pulled it off successfully. And yet, for some reason, well, for very obvious reasons. It's not for some reason. It's for a very simple reason. Like, the, the right, they have to make up a whole bunch of stuff. They have to construct... Oh, there's the, 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 the Jews, it's the... the the degenerates, it's the, the, the cultural Marxists, it's George so like they have to come up with all sorts of, of crazy things to justify why, uh, hmm, I wonder why the government and corporations would uh, continually do things that give themselves more power. I wonder, like, hmm, why would they be doing that, you know? It's, it's very strange. 
it's very it's very unusual it's a very unusual situation i think a lot of it comes from i've often said right and i know this is this just sounds kind of silly because i i also believe that like my attitude is is te- technocratic and a bit silly as well right like it's 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 also uh maybe this sounds like lib shit but being able to emotionally detach and look at like that's that comes from a privileged position right like if you are in the midst in the mud you might not you might not you know have the the opportunity to sit back and be like well we have to think about this logically you know you're just trying to fight for your survival uh which you know is fair enough uh and i also don't necessarily you know that although i have this temptation where i'm like look if we just put really smart people in charge like these systems that are fixable you just read stafford beer and and fix this but then you know i'm also like that's a bad idea <laughs> we shouldn't do that probably because of various reasons um you know stafford beer is is pretty clear on this particular idea where he's like well you should have a management system but the systems one should be self self-governing self-managing the vast majority of the time and they should only appeal to the management system when something goes wrong basically like the management system is there as a to solve problems to solve crises to allocate resources and uh stuff like that but day-to-day operations should be self-managed and i'm sort of like okay you can say that mr beer but there's nothing actually in the structure of the society you outlined that takes away power from these management systems like you have still set up a particular system of hierarchy that relies on management being good and sensible in order to prevent it from turning back into a shit show whatever read uh seeing like a state for more information on why this stuff doesn't work and also possibly uh fuck tikkun did something about this as well right i don't remember what i don't remember what it was but there's a there's a tq tq tikkun tq i don't know how to pronounce that name uh the cybernetic hypothesis yes the cybernetic hypothesis that's it by tikkun uh and that's it's also pretty good. So so you know, I have I have conflicting ideas. I don't have all the answers. I'm not sitting here with all the answers. I'm not I don't have all the answers, but I will say I've said before. I think a lot of your politics is just determined by whether you fall whether you you fell for uh Cold War era propaganda or World War 2 era propaganda. Like whichever one you if you fell for Cold War propaganda, you become right wing. If you fell for World War 2 propaganda, you become left wing. Like that's pretty much all there is. And I think a lot of it what's interesting is that uh I think I think there's a lot of historical revisionism that goes into how we learn about World War 2. Uh like if I if I were to construct a curriculum about World War 2, you know, when you when you read about the Nazis, what do you what do you hear? There's a lot of of interesting stuff going on with the Nazis. <laughs> but uh like the Nazis were a anti-communist counter-revolution that's what they were the majority of nazis saw their primary enemy as soviet communism not the jews not any of that stuff this is a fact you can look this up the majority of nazis saw their their main enemy as being soviet communism the nazis came to power after a failed communist revolution of the sdp i believe is what they were called the german communist party they they failed and then the nazis took power um as a reactionary counter-revolution you know that's how i would that's how i would teach teach it but then going beyond that and this is where it gets a little scary this is where it gets a little iffy so there were various right-wing individuals particularly of the libertarian variety who like to espouse ideas about how the nazis were in fact socialists communists left-wing whatever there's even i i saw a youtube video once with like a million views that was about how the nazis were socialist um and now any bog standard leftist will tell you that that was nonsense right that like fascism is literally the opposite of socialism the 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 word privatization was invented to describe what the nazis were doing you know and so on they'll talk about that sort of thing but 
this is where, like, in my opinion, the whole left wing, right wing divide kind of starts to get in the way of, of actually talking about things. Because it's true that functionally that's what happened. But if you really do dig into the roots of Nazi ideology, it's more like, it's a bit confusing because the word socialism and communism, they kind of have, they have a few different meanings, right? Obviously the Nazis had national socialists in their name and that's about as far as a lot of people look. But the fact is that Nazi ideology was inspired in large part at the beginning by various anti-Marxist utopian socialists like um, LaSalle, LaSai, I don't know how to pronounce his name, and Bruno Bauer. Uh, these anti-Semitic utopian socialists, in their ideology inspired the Nazi party in a lot of ways. Hitler was a, was a member of the German Social Democratic Party at one point, uh, who themselves were inspired by um, one of those guys. I think I think LaSalle, or some, one of them. Either way, they were very anti-Semitic, and they were anti-Marxist, and but they called themselves socialists. And they were, like, there's a there was a weird thing that existed for a while that was anti-Marxist socialism. And that's the tradition that the Nazis were coming from. Uh, utopian socialism as opposed to so-called scientific socialism, which just a little, just to, to demarcate this real quick, when... When Marx says something is scientific, they mean something very different. <laughs> it's a classic Marxist thing where they have a word that everyone uses in one way, and they're like, nope, that actually, we're going to use that word in a very different way. And people get very confused. But in this case, it's just because it's old shit. It's fucking ancient. It was from, from fucking hundreds of years ago, you know? Back then, the word scientific meant something closer to what we might call synthetic a priori uh, knowledge, i.e. like mathematics, where you can sort of sit in a room and think about something for a long time, and uh, that's how you can come up with knowledge about the world. That's what scientific meant to, to Marx, like, and that's how the word was commonly used back then. Obviously, nowadays, we use scientific to mean basically the opposite. We use it to mean having a hypothesis and testing it to see if it's right or wrong, rather than just sort of doing logical thinking in, in in a room by yourself. I don't know. It's a bit silly. It's all a bit wacky. And then what's very funny is that there were some Marxists who then, when they say they're confronted about this, they're like, well, you call this scientific socialism, but, you know, this isn't scientific in the way we would use the word these days. They'll say, oh, yeah, well, it's not bourgeois science. <laughs> <laughs> where you test hypotheses and <laughs> the bourgeois science is such a funny idea to me. Uh, those fucking lefties, man, what are they doing? What are these lads up to? I don't have all the answers. I don't have all the answers, but I do have all the questions. I've got a large number of the questions. I don't have all the answers, but I got a lot of questions. And my question is how, why is everyone a fascist? Including me, clearly. What's going on with that? I just said how I got technocratic cybernetic tendencies. Why, why am I like this? Why is everyone a fascist? Well, I'm sure Deleuze would have something to say about that, but he, he, I have no idea. It's not good. It's not a good situation that we found ourselves in. Sorry, just sort of thinking about this sort of thing. Don't mean to bog, bog, bog down this podcast with, with uh, leftist propaganda, but if anything, I'm shit-talking leftists, okay? I'm shit-talking everyone. I'm like a centrist. I'm like an... I'm a lot like an enlightened centrist. You ever think about how... I, I often feel like post-leftism, which kind of died out, in the sense of, like, post-left anarchist, not, like, post-left who are just people who used to be left-wing and are now right-wing. Um, it kind of died out on the internet. It never really mattered. Right? I mean, I guess it did. There were a few post-left groups in the real world as well but they don't i don't know whatever the case may be it often seems to me that i used to call myself a posty but now looking back i feel like it's also just an excuse to kind of feel like an enlightened centrist to be like well i'm above left wing and right wing i'm actually better than everyone <laughs> like even though i personally have red marks and have nuanced and mixed opinions which you can 
hear about in my like hour long rant about communism on IDMR and in various other rants about communism, uh, I still these days call myself a leftist, even though it's pretty, you know, there's a lot of stuff in leftist politics that I generally disagree with. Um, even to some extent, the entire Marxian project, right? Like the furthering of human powers and species becoming, I kind of disagree with. I still just don't see the point. I just like functionally 99% of the time when it comes to like policy, it's unfortunate, but the left is just generally correct. Like when it comes to economics, yeah, you know, leftist economics, it might sound kooky because for some reason, I don't know why, I don't know how, but the right, they've convinced everyone that they're the ones that are sensible about economics. That we're very sensible. We're the, the Tories in the UK love doing this. We're very sensible about economics. We have, we have very common sense economics. Like, it's, it's really just misunderstanding how the monetary system works 99% of the time. It's like, well, it's sensible because you're framing it as if the government is like a household and they're basically the same thing. Like there's an in, you know, we have to balance the books and so like th that sort of thing. Which is, by the way, if you if that's not how government works. That's not how the monetary system works. That's not how economics works. And, you know, maybe, you know, back in the, the 70s and 80s, uh, the economics profession, academic e economists had stronger pro-free market takes. But modern economics, beyond the, like, Econ 101 level, is not that anymore. <laughs> you know, it's very much not, uh, you know, deregulate every market, the Austrian, whatever. It's, it's, uh, you know, it's behavioral economics, it's nudge, it's, it's all sorts of things like that. Uh, whatever, sorry, I'm just fucking rambling now about, about bullshit. Hello, slice of life viewers. Listeners, I should say. Oh, shut sorry. up, shut sorry. up, Nintendo. Nintendo is trying to ruin my podcast. It's Nintendo themselves. It's 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 Mr. Nintendo San. It's Mr. Nintendo. It's Nintendo San. Yeah. He's come to me to ruin my slice of life podcast. As you can hear, I'm in Estonia with Dots, mate. Swag on a bitch. You know what the fuck I'm talking about. Um, but every place is just a place. So let's get back to business. Denforchan.org. Anonymous says, responding to the Slice of Life podcast season 2, episode 1, baby. I'm just going to read the whole thing out here and respond to it as I read it. Hey, no. I like your Slice of Life podcast, and I would miss it if, I, if it were gone. Glad that it's back. It's not like I'm listening to get a philosophical answer, so don't feel too pressured to say something deep. Even if you are repeating yourself, I also easily forget what you've said in earlier podcasts, so it doesn't bother me. I'm more into your otaku-oriented rants and reactions, so I guess what puts me off from trying TF2 is TF2's art style. I know it's superficial, but TF2 is not cute enough. You're not alone. Osaka Syndrome also famously hates TF2's art style and refuses to play it because of that. Uh, a lot of people feel this way, which is strange to me because most TF2 fans, including myself, um, you know, think that the art style is one of the best things about the game. And if not for any reason other than it's extremely readable, it makes the gameplay really good. Um, and it's it's just quite unique and stands out. You know, you can I probably couldn't tell the difference between a, a Valorant screenshot and an Overwatch screenshot and you know whatever. But you see a TF2 screenshot, it's instantly recognized. It's got a. But I also understand if you don't like it. Like that, it can it kind of makes sense to me. Like it is it is pretty. There's definitely a, <clears throat> I guess this is probably why most games don't have such intensive stylization like that, is because once you st start to have a, a stylistic voice that's so strong like TF2 does, you know, you, you, you're going to alienate some people. So, you know. I think you're just quoting the post I made on Dinfajin. I Because I said that exact thing on Dinfajin. I'm pretty sure. I wasn't doing it on purpose, but <laughs> there you go. I, maybe we're just... You ever thought about maybe we're both just thinking along the same lines? Maybe. I'm just like... I mean, like, that post like a month ago where I just I said see. that. I don't remember seeing that, but... I see. Maybe I, maybe I, maybe it subconsciously, subliminally influenced me. I know it's superficial, but TF2 is not cute enough. I mean, you should see my pyro cosmetics, man. 
Also, I'm not into multiplayer games because of the social aspect. That's completely fair. Like, one of the best things about TF2 is the social aspect. I mean, not necessarily the chat, which is, you know, let's just say it's hit or miss. It has a high signal to noise ratio in a bad way. Um, a high noise to signal ratio, I should say. Uh, but, you know, the, the aspects of being friendly with other players and group taunts and civilian posting and mic spamming and, you know, whatever. But, I, yeah, I completely get that. If you're not into multiplayer games, of course you're not going to be into TF2. That makes perfect sense. Having said that, being into one game like you are is probably truer to being an otaku than it is to just watch a lot of anime in English and give opinions about it. I think that's probably true, but that one game being TF2, you know, maybe if it was an MMO or something, it would be, it would be, but I guess, yeah, I don't know. I'm not, I think you're probably right about that to some extent, but yeah, I mean, I don't really have that much to say. Did the right thing by creating a new TF2 channel. The new channel will get more views too, since it's only about TF2 from the beginning. Uh, I mean, yeah, I hope so. Views are nice. I'm not really into propaganda. I see the number. If it's big, I get happy. <clears throat> I can relate to you about putting my opinions online and then later regretting that I did. However, I can also relate to some of your life. And I guess what I want to say is that having seen your face and flat has actually been reassuring, has ma made you feel real and not like some kind of opportunistic grifting LARPA. Well, I'm glad that I can offer a sense of... Uh, authenticity in this age of fakery. I don't find your appearance of, or your flat to be disgusting or even ugly, really. Well, then you may want to get your eyes checked out. You're tall, so if you set up a home gym and get a bit fit, you'd do more than fine physically if you care about that sort of thing. Yeah, I probably am not going to do that, but you're also probably right. I think if I worked out, I have like... No, I'm first, I'm tall and I have like naturally broad shoulders. I, I kind of have like rugby player physique. Um, so I, you know, if I had been really into sports or exercise from a young age, I probably would be, I probably would be a bit of an EK man, you know. But I'm much more into playing Team Fortress Two than <laughs> doing any of that. So whatever, it doesn't bother me that much. I, it's it's not necessarily that I'm like self-conscious about the way that I look. I would say I'm more self-conscious about my flat being messy, in part just because every time I've given, like shown in videos, you know, I have tissues everywhere. I, but I also, I have t like, I don't really understand how, it seems like my tissue problem is unique, you know? Like it seems like most people, they don't have, they don't use as many tissues as I do. I don't know why, but my nose, it's been like this ever since I was a kid. Like I just have a, a runny nose, you know? Like all the time, not literally all the time, but very frequently. So I just use a lot of tissues, and I, I feel like it looks kind of gross. But me, yeah, it's, I always get comments about it, and that made me. I didn't used to be self-conscious. I used to be like, yeah, you know, I'm an, I'm supposed to be exemplifying the degenerate, neat lifestyle. But after I kept getting comments about it for years, I started to grow more self-conscious about it. Um, I don't really know though, and I I have mixed opinions. As for your flat, you own, as far as I'm aware, a flat in London, so that's already a blessing. I know you hate landlords, but if you can move in permanently with Dotsmite, your South South Dotsmite, and then you could rent your flat in London, maybe split that 50-50 with Dots, I don't know. Pfft, no, that's explaining 100% with me. <laughs> then you wouldn't have to worry about your flat. I would never sell your flat, though, if I were you. Yeah, we've thought about this. This is this is like a very likely direction that my life is going to go in. It seems like the obvious thing to do. Um, rather than philosophical questions, one of the mysteries of this world that I've been pondering for years is how you can afford to be a neat with your own home, enough money to even buy plane tickets. I've been un unable to find an answer to that mystery despite watching a lot of videos. Well, I could tell you um, I don't really have any strong reason that I haven't explained that thing before. But for some reason, it just feels weird to talk about. Like, I just kind of want to keep it private. I don't know why. There's just something about it that just makes me feel like... It's a very boring answer. 
<laughs> like it's, it's it's not special or interesting in any way but for some reason it just seems like invasive not that i'm accusing you of, of asking an invasive question because i share basically everything else about my life i don't know why i feel the need to keep that private but i just want to um also oh yeah i mean if you think about what it could possibly be it's probably that also, what was that edgy opinion you withheld at the end of the cast? I honestly don't even remember. I hate when you do that, lol. Well, hate may be too strong a word, but it's kind of annoying being teased like that. Just don't mention it at all if you're not going to say it. Well, I was going to say it, and then I stopped myself, but I don't remember what it was. It was probably something racist. <laughs> I actually like your format more than Osaka's and John's, because your format is more fluid and natural. Yeah, fuck that guy, man. Fuck Osaka Syndrome. Whereas Osaka's feel like he has to pause himself to talk about the same topic throughout the video, just to stay on topic. And so it feels like his videos are too long for the point he's trying to make. Osaka is great too, especially on live streams. I'd like to hear him talk more about anime too. I'm just saying that I prefer your videos to his. Well, thank you. We're not in competition though, but we might be. Maybe I should start a beef with Osaka Syndrome. Maybe I should start calling out Osaka Syndrome. I, you know... Can I, let me reveal on this podcast, there's a video that you guys will never see. I actually did once make, in earnest, a call-out video of Osaka. Osaka made this video that was called, I don't even fucking remember what it was called. It was a garbage video. It's just the worst video Osaka's ever made. It was called, like, Surveillance State is a Good Thing, actually, or some bullshit like that. And it was about how, like, he he just read this, like, fear-mongering bullshit journalism article about... A discord a satanic cult and it, i don't know why but for, so he'd just fallen for this like fox news tier like the kids are going on discord and joining satanic cults propaganda like i don't know i don't know how i thought he was smart like it's an insane thing to like take the bait of and then he just sort of ranted for ages about how like you shouldn't be allowed to use the internet if you're under a certain age and there should be limits on like free speech and most importantly Everyone on the internet should be tracked constantly and have, like, an ID card. And his arguments were just completely nonsensical. Like, he said stuff like, I don't care if they try to track me, because you can just use Tor anyway to circumvent it. Okay, so what the fuck is the point of trying to get them to track you, then, if you're saying you can just suck... Like, the half the, the video was so full, it was, like, the initial premise was so dumb, and then the whole video was full of so many weird, like, logical fallacies that... I just, all in service of, you know, I feel passionately about digital rights. So it was all in service of a message that I strongly disagreed with, to the point where I wrote an entire scripted response video, and edited, wrote, recorded, and edited an entire, like, 20 minute long teardown of this video, where I went, like, point by point, and pointed out, like, every logical flaw in Osaka's argument, and, and, and everything. Um... And it took me a whole day. I spent the whole day fucking doing it. And meanwhile, like, at the time, I wasn't the only one that hated this video. Everyone fucking hated this video because it was a terrible video. So the point, and Osaka got so many, like, hate comments about it that he then made, like, a follow-up video where he was like, oh, it was just my opinion. Like, I could say anything I want because it's my channel. Like, you shouldn't take me seriously. It was so awkward. And But, like, I felt kind of bad because clearly he was getting a lot of hate. And then he, like we were talking and i was just like i really did i told him like this video is really bad blah 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 and he was just like hit, getting very defensive i probably shouldn't leak too much this maybe let's not get too into our private dms he was being he wasn't i don't want to make osaka out to sound like an asshole here i think he was just having a bit of a a, a moment of you know we all have we we're real we're flawed human beings. He wasn't. He would. He didn't respond inappropriately or anything. He was. He was chill about the whole thing in general. Um, but I ended up just sending him the video and just keeping it on this on my channel. And then he was like, "Yeah, those are good points." And that was pretty much it. Like, but I I, I spent a long ass time making that fucking <laughs> response video, and like researching sources for my arguments. Trying to find the original source for Osaka's argument as well was really hard. I, I, I don't even know if I could find the like original article he was talking about. Um, to like fact check it. Um, and I found a few things that might have been it, but I, could, I, I, I still don't know if I got the one that he was actually talking about. But anyway, obviously it all ended well, but 
yeah, that's the most effort I've ever put into a video that you guys will never see. Because it's just kind of cringe. Like, I don't actually want to call out Osaka. We're, we're good friends. He just made a video with a bad argument after having seen something that made him very emotional. Like, that seems pretty understandable to me. But anyway, I'm starting a new beef with Osaka. Fuck that guy. Fuck Osaka Syndrome. This, this guy, he's, first of all, this guy, all he does is smoke weed and have sex with his girlfriend and brag about it. That's all he does. He used to be cool. He used to be cool, but now all he does is smoke weed and have sex with his girlfriend on camera for money. He's living in Justin Trudeau's fucking world. Okay. This guy, he's insane. First of all, I miss the old Osaka. Osaka these days, all he does is brag about his GF. Vaxxed, maybe? I don't know. Vaxxed? I'm just putting it out there. While smoking weed. I feel like Osaka has like left us involuntary celibate fans to brag about his GF. And I miss when he used to make video like, why you don't need sex. Now all you do is degenerate marijuana smoking satanic rituals with your Vax GF in Justin Trudeau Land of Dreams. So we're starting a beef with Osaka Syndrome. Osaka, I'm calling you out. You're having too much weed. You're too satanic, too much degenerate Satan. You're a Satan worshipper. And, on top of it, you're gay. So, let's just put that out there. Um... And your mama fat. <laughs> um, so we're beefing now. Me and Osaka are beefing. If you want to respond to this, Osaka, we're beefing now. Okay. Let's keep reading this comment. Um, <clears throat> where were we? I would also... Osaka doesn't really watch anime that much anymore, so I don't think you're going to get him to talk about anime. Uh, okay, I'm just rambling now. Don't worry about it. Feel free to use this website as your personal diary. But I was kind of sad when I heard that you were feeling low. Since you're in a somewhat similar position to me, I want to be able to see you being well so that I can hope I can be happy too. Anyways, from your perspective, I'm just text on the screen. So don't let some text on the screen make you feel bad, make you feel down or doubt yourself. Look, some of the some of the most important moments of my life has happened through sex through sex on the screen. <laughs> text. Text on a screen. Text. Very different word. Very different connotations there. Some, I, there's nothing... Look, if you aren't placing utmost importance on anonymous internet posters, <laughs> then you're not doing it right. Okay, finally, if you're out of ideas for the Slice of Life podcast, I'd like to see you talk about light novel series volume by volume. For example, I really liked your Horizon in the Middle of Nowhere anime video. I'd like to see you go more in depth into that, or maybe No Game No Life, since that was a light novel series that was meaningful to you. Digi was your inspiration, so maybe you could also write a light novel and record an audiobook like they did. Maybe even sell the actual book on Amazon. I'd buy it. Uh, I would not enjoy doing that. I I'm not. I don't enjoy writing fiction. I'm very bad at writing fiction. I I'm the thing I'm bad at is. The, actually, I was gonna, I was gonna say a particular aspect, but now that I think about it, the thing I'm bad at is all of it. <laughs> like I'm just bad at writing fiction. I don't really read that much fiction outside of visual novels. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't really have ideas. Most importantly, I'm not fucking did. Like I can't just bang out an entire light novel in a day like Digi can. I don't type that fast. I mean, to be fair, half of Digi's book is just this book, this book, this book, for like two chapters. But, so that's kind of cheating. Anyway, no, I'm not going to write a light novel. Uh, that wouldn't be fun for me. But I could probably talk about light novels. I might, I might have to give the No Game No Life light novels another chance. To be fair, you tried to make the Horizon fucking light novel video. I did? Yeah. Oh yeah, I did. Like three years back. I remember that. Yeah. Yeah, I was I was reading <coughs> Horizon and taking like detailed notes for a, a future video, but I, I, I just got bored of the books to be honest with you. I got like halfway through the second book, or I don't know, no, no, I that's not true. I got pretty far. I got past the end of the anime, I think. Actually, 
I don't know. I was I remember reading stuff that isn't in the show, but it might have just been stuff that got left out of the show. It might have it might not have been past the end of the anime actually. I don't know. No, I don't think I did get past the end of the anime. Maybe I did. I don't. This was like three years ago. I don't really remember. Uh, I think I finished the first volume. I'm pretty sure I finished the first volume, at least. I don't know how much further I got beyond that though. But yeah, I was taking like detailed notes. I was planning to do a lecture on Horizon in the Middle of Nowhere lore. I still remember most of the lore of the series, but yeah, the thing is, I don't know. I don't know. Like, I'm kind of, uh, how do I put it? it it's it's a very, there's a lot of characters. It's, a, it's kind of hard to keep track of. Like, it's, it's a very complex story with a lot of moving parts. And uh, some of the translation of the light novels is uh, not particularly great, which makes it even harder to follow. So, <clears throat> I don't know. I'll, I might. I mean, I still have the PDFs, so I might. I might try and get around to it at some point. But don't get your hopes up. Okay, I'm not that much of a light novel guy to begin with. Uh, but you are right in the sense that I, 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 I enjoy making, even though I feel like no one watches it whenever I make anime-related videos. But also, a lot of people like the anime-related videos, or, like, otaku-related videos. Um, but yeah, I should probably make more of that, because I enjoy making it, and I enjoy it, yeah, and, and people seem to enjoy it, so... Even though it might not necessarily be about light novels, but, yeah. I feel like there's only, there's, there's like, one visual novel YouTuber, she's called Amelie, there's, there's a few, right, but there's one serious one. Like, most of the visual novel YouTubers are just covering, like, new releases and, and news and, like, quick and dirty review type stuff. But there's one, the, the person who does, like, detailed hour-long video essays about visual novels. But they're all the good visual novels, right? Like, she's talking about, you know, all the, <laughs> all the good stuff. Uh, you may be Kusuri, Ghost Screaming Show. Uh, I think she did a video on Cross Channel, if I remember correctly. I think that's how I found her. Um, she did one on Fushigi Densha, which is really cool, um, but I've, you know, I, ain't no one making no YouTube videos about fucking Usersoft bullshit, although I'm very disappointed, cause, cause I, I was, I was, I literally read, I picked up Riddle Joker, because I was like, oh, Usersoft game with a little sister root? That's an easy, like, you don't have to say anything more than that, Usersoft game with a, with, a, with an Emoto root? That's a that's an instant classic to me. I I'm I'm like I got like halfway through or maybe a little further through the Emoto route. I mean I played through other routes first, but then I I started reading the the. I was very disappointed. I was it was it was very weak, very weak route. Like it had some cool stuff, like uh, Emoto uh, masturbating to her little brother secretly. That's cool. That's cool. Peak right. You gotta love that shit. But the actual story content besides the the h scenes it was pretty cringe uh, not cringe it was just like boring mostly like it was a lot of focused spoiler alert it's not not that much of a spoiler but uh it was mostly focused on like the the premise of of riddle joker is that the two main characters like the, the the main guy and his sister were both like secret in part of a secret non-government agency for kids with superpowers who do like secret spy missions and shit and they're sent to the school to investigate shit that's going on right um <clears throat> and so because they're both in this thing like most of the content of the route is just them doing various missions but they're not very exciting like they generally just go as planned <laughs> you know like them and nothing really interesting happens and they're not they're not like there's not really that much intrigue or and there's also just not that much like slice of life or sort of comedy chill moments like it's a lot of just n nothing in a in a bad way like it's a lot of uh the same types of stereotypical scenes happening repetitively and then they go on a mission and it's kind of all the same shit i don't know i'm i was just very disappointed with with that route uh which kind of made me just stop reading the 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 visual novel, even though I had enjoyed the previous roots route that I'd read. Uh, 
So I don't know what I don't know if, what the fucking next. I don't know if I'm gonna finish Riddle Joker because that was pretty disappointing. I mean, it's not terrible. Like I wouldn't be I wouldn't it wouldn't be painful to keep reading. I definitely could finish that finish Riddle Joker. Like it's fine. Um, but then I have so many different options of games I could play next or visual novels I could read next. Like that I I I I kind of want to go back and read the classics. I like I I really want to read the Capo. I want to read Shuffle, you know, I want to finish Canon. Um, but then there's also, like, I I kind of don't feel like I'm, I want to jump into another, like, 40, 50 hour long visual novel right now. Like, I kind of want to read a shorter one. In which case, the best option for me would probably be <coughs> Koini Kanmi or Sora Tattoo, which I've also been putting off for a long time, and I really want to read that. And then there was another one which I forgot the name of that I wanted to read that was shorter as well. And then there's also like stuff that I want to give a second chance. Like I kind of want to give my tattoo a second chance because um, I dropped that because the storyline was bad. But maybe maybe I was bad. Like maybe <clears throat> like I remember there being a lot of like the the bit in bits in my tattoo that kind of put me off. There was there was sort of like what I was considering to be forced dramatic scenes that the plot was acting as if they had a lot of tension but like I wasn't really feeling the tension at all but maybe I just need to try harder and that might sound like Stockholm Syndrome but it's a real thing you got to give yourself over to a work sometimes and then you know not to mention there's a whole bunch of slightly or slightly more modern visual novels that I want to read like um uh fucking I'm forgetting what it's called Iroseka Iroseka that's a that's definitely something I want to read that's supposed to be like a masterpiece it looks great um Iroseka so like yeah it's just crazy there's too much fucking shit to read and it would take so long <laughs> and I just haven't gone around to any of it and now I don't really have any way I I couldn't bring my think I, I, I wanted to bring my thinkpad here to Estonia to read visual novels um, but it wouldn't fit in my bag. I ran out of space, too many clothes. Uh, so I don't know what to do about that now. But hey, what can you do? To finish off this comment, forgive the ESL tier comprehensibility. English is not my first language. Peace. I think it was perfectly comprehensible. You don't need to worry about You don't need to worry about that. Right, there we are. Um, DanPachan.org is a website where you can go to and ship posts. People on Denver Chan uh, were asking if I, well, they were just sort of talking about Endless Jess in general and vaguely asking if I knew about Endless Jess. So I guess Denver Chan is basically like my comment section now because uh, normally these videos include responding to comments. I should do that. There's probably comments on the, on the feed. No, there's not because the last episode was exclusively posted on my website. So there's not going to be comments. Okay, well, Denver Chan is my comment section now. Well, no, that I was, you know what I'm trying to talk about here, okay? The the episode prior to the season two, episode one, the the season finale of season one was posted exclusively to no thank you and not on YouTube. <clears throat> People are asking about endless Jess, so I thought I'd give my take on endless Jess, which because I don't really talk about endless Jess very much, and I never really have, because. So just to be clear, like I've I've watched the entire Horseshoe Saga. I watched it all in one day. Oh, that's a uh, that's my alarm going off. Don't worry about that. I watched the Horseshoe Saga. I watched it all in one day. It's about twelve hours of video. So it was a big day where I just sat down and watched all of the Horseshoe Saga. And then when I finished it, I was like, well, that was the best thing I've ever seen in my life. And then I immediately stopped caring about it. <laughs> like. I don't know what it is, but while the Horseshoe Saga was good, it was also kind of, like, there was something about Jesse's content that just never really, like, clicked with me in the same way. Like, I think a lot of his videos are really good. I, I do. I think a lot of his uh, comedy-focused stuff is very funny. Um, and I, you know, he was the only one member of the PCP that was, like, genuinely funny. He had the best comedic chops, for sure. Um, and I think when he tried to, do, to be clever with it, you know, there were times he tried to be clever with it, and I think sometimes it worked. I think sometimes it worked, and I think sometimes it was like, okay, you're trying to be clever with it. I see what you're doing. And I think the reason for this is a lot of Jesse's style was very influenced by, at least it seems to me, 
that is very influenced by wrestling. And frankly, I just don't give a fuck about wrestling. You know, wrestling appeals to the type of guy that's like really into Gurren Lagann. You know that type of guy? You know the type of guy that's really weirdly into Gurren Lagann? Like they, 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 they suddenly turn into like something about hot blooded masculinity and passion, whatever. And look, a Gurren Lagann's a good show, but I'm not one of those guys that's really into Gurren Lagann. And for the same reason, I'm just not like that into wrestling and that style of storytelling. I don't really care. When the guy jumps off the top rope, it's like, well, good, good job, I guess. I don't really care. It's, but I'll give it this, okay, I, I would rather watch a WWE than UFC. Probably. It's more interesting. Choreographed fights are obviously just going to be more entertaining than real fights. Uh, at least in my opinion. But I don't really care about people fighting each other anyway. I'd rather watch them fight in Quake. That's more interesting to me. That, that's actually the peak of, of human activity. Watching like Quake Live. Watching two human beings go at it in Quake Live. That is, to me, the peak of human combat. Does this make sense? No, it doesn't make sense to anyone who isn't me. But it makes perfect sense to me. It's like, people think, oh, bro, MMA, UFC, bullshit. It's like the purest thing, right? Because there's, there's less rules and it's just two guys punching and kicking and wrestling and and Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu won at the end of the day. So everyone has to do BJJ now. It's forgetting the fact that, like, no, actually, UFC obviously does have a shitload of rules. There are a whole bunch of rules, and they're completely arbitrary. Um, and, like, one of the rules being you have to punch each other in the face with your hands, like some sort of, you know, fucking cave society. I don't know. I don't know how to explain this to you. But human beings, we make tools, we make technology. There's nothing purer about not using any of that stuff. If anything, it's, it's more contrived. A pure human activity is to not pretend that you, you haven't invented a, a game, right? Like Quake, Quake is a game. Everyone who plays Quake, no, no one's pretending that Quake is like natural human instincts. And yet, it is. It's, the, it's actually the purest form of combat. I think that all international conflicts should be solved through arena shooter 1v1s. That's what I think. I think that, you know, Putin and Zelensky should nominate champions to hop on Quake Live. Or Quake champions, for that matter. And, uh, you know, 1v1. They should just they should just have like a best of five or something and go at it. And then whoever wins gets the Donbass. <laughs> That's how I think it should work. I think international conflict should work that way. It would save a lot of bloodshed. It's better. And I think all conflict should work that way. Video games are just more interesting because human beings, the way they move is very boring to me. Like 99% of the stuff pe people are capable of doing is extremely boring. Even in wacky wrestling fights... It's like, okay, I mean, it's a nice dance. Like, I, I, I appreciate the aesthetics of this dance, but it's not as cool as rocket jumping. Nothing else is, <laughs> you know? Nothing else is as cool. You know that moment in a quake fight where they both pull out the lightning gun and it's just pure, like, who has better footsies and better, better tracking? Like, that, to me, that is the peak of human... That is, that is the most entertaining thing you can watch. That that is the that I don't know how to that's just the peak of humanity. It just doesn't get better than that. It just simply doesn't. Air shots doesn't get better than air shots with a with a goddamn rocket launcher like God intended. Okay, it just doesn't. I'm just telling you, man. That's what it should all be. Sorry, I, this isn't about endless chess anymore. I'm just a, I'm just I can't play Quake. Okay, I suck at it. I I get there's too many weapons. If Quake had three weapons instead of like nine, you know, <laughs> I would be I would love it. But, but there's too many weapons, and I, I, I can't, I don't understand how you juggle, like, pressing all these buttons on your keyboard. Like, I just can't do it. It's like, how, how am I pressing, you know, switching to weapon six without looking down at my, like, that's a, that's a weird key to hit, you know. I guess people probably have all sorts of binds that they have set up, but I've never found anything that works for me. I don't know, there must be some way to go about it where it works, but I've never been able to, to run arena shooters, that sort of 
quickly changing weapons and, and comboing weapons like that with with so many... I don't know, man. I don't know. I'll figure it out one day. Someone tell me how to do that. Uh, right, Bandless Jess. You know, I liked the, I liked the Horseshoe Saga. I thought it was, was had some funny moments. But, but also, this is another thing. I also just don't really care about MLP. Like, the Horseshoe Saga, as far as I'm concerned, is better than MLP. I think MLP is one of those things that there's no reason to... Like, if you, if you go back and ignore the community that's spawned around it, you know, it, like, doesn't stand on its own, right? Like, it was worth, like, it was a particular moment, right? That's the, the thing about MLP is it, it, like, all of that, the bony stuff was good because it was a particular moment. Because it had this particular fandom that was, like, so creative and passionate about the show. To the point where, like, the actual show itself barely fucking matters. You know, it was about the character designs, it was about the the art and the music and all of this. All of this other stuff. The show itself, who fucking cares about the show? Right? Like, even Horseshoe, Horseshoe, Horseshoe Saga? Halfway through, it gives up on pretending it was ever about the show. Right? That is a... That, that is, you know. But So if you go and actually try and watch MLP, you'll quickly find that it's not that good. Which I have done. People say, oh, it's just like a slice of life anime. It's really not. It's a show made for little babies, and it, you know, you watch it, and you're like, oh yeah, this is a show made for little babies. And that's fine. I'm not, com- I'm not complaining about that. There's nothing wrong with shows made for babies. Babies need shows. I've watched a bit of Bluey. Bluey's pretty fun. I wouldn't necessarily become involved in the Bluey fandom in a big way, you know? <laughs> but I, I can appreciate Bluey. Uh, as the same with MLP. I've watched a bit of Steven Universe. I'm like, yeah, Steven Universe, that's a, that's a show made for babies. Like, yeah, well, I'm sure babies like this. There's nothing wrong with that. We all were babies at one point. Uh, Adventure Time, I'm like, yeah, I can see why people who smoke a lot of weed would like watching shows made for babies. Because that's what smoking a lot of weed does to you, you know? Like, yeah, that, that all makes sense to me. I've smoked weed and watched Adventure Time. It was great, <laughs> you know? But like being, there's no reason to get really into a show like that without a fandom surrounding it. So yeah, that's basically where I'm at. Jesse, if you actually look at his tastes and stuff, beyond MLP, it's like the most giga normie stuff ever. Like he's, he's like one of those guys who's really like into Quentin Tarantino, but has never seen a film that's influenced Tarantino. You know, he's like one of those type of people. He's big into Gurren Lagann, big into, you know, video games, but, but not like interesting ones, you know, he's, he's just, he, he seems to have like a bit of spite, right, where he was into the big AAA single player releases in like the PS2 era and the PS1 era, where being big into video games was still kind of stigmatized by society, and now video games are like, you know, not that they're a multi-billion dollar industry bigger than film and he still wants to play the popular triple a releases because that's the type of video game he likes but he's mad because he's now like not in a special secret club but he doesn't actually like like interesting indie games and weird shit so he's i don't know he's just kind of molding about it and then he literally dropped off the face of the internet to become a giga normie so like you can't even say that i'm wrong and just molding because he, he has different tastes than me like that's literally what he did uh so i was right the whole time so that's my opinions on Endless Jess, is uh, we should have, we should solve international conflicts through Quake. I know I kind of only talked about the Horseshoe Saga just then, but that's because it's the only Jesse thing that I even can pretend to give a fuck about. Like, all the other stuff, even stuff that Digi used to really like, like the, the Dark Souls playthroughs, like, it was just bad. <laughs> I only know, like, most of it wasn't very notable to me, even though I watched quite a lot of it. It was just, like... Yeah, I don't know. I didn't. I never really got it. I never really saw anything particularly special or interesting about it. Uh, yeah, so that's why. I, like, I only mention the Horseshoe Saga because it's the big, mo- is the biggest thing Jesse ever made. Yeah, I don't know. There's this guy called Mark Rebele. Mark Rebele, um, and he's one of these. You've probably seen him. He's pretty well known on the internet. He's mm-hmm. one of these. Uh, live looping improvisational guys now as far as live looping improvisational guys go he's not one of the best he's pretty subpar actually 
the peak of live looping improvisational guys is a guy by the name of Beardy Man. Beardy Man is the best live looping improvisational guy. He's the only one who's actually good at it. <laughs> like, to the degree where he makes music I would actually listen to. Like, right? Like, he, he, and he can do that because, first of all, his, his live looping setup is based around beatboxing. And that just gives you a lot of options in terms of sounds that you can make with your mouth. So that's the first thing. Secondly, he's a good singer. He's a talented singer. So when he sings, it sounds good. <laughs> and he's quite versatile as well. His voice is quite versatile, so he can do a lot of different styles. Uh, so he's a good beatboxer, he's a good singer. But then, third thing, he actually has good taste in music. This is the number one thing that, that, uh, that singles him out among these guys, is that Beardy Man is an old school raver. He's clearly been to a lot of raves and was a big, big into the UK rave scene back in the day, an electronic scene. And so he knows his music and he knows the type of music he wants to make. He has good taste. He knows how to actually, you know, play electronic sounding music for a crowd. And what sort of, he's been to, a, clearly been to a lot of shows. So when he's playing shows, he knows what sounds good. He knows what, you know, he's good at it. And then finally, perhaps most importantly, he has the best tech. He has built his own insane custom rig called the Beardytron 9000. Now, to be clear, he was doing this before that. I saw him live before he had the Beardytron. He just had live looping pedals and some chaos pads, which are like effects units. Um, but now he has this crazy setup which I don't understand, but it's something, it's Ableton or something, <laughs> but like, it's like 50 iPads with custom UIs. It's insane the stuff he can do with his voice and he's got a keyboard and drum pads. Like, it's just nuts. The setup is completely custom, software completely custom. It's insane. And it just lets him do insane sound design in real time. It's like, really a technical marvel, this thing. Um, and so Beardy Man makes the best live looping improvisation music. But there are other people who do similar things. And Mark Rabelais is quite popular. But the problem with Mark Rabelais is that his music's not very good. He's, he does a lot of focus on, on lyrics, but he doesn't seem to have improved at freestyling lyrics in the past like four years. He's still really bad at it. He doesn't seem to have put much effort into improving. Now, it's not that he's terrible. He's got some good blues licks in his hands, right? He can play a good, a good blues lick, and I appreciate that. I approve of some good blues licks. Um, but he doesn't really have much technical skill when it comes to sound design. He's using main stage, which is much more limited for live audio than... Um, than Ableton is, uh, and he's using default main stage plugins and uh, and instruments for all of his stuff. I know this because I've used main stage quite a bit in the past, and yeah, he's using all default stock main stage sounds, which means you know everything comes out sounding a bit generic. Um, his his ideas for melodies and stuff aren't particularly original, and mostly his lyrics suck. He's not, you know, but all that being said, there's something very important, which you can't capture through pure, purely talking about technical skill like this, which is that when you watch him performing to a crowd on a street corner or whatever, it's hype. He brings a lot of energy to the performance. He's a, he, although he's not a talented singer or good at improvising, really, he is a good performer. He really gets the energy going in a crowd. Like, he has a very infectious energy. And you can't help but watch him do a performance and think, like, look, the music's not great. His lyrics aren't very good. You know, I don't feel good singing along to him saying, talking about manifesting and, and all of this garbage, right? Like, oh, he says, he says the fuck word a lot. Isn't that funny? But at the same time, like, yeah, if I was there, 
I would fucking smile and, and dance and have a good time. Because why be a cynical, you know, downer, Debbie Downer, when everyone's just playing a bit of music and having a good time? It doesn't really matter if the music's great. It's a beat to dance to. It's upbeat. It's fun. We're all having a good time, whatever. So that's, that's Mark Rabelais. Weird guy. Um, he, uh, he performed at, at Google. This was a weird thing that happened that I, I saw a lot of people being very confused about tech, tech people who didn't, who don't know who this is or whatever, but there was a, when Google released that they did a press conference for some AI bullshit, right? Um, that like in the intro, it was him on stage at Google. So you've got this like corpo tech company stage design with just Mark Rebelay telling everyone to wake the fuck up, uh, you know, in the middle of it, which is a bit strange. It like, it's, it struck me mostly as like, oh, I've kind of lost respect to, a little bit for this guy, but also kind of not, I don't know. Though it's weird for him to perform at Google. It's weird for him to do that. He got to get the bag, you would imagine, right? Like, Bro's chasing a bag, but Bro's not struggling for a bag, right? This guy, he's clearly doing fine. He's even, you know, he, he's been on tour. I know tours don't make that much money uh, for a full band or whatever, but he's just a solo performer. He doesn't have a backing band. You know, he clearly, his, his setup is very simple. He doesn't have to spend, you know, he doesn't have a lot of the expenses that a regular touring band would have, and he's not splitting the payout between a whole bunch of members. So he's probably one of the few people who's making decent money just off touring. Um, but then on top of that, he has a very successful YouTube channel. Like even if it was just his YouTube and Twitch, he would be making plenty of money, you know, aside from him playing gigs. So the guy is clearly not, you know, strapped for cash. Mark Rebelais is clearly making plenty of money, which makes me think Google paid him a lot of money, which is kind of strange, right? But then, at the same time, I'm trying to understand, I think Mark Rebelais is one of these examples of average American voter. Like, this is the average voter, where he's got this weird mixture of, like, self-help airport book um, philosophy, right? You know what I mean? Like he's got you know you know the type of thing I'm talking about the manifest he the, the, he talks about manifesting too much to not have this ideology, like he's definitely one of these guys that believes that sort of thing, but then at the same time he's also got vaguely lib sympathies, and I think this is like average American voter is is Mark is one of these examples was like just a just a weird muddled politics of like yeah uh you gotta you gotta chase a bag you gotta get rich and successful because they're trying to keep you down so you gotta uh, make it out of the hood and get rich and build a business and manifest and start a business and get the hard work hard protestant work ethic but at the same time fuck the cops fuck the billionaires you know whatever uh because there's a video of him where he's literally, like, de-arresting someone, which is a fairly radical act, right? Like, de-arresting is, is when the police try and arrest someone and you, you know, grab the guy out of the police's hands or grab the police to stop them from arresting someone. Like, is, is, is getting hands-on with the feds. That's something you got to respect. you got to respect someone who's doing something like that. Um, and then using his platform to talk about it, right? You gotta respect that. But I don't know. Basically, I'm just sitting here confused about Mark Rebelais and where he's coming from, because he's on the one hand, some of the time he talks about fuck your boss, sleep in, you know, whatever, and then sometimes he's like start a business, <laughs> you know. He's just got this weird muddled situation going on, and it's all in the background of very upbeat music about vaguely nothing and performing at Google, but then also fuck the NYPD. I don't know. I'm just confused about it all, okay? I'm just very confused about it all. 
and that's all I wanted to talk. I just had to get it, get it out. I don't have the answers. I don't have all the answers. I just wanted to, I just wanted to talk about how I'm confused about Mark Rebelle's uh, existence. I'm watching Onepixel, watching Onepixel react to uh, Vital CS:GO, CS:GO Rewind. Um, I don't know which one this is. I can't even. I think this is 2021 and 2022 CS:GO Rewind, which for some reason only just got released. I guess it took them a long time to get around to it. But it's making me nostalgic because that was when I this was the this was the end of my counter strip. This was I think okay, this might sound crazy, but to me this was kind of the peak. I don't know if this was the peak. I was just playing a lot. <laughs> because at this time I was really into playing Wingman. I'm the only but I played the most Wingman out of anyone I know. I played so much Wingman in Counter Strike, which if you don't know, Wingman is two V twos. I fucking loved Wingman. It's so it was so addictive. Like playing comp, you'd play, right? And you spend half the game dead watching a YouTube video on the other screen because rounds take a long time. You know? And then it takes so long to play a full cuz back then it was first 16, right? It takes so long to play a full game of Counter-Strike and then it fucking sucks the whole time. And then you finish, you get out, and you're like, oh, we lost. After all that, I was trying so hard, and we lost. Wingman, it was like, no one ever cared, right? Like, no one, if if people got mad at you for, like, throwing, which wouldn't normally happen in Wingman, like, it was just much better, right? Because no one took Wingman anywhere near as seriously, right? Because it's a Wingman. No one took it as seriously as the main game, so you could do, like, there was a while where I just played Deagle only on Wingman, and I was kind of good at it. Like, I don't know what it was. I, I think I told this story before. I was playing Wingman on the map Hive. And I ran into an, the, the other guy on my team was playing Deagle only. And he was talking. I, I don't remember. I feel like, if I remember correctly, he was German. But he was, we were talking, like, in voice chat. And he was really good with the Deagle. And I was like, how do you do it? And I, I don't remember what he told me. But just him speaking to him while doing it and, like, watching the way he played, his particular like crosshair placement and stuff, it just made me think that looks really fun. And so then I started playing Deagle only after that for like a week. And I was pretty good at it for a while. And then I, then I got bad and so I stopped. But uh, it was around that time I was playing so much Wingman. Wingman was a great game mode because it's so much more fast paced as well. So it's like even you get, you get done with the game, it takes like half the time of a regular Counter-Strike game. You get done, you just insta re you're back in it. It was a great time. I love Wingman. Um, you know, the only problem with Wingman is nuke. Like, the the nuke Wingman map is B bomb site when I really think it should be A bomb site. Uh, that's always annoyed me. Like A is just so much more interesting than B on nuke. I I don't know why B is the fucking Wingman nuke. I mean it's okay. There's strat. The thing is the the strat for playing CT Wingman nuke. I just sort of figured it out at some point is that you just like abuse util like in fact util is on ct in wingman is like kind of op and once you figure that out the game like it kind of like that's the once you get like to a slightly higher ranks in wingman you just kind of get fucked by ct util like you can just get completely shut out of an area by by smokes and mollies and it's it's very annoying to deal with and it's also not even that fun to play like that on ct because you're not even really taking fights you're just throwing mollies you don't have enough money for a good gun, but you still win because you're just throwing mollies everywhere. I don't know. It's annoying, but it, people didn't. It seems like most people didn't really figure it out, so it was fine. But on nuke, people really figured it out. I don't know why. Something something about nuke made people uh, use a lot of util, which is fine. It's in the game. I'm not complaining about it. But sometimes you'd come across a team that. Like, you'd come across a guy who was just really good at CT side util on nuke, and it would just be impossible to play. Anyway, now I'm just rambling. Point is, I'm seeing this video with Onapixel reacting to this video, and they're showing the maps from this, this, this era. And man, it just made me remember about Calavera. This wingman map, Calavera. Bro, that was my favorite fucking map. 
it had so many weird movement spots like it it was so good for movement it had like lots of it had like three or four different skill jumps that you'd get to a spot where no one would expect you to be and you could like rush if you had good b hops and good movement you could rush to a place where T's wouldn't expect you to be at the start of a round it was it was so fun i fucking loved that map i got so i got so good at that map i would just queue calavera only and just fucking roll oh man i missed that i missed that map actually that was that was so good it it was actually kind of weird like if you were trying to play it normally it was kind of weird and like it almost i can understand how you might say it was bad like the site in particular the design of the site was pretty weird but pre-plant on t or ct it doesn't matter it was it was really fun we also had insertion 2 which was a great map that was a really fun map to play on there were some bad maps uh there's always bad maps but uh what else was there pit stop was the other um pit stop was the the other wingman map that i played a decent amount at this it was in the same operation and that was okay it had an interesting drop down which was kind of fun to play around but it just had less it was less open it had less options it was still pretty fun i played it a decent amount but yeah and what else was there uh crete oh yeah this this map crete crete was a really well designed um it was a really well designed wingman map like uh it was a great it was a good size for a wingman map like they they understood the whoever made that like understood the tactics of wingman properly like the fast rotates the i don't know it was just it was good the design of the bomb site was really creative there was like a window you could shoot through um but yeah and you could sort of hide in corners and then like molly people when they're trying defusing it was it was a it was a good map but it was almost too good like it was very like uh so there was a stairs on this map and like they didn't give CTs very good cover for holding stairs on purpose. Like, the, the you have very low cover for holding stairs. All the other entrances, CTs have good cover to hold from. But stairs, CTs don't have good cover to hold from. But, like, for T's to actually push out, they had to walk down a set of stairs that was completely open. So, like, they had cover at the top. And it just made it kind of weird to fight in. It was just a kind of a weird area to fight in, right? Because, like... The CTs were holding at the bottom, but they didn't really have good cover, like, to hold from. It was kind of an awkward angle. But then T's had good cover at the top, so they could take a fight with the CT and win at the top a lot of the time. But if they actually wanted to push... So it just made this weird, like, you have to hold passive-aggressive, or you have to push awkward... I don't know, it was kind of weird, but it was also kind of fun. And then there was a fun little orb window in mid that was that was fun to fight through, and you could throw, throw a nade through it and stuff. It was also a good place to play... Uh, there was a drop down on the other side that you could boost up of and surprise people. That was really fun, um, and it it had a lot, it had a, a lot of close range areas where shotguns were very viable. I played quite a lot of Crete. Yeah, I wouldn't say it was one of my favorite maps, but I did play it quite a lot. Um, and then there was Hive, which was is one of my favorite looking maps in CS:GO because I just like brutalist. Uh, it looks like um, that game. Uh, what's that game called? I don't remember. Fuck. I just had it. What's that game called? Uh, hold on. I'm gonna Google this in real time. It's not this, right? It's developed by Remedy. That's right. Remedy. What's that fucking It begins with an A. An I. It begins with an I, I think. Da -da -da. Alan Wake 2. Control. Is that the one I'm thinking of? That's not doesn't begin with an I, but yeah, control is the one I'm thinking of. It looks like a, it looks like control. That's it's got a really weird. Um, the bomb site has this weird structure in the middle of it. It's like a statue kind of thing, like an abstract statue that looks like a like honeycomb. But that that's really kind of fun to play around. It creates a lot of interesting angles and cover. And then there's uh, there's just it's just good. There's good corridors. I like that map. That was a fun map. Oh, and Black Guy. I forgot about that fucking map. Wow, I completely forgot. That map had a jump on it that I still believe to this day you could have jumped from CT spawn to this weird place. 
So okay, I, I don't. <laughs> this is gonna. This whole segment just makes no sense if you don't know what I'm talking about. But there's this map called Black Eye. It was a, another wingman map, right? And there was an area. So CTs spawned next to like a a river, and their their spawn was like down a set of stairs, and then you would go up the stairs and you'd be on the site, right? But then. Like, one of the three ways to enter the site, there were three ways for T's to get into the site. There was, like, a, there was one lane that was, like, in a little shop. It took you to a corner on the side. In TF2 terms, it would be, like, the flank, right? Uh, and that, that took you to, yeah, that, that had a pretty good angle. It kind of reminded me of something you might see on, like, in, uh, Inferno. And then there was a drop down, which was, like, the most straight ahead, fastest way from T spawn into the site. And then there was another flank where T's would go down onto this like path by the river that was also like down low. And there were fences that you could jump over and like fall into the river and die, right? It had like a map hazard like that. Um, and you could do the same from, T from CT spawn. You could jump over the fence into the river and die. But I be there was a little slanted edge. Like I still believe that it, it must have been possible to jump from CT spawn, climb on the fence, and then like surf on this slanted edge down to the, the the flank by the river, to that area of the map. I tried it so many times and died in three rounds like that. I even loaded up a private server and tried it, and I almost made it so many times, because there was an area where you could jump down on, uh, onto this, these rocks that were down there, and it looked, like you, it looked like it would be like part of the kill plane, but it wasn't. You could stand on these rocks. It was a completely useless spot. But you could stand on them, because um, it was like oh, it was backwards. It wasn't towards. It was like it was completely pointless to stand there. But uh, I still believe that it must have been possible to make this weird long jump to surf and get there. But I could never do it. But that map was pretty fun. I actually liked. I really liked the bombsite on that map. It had. It was very simple, but it was also very effective. I don't know why. I didn't like the drop down. The drop down was su I don't like drop downs in general. The drop down was super awkward to fight around always. Um, there was an interesting boost you could do though. I remember doing that I remember, yeah, there was a super common boost where you could boost like next to the drop down with a and, and it just peek over. That was pretty fun I guess. The drop down was always really awkward to fight around. I, I stopped going. Yeah, it was bad. That, that, that was stupid. But the rest of the map was pretty good. Man, I miss I miss these days. I also remember same operation. There was a a, a comp map, no wingman. That was uh, it was called D Climb, and it was based around a climbing gym. And I still don't know, understand the layout of that map to this day. I it was so fucking confusing. I never had any understanding of what was going on. <laughs> I think I played it like twice. I couldn't figure out the map layout, so I just never played it again. I've never even seen this this iris map. I don't even know what this is. Vineyard. I don't recognize this at all. I do not recognize this map. I think I think he, this guy. Oh, this is a danger zone, maybe. I can't even tell. There was also there was this map. I don't I don't know what the fuck this is. And there was this map Ember. That was a danger zone map. Hold on, there were other maps, man. I kind of miss I miss that's the fucking thing with why did they just get CS2 is so fucking garbage, man. It's so garbage, no maps. It's been out for how long now? No maps. Zero maps. Like what the fuck? Where's my wingman maps? What the fuck? How did Valve fuck up? I, I hate this company so much. I fucking hate this company. <laughs> they fucked up their game. How are they so bad? Okay, I gotta get to the, where's the community maps? I'm on I'm on developer.valvesoftware.com. Has this got every map ever? Former maps. First added. Date first added. That's what we want to sort descending. Um. Okay, wait. Oh, wait, I can... What is this? 
Sort us. I don't even understand. Wingman. Let's go wingman only. Okay. Elision. I don't remember this. Pit stop. Calavera. Ravine. What the fuck was Ravine? It doesn't... Is, it, is this how I click on it? That just brings me to the item. Can I not... Can I not see Ravine? Okay, this is garbage. This is garbageo. But you know what was a good map? And I, I've talked about this before. You know what was a great map? It was a... Uh, oh, I don't even know what it was called now. Rialto. That's right. I have mentioned this before. Rialto was the best danger zone map. I mean, sorry, best wingman map ever. Rialto was the best fucking wingman map ever. I miss that map so much. It was so fun to play on. I would spend hours just kill because there was a wall bang you could do off round start. It was so fun. You could just buy an orb. There was there was an orb wall bang that you could you could just spam through this like wooden structure straight off round start. There were all sorts of wall bangs on this map. Crazy wall bangs. Um and it was so it was so tactical. That map was it had so much focus on the sound cues and and tactics and predicting where players are going to be and stuff because of the roofs. The, and there was so, there was so much interesting movement stuff and it it, it wasn't a situation where you, it was not it was unlike any other Counter-Strike map that's ever been made because it's all focused basically on this one bridge. Right? It's all real if you look it up, if you look up Rialto CSGO it's all this map based around like this bridge and it's a bridge that has like two buildings that go across the entire site so it basically splits the map into three lanes that go across the, the, the across the bridge and then two buildings that you can climb on the roofs of it as well and then the, at the middle of the bridge there's like an intersection where you can cross between everything and there's ladders up to the side. It, it was just, it was just great. Well, you could stat. Holy shit! I'm seeing a CS:GO spawn killing glitch. Rialto. This is crazy. What the hell? What is this? Oh, he's standing. What the hell? That's pretty crazy. Anyway, I just loved that map. I love that map, and I would, I would, I would wish, I would, I would actually install CS2 if they would bring that map back. I would, I would play that map. I'm just, I don't know, Wingman, right now in CS2 is just the default maps, right? It doesn't even have anything in any community maps. Like, why not? Where it's been so long since the Valve, since the game came out, there's gotta have been so many community maps made for CS2 by now. I know FM Pwn made that. Um, Santorini, it's not called that anymore, but he made that new map that everyone, I mean, it looks amazing. It looks like a great map. It has a, it has a bunch of really super interesting stuff in it. That map looks great. And that's not a wingman map, that's a normal map. But yeah, that looks great. Where's the operation? How could, I don't understand. Like, how bad do you have to be to launch the new Counter-Strike game with no operation? It's insane. What is Valve doing? What the, and then making, they're spending the, all this time not working on any of their games because they're making a 5v5 third person MOBA in 2024. Like anyone wants that. Like anyone has ever, they're so fucking out of touch, it's insane. It's actually fucking insane. Oh, it's a 5v5 class MOBA third person shooter. Yeah, like that might have popped off in five years ago. Five years ago, if they'd released Deadlock, it would have been the biggest game ever made. Absolute fucking garbage. I, I, Uncle Dane made his fixed TF2 video today, right? And he's like, I had to, because if you don't know, Deadlock, you know, the new Valve game that got leaked. It got leaked because Uncle Dane le <laughs> leaked it. He was uh, screen sharing to Discord and someone, like, playing, because he was in the, the closed alpha and he was screen sharing to Discord. And then s someone recorded his screen share. And, uh and spread that someone in his discord server recorded it and then uh 
um, he got kicked from the closed alpha because they found out it was him. But in the video, he's like, yeah, I was screen sharing to show all my friends how bad this game is and how out of touch Valve is. But like, I, I genuinely couldn't believe like, that they could make a game like this and think that this is what people want instead of just fixing TF2, etc. I made my fixed TF2 video. I made my, uh, I made a fish TF2 fixed TF2 video. And my, my fixed TF2 video is, um, I don't know. It's, it's about how we need to abandon Valve servers and return to community servers. But I, I kind of think I did a bad job on it. Firstly, it doesn't have any footage, it's just a, an image in the background because I haven't had time to record TF2 yet now that I'm in Estonia. Um, but I want to make another video which is just called something like how to make a video game with no cheat cheaters. Like, it's, it seems like, how do I put this, that cheat, cheating is not, of TF2 of all the popular games is hit worst by cheaters, right, because, like, there's no other popular games that literally have instant killing you spin bot, bots that aren't even real human players, right, like, I think it's the, the worst out of any game, but I think in every game right now, there's a cheating problem. Like, Apex has a cheating problem. Uh, CS2 has a massive cheating problem. Um, Fortnite has a cheating problem. All the new Call of Duty games and everything that looks like a Call of Duty game has a cheating problem. Uh, and all of these games, they, and it seems like we never used to get it this bad. Am I crazy? Like, I'm, I'm, I feel like cheating in video games is worse now than it's ever been. And I think that the things that are to blame for this, and even in Valorant, right? Like, Valorant has this invasive anti-cheat that has a, a rootkit, you know, malware anti-cheat. And I think people think they're safe because of that. But I personally believe that this is a false sense of security and that there were probably way more cheaters on Valorant than anyone realizes because everyone assumes, oh, we have a... Uh, a really strong anti-cheat so they can't possibly be cheaters not realizing that it's still very possible to bypass kernel level cheats uh, kernel level anti-cheat it's still very possible to bypass that um, like I, I I personally think there were probably more cheaters in Valorant than, than most people assume uh, so it seems to me like there are there are cheaters in in all the popular online games and there are more than there ever used to be like, it seems like cheating in video games like this is, is a bigger issue than it's ever been before. I think there's a couple reasons for that. I think the first reason is that the normies who play, like, Call of Duty type games, they used to be console fags, right? They used to be only on console. And now, the trickle down to all of these people have moved over to PC over the years. Uh, and obviously, it's just easier to cheat on PC than it is on console. I think that's one thing, is that, like previous Call of Duty games might have been available on PC, but the majority of their player base was on console. But now, I, at least I think, I, I'm kind of just guessing here, a lot of the people who have stuck with Call of Duty over the years have switched from console to PC and are now, like, you know, facing more cheaters in, in PC lobbies. That's a guess. But it's that sort of thing where I think the PC gaming market has has definitely increased over the years, right, compared to the console gaming market. The PC gaming market has definitely, got in, you know, gone bigger and bigger, and so more and more people are facing cheaters. I think a second problem is the increased competitiveness of games. It seems like we're finally reaching the end of uh, everything has to be an eSport. Now that the eSports industry is completely collapsing, no one's making any money, uh, no one ever was making any money, but they were scamming people, scamming investors and advertisers, right? Uh, and now the investors and advertisers have realized they're never going to make their money back, and so they're all pulling out. So esports is collapsing. It has been for about two years, uh, but now it's like really collapsing as a financial endeavor. And I also think that the the people who play these games are realizing that like what makes for a fun esport doesn't necessarily make for a good game, and vice versa. Like what. What makes for a good game doesn't necessarily make for a fun esport. 
Uh, now, there are some games which I think, uh, you know, have a great potential to be both. So uh, one of these would be Rocket League. I think Rocket League is basically football, right? Like, <laughs> it's, it's going to be good. It's going to be a good eSport and it's going to be a fun game just because football is already that, right? I've never played Rocket League, but I'm, I just it just looks it just looks like that to me. Um, I think fighting games are a similar situation, but the fighting games FGC is kind of its own thing. I can't really comment on it. I don't really know anything about it. I like vaguely follow the Smash community, and that's it. Um, but when it comes to FPS games, I also don't know shit about MOBAs and RTS. Uh, I think those probably make good esports. I, I feel like there probably isn't very many casual MOBA players, you know, or casual StarCraft players. Maybe I'm wrong about this. I don't know anything about the community, but it doesn't seem like there are that many casual, you know, League of Legends players or whatever. Like, I think most people who play League of Legends are, like, they, they want to sweat, which is one of the reasons why the game is so bad. Uh, but I think the general gaming populace has woken up to the fact that what makes a good esport doesn't necessarily make a good game and that turning every game into a competitive sweat fest is actually just sucking the, th the fun out of gaming like it's actually a lot more fun to play a game casually sometimes not always like you know it's also fun to try hard but like you it's having the option to not try hard is good and not everything has to be hyper competitively optimized uh, and then the final thing is what I said in my Fish TF2 video is that when it comes to PC games you know let's take a look like I need to double check something I need to fact check this before I say it so there's this game called Zonatic right which is a completely free open source software arena shooter which I've played a little bit I've played a tiny bit of Zonatic I haven't played very much uh, but as I understand it Community's kind of dead these days, but it did have, because the, the like arena competitive AFPS community kind of has jumped between games a lot of the time, right? Like there were people who will just stick with Quake forever, people who will just play Quake forever. Um, but the people who don't want to just play Quake forever, they've jumped between a lot of different games, especially because a lot of people like don't like Quake Champions and whatever. Uh, and one of the games that had a really strong community for a time was Zonatic, which is a completely free open source software game. And as far as I understand, it's generally considered to be quite good. Uh, and they, as far as I can tell, even though you would expect a fully FOSS game to have loads of cheaters, never had a serious cheater problem. Why? Because, um, you know, there were no official servers. If you, it, you would just call an admin if you saw someone cheating and they'd get banned, right? Like, it was it was that simple. Now, yeah, it can be kind of hard to tell if someone's cheating sometimes, right? It can be hard to tell if it's cheating or just a good player. Um, but, you know, an admin is n not going to be 100% accurate, but an admin spectating someone is going to be a hell of a lot better at telling if someone's cheating than, uh, you know no no admin <laughs> no one doing anything <laughs> it's it's better than no it's better than the option of uh you know official matchmaking servers where there are no admins there's just software right like zonatic is smartly designed at least supposedly in the sense that like it it has all sorts of uh server side checks to make sure your client is like you know it unmodified um so it does have, to some degree, software level anti cheat. Of course, every game should have soft, some. Every multiplayer game like that should have a software level anti cheat of some kind. But you know, it's never going to be. It, the, I have never seen a case where you've been able to completely prevent cheaters or prevent a critical mass of cheaters without h human moderation on top of software moderation. Like I don't support having just human moderation because uh, without preventing the most basic easy types of cheats uh, it would be the workload would be too much on individual human moderators but with just software moderation you have the same problem so what I'm saying is I think another reason why uh, cheating is so prevalent uh, 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 on top of 
the things I previously stated. I don't think I really explained that this competitive the fact that every game is focused around winning and competitive is uh, I think you can draw the implication as to why that would make people more likely to cheat. Um, but yeah, the move away from community hosted servers towards centralized skill based matchmaking, I think with no moderation has massively I think that's the number one thing really that's allowed cheaters to thrive. Like all of the other things, yeah, they might have incentivized people to cheat more, but it wouldn't matter if the servers were moderated, right? The reason people cheat now is that, yeah, they have a stronger incentive to, and then when they actually do it, they don't get banned. They're fine because their servers are unmoderated. Like you shouldn't call them, like let's actually acknowledge how, how insane this idea is. Like all of these games just have unmoderated servers. That's what they are. They're not calling them official servers or skill-based matchmaking or centralized servers. Those may be accurate, but let's say what they really are. Like you're running a game full of unmoderated servers and expecting there to be no cheaters. Of course there's going to be cheaters. Bo Burnham. He was making the internets. <laughs> he made a thing. It was called Inside. I never watched it. I don't really care about it. And one of the reasons I don't care about it is that the thing that got shared the most from Bo Burnham's Inside was his song, Welcome to the Internet, right? And I've heard that song, I think it's... The first time I heard that song, the first few times, I was like, this is, this is just corny. Because, specifically, it just was, like, late. It's so, like, it's pointing... It's very much pointing at the internet like it's a novelty, which is really weird for Bo Burnham, who's been on the internet for a long time. But I think... Really, it just reminded me of this old song by, by Weeble. Anyone remember Weeble stuff? Remember Badger, 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 Mushroom? Anyone remember the Badger Mushroom song? Anyone remember that? Remember Weeble? What else did he do? He did also, he did so much stuff. Narwhals, Narwhals, swimming in the ocean, causing a commotion because they are so awesome, or something like that. What else was there? He's done, a, he, you know him. Look at my horse, my horse is amazing. Give it a lick, mm, it tastes just like raisins. Classics, classics, so many classics. Um, but one of the songs he made back in the day, which is not on his YouTube channel, so I don't really, I don't even know how I heard this when I was a kid. It was called um, Welcome to the Internet, I'm pretty sure, or something like that. It was called I Love the Internet. It was by Weeble. It was called, you can look this up. You can find re-uploads. Um, but the thing, I think it's because he made it for uh, E4, which was the, the internet channel 4 in the UK. Uh, they commissioned it from and So they probably own the rights to it, not him, which is probably why he doesn't have it uploaded. Um, but it's just the same song as Welcome to the Internet, but like slightly more upbeat and with the memes from, you know, a million years ago when it was made. It's called, it's called We Love the Internet, I think. I don't know. You can find it. Look for it. Look for Weeble, We Love the... I don't know. You'll find it. You'll find it somewhere. It is just exactly the same premise as Welcome to the Internet by Bo Burnham, but like 15 years earlier, <laughs> uh, which I think is just why the Bo Burnham one never hit with me. Now, to be fair, the Weeble Welcome to the Internet one is more focused on isn't this place wacky and silly you you're gonna see tub girl but there's also f funny cats and chocolate rain uh you know whereas bo burnham's one is more like isn't this place horrifying uh which i think is probably more appropriate for modern internets um yeah Maybe Bo Burnham's inside is, is good. I'm sure it is. I've enjoyed some Bo Burnham's in the past. Uh, I don't know. But I just wanted to point out this parody that I'd seen. I have interesting... Not interesting. I have... I have thoughts about piracy. And I just want to sort of talk about them. I don't know. Just sort of try and think about what's going on. Because I think piracy... When it comes to, um, you know, everyone basically agrees, and I would hope I would hope that everyone agrees that it's perfectly reasonable to pirate um, <clears throat> anything that that, uh, 
made by a big company, right? Like no one would complain. Like if you if you're really getting mad about pirating, you know, big blockbuster movie, then you're just an idiot, right? There's no question about it. You're an idiot. If you're getting mad about pirating big triple A game, you're an idiot. No one in their right mind should be getting mad at that. Um, and I think a lot of people also agree that piracy is good for preservation. Like, if there's no other way to get hold of something, I think everyone agrees that it's acceptable to pirate, right? I think, or if the only way to get hold of something is prohibitively difficult or expensive, I think everyone agrees that it's okay to pirate. And then you get to the strange situation, and that is when it comes to pirating things that are freely available, um, are not prohibitively expensive, and are made by a small team or individuals who need the money, who need the support. This is the debate around pirating indie games. Um, and I think it's pretty interesting. I used to be very hard line. No, piracy is always good. I will never pay any money for anything if I don't have to, um, etc. But after getting into visual novels, my opinion, I've started to have a couple doubts. This is the real question. So there's this system, and I've talked about this at length, the system by which we pay for digital files is absurd. If you look at the actual material goings on, you know, we're paying for something which should, you shouldn't have to pay for, right? It made sense that you had to pay for physical media because it was made of physical stuff that took money to produce and distribute. But copying a digital file is essentially free. And so instead we put up artificial paywalls, like it wouldn't take any more infrastructure to distribute every game on Steam. For, I mean, obviously, you know, Steam would have to make some money, but Valve, if they wanted to, could run Steam as a 100% free store. If all of the devs wanted to suddenly make all their games free, Valve could do that because it, and support it with the money they make from CSGO cases or whatever, like easily. Like it just doesn't cost that much money to, do, to, to distribute digital files. And Steam is the biggest digital marketplace in the world of anything. Um, like, you know, distributing, copying a file is not, um, doesn't cost any, you know, significant resources. Um, so the idea of like paying for something that is non-scarce, like it kind of, the thing about digital distribution is it kind of breaks the logic of capitalism, right? Like capitalism was not invented to handle goods that can be infinitely replicated uh, to, to at, at almost zero cost. Uh, it's designed to distribute scarce goods. So this is why you have to invent weird things like intellectual property and copyright, which is just nonsense, right? Like if I, if I copy a file, people say you're stealing it, but you're obviously not because the problem with theft is that I'm depriving you of something. If, if you have a bicycle and I steal your bike, that's bad because you can't use your bike anymore. If I could just control C, control V your bike, then we'd both have a bike, everything would be great. It would be like having a Star Trek replicator. You know, we'd be living in post-scarcity luxury space communism or whatever. Everyone would love it. But that's the situation we have with digital <clears throat> distribution. And yet, um, you know, the rest of the market hasn't caught. It's just a weird thing. <clears throat> like, it's, it's an obviously stupid and illogical system that we'd have to pay for things which shouldn't cost money. But the fact is that we do live in an obviously like people people's livelihoods depend on you engaging with that stupid and logical system. This is the like I I like visual novels. I come from anime. I come I come from the land of anime, and in anime land, uh, piracy, you know, is the norm, and there is really not like a great alternative, right? Like, there are, there is Crunchyroll and nothing else, and Crunchyroll sucks. It's over, it's overly expensive for what you get. Like, it just has a bad selection. It has bad trans, it's just bad. <laughs> like, in so many ways, it's bad. It's literally a worse service than the, what you would get pirating. There's, there's not as much stuff. The translations are worse. 
hard coded subs that you can't download, streaming compression artifacts, you know, it's worse than, than just torrenting anime in in every situation. And it's very easy to excuse not using Crunchyroll because Crunchyroll themselves are a bad company. No one likes Crunchyroll. Like ev- everyone hates them. They're famous for like underpaying translators and spending, you know, giving executives big bonuses, treating people like shit, making bad changes to uh, localizations and, and all sorts of like they're just famously a bad company. And then they also are now basically a monopoly. And then you add on top of that the fact that uh, like paying for Crunchyroll doesn't really support the industry. Like a lot of people initially, the sell on Crunchyroll was yeah, you could pirate all your anime uh, like you have been doing, but like if you want anime to keep getting made, if you want to support the people who are making the anime, you pay for Crunchyroll. But as people have come to realize how the anime industry actually works, um, yeah, no, basically none of the money that you give to Crunchyroll is actually going to animation studios in Japan. It's it's a tiny, tiny, it's nothing. It's basically insignificant. Um, and so there's no reason, like, because of that, there's an, I, I can't think of a solid argument that, you know, there's any any negatives coming from pirating anime. When it comes to visual novels, when I started reading visual novels, it got a bit weird for me, though. And the reason is that quite a lot of visual novels are available on Steam from the companies that made them in English and so on. Or if they're not available or if you, you know, if you don't want Valve to take a cut or whatever, you can normally buy a digital version of a visual novel from there's various web mangagamer.com or whatever. You know, there's like a lot of places where you can buy digital copies of visual novels and you know for a fact that that money is actually going to support the developer and also unlike anime like famously at this point anime is is like in a really fucked state where the the all of the anime studios have like divested or, or diverged there's like 10 million anime studios. There's there's 12 new studios every season that you've never heard of. There's 5,000 anime being... Like, I used to do these videos where I would watch the first episode of every anime each season. And I would do it in a day. I can't do that anymore because there's just too much anime. <laughs> like, there's just too much each season to watch it. Like, you, I can't do it in a day anymore. And that makes it not fun. Like, it's... it's it's it's, it's <clears throat> That exercise was fun. Because it was kind of a slog, and it would kind of go insane, and it was a it was a, a crazy day that would happen like four times a year, or, or however often I would decide to do that sort of thing, right? But now it's like okay, it's not a day anymore. Now you're gonna be going to sleep, waking up the next day, and being like, oh, I gotta watch more fucking anime. It, it would suck, right? So, so I stopped doing it, and f- like famously, this is a massive problem, and. Like, the only way to solve this problem is to make sure that these tiny shit, you know, garbage fucking anime studios pumping out trash that no one wants, they, they should fail, like, on the, on the market. You know, they shouldn't be making money. <laughs> they, need to, they need to collapse. The anime industry needs to consolidate. And so there's, you know, a, a reasonable argument to be made that, like, there's too much money going around. I don't know if that's actually the case. Um... Because each, I don't know what, it's, I need someone who knows about economics to explain this to me. Like, what is the economic pressure? I don't, I, okay, everything I just said was kind of stupid. Ignore that. But what is the economic pressure that is pushing anime studios to separate into smaller and smaller and lower and lower budget studios pumping out trash instead of just consolidating and making higher quality stuff like I don't. I don't really understand the economic pressure of pressures at work there. <clears throat> I need someone to explain that to me. Uh, anyway, uh, the visual novel industry is not like the anime industry. The anime industry is a bit fucked in terms of workers' rights, and and uh, working conditions and budgets, time budgets, and so on. You know, a lot of people think that anime that looks bad is made cheaply, but it's normally not made cheaply. It's normally made quickly. Like, the real weird thing about, about the way anime is produced is that it, you're, you're probably going to be finishing an episode, like, on the day it's going to air. 
like they they have these insanely tight schedules um which just continues to cause so many problems like constantly and yet in typical japanese fashion they're like well this is the way we've always done it so we're not going to change uh you know animation everywhere else gets finished long before it airs it would be insane to ask a western animation studio i mean other than south park uh but you know uh, that's what really causes a lot of problems. It's not necessarily, although some of them do have budgetary issues. Most of the time, when you see anime that looks cheaply made or or shittily made, it's because of it's because they don't have enough time. It's it's literally just an issue of time. Like, it's there's a there's this meme where it's like, um, if if you're if you're currently thinking to yourself, well, isn't that the same thing? Because you can just uh, if you have more money, you can buy more animators. And that's like, this is like that meme where it's like, if, uh, management is the type of people who think that if uh, it takes one woman nine months to have a baby, it will take nine wo- women one month each to have a baby, <laughs> right? Like, it's like that thing. <laughs> uh, it's just not how it works. Anyway, I got really off topic there. The point being, visual novels are the opposite of anime. They're, they're a, they, like a dying medium. Anime is booming, visual novels are dying. They have been dying for a while. Now, for years. Dying just means they're past their prime, right? There was, there was a prime era of visual novels, and now, like, the market is just not as big as it was in the past. For a lot of reasons, but the cultural moment for visual novels has, has passed. And so, a lot of these studios, especially the smaller ones in the indie visual novel studios, they really do, like, need the money, <laughs> you know? Like, there are a lot of studios that are... Assumedly, you know, if you want visual novels to keep getting made, you should be buying them. Uh, but at the same time, you know, they're expensive and oftentimes not even that good, right? So that's why when it comes to visual novels, I've adopted a try before you buy strategy, which I think a lot of people have done, which is that I will pirate the visual novel, read it, and then if I liked it, I'll buy it on Steam. And if it's not on Steam, then I won't buy it because I'm not going to go out of my way t- to do this. Like, there's no excuse for not putting your game on Steam. You just you, you just lost a customer for no reason, you know. Uh, that's, that's your fault. Uh, if, if, you, if, you, if it's 2024 and you're like, no, I'm not going to release my game on Steam because of s- some reason. It, it's just silly, right? So, you know, if, if the game's available on Steam, I'll buy it on Steam. Um, after I finish it, because I want to, I want to support the devs, and I, I don't, I don't know. Part of me is like, is this cucked? Is this cucked? Am I, am I, am I, uh, you know, is this cucked? <laughs> I don't have a better way to put this. Like, should I be more Max Stern appealed here? Should I be like, no, you know, and it just seems kind of ridiculous. Like it seems like a situation where, like. The visual novel market, even in Japan, is relatively small. It's a small niche in the overall otaku market, which is already a niche market. And then the overseas visual novel market is like a tiny niche. It's probably like less than 100,000 people. It's probably le- less than 50,000 people. You know, it's it's a, it's a very small niche. Um, especially once you get past the like super, you know, the, the nonary series or the dangan rump, rumpers or whatever like once you get past the super popular stuff um and then you know you got your higurashis and and you got your your Marvel loves and you got your um well to be honest super hebes at this point and your cyanorutas and stuff and maybe your sci adv uh stuff but what the fuck is this noise that's happening this is this is very confusing to me anyway but but the the market for like moege you know the stuff that i read uh translated into english is probably like fucking tiny like it's probably just barely worth it for these companies to translate their games into english and the reason you know that is because 90 percent of them don't bother like only a small handful of visual novel companies even bother to translate their games into english so if you know, 
if these companies saw that sales of English visual novels did well, then other companies would translate more of their visual novels into English. And like, I don't even need them to be new releases. In fact, I don't want them to be new releases. I would be very happy if a bunch of old untranslated visual novels got translated. That would be that would be fucking great. Uh, so, you know, in a sense, I do. You know, when it came to when it there's the, I have an instinct for gatekeeping for good reason, right? Communities need to be gatekept. Uh, to survive on the internet. This is the, if you deny that at this point, then, you know, I don't know what to tell you. But at the same time, gatekeeping kind of doesn't do anything. Uh, like, if it, it's whatever. But perhaps, when it comes to visual novels, the opposite should be the case. They're like, we should be out here actually desperately trying to get people to spend money on English language VNs in on Steam, you know, in order to convince the industry to that it's worth translating stuff, you know? Uh, or, alternatively, I could just learn Japanese, which is the, the common route for... Haha, <laughs> get it? Common route, we're talking about visual novels. Which is the common route for people who get really into visual novels. They tend to just be like, well, I guess I gotta learn Japanese to read untranslated visual novels. Uh, and maybe that's the play. I don't know. But for me, I still have so many translated visual novels on my backlog that I think by the time I actually run out, it's gonna be, it's gonna be years. Um, so anyway, that's kind of my weird conundrum. Is like, I kind of feel less bad pirating indie games because I know the indie game, like the Western indie dev community, is generally speaking doing fine. Like that, it, it's the same situation as like any, 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 anyone. Well, it's like ninety nine percent of people are making no money, and then one percent of people who gets rich. Like that's just always the case in industries like this in the arts. And um, my choice to pirate or not pirate, you know, I just feel like it doesn't even matter, and I don't really care, and I kind of hate most Western indie devs anyway. Um, but the based Japanese visual novel developers, I want to, you know. I want to indicate to them that there's a there's a market in the West. I want to in, and I want to support them because their industry is not you know on the up and up anymore. But then again, what I don't want is for the thing to happen that always fucking. Why is anime playing through my headphones? Like, what actually is this? This I, this has been driving me fucking insane. It's this. It's this, oh my god, okay, I gotta put that down and just stop fiddling with it. Anyway, um, what I don't want is something like be the beginning. I don't want this thing that happens sometimes when Japanese people try and imagine I'm gonna make the type of, you know, they're like, I'm gonna make an anime that will appeal to Westerners. And it's always the worst dog shit you've ever seen because they have, they have no fucking clue what, like, for some reason, they think that, oh, this fan base that already likes the thing, I have to pander to them and change, like, I don't know, the, these guys are very, uh, they're very strange. Like, if you're an anime fan, you're an anime fan already. You know, you don't have to change what it means to be an anime fan to pander to Western fans. They are already a fan of what, you know, like, it's very obvious. And it's, a. Uh, but it happens so often that Japanese creators will, um, you know, they'll see that there's a Western market and then they'll try and go after the Western market by changing the fun, you know, and they just don't know what it. It's silly. It's very silly. It's like, so that's why I don't want to happen. I really don't want visual novels to pander to the West. That would be the worst fucking thing could possibly happen. Uh, so maybe I should keep pirating them um, and then just learn Japanese. That's probably a better play. The Slice of Life podcast, ladies and gentlemen. So I'm going to respond to some comments on the previous episode, which is a classic thing we do here. Hell yeah. Um, <clears throat> duh, duh, duh. Someone said disliked. What's the best Gundam series? I haven't watched any Gundam other than uh, War in the Pocket. But 
I'm going to go out on a limb based on what I've seen from other people and say turn A Gundam. That's my that's my take. Having not watched any Gundam, it's turn A. Wesso Back says Alice Quintanilla 3718. We are. At Liam 6364 says serious Taco Bell problem. Indeed. Well, that problem has been solved by the fact that there is no Taco Bell or Mexican food at all in Estonia. Which is sad. There's Mexican food. There's Mexican food? Yeah, you can get it. Where the fuck is Mexican food? Just randomly. <laughs> Just randomly? Yeah. I, I, I never saw... I mean, we're not in positions anymore to be spending money on delivery. So, yeah, yeah we're both bro- broker than we were last time around. Um, we've just been eating lots of chili, which I guess is Mexican food, now that I think about it. So, maybe we have been eating Mexican food the whole time. But uh, not a super, not a very traditional chili, if a tr- if such a thing ex- exists at all. Oop. Yeah, we've been eating a lot, lot of potato today. You know what I just ate? <laughs> you know what I just ate? I just ate a sandwich where the filling was potatoes and onions. That's how broke. <laughs> that's how much we eat. In like six. And, that's how much we're saving money on food. That was my dinner today. It was two pieces of white bread, and then the filling was potatoes and onions and i gotta tell you it was and a slice of cheese and some mayonnaise and it was actually pretty good i gotta be honest with you i put too much salt on it because uh well you know i don't need to get into too much details but unfortunately i over salted it but it was still really good um i actually kind of recommend that it's it's not that crazy you know they put uh you know chips in in like uh shawarma shawarma and, uh, and and stuff like that, right? And in in gyros, and there's a thing in the UK. We have a we have a classic sandwich called a chip butty, which is you put chips in in a in a butty, which is like a type of of roll, and put a bunch of ketchup on it. It's not exactly a classy food, but hey, I mean India, they do that shit all the time. They've got potato samosas. That's like a that's kind of like a that's a lot like a potato sandwich. They do that shit all the time. But, oh, when I do it, suddenly, oh, white people food. Just because I put mayonnaise on it. Motherfucker, mayonnaise is good. You're going to sit here and tell me mayonnaise isn't good? I didn't, it's not, whatever. Shut the fuck up, you stupid bitch. Let's get back to reading comments. <clears throat> uh, Sumio Mondo says, this is so cool. I wish no thank you was real. So do I. So do I. Dan Makusuki says, yes, another one of these. Back for another one of these. Uh... Sends a terminal autism says it's another one of these. That's right, it is. Uh, Element of naivety says we are so resurrected. It's very true. And now I have a shitload of sense of terminal autism comments to read. Um, you make it because you don't have anyone to talk to. I listen because I don't have many people to listen to that are real and also don't suck. It's only too presentable either. Okay, I don't know. This is, I don't want to read all. There's some comments that I'm just not interested in responding to. Odyssey is overall good, has the most atrocious search that I've ever seen, though. This is the, the, talking about the, the the video platform, Odyssey. Especially if you keep your file sizes low, most of my stuff is 480p gameplay. It would have been 240 if I had a monitor that went that low at the time. I only posted most of my stuff there. Some of it over an hour, so I don't know about any limit. There is a limit to 15 minutes. Uh, no, there's a limit to an hour. Sorry. Yeah, or at least for backing up YouTube stuff on Odyssey. Maybe it's just for mirroring, but I haven't done that. Yeah, I, I, it might just be for mirroring. I don't know. Meanwhile, on YouTube, the limit is like 15 minutes unless you dox yourself to them. Um, I guess I guess I'd already... I must have already doxed my, myself to Google, like, from my phone at some point, because it never asked me to do anything like that. Um, I'm, I must have done it without thinking, or because I had to do it to access something on my phone at some point. Uh, I, don't, I don't know exactly what happened. Uh... I don't, I don't, I mean, it wouldn't, I'm not denying, I'm not saying you're wrong, I'm saying I don't, I don't remember having doxxed myself, but it probably is because I just did it in another situation, it just carried over, um, I'll, but I'm pretty sure, I don't fucking remember, who cares, uh, blah blah blah, at least that's for the last time I checked a couple years ago, I don't, I only don't comment on Odyssey because nobody goes there, but maybe I should do it anyway because it doesn't really matter, I mean, Odyssey's fine, I don't have any strong opinions one way or the other. Making a website democratic is a quick and easy way to ruin it. Look at the things that people use and think are fine. They'll do that. What the fuck does that mean? That, that, I don't understand. 
all of the criticism of the government that you see in art funded by the government is government approved criticism that the government doesn't see as a threat and in fact may see as beneficial controlled opposition uh okay where the fuck do okay <clears throat> it's more complicated than that you're you're partly correct i will I, I you're partly correct but it's you're also only scratching the surface and this is the bit that i that is strange people supporting communism are very good for the government because communism gives it a whole lot of power okay that's not how communism works <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, I, I, even if we're talking about some sort of Stalinist, you know, Soviet Russia, you think that the communist revolution would keep the same people in, like, you know what I mean? That's not how, that doesn't tend to be how communist revolutions work, even the authoritarian ones. But there are very few authoritarian socialists or communists left in the world. They're, they, they, they either exist in third world countries and are like revolutionary Maoists who generally are just like conducting guerrilla warfare and not really doing much actual politics. Or they're like internet tankies who don't exist in the real world and never do anything. Like those, this is not the majority, this is like, you, clearly you are mis I'd misguided. That's happened every single time a system calling itself communism has ever happened. That's not true. There is a whole bunch of systems that have called themselves socialist or communist or something similar to that that have not done that. Just off the top of my head, two that are existing, actually existing socialism right now. Rojava, um, although how much that still exists is debatable, but Rojava, they didn't do that. The Zapatistas, they didn't do that. Um... <clears throat> there's there's others i'm not into just naming them off you know <laughs> not yeah there's there's been there's been some <clears throat> whatever i'm not into just, i'm not just gonna go into an argument about communism here i think you have valid i think i think you have valid complaints right you're you're let me okay i guess what i should really clarify here right because you it seems like you're not so all of the complaints you're making about like previous examples of communism I think you don't realize that that communists today, they can also read books. Like they can, they can also read history books. They also agree with you, like, you know, uh, and there's a good argument to be made that like, if we take the example of Soviet Russia, for example, damn, that was too. God damn it. Take the example, for example. I guess I should just kill myself. Um, we take Lenin as an example, like. A good chunk of Marx's writings hadn't even been published when Lenin was doing his shit. Important among them being the German ideology. Lenin never read it. And if he had, he probably would have done less fuck shit. But, uh, you know, expecting anyone to actually read or understand Marx is, is a, a very high bar to pass. Uh, meanwhile, plenty of people do get censored constantly. Hell, most of my comments are getting removed by YouTube immediately, even if I try not to trigger the bots. And you won't see those people being able to make government-funded art, right? Um, I'm a little okay. So I'm con I'm very confused. you so your your point seems to be that like clearly any art with a radical communist message that is funded by the government is so ultimately serving the aims of of the state. This is a debate the leftists have been having for a long time. Um, I think you you called it controlled opposition. I wouldn't necessarily say it's controlled opposition. I I think it's something even deeper than that. Um, that relates to some of the sorts of things that Baudrillard has, was talking about. You know, maybe some of the, this 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 realm of the spectacle kind of some of the stuff that the situationists were talking about. Well, it's like <clears throat> it's not about controlled opposition. The idea is sort of. Um, it's hard to just to sum up succinctly, but to give a, a vibe that I get, it's like there are there is the the we we live in 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 the realm of images, right? Like like that's what controls the majority of our lives, not not anything relating to some sort of underlying reality, but merely images, reproductions, simulations, and simulacra of reality, and therefore. Uh, any 
art with a political message in that sense is also just a spectacle of a political message. It's just a simulacra of a political message. And so, of course, it can never represent any sort of real threat. However, I think you'll find that the majority of people, communists who are making art like that, for example, the people who made Disco Elysium, none of them are said it like Disco Elysium, you know, very popular game made by Estonian communists. <clears throat> You know, no, they they weren't going around saying, we're going to make this game and it's going to spark a communist revolution. Like, a lot of these people, I, I, I don't think any of them think that, that, that that's how any of this works, you know? Like, I, I the, it, it's, the, the whole deal with communism is very clear about, like, you know, what, what you do, what needs to change, the, the mode of production. No one's got any illusions about, um, you know, making some random piece of art with a message is going to somehow affect the material conditions of the working class. Like, no, no one's under that delusion. At least I hope, I hope they aren't, you know. Uh, there are some people, there are some theories about, like, radical art, not in terms of, like, messaging, but in terms of form, right? Like, uh, that this sort of thing can challenge... Um, the institutions that produce it and deconstruct them or, or deconstruct modes of thought like that sort of thing it's kind of a different thing than what you're talking about if you're talking about like you know i, I think you're kind of acting like right-wing art doesn't exist or doesn't get made but uh i just don't think that's true i mean as far as i'm concerned every commercial ever made is right-wing art <laughs> you know there are all of these movies about jesus that get made all the time it's like a whole industry of American Christian cinema. There's a whole industry of like Christian music. Uh, you know, that's all uh, right wing art. There's there's a whole bunch of TV shows about uh, that are either like, you know, some of the most popular TV shows are right wing art, uh, like 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 CSI and NCIS and all of the the other propaganda, so called propaganda shows. You know, those are all right wing art. Um, <clears throat> That, that are immensely popular, not to mention Fox News, obviously, which, whether you want to call that, like, art or, I don't know, it's it, it kind of is a, in a weird position, but that's something, it's media at the very least. Right-wing, very popular right-wing media on mainstream channels that, all of this is often, you know, if you actually pay attention to the content of these propaganda shows, um, and it's not necessarily just stuff like the, the police procedurals, but there's also things like um the 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 rogue cop type genre like like reacher or uh dirty harry type stuff you know like all of that is uh effectively not just effectively i mean essentially uh from a, coming from a right wing standpoint about um you know perspectives on on regulation and use of force in the police so like all you know i i just think you you're sort of Im saying, well, those things don't count for, for some arbitrary reason, because you don't, you just sort of have accepted them as normal and, like, non-political, where they actually are political. Like, they, they, it seems like you just don't, you just only notice that something's political when it has a left-wing message, you know? But a lot of the times when I see right-wingers complain about, like, left-wing messages in popular media, it's, it's bullshit that they're talking, like, it's stuff that no lefty gives a fuck about, like, Star Wars has a black guy in it or something. So who fucking no? There's no communists going out there like we're winning Disney Corporation, but like this doesn't exist. This is not how. The, I'm glad we're having a bit of like crossing the aisle with with left wing right wing discourse. Like this, the, the people you're imagining that are like the blue head SJW communists, they they like I I'm in with them. Okay, I see them every day. <laughs> They're not celebrating that sort of thing. They they don't care. They in fact dislike it. Uh, when when you know you know the boys like the boys or or uh, mr robot these are both really popular tv shows produced by giant corporations that are you know uh that have anti-capitalist messaging um and a lot of lefties don't really know what to do with it but but the majority of them don't like it the majority of them see this as like message co-opting uh at least i that's that's what i've heard it's the same with like um lgbt stuff when, when large corporations put a pride flag in their, their fucking thing, most of the time, uh, all of the LGBT people I know 
have uh, they either are completely indifferent to it or they think it's like co-opting the movement and just using it to sell products and advertise, which they hate, um, and while doing like nothing meaningful. Uh, <clears throat> like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. Anyway, I feel like this was a bit of a political rant that maybe I shouldn't have gone into. Probably should have avoided reading this comment. So I because I know I don't, the, the last thing the internet needs is more political rants. But what I'm hoping is that this is. Rather than me ranting about politics, I'm not getting annoyed at you, Mr. Sense of Terminal Autism. What I'm trying to do is simply uh, cross the aisle, as it were, give you t- tell you what life is like on the other side of the political divide. You know, I'm not trying to trying to cr- criticize you. I'm just trying to you 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 just might not know. That's that's what I'm trying to say, really. Uh, and I'm sure there's a bunch of stuff the other direction that 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 I'm misguided about as well. Uh, Okay, this is actually the comment of yours I wanted to respond to. Randomness is a terrible way to balance weapons or differentiate them, just a sign of a bad game. See, this I completely disagree with. Uh, They should get rid of it and give the weapon actually unique effects or just buff them to do more damage overall. And if that makes other weapons obsolete, then that's because the weapon design was flawed and was just the same weapon but with different numbers. Competition should be about skill and luck gets in the way of that. Um... So what if there was a skill-based element to managing luck? So when it co- I don't remember exactly what I was talking about in the previous podcast that spawned this, but let's imagine I was talking about the Beggar's Bazooka in TF2, right? That's a, a rocket launcher where you get the advantage of uh, never having to stop and reload a whole bunch uh, and also uh, some advanced movement tech. Uh, but the disadvantage is that your rockets are quite inaccurate um what this means is you have to adapt your play style right because if you imagine a bunch of rockets shooting out in random directions from the end of your rocket launcher you know uh in order to it it means you can't like sit back and and aim from far away you know you're gonna have to try and get up real close to to your opponents in order to to play around the inaccuracy in order to guarantee a hit you know or if you are going to take a more risky mid-range shot you have to factor in factor that in with your ammo management and the amount of time it's going to take to load the next rocket right if it misses like okay if i shoot this shot um there's a good chance it's going to miss and i've taken this risk you know am i going to take this risk reward thing even by equipping this weapon instead of the stock rocket launcher you know, I'm I'm giving up reliability in this sort of mid-range or long-range situation uh, for the ability to do some beggar's bazooka um, jumps and uh, faster firing speed and stuff. Whatever the beggar's bazooka is a really really weird weapon, uh, very unique to TF2. There's there's not really anything else in any other game like it. But, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm giving up reliability for certain different things and th- my playstyle has to adapt around that, right? To a, and it's the same in Counter-Strike, right? Where weapon randomness, bullet, bullet, bullet randomness is a, is a very key balancing feature in that game, right? Like, they basically use random bullet spread to punish anything they don't want, like moving while shooting uh, would be the big one. So it's like, uh, oh, is he going to get it? I'm watching the dog try and eat a mosquito right now. I think he missed. Oh, he's going for it. We're both going for it. I'm trying to get this first time. Ah, oh, fuck. I don't know where it went. I, I, oh, I just saw it. Did I get it? I, I kind of felt it. Oh, I got it. I fucking got it. Yes, let's go. I've been trying to kill that guy for so long. <laughs> I hate mosquitoes. Anyway, sorry. That was, that, that was probably really loud for you. Uh... So when it comes to Counter-Strike, you can get a feel for how, uh, at what distances, like if you're at a super close range, you can afford to move more while shooting because, uh, you know, the bullets are coming out of your gun in a cone. And so the closer to the start of the cone you are, the more accurate it is. And so that it just, it just the randomness, I think, is actually a, a perfectly reasonable way to balance a weapon because it forces you to take a more risky playstyle like standing close to an enemy is always going to be more risky than standing far away it's going to mean you have to going to you're going to have to extend much further into 
you know, risky situations, um, which is a good, it's a, it's better than just like, oh, it does less damage because does less damage doesn't, you have to play around that as much, right? It's, it's, it's not about like, that just means you have to land more shots. Whereas randomness actually means you have to play with a more aggressive, uh, close range play style, which is, is a more interesting way to balance a weapon than just reduce damage in my opinion. Um, let me continue to read the rest of the second paragraph of this comment. Uh, though I guess it does belong in, like, a joke weapon that nobody would actually use competitively, that's fine. But yeah, if luck is fine, then add tripling, like Nintendo did to SSB. I mean, that's a very different thing, right? <laughs> like, also, oh, none of the pro players... I don't, I don't know, hold on, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come closer to Dotsmite so you guys can hear Dotsmite weighing in on this. Okay, so, like, uh, pro people have been making videos recently, have you seen them? I have not. They are... Basically, the sentiment in Brawl is like tripping isn't really a big deal, just because it realistically doesn't happen in most games. So, it just means that you can't really wave dance, and practically it means that once every 100 like wave dashes you trip, right? Since you're not wave dancing. Which means it doesn't really impact the game, like mm -hmm. realistically speaking. So it's like way overblown. You know what, uh, but you know what, you know what is an issue in Brawl? Yeah. Glancing blows. Yeah. Completely not random, right? That is completely determined by yeah. dis the spacing, but brawl players hate that a lot more. Yeah. So it just goes to show something, shows something about something. Um, but random weapon spread is nothing like tripping in brawl because tripping you can't play around it, right? But weapon spread you you you. Tripping you can play around, but just not dashing often. I see. Yeah, which is what brawl players do. They just don't dash as much. Right, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, da -da -da. Though it's not just that game. All of the multiplayer games are designed to reward being bad. And actually, oh, all of their multiplayer games, you're talking about Nintendo. And actually, from what was talked about in an Electric Underground podcast, seems like the first SSB games may only have been good because the programmer sneaked some depth in there because he was a fan of a virtual fighter and some other arcade games. I mean, that seems, that seems like, I, I don't really know that much about Smash. Uh, and the only things I do know are just melee and nothing else. I am really, really bad at fighting games. I have never really played fighting games. Uh, but I do watch a few videos about Melee, because the Melee community is pretty cool. Uh, right. What the, yeah, I don't really have anything to say about that. I mean, that's cool, I guess. But, yeah, you can't really compare something like tripping in Brawl to, um, you know, random weapon spread in a first-person shooter. Now, obviously, I, I think... If if everything is random all the time, like there's also so in TF2 there are, there are other there are other things with random weapon random bullet spread, like um, heavies mini guns all have random bullet spread, and the reason for that again you have to remember bullets go out in a cone uh, from the muzzle of the gun or from in heavy's case from his eyes technically or from his singular eye in the middle of his head from the camera, uh, and. Uh, so, so having the bullets spread out randomly as you as they get further away, is a way again of forcing heavy to get up close to his enemies and put himself in more danger. Because a heavy that could laser beam you down with a perfectly accurate stream of bullets from across the map would fucking suck to fight against. <laughs> like it doesn't matter if the damage fall off means those bullets are doing no damage. It would still be really annoying to take like a bunch of damage from across the map that you can't do anything about from a revved up heavy. It would just suck. No one would want to play against that. Uh, so actually, you know, I used to be of the same opinion as you, but but it, since I realized that random bullet spread actually exists to force people to play aggressively close range rather than just sort of like weaken a weapon in general, like overall. If they wanted to weaken the weapon overall, they would just reduce the damage, yeah. But uh, the reason you do random spread is to force people into close range fights. Anyway, that's, uh, that's why Uncle Topia should undo the fixed spread thing. Oh, I don't really care that much. I'm not going to bother complaining about it. Uh, I think that's all the comments. Okay, I just found this tier list. This is called the Reddit Core Anime Tier List Maker. And uh, it goes from S tier to D for doo-doo and get the fuck out of my face with this bullshit. And it's all the Reddit Core Anime. I don't even know some of these. So uh, that'll, be, that'll be interesting. But the f first off is... Kaguya-sama, love is war. That's definitely D for doo-doo. 
I don't. I recognize this. I recognize this show, but I don't know what it is. This is Konosuba season three, but there's no other seasons of Konosuba on the list. I'm assuming it just means Konosuba in general. I'll put that in a solid B tier. I like I like Konosuba well enough. It's it's not one of my favorites or anything, but it's 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 decent. Oshinoko. I'm gonna put that motherfucker in D for doo doo. Dress up, darling. Get the fuck out of my face with this bullshit. Uh, my teen romantic comedy snafu. That's D for doo doo. Uh, next. Uh, uh, oh, this is a uh, Anohana. Get the fuck out of my face with this bullshit. Violet Evergarden. I haven't seen it. Uh, You're lying, April. I haven't seen it. <laughs> Overlord. I haven't seen it. Shield Hero is fine. Uh, I'll put that in C tier. It's okay. Um, I don't know what that show is. Uh, I don't know what that show is. And I don't know... Wait, what is... That looks familiar to me vaguely? But I don't know what it is. Komi. Komi-san. I don't really like the anime, but I, I, I kind of like the manga. The manga is pretty good. I'm, I'm happy to put that in like a, a B tier. Sure, whatever. It's There's nothing nothing super bad about, about Komi-san. I can't tell what that show is. It's too small. Um... This is free. I haven't seen free. No, is that, that is that free? Um, I I I can't tell what this show is. Let me read the the hiragana. Does that say Gurin Puri Guran Puru Gran Blue? That's what that is. Guran Buru. I haven't seen it. <laughs> um, eight, I haven't seen that one. Re Zero. They're gonna go in D for Dudu. I was Neverland. It's gonna go in D for doo doo. Saki K. I like Saki K. A tier. Um, Angel Beats is D for doo doo. Maybe even get the fuck out of my face with this bullshit. But it has a couple funny jokes. I'm gonna put it in get the fuck out of my face. Uh, Free Ren. I haven't seen it. Erased. I haven't seen it. Bochi. That's pretty A tier. I like that show. Um, Bunny Girl Senpai. That's D for doo doo. Uh, Made in Abyss. S tier. That's a great show. Steins Gate, S tier, it's a great show. Toradora, uh, C tier, it's okay. Uh, Cyberpunk, I haven't seen it. Dungeon Master, I haven't seen it. Uh, I don't know what that is. Uh, the God of High School, I don't know what that is either. Solo Leveling, that's definitely going and get the fuck out of my face with this bullshit. Uh, that, that should go, that's right at the bottom. That's, I think, the worst show on this list. Um, Yiru Camp, S tier, it's a great show. Uh, Place further than the universe. Uh, I haven't. I, I've watched like the first episode and never finished it, but I like the first episode. I don't know where to put that one. Um, Odd Taxi. I haven't seen. Asylum Voice. Uh, Asylum Voice is pretty good. I, I'll put it in, a, in maybe somewhere between A and B tier. I'll put it in low A tier. Fate. Uh, I don't care about Fate. Uh, I'll put it in C. It's not the worst thing ever. And Hibiki Euphonium. Happy to put that in C as well. That's the Reddit tier anime tier list. The Reddit core anime tier list. Oh, I just realized one of these is Mushoku Tensei. I somehow skipped over Mushoku Tensei. Uh, that's... C tier. B, maybe... Maybe... Nah, C tier, I think. Yeah. Okay. So something very strange happened to me. And uh, that is that a video... I made on my TF2 channel, Feach TF2, brand new channel, uh, uh, blew the fuck up, uh, much more than any video I've ever made before. It's currently sitting at around 30,000 views, which is, I know in the grand scheme of YouTube, still a pretty low number, but that is multiple orders of magnitude higher than my normal views for a video and it is about three times more views than anything I've ever made uh, has ever gotten unless you count the 100 Gex remix uh, and it's it's an odd experience it's a very odd experience and I've got to tell you I immediately understand why all the YouTubers are fucking insane because commenters are fucked these people are idiots <laughs> like the, the YouTubers weren't lying. Like, I can actually confirm to you. People just comment stuff that makes no sense if you've watched the video. Like, a shockingly large number of people comment stuff 
that is either directly addressed in the video or has nothing to do, like just complete non sequiturs. Like the amount of comments that are just random shit that is tangentially, but like it's, it's crazy. These comments are insane. I don't know what, to, I don't know what to say about it. Like it's, it, it would drive, if I had to deal with this every day and my livelihood depended on pleasing these people, I would go fucking insane. I understand why all the YouTubers are like nuts, you know? Like all of these people have weird ass relationships because it's fucking fucked. These people are stupid. What is going on? And I, I, the only, why did this video blow up? It ended up in a, in a different, different way than I, I've gone into the algorithm-ish before, which is normally through recommendations. In this case, for some reason, YouTube decided to, to put my video pretty high up when you just search for fixed TF2. Uh, and at the same time, I went a bit too hard on the, th the thumbnail. The thumbnail goes hard. I just put something together in GIMP that I thought looked looked okay, but I guess the thumbnail came out looking good with something, I don't know, but um, yeah, it's a weird video to blow up because, especially because it kind of doesn't make any sense unless you've watched the previous video. It is like very explicitly just me expanding on points that I made in the previous video, which no one watched. <laughs> Because it's just, you know, it's not really a very good video. As it's like as a YouTube video, it doesn't, it, you know, it's just kind of me talking with with no footage. Like it's just an image in the background, and it's, it's, that I put together in like ten seconds or whatever. It's just a very big, you know. So I I don't know, I don't fucking know what the fuck happened there. Altogether, I would say having a YouTube video actually blow up much more than any video I've ever had before has been a negative experience for me. <laughs> I have not liked it. I do, although there's some some of the comments are interesting or bringing up stuff I hadn't thought about or whatever. But there are so many comments like okay, for example, I just got a comment, the most recent comment on on the video, someone called Orange Tabby 7122. If most of the player base migrates to community servers, won't bot hosts do that too? If they notice that their bots aren't getting the desired effect on the blah, 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 blah. Okay, bro, if you'd watch the fucking video, you would know that that doesn't make any fucking sense because the whole point is that community servers are, are moderated by human beings. And that's literally the central point of the video. Like, how could you miss that? You know what I mean? Like, these, it's, what is going on? How, these, I don't know. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. Like, it's just not pleasant to read these fucking idiots. Like, why are there... So, are they, I, 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 like, I would love to just assume these are all children. Like, these are all 12-year-olds. That's the only way I can wrap my mind around it. I don't understand. I don't understand what compels people to do... The, to... <sighs> I don't know. I don't get it. Well, it's pretty pretty wild uh pretty pretty strange situation that's really all i have to say is um that it's a very strange situation you know like what the fuck why why now why this video oh someone reckon recommended someone recognized the hidamari sketch background music that's pretty based um anyway i could expand upon the stuff i've said in this video right but i'm i'm I, this is this it leaves me in a bit of a strange situation right uh and that is like what do i do now with the fish tf2 channel because i have an idea for another video and that would be good uh but it would be very high effort it would be maybe the most complicated video to produce that i've ever made on youtube it would take me weeks to make um i have other videos that all the video ideas i have are fairly high effort right now and then i also have you know i could migrate the, st the stuff that i put on this channel right like i could just re-upload the the tf2 videos i put here onto fish tf2 like that would be maybe maybe i could do that i don't know i th I, I i have this paranoia 
that like if I do that, YouTube is going to like think my channel is a is a bot or something. I I don't know. I like I have this I have this this theory that YouTube's algorithm is going to be like he's uploading videos that have already been uploaded before. Therefore, like this guy should be buried in the algorithm, you know, uh, which to be clear about what I want. I don't want videos that blow up. I want a the same thing I have here, which is a small but tight knit community who come back and watch my videos. You know, that's the type of I don't I don't want videos that get views. I want subscribers. I'm just that kind of guy. You know, I want to build a community. I that's that's the type of thing I enjoy doing on YouTube. Uh, and so I do, to some extent, need people to find my channel in order to achieve that, or I want people to find my channel in order to achieve that. Uh, so I could I could migrate those videos over. That's option one. I could remake those videos. That's something I could do. Um, or hmm, I just had an idea. I just had a video idea right now. Cause cause two of the videos that I made were how to push bomb blitz last and how to push upward last, right? What if I, I, I just had a, an idea that I could, I could make a generalized last pushing theory video and I could even generalize it more than that because really when it comes to pushing a last in TF2 or pushing anything in TF2, there are, there are only really two things that you need to pay attention to, which is Uber and high ground. Those are the two things and Uber, everyone basically understands. But I think, I, I bet I could make a pretty interesting video about high ground, like the importance of high ground. I think, I think a lot of people probably don't understand how important high ground is in this game. So that's a good video idea. <sighs> but the video that I have, the, the, really, the really difficult high effort video idea I have is uh, a video about sticky, sticky bomb lineups, which is a mechanic an emergent mechanic in the game uh, that no one uses, no one cares about, even though theoretically it should be super powerful. And I mean, that is the exact kind of thing you want to make a video about, right? Like if you want to make a, a TF2 video, uh, hey, here's this super powerful mechanic that is completely overlooked by the community. It's niche, but it's also interesting. And it's something that you can learn by watching a YouTube video about it. Like it's basically the perfect subject for a YouTube video. And because of that, I want to do it right. Like I get one shot at this. I'm not going to become the sticky lineup guy. So in order to do it right, I'm going to have to collect. Uh, first, I have to go hunting for sticky lineups, which takes like hours because I found a few. I've done it before and it's difficult. And sometimes you just fail. Like I was looking for a lineup. Uh, there was, there was one time when I was looking for a particular sticky lineup, like I, I was like, it's always really annoying to deal with sentries here. It'd be really nice if I could like somehow, you know, have, find some lineup where I can deal with these easily. And I just couldn't find one that worked. Like I spent uh, like maybe two hours on a private server, just looking around, like testing everything. And I found some stuff that was kind of close, but no, like I just couldn't, I just couldn't get anything to actually, that, that seemed like actually viable. And so stuff like that's just going to happen, which is really annoying. Uh, so I have to like spend a lot of time looking for the lineups. I have to spend a lot of time gathering footage. I have to write a script and the video is going to have to be like pretty heavily edited. So gathering footage doesn't just mean like gathering footage of me using like the most time consuming part of that is I have to successfully use lineups in actual matches and record that. So that's one thing. But then also I'm going to have to rec record, so that's like the most, but that's actually fun to do. Then I, there's also stuff where I'll have to record like, that is just like demonstrating something, right? So that's going to be, and then yeah, the, all the editing, that, that's going to be, a, and, and writing the script, it's going to be a, a big, a big project. That's going to be a big project. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't fucking know, man. I don't know. I wanted to make a video on this channel, uh, but I, I could just put it in, in here. Here's, I, I wanted to make, there's, you can't really say much beyond the first sentence, so I don't really know what to do. Basically, uh, this is it's just, a, it's just this. Google has begun A-B testing this, 
a feature, anti-feature on YouTube, which is basically, I mean, it's not basically, it is precisely um, after you watch a certain number of videos without being signed into an account, YouTube will stop serving you videos and it will start saying, and it will pop up a thing that says like, please sign into your Google account to confirm you're not a bot, right? And that this, if they actually rolled it out, will effectively kill everything. Like it will kill invidious, it will kill uh, like YouTube downloading type stuff. It'll be a massive, it, it would be a huge problem. I mean, it might not 100% kill it, but it will massively neuter it. Uh, and it's something that I just didn't expect them to ever do. Cause it's like such a nuclear option, right? To, to just rate limit people on the website if they're not signed in. I mean, obviously you can get around it, like it's it's not impossible to get around. You could either have spoofing accounts. You could have you could have like fake account. You you could like you know just have a like let's say something like Cobalt dot tools. They they could just have a bunch of Google accounts that they set up like a bunch of dummy accounts that they just root root your downloads through. Like they could do that, or they could ask you to sign in. You know maybe maybe something like YTDLP has some system where it connects to your Google account or whatever. Like. Yeah, it, it could be possible to bypass, but it's definitely going to be a fucking nightmare to deal with if they do decide to roll it out. But it, on the other hand, I feel like it would be pretty just... This is basically just Google betting. They're just making a bet. They're saying, I bet that everyone has a Google account at this point and anyone who wants to watch YouTube already has a Google You know what I mean, right? Uh, yeah, it's pretty, yeah, it's pretty fucked up. I don't think I have had enough to say about that to make it into a full video on this channel, but it is the sort of thing I would normally talk about. Uh, but yeah, there's not really that much you can say about it beyond what I just said, which is, it's not a good situation. And then, what else? I want to try out, this is not for a video, this is just for my own personal life. I want to I wanna try out TF2 Classic, which if you don't know what that is, it's a mod for TF2 that, um, well, it's kind of hard to explain. It sort of takes a, it's, it's almost reminiscent of some of these Minecraft mods that exist. Um, let me see if I can find this, the, the thing I'm talking about. Okay, so it seems like there's not just one mod that does this, there's quite a lot. Um, but they, they, they are generally referred to in the Minecraft world as parallel timeline mods. Uh, like, take a look at Minecraft Alpha, and a lot of people correctly say like, hey, the game has like gone in a very different direction than the way it was at Alpha, right? Like if you look at Minecraft Alpha, there's a few things that are really apparent in terms of what they seem like very deliberate game design choices that have a huge impact on the feel of the game, which the game has gotten rid of. For example, uh, there was no sprint in Minecraft Alpha which meant, and you might think like, oh, that just means it takes you longer to get everywhere. But the important part about that is it means mobs are faster than you, which is scary, right? Yeah, actually, thinking about that for a second, I'm like, I don't, that sounds scared. That sounds terrifying. You know, surviving your first night when mobs are faster than you, that's tough. Or like food heals you directly instead of heal, having like a, a, a hunger system that has huge impacts on the game you know um i mean there's all sorts of stuff there's also there's so much stuff right like hey the game didn't have any direction there was there was no ender dragon to defeat that's a pretty big deal you know there wasn't this main quest that you have to complete every time you load up a minecraft world right it was like you get diamonds and that's kind of it that's the end of the main quest there there wasn't you know let's this isn't a, there's, a, there's a bunch of stuff and there's a, you can find it like 50 YouTube video essays about this topic and how Minecraft diverged from, from the, the sort of goals it had at Alpha and how a lot of people don't like that. And so there are a lot of mods which aim to like recapture that spirit. Like imagine what if Minecraft had kept evolving and updating with some of the quality of life stuff and whatever, but had retained the spirit that it had in, in the original Alpha. TF2 Classic is like that for TF2. It's like, um, what if TF, because we, we have some information about the alpha version of TF2, uh, 
and obviously we know what TF2 was like on launch in 2007. And in a lot of ways, the game has gotten away from, from, from that, as well as has gotten further and further away from being anything like Team Fortress 1, you know, Team Fortress Classic. Uh, and so TF2 Classic is like an attempt to do a parallel timeline TF2 mod, where it's like, this is what TF2 could have been like if Valve had attained it like that. And one thing I really like about TF2 Classic is that it doesn't present itself as a live service game. Because the more I've thought about the bot issue and the stuff I've said in those videos, the more I realize that it's really like capitalist greed that killed TF2. Uh, this guy, this YouTuber called Richter Overtime, made a video about this 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 um, fixed TF2 thing, and I think he made some good and bad points in the video. Like one thing he says is we should be review bombing other Valve games, which. Um, it just seems like kind of a bad idea to me, not because it, like I mostly just I don't know how to I I just I just feel like it would get all of the, it would just make everyone hate TF two fans even more than they already do. Like I'm already seeing a huge like as as this fixed TF two thing is happening, like there's there's just a massive uptick in the amount of people who just are complaining about how obnoxious TF two fans are. And they're kind of right is the fucked up part about it. Like they're they're pretty right. TF two fans are pretty obnoxious on the internet. Like and they're they're pretty right at it, uh in a lot of ways. Including myself. So, you know, I think review bowing other games, it would just it would do more damage than it would help. Like, yeah, it might get Valve's attention more, but at the cost of, you know, unfixably ruining the TF two communities, uh reputation on the internet which i just don't think is worth it but he has a bunch of other good points in the video as well and uh he sort of is the only real like there's some other people who have kind of like hesitantly gone in this direction like shonik kind of vaguely pointed in this direction um in in his his videos on the subject and i think lister also vaguely pointed in this direction but Richter Overtime is the first guy who just openly said, really, like, this is all, I guess, um, those people have put, yeah, whatever, but list, Richter Overtime, like, very clearly says, this bot crisis is happening because of the ma meet your match update, like, it was, it was, if you, he's, he's, his, he has this particular narrative about the, the game, where he's like, uh, Valve were working on this game, it was a Quake-inspired you know, whatever the fuck, arena FPS class based Quake mod game. And then over the years they used it to experiment with with ideas that would later come to embody the live service game model. Like they basically used TF2 as a testing ground for the live service game model, but it still retained its shtick as being a the Quake mod, you know, whatever the fuck. And then Valve basically got bored of it and went, like everyone moved off to doing other things, except for like one guy who barely worked on it. And so they hired this one outside contractor, like literally, we know this, TF2 was maintained by two people, only one of whom was an actual Valve employee, the other one, I don't know why I'm saying was, TF2 is now maintained by like one person. But uh, but it, it, he's basically like, yeah, this guy, this random outsider who wasn't a Valve employee, wasn't involved with the development of TF2 from the start in any way, uh, just came in, saw this, like, this guy clearly, like, had some mission to turn TF2 into an eSport and push this, like, poorly thought through update, which fucked over the server system and provided the perfect breeding ground for bots. Uh, and that's why we went, and cheaters, and fucked the competitive community permanently and, and just fucked everything because this one guy just like really wanted to turn TF2 into an eSport. And I think it's a compelling narrative. I don't know how true it is, but it's definitely, it's, you know, as a narrative, it's compelling. As a factual account of events, I'm not so sure. Um, it seems maybe, it seems almost too, too good to be true. It, it seems too clean, you know. It's, it seems too easy to understand. Real life events tend to be more messy than that, so it makes me a bit skeptical. Uh, but I'm sure that it's getting at the truth, even if it's not the full truth. Uh, 
But even, you know, this is where I have, I'm like, yeah, that's good, but we need to go even further than that. And I've seen some people talk about this too, uh, not TF2 YouTubers, but actually the, the War Owl, a Counter-Strike YouTuber, made a video about cheaters in Counter-Strike just today where he mentioned the TF2 bot issue. And he brought up in that video what I've been saying, which is cheaters in all video games are getting worse and worse and worse, and there's nothing we can do about it. Like, it's not, just count, it's not just Valve games. It's every game is becoming unplayable due to cheaters. TF2 has hit the worst of any, like, popular game, but that's just because it's been around for so long, and so cheaters have had enough time to, like, master the, the engine and all the ways to bypass all of the safeguards and whatever. But, like, outside of TF2 and even outside of Counter-Strike, every game is, like, cheaters in every single game are, are a worse issue than they've ever been before. And he, you know, it's kind of an idiot and doesn't have very good answers to the problem, um, at least outside of Counter-Strike specific stuff. And his Counter-Strike specific stuff is, like, pretty, pretty, I don't know, band-aid tier fixes. Um, but I have the answers. Uh, <laughs> no one wants to. No one wants to acknowledge my answers, which is it's actually just the live service business model that did this. Like all of the games that are hit super hard with cheaters, they all have some sort of live service model. Every single one of them, even Counter Strike. Uh, well, I mean, I don't know why I said even Counter Strike. Counter Strike is very obviously supported by skins and crates. I don't. Yeah. Uh, but like all of these games are run on the same model with official ranked matchmaking servers or uh, you know official centralized unmoderated servers uh, with a competitive mindset a lot of the time uh, you know propped up by by loot crates free to play or very cheap um, with you know whatever and the thing is this is just prompted this it's kind of like <laughs> it's kind of like the way that governments will use national security as an excuse to do anything. Except this time it's like the reverse. You've got the fucking player bases of all these games just begging these corporations to spy on them. It's insane. Like, please protect us from war cheaters by installing a bootkit on my computer. Please, I need to give you wing zero access to my computer to feel safe. Because I don't want to spend two minutes looking through a server browser. For me, I need to be able to just click one button and load into a competitive matchmaking server with wanks. <laughs> I can't click through a server browser like it's the 90s. I can't do that. Uh, please install a rootkit on my computer. I can't stand. I can't stand these fucking people. Uh, yeah, no, this it's retarded. For some reason, I decided to rewatch Patricia Taxon's video called On the Ethics of Boinking Animal People, which is a good video. The second time I watched it, I enjoyed it a lot more than the first time I watched it. And if you haven't seen it, you should watch it. But I have opinions. Opinion number one, it's insane that this video has like well over 200,000 views. This video should have like a thousand views and there should be like one Discord server that is obsessed with it and thinks it's the best video ever made and Patricia Taxon is in that, that Discord server and those people shill it. Like my videos. Like, you remember how people reacted to Denpa? It should be like that, you know? Like, there should be one Discord server where everyone is obsessed with this video and thinks it's a masterpiece, and no one else knows about it. It's fucked up that this video has 200,000 views, or more than that, I don't remember. Um, it's fucked up and it shouldn't happen. It, that sort of thing isn't, isn't real. Secondly, this is just a better version of a Digibow Smoking Weed Arc video. Um, if the Digibo smoking weed would have made the exact same video about why it's okay to fuck lollies, except it would have sucked. <laughs> um, what else opinions? I had more adults, might remind me of my opinions. Uh, data structure. Oh yeah. So the, the final thesis of the video, um, well, it's partly the, the let me just speed run the video. Uh, there has so far furries have been really bad at articulating why furry porn is not zoophilia. Um, Patricia Taxon sets out a theory of furriness in order to account for this. That furriness is constituted of three parts. Uh, the symbolic, the sensory, and the autistic. And then she goes through those things. 
but the autistic is sort of the primary thing that's important here, i.e. Uh, like very many autisms and just people who aren't normies, right, uh, identify or have, have been told their life that they're in... I mean, there's a line in the video which is something like, you told me my whole life that I was less than human, so why are you surprised that I became a dog or something like that, right? And I think this is very real, and I agree with this premise a lot. The like the the central point of the video is like, uh, you know, there's 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 shit of Zeus seducing people as animals, like tying the animalistic to the sexual is a very human activity. Uh, this synthesis, uh, this dialectic of the the human and the inhuman, uh, you know, is actually good and based and epic and autistic. Spe specifically, it's autistic because like being autistic is being caught halfway between the human and the inhuman, right? And this is something that I agree with a lot, and I support a lot. And now I will tell you about furries. So personally, I've not really, I don't really identify as a furry. I don't have a fursona, I'm not really in the furry fandom or anything. However, on multiple occasions I've masturbated to furry pornography. There are many furry characters that I'm like, that's cute. I would pet that, I would fuck that, I would maybe do both simultaneously, you know? I'm, I'm, I'm not a massive furry, I don't necessarily go out of my way to consume furry media, but when I do come across furry media, sometimes it's really bad, uh, but there's some times where I'm like, yeah, that's, that's a good character, that's good art, I like this, I have nothing but love for, for the furries, okay? Um, and, and I'm somewhat into it, you know? Uh, however... There's a big distinction, which is Patricia Taxon is like, well, if you're lay autism, then you're like, you know, there's this whole thing about identifying with the inhuman. And this is something that, that hits me very hard. Yes, that has been a core tenet of my experience of life. True. But while furries seem to have gone down the direction of like, well, the inhuman is the animal, for me... It was always the machine, the digital and the electronic, the, the machinic, the, you know? And I think it's because furries, when they were kids, they watched um, Robin Hood furry Disney film. And when I was kids, I watched Star Trek The Next Generation Data. And Data was my favorite character in Star Trek The Next Generation. And I watched the episode Data's Day on repeat because it's such a good fucking episode of Star Trek The Next Generation. And I loved Data, and I was obsessed with Data as a kid, and uh, all of Star Trek The Next Generation, to be honest. Um, but that's the difference, is that I can't be a furry, because even though I identify with the inhuman element, and I appreciate that, and I, that, 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 that strikes a chord with me, and I like the cute animal people and the furry fur that's, that's cute and whatever... Uh, I could I, I don't see myself as like the thing that's really hard for me to do is to that fur I don't know how they do it when furries they're like I'm a dog they're like I'm a fucking antelope you know I don't understand I can't pick a fursona I can't I don't feel like I'm any sort of creature specifically I feel like I'm a creature but I've never felt like that's not true never I don't want to get into it but I don't really generally feel like aha, I am this particular type of animal, uh, because I'm really not like any animal, right? <laughs> like, that's the thing. Every time I start to think about it, I'm like, yep, I'm a dog. And then I'm like, well, dogs, they like running around and, and doing shit like that. And they like getting pet by strangers. Like, I don't want strangers to touch with me. And I hate running around and going outside and, and touching grass. I hate doing that shit. And that's kind of the case every time I try and think of an animal that I kind of relate to, is I just start picturing all the parts where I'm like, no, actually, I kind of hate doing something that's core to identifying as this particular animal. However, and I never get really urges where I'm just randomly like, I'm, a, I'm an animal right now. I'm a puppy right now. But very regularly... I get the feeling I should be a machine. I, in fact, just earlier today, literally, I, you can't make this shit up. I messaged Osaka Syndrome. I wish I were a machine. To which Osaka Syndrome said, like a Delusian machine, misspelled. And I said, no, I'm already a Delusian machine. I want to be made of wires and tubes and metal and silicon. 
just had to cut out a segment anyway uh yeah and that's a feeling i've had for a long long ass time it's a feeling i've had for a long ass time when i was a kid it was a feeling of identifying very strongly with commander data from star trek the next generation and then when i was a teenager it was uh the lane from from the anime serial experiments lane and now it's sort of nothing because i i i kind of don't I, I don't know it's me listening to a lot of throbbing gristle that's really what it is it's just me listening to a th- to a lot of throbbing gristle go on youtube right now okay this is what i want you to do this is what the fuck i want you to do um no 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 hold on Check, let me find this uh I gotta find this playlist that I found. I don't know. You'll you'll find it. If but go go and look, go on YouTube and just look for all these videos of of steam trains that that work in in Chinese steel mills. It's so fucking sick. Um, I don't know if this is it. There's this fuck. I found a playlist once. I, I I don't I don't I don't know if I'll ever find it again. Uh. Steel Mill Trains. Steel Mill China Steam. That's it. Go on YouTube and search for Steel Mill China Steam. And you'll find a playlist by a guy called Steam Crane. And, like, this, for me, is the peak of eroticism. Uh, This is just where... This is... I, I was just... There was a week where all I did was smoke weed and watch videos of Chinese factories and shit. It was... It was a great... Uh, it wasn't that great. I was going a little bit fucking insane, but it was, this is all what I'm all about. Okay, it's all about big industrial machinery and and slag and steel and steam and coal and and pollution and and coughing and fucking shit called the Beijing Iron and Steel Group Co Limited. Like when I see these Chinese logos, it's always like gold text on a red background. Because they love gold and red in China. Um, which I used to hate. I used to be like, oh, it's so gaudy. I just didn't understand it, okay? Past me, didn't understand the Chinese aesthetics. I get it now, okay? But anyway, you see these videos? They're like, yeah, they were just still using steam locomotives in these steel mills until fairly recently. Like, ten years ago. Um, and it's just all these, like, videos where people would just record... It was sick, okay? I, this is a bit of a tangent. The point being, I like machines. I like I like machines that do that do all sorts of things. I like it when I you you know um you know uh, Maho Shoujo Lyrical Nanoha A's. You guys know Maho Shoujo Lyrical Nanoha A's. Uh, in Nanoha A's, the 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 fucking weapons, right? The weapons they install this cartridge system. They install a cartridge system, and they they do look at this, folks, mate. They they have all of these mechanical. Hold on, let me mute this so I don't get a copyright strike. They have all of these mechanical aspects to them. You see this? You see? Look at that! The ah! Oh, you know what I'm saying? You know what I mean? And you know what else I grew up watching? I grew up watching fucking Thunderbirds. Okay, Thunderbirds mechanical aspects. It's a it's miraculous. The, ignore the what you just saw i have other reasons for being into nano her as well okay um <laughs> uh it, it's a miracle that i'm not like the world's biggest gundam fan i don't i don't really know but i'm more look i'm more into the did you look at the generator rex transformation sequence the what <coughs> the type type tape it now this is content just a reaction video where you can't even see the thing that i'm reacting to Okay, I'm watching Generator Rex Forced Transformations and Reverts. This is someone's fetish, and I might be someone. Okay, this is great. Fuck yes. You get it, Don't Smite. This is amazing. I like this. What is this show? What the fuck is Generator Rex? Yes. <laughs> it almost seems like a normal transformation sequence. I like it when he's in pain. Yeah. That's, that's the bit <clears throat> I can relate to. I mean, this is this is all forced transformation. So, yeah. here Rex evolves into his Omega I mean, this evil is some form. Cringe, I think. 
It's new fag. <laughs> it's generator Rex new fag cringe. I think this is like from like the way three seasons of three that I know of. I see. This. Yeah, yeah, that's a classic. This is the classic shit. Rex Salazar, all powers and fight scenes number one. Generator Rex season oh one. There's a monkey in this show. Yeah. I will not be watching this because it looks like garbage. But it is garbage. Yeah, but I like I like the mechanical aspects to it. Yeah, that's pretty yeah. cool. There's a character in um uh Ma- Maho Shoujo ni Akogarite who has the same um big fists. It's such the big fist right there in this one. I see. The chainsaw is the. Oh yeah, I was also really obsessed with Ben Ten for like three or five years. Yeah. Yes, I like body horror. Yeah. You know, this is true. This is it's gone <laughs> from. What happened was it was originally being really into data from Star Trek, and then it was being really into Lane from Serial Experiments Lane, and it was really into Ben Ten from Ben Ten, and there was uh, all of these things. And then it's transitioned into being really into Throbbing Gristle, being really into, um, uh, fuck, what was the thing I was just about to say 10 seconds ago? Uh, oh god, I'm having a brain fart. It's, it's evolved into being really into, to, um, David Cronenberg movies, <laughs> especially Naked Lunch and, uh, uh, Videodrome. People don't realize how good the David Cronenberg adaptation of Naked Lunch is, man. People talk about the best Cronenberg movies. They're like, oh, Videodrome is really good. Correct, Videodrome is really good. They're like, oh, uh, I don't know, other things he made, really good. They're really good, I agree. But no one ever brings up Naked Lunch as one of his best movies. It's one of his best fucking movies, and I will not listen to you if you're not talking about it, okay? I also like the desert. I like it when the the Bedouin are there, and and the best movie ever made is uh is is Lawrence of Arabia, guys. I'm just talking about things I like now. Okay, um, I think this this segment is over. The point is, I want to be. I want to. I want. You. Kn- there's sometimes there's scenes in movies, right? There's scenes in movies where a character gets injured, and it's revealed when their hand falls off or some shit that there's just wires inside of it. You know what I mean? You know what I'm talking about? Like, they take an injury, and it's like, oh, fuck, they were, they were an android the whole time. And maybe maybe they were hiding it, or maybe, even better, they didn't know. You, you know what I'm talking about? Where it was revealed that they were, they were a replicant or some bullshit. They, take, they get injured, and they're like, oh, fuck, I was an android the whole time? I want that to happen to me. As if it could get any fucking weirder. I go to check the Team Fortress 2 subreddit, as I do sometimes. I don't know why I bother, but sometimes there's funny stuff on there. Occasionally there's funny memes on there. Most of the time, it's Reddit. But I go to check the Team Fortress 2 subreddit, and I see a meme about my fucking video. <laughs> like, <laughs> with 6,000 upvotes. Like, what the fuck? This video is too big. I don't like this. I don't like this. <laughs> this I just... <laughs> If I'd known that this would happen, I would have made the video better. I think the video is fine. Like, I think if you actually pay attention to what I'm saying in the video, nothing is wrong. The main things that I'm getting complaints or whatever for in the comments are the following. There's a lot of people who say, Oh, the game is a million years old, just let it die, move on, find another game. That shit's obviously fucking retarded. I don't need to bother retaliating about that. Then, there's a bunch of comments who say stuff that, uh, like, uh, something I actually found out from the comments, which is interesting, there are, like, n- almost no community servers in Australia. Like, Australia has a severe lack of community servers. But that doesn't really go against the video, because the point of the video is asking people to make new and better, make more and better community servers. Like, the point of the video is to try and solve that problem by making more and better community servers. So, that's kind of stupid. I get a lot of comments who are saying, who are, who are like, finally, someone's talking about UGC ping spoofing, which uh, I think they only mention that because I say it in the first, like, few minutes of the video and no one else, no one watches f- further than that. But yes, they do ping spoof and it's very annoying. Um, and then I get a lot of comments saying, uh, talking about just, just nonsense doesn't make any sense. People who don't really understand how video games work or cheats work or moderation works or community servers work. We're like, won't the bots just come to the community servers? 
you know, um, I get, I've gotten comments about how the Valve's investors are going to get scared away from people who don't realize Valve is not a publicly traded company. I, I, it's just like, I get a lot of comments from people who are like, uh, I don't fucking know. It's, it's just insane. <laughs> it's just insane. The, the, uh, the Australia thing is interesting, I suppose. I mean, I, I didn't know that. Um, but, uh, yeah, a lot of people are just like, uh, there's a lot of people who are complaining about the title of the video or the, the thumbnail, I guess, you know, who are like, what do you mean? What if Valve ignores us? Valve is already ignoring us, which I think is, you know, kind of a good point, but it's just, it's just the thumbnail, you know, uh, then, uh, but the, 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 the Reddit post, the Reddit post and quite a, a large sway the, the, the comments on the video are people saying, bro, don't be so pessimistic. Stop being so pessimistic. It's not pessimistic. It's the opposite. It's just being not helpless. This, that shit actually kind of pisses me off. Like, I'm, I'm not even going to be like, oh, I'm not being pes a pessimist, I'm being a realist. It's not that. I'm literally doing the opposite. I'm saying like, it's the opposite of pessimism. I'm saying, look guys, we don't even need to rely on Valve. We can b come together as a community and solve this issue ourselves. Like, that's the opposite of pessimism. Oh my god. <sighs> that's so annoying. I, I I understand why like William Osman had a fucking breakdown from reading YouTube comments. This this place this website sucks. <laughs> YouTube commenters are fucking retarded. They're like sub zero IQ. This shit is insane. If I if I'd known that this video would pop off, I would have made like extra sure. I don't even know if I would have, but I I mean I feel like I would have made extra sure to like you know set out the initial premises of my argument right at the start of the video instead of what i actually did was assume no one would watch it because it was a follow-up to a video no one watched right and so i assumed anyone who is watching it would be one of the like less than 100 subscribers i had at the time who would have watched the previous video i made and it was a follow-up to that right and I was like, well, I don't need to restate my point. So I'll start by just talking more about in depth about community servers. And I even started off with the, the cons of community servers. Like the first half of the video is about like, here are the negative aspects to, oh my God, I don't even know. I don't even want to talk about this. I've been having like zero fucking fun in TF2 uh, because I don't really know. It's not true. Saying I've been having zero fun is not true. I'm exaggerating there. Uh, I've been having less fun in tf2 and it's partly just because my setup of my place is optimized for fps gameplay and dot smite setup is not optimized for fps gameplay so like i'm playing in 720p with with low lower settings on a tiny mouse pad on a kind of you know it's just kind of janky which means i can't necessarily perform as well as i normally would but that's not really the problem because you know doing Fragging out is ne not, you know, it's more about having fun than, than fragging out, always. Uh, I do feel like when I'm playing on, I don't know what it is, but, but but I'm playing on this setup, I don't have the urge to, like, just go again that I normally have. Like, when I'm, like, I, I feel like I don't have the urge to just play for 14 hours straight. Um, but really, what's been kind of annoying me more is that I've been, I've been wanting to play uh, Team Fortress 2 Classic, which, if you don't know, TF2 Classic is a mod that, uh... Wait, didn't I already talk about this? I'm having deja vu. Did I talk about this already? Anyway, the point is, I can't get this... I can't get TF2 Classic set up. Like, I, it's it's just not working for a couple of reasons, and they are reasons that it's hard to solve on a shared... Com like, running out of hard drive space? I don't know what the fuck... I don't know. It shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. It, it basically, like, it should have enough space. It's weird. It's it's confusing to me that it. I, I don't really know what's going on with that. But it's annoying that I can't. Like, I want to play TF2 Classic. It seems fun, and I I can't, and that's kind of sad. I was compiling a collection of the best autism autism YouTubers, aut autistic autistic YouTubers. It's not just autism YouTubers, because an autism YouTuber could be really anything, right? Like. Um, I, I, I don't know. A anything could be an autism YouTuber. Like, Matt Pat could be an autism YouTuber, but he's not an autistic YouTuber. I'm trying to compile 
autistic YouTubers. So far, uh, this, these are my recommendations. Like you, you got Patricia Taxon, based autistic YouTuber. I once I once called her white, and she got kind of mad. <laughs> That's the only interaction we've ever had. Uh, she made a cover of a Stevie Wonder song, where she turned it into like an electro pop dance thing, and I commented, like t- taking this turning this song into like an electro pop dance thing is the whitest move ever, and then she responded, like, uh, with something like, "Oh, this song was always a dance song," uh, to which I could have said, you know, if I wanted to be edgy at the time. My, the back of my mind, I was gonna say, "Hey, I said it was the whitest thing ever. White is not an insult, right? That's the very edgy thing that you can say." But I just like, there's no point. So I just, I think I, put, I think I just deleted my comment. Actually, <laughs> I don't know what I did, but uh, Patricia Taxon definitely knows who I am. She's definitely heard my music. I, I have some evidence for this. But anyway, she makes great videos. I love her videos. Uh, then. And she's very autistic, which is based. There's the what, the what show, TF2 YouTuber, very definitely autistic in my opinion. He sounds autistic, but this is not an insult. This is a good thing. Uh, he's just auti- He's just good. I like. I, out of. I think he's my favorite TF2 YouTuber. Uh, although he doesn't just talk about TF2. He's done videos about about a bunch of other stuff as well. But he's mainly about mainly a TF2 YouTuber. But he has a good sense of humor. He's actually funny. Uh, his videos are well edited, but they're not like over edited. Like Soundsmith, you know, one of the most popular TF2 YouTubers. He he uploads like a, a proper. He uploads like low clip dumps, but he uploads like a a big project video like twice a year because they're so fucking over edited and they have like a million source for maker bits in them and it's like what's the fucking yeah I mean I guess this is it's impressive on a technical level, but there was a a lot of since TF2 has been out, been out for so long, right, and these YouTubers, a lot of them have been doing it for so long, there's always this pressure on YouTube to one-up yourself with each upload. And so, uh, yeah, it's just led to a weird inflation where TF2 YouTube videos are just, like, more and more and more, like, heavily edited, more and more complex source filmmaker interludes, more challenges that are more extreme and more, dif- I don't know. Uh, doesn't necessarily improve the viewing experience. The Watt doesn't have that. He just has a calming cadence. He's clearly autistic about this game like I am. Uh, yeah. There's also Shonik, who is also a TF2 YouTuber, but he talks about the technical side of TF2, like the the code. Um, again, autistic cadence, very, very relaxing, comfy, comfy autistic cadence. Um, and he just has like insane knowledge about the way the game is programmed. And he actually has good opinions about stuff as well. Uh, next is Mega Pig Nine Thousand and One. This guy's a you def- almost certainly haven't heard of him, uh, but he's a he's a Toho YouTuber. I don't even care about Toho that much. I just read the porn, but uh, his videos are fun. Uh, then this next is Theme Park Crazy. Theme Park Crazy is a is a roller coaster enthusiast YouTuber who makes like top ten videos about theme parks. But uh, that the, he's clearly very into the coaster enthusiast hobby. He has a, the relaxing autism cadence in his voice, and he also makes a lot of videos about sub mechanophobia, which is not something I have any interest in, or at least I never I never had any interest in it until I saw his videos, and it's mostly like he seems to be passionate about that, and it's kind of an infectious infectious attitude. I don't know. I, I don't really care that much about roller coasters personally, but hearing him talk about like Interman and whatever, he has kind of an infectious enthusiasm for them that I, I quite appreciate. Next is the man, the myth, the legend himself, Pat and Kowik. He needs no introduction here, okay? But I can't leave him off a list of the most based autistic YouTubers. Pat and Kowik is a god amongst men, and uh, we can only hope to one day achieve his greatness. Next is Annie C. Uh, she's a Thomas the Tank Engine YouTuber, mostly focused around the wooden railway sets, which, if you don't know, is is like a particular type of playset toy railway for for Thomas stuff. Um, she makes music and a little uh, fanfic like 
animation stuff with the wooden robot. It's pretty good. It's pretty comfy Thomas stuff. Very autism core. She makes videos about like stim toys and stuff as well. Uh, pretty good. Pretty comfy. Uh, Dolts might suggest that I put Vihart on this list, which is a good idea. I kind of forgot Vihart even existed. Uh, you probably know who Vihart is, but if you don't, she's like a maths YouTuber. Uh, she also does stuff with music. She's been around for a million billion years. I remember watching the like Hexaflexagon video when I was in school, and then making Hexaflexagons in school the next day when I should have been in maths. <laughs> she kind of ruined my life. <laughs> like, uh, not really, because I wouldn't have been paying attention anyway. But, like, she had a whole series that was sort of unofficially about, uh, like, doodling in maths class. Where it's like, you're supposed to be in maths class, paying attention to the class, but instead you're doodling. But then whatever sort of thing you're messing around with turns out to actually reveal some sort of underlying mathematical concept and relate back to some, like, you know, the history of some important mathematical concept or whatever. Like fractals or some sort of geometric principle or whatever, um, which are great fucking videos, by the way. Um, but I would just doodle those. I would just, like, copy whatever she did in the videos in my math class. <laughs> anyway, based Vihar is based. And finally, Jan Meesley, who I just remembered existed. Uh, sorry, I'm, I've got a bit of a cold. Oh, it's not cold. Uh, hay fever, I mean. So I'm kind of going to be... Sn I'm, I'm sniffing a bit. I apologize. Uh... But Jan Meesley is obviously based. I started watching him because of Conlang Critic ages ago. And then he blew the fuck up because he made it like a bunch of videos that were had broad appeal. Um, some of which are good. <laughs> and, and then just most recent. So he made this video called like how many mainline Mario games are there. And it was a great fucking video. Everyone loved it. And then like a week ago, which will be much more than a week ago for you watching this. Uh, he made a follow-up, which is, like, going, I guess, more into depth about it. But the the original video is, like, 20 minutes, and the sequel is, like, two hours. But the thing is, his second video, although there are good moments in it, it's, like, not very good, in my opinion. Like, as a as a YouTube video, it kind of fails. Uh, it's it's extremely, like, long. It, it kind of, I don't really understand why that video was made. I don't really understand the purpose it serves. It's like, I don't really know. I don't want to complain about it too much because I, I did enjoy some parts of it. Um, but I I really enjoyed the original How Many Mainline Mario Games Are There video. And so seeing a two hour long follow up was like really hype. But I was pretty disappointed by the actual content, which was mostly like, let's just, I mean, obviously the entire point of a video like that is to argue semantics. But he really goes off the deep end arguing semantics with people who don't exist. Like, it seems like he, if I had to imagine, I think he's, as someone who has now had a video with lots of randoms commenting on it, I think what probably happened is he made a video and he got a bunch of randos commenting on it, making really piss poor arguments for, for stupid shit. And he was like, I'm going to make a, a video carefully deconstructing these people's arguments and why they don't make any sense. But, but uh, you have to remember that YouTube commenters aren't real people. They're basically, they, they don't have like brains like the rest of us. Uh, so you can't, you can't treat their arguments with any level of respect. You just have to tell them to fuck off. Uh, yeah, I don't have anything else to say on that subject. I might be kind of low energy because I am sleepy because I have stayed up past my bedtime playing video games he <laughs> tee hee 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 don't tell don't tell mommy he <laughs> he actually this is okay um but what happened is i managed to finally get tf2 classic to work and it was a fucking pain and shout out to don't smite for the tech tech support uh the tech support being for some reason extracting the zip file would tell me there wasn't enough space on the hard drive so we extracted the zip file in an external hard drive and then just copy pasted the files over to the computer and then it worked. Very strange. It's like, oh, you're not allowed to extract the zip file. There's not enough space. But there, well, there was enough space. It was very strange. And then I had to fuck around with it a bunch more to get it to actually run. But through some miracle, it all worked out. And I actually managed to get TF2 Classic to work. And uh, boy, howdy. <laughs> 
<laughs> that's not that's not a phrase I say. Since when do I say boy howdy? Uh, but but oh man, that is a fun video game. I didn't really understand until very recently. I had no understanding of like what the appeal of TF2 Classic would be. Like because I'd heard about it before, and I was like, Open Fortress. That makes perfect sense to me. It's very different. It's the TF2 engine. You know, it's got a lot of TF2 mechanics. But it's a completely different game. It's an arena shooter. It does, it's not class-based. There's b-hopping. It's a very different game, right? TF2 Classic, I was like, why would I want to play? Like, a, the, I, thought it would, I thought it must be like some sort of super niche thing. Like, oh, it's a recreation of TF2 from the beta or whatever. But it's really not that. You know, it's more like, as I described it earlier, it's like an alternate parallel timeline version of TF2. Um, and what it really is is TF2 if it never became a live service game, which makes it better to play. Um, there's no fucking cosmetics. There's no, there's no, none of that bullshit. There's no unlockable weapons. You just have all the weapons, but you don't have all the weapons, right? They, they got rid of a bunch of weapons from the original, from, from real TF2, right? It's, it's a much more stripped back experience, which I thought I would not like, right? If you don't know, I know I said I wouldn't talk about TF2 on this podcast as much, and I have been talking about TF2 a little bit. I've mostly been talking about my TF2 YouTube channel, uh, but this isn't TF2. This is a this is TF2 Classic. It's a mod. It's a different game. Okay, so I'm allowed to talk about it. Fuck you. I saw some fucking comment that was like, "Oh well, these podcasts are fun while they lasted. Now they're bad. You kill yourself. What are you fucking talking about?" Anyway, uh, TF2 Classic is a fun video game. It's a stripped back. It's minimal. It's good in all the ways a video game should be good. At first, I played in a server with a bunch of custom weapons, and that was pretty fun. I liked some of the random custom weapons, but a lot of them were just kind of garbage. Like, a lot of them just seemed... They, I mean, when I say garbage, what I mean is they were well made. They, like, clearly a lot of effort went into making them, but, like, I don't know why you would ever use them over stock, basically. Like, they were just very strange. Maybe if you just... If there, maybe if the server didn't have a million custom weapons, it would have been better. But there's just so many that's like, you don't have to, I don't know, whatever. So I played that and I was like, this is fun. TF2 custom weapons, that's, that's fun. But then I hopped in an actual TF2 classic server. And yeah, that's the most fun I've had playing TF2 in fucking months. Just when you kill a spy, the spy actually dies. If you're fighting a spy and he stabs your teammate, you can still kill him. There's no fucking vaccinators. There's no quick fixes. Me- you know, medics actually hear you. It's just, there's so there's no Jurati bushwhacker combo. There's, it's just TF2 without the bullshit. That's what it is. It's, it, there's no, no Wrangler. There's no Rescue Ranger. You know, the, the, it's, it's Team Fortress 2 without the bullshit. That's what it is. And then they do have custom weapons, right? Like, Scout has a nail gun as well as, you know, as an alternative to, to the shotgun. And that's really cool because Scout's alternative primaries in re- regular TF2 are mostly garbage. Like, the only one that is, uh, that is like, the only kind of interesting ones are the uh, the Force of Nature and the Soda Popper. Uh, but, but none of them actually, like, change scouts gameplay very much at all but switching the the nail gun changes scout from a close range class to a mid-range class and that's an interesting change now i don't play scout and i'm not going to play scout even in this game uh it might be more fun with the nail gun but i i I, so i might try it out but i I didn't because i was playing demo man because there's nothing more satisfying than playing demo man now i will say when i was playing on that server with a bunch of custom weapons one of the custom weapons was uh, the grenade launcher from Quake, and man, I wish the grenade launcher from Quake was in TF2. I love the grenade launcher from Quake. Uh, I don't, I'm just gonna, I'm just kind of rambling and gushing about how much I like TF2 Classic. It's just there's no bullshit, and the weapons that they've introduced are so well designed. It's insane. Like the, the there's such clever side grades, like the the pyro weapon that lets you jump, like the force of nature, but it's for pyro, the double barrel or whatever it's called. Like, that's such a well-designed weapon for Pyro. TF2 devs would never have the balls to do that shit. It's so much... It's so clever. 
the the jump pads for engineer you know i thought it was a stupid gimmick and it is it is a silly gimmick it's generally speaking not as good as teleporters but it's fun who cares it's fun you know um medic has this new melee i don't remember what it's called but it like ch- there's like a, a meter that charges as you heal people and then when it hits a certain point if you melee your teammate you give them full overheal that's such a good it's so clever because it's when you're when I was playing medic with that weapon, it's actually like quite strategic because spending that charge is a big investment. It takes quite a while to get that charge back. So like you have to be careful with when you're using it, and also you have to melee your teammate, which means you can't be standing in a safe space around a corner while they take a fight. Uh, so it's quite strategic when you decide to use it, um, and it is incredibly powerful, but not overpowered. Because you, you only get one, and then it takes ages to charge again. But playing Medic and using that was super fun. And then playing Demo, and there was a moment where Medic saved my life with that item, or that weapon. And that felt great. That felt amazing. I will say, the only thing um, that I, th- I think, the only complaint I have about TF2 Classic is that it doesn't have the Crusader's crossbow. I, I'm sure they must have some reason for this, but... Personally, my medic playstyle is very crossbow heavy. I use the crossbow a lot. And so adjusting to playing medic with no crossbow is really weird and awkward to me. And it kind of sucks. It makes medic a lot more boring. Like the crossbow is such a high skill ceiling weapon that it's... I don't know why they would take that out of the game. It's kind of annoying. Um, But other than that, it's basically just TF2 with a whole bunch of... With a bunch of bullshit removed... Like, all of, all of the weapons and items and unlocks that are just retarded, taken out. No fucking cosmetics. Gordy ass bullshit. Hey, your FOV can go way higher. Like, that's really nice. Being able to play a... I'm playing on, like, 110 FOV instead of maximum and regular TF2 is 90. That's really nice. And then... Oh my god, this is the best fucking thing ever. There's a toggle to make projectiles shoot out of the center of your screen instead of the side. And in TF2, that's not just a visual thing. Like, I don't know why they thought this was a good idea. It's always pissed me off so much that, like, Soldier, yeah, the stock rocket launcher shoots out of the side of your face, or the the side, like, where the rocket launcher is being held. But then you have the original, which shoots out of the center. But they just never gave Demo Man anything like that. So Demo's projectiles just always shoot out of the side and it's so i hate it and playing without that it's so nice it's such a subtle change like most people probably wouldn't even notice the difference but i notice and it's amazing and i don't know how i'm going to go back because it feels it just feels so it just in a in a tactile way feels so much better to have the projectiles shoot from the middle it's it just feels better i don't know um there's just it's just tf2 with a bunch of there's there's various quality of life improvements in terms of like settings you can change that you can't change in the original game or stuff that's in a menu rather than being a command that's kind of nice um and there's there's animation fixes there's it's just like a whole bunch of little things like little quality of life improvements that just make the game better it's it's so nice it's so it's so much nicer I don't know. I don't know what else to tell you. It's still TF two, but it's just it's just it's just nicer. <laughs> like I don't know. I don't fucking know what to tell you. There's silly stuff in it, but it's not too silly. You know, it's got the perfect TF two ness to it. It's it's like they they gave the gunboats to Demo Man. You can you can sticky jump around now and not lose all your health if you want. But then you know you only have the stickies, which is limiting. You know. That's a, that's a fun thing to do. It's it's situational. It doesn't. It's it's not amazing, but it's definitely fun. Uh, ooh, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you, man. There's a bunch of stuff just looks better as well. Like they changed the they 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 changed the lighting engine, and so in my opinion, the game just looks nicer. The game also runs way better. Like I don't know what they did, but it runs. It just runs better than than real TF two, base TF two. Like it. it you just get better FPS. I don't know why. Um, yeah, there's femme versions of every character if you want that for some reason. And although that might have just been on no, I, I don't know if that's on the that's a, that's not a base. That's not in the game. That was just in that one server I played on. But that was that was funny. That was fun. 
um, and the femme designs were actually good. Like, they they weren't like over the top sexual or anything like that. They just subtle and appropriate. I liked that. It fit the game's art style. Yeah, the lighting changes look better. There's a there's just a bunch of like little things. Like, hey, this animation is smoother now. Like the sentry gun animation is normally jerky in the base game. Like at a low FPS, they just smoothed it out and it just looks better. It just does. Uh, the medi medi beams, like the uh, the beam for the the crits looks different from the beam from stock, and it looks really cool and, and clean and crisp. And the crits model is more distinct from stock and looks nice. Like there's just a whole bunch of little stuff like that. Like a demo man's reload animation for his grenades has been broken forever in TF2. Like it's always looked like shit. Demo doesn't put the grenades in the right place. Um, like when he reloads the gun, it's it's always looked terrible. They fixed it in this version. Like there's just a ton of little little things like that, you know, that just make the game feel polished. It just feels more polished. It just it just feels better to play. I don't know. I really, I really, really enjoyed playing TF2 Classic, and I'm definitely gonna play more. I had a great time, and it feels like oh, maybe it's just because it's a, a a new game for me, and I just switched to it. But I, I don't. Something about it, it just feels more chill. It just feels more relaxing. It feels less. I think it's just the less bullshit. Like it just, it doesn't feel like I have to. It doesn't feel like there's any pressure to perform. You know what I mean? Which is good. I, it, it feels like people are playing to have fun. Like, they don't have some... I'm not saying I'm going to quit original TF2 and switch to TF2 Classic. Puma? Like, there's definitely stuff I've, I'm going to miss from, from base TF2, right? Like, the, there's, there's, there's cool stuff. The, the crossbow, um, the extinguisher. Although there's something similar for Pyro in this game. The, um, there's like a scythe that can deal guaranteed crits. Which is probably better than the extinguisher. But I haven't tried it out yet. I just wanted to play demo because I like playing stock demo. I, d I really do think there's like dem playing demo man in TF2 is like the best feeling of any video game. And it feels even better here. I don't know why. It just does. Uh, like it just, the feeling of like hitting a sticky pipe combo, it just, there's nothing else in other, any, any other video game that's as fun as that. I don't know. Don't ask me. I'm going to stop talking about this now because I said I would talk less about TF2 in these podcasts and I am still talking about TF2. I I have there's an experience. I want to I want to know like what goes on with 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 other people with this experience, right? Like okay, so I I generally like so-called modern art, right? I like not that I like all of it, but I have an appreciation for abstract art non-representational art i think part of that is probably because my dad does and so he took me to a bunch of art galleries as a kid and stuff like that uh but i also would like to think that i maybe have some independent thoughts sometimes <laughs> uh but i do share a shocking amount of opinions on art with my dad uh but that's fine my dad has good opinions on art so i'm okay with that my dad's a cool guy uh anyway uh but one thing that i never got one, uh, one modern artist that I never understood, abstract artist that I never understood. You know, I liked, when I was a kid, uh, I really liked Mondrian. I, I, I was a big, big Mondrian guy. Uh, but, but I never really liked Picasso. And, to, uh, sorry, not Picasso. Uh, I never really liked Rothko, I mean. Uh, and, and a lot of people who don't like Rothko, they'll say, oh, it's because you haven't seen it in person. You haven't understood the texture. The thing is, the Tate Modern, which is the big modern art gallery in London has Rothko's it has a room full of Rothko's and so I'd been there and I just hadn't really seen anything that appealing about it um I still think to this day you know Rothko the, the point I'm trying to make here is that I I went into this room multiple times every time I go to the Tate I go into this room full of Rothko's and try and see what it is that people are getting out of it and over the years it went from I I you know worked on it because I was like people are definitely getting something out of this. I can't really describe it. I'm not someone who's very good at explaining the appeal of visual art in words. Uh, but I started to grow more and more of an appreciation for it, and it took effort from me. It it was a, a bit a bit challenging, one might say. It's not I didn't force myself to like it because there's other stuff 
there's lots of other art that is popular, but I'm just like, no, this fucking sucks. <laughs> and there's no way I'm going to get myself to like this, right? Uh, I've given it a lo- bunch of chances, and I'm just like, no, this is just bad. Rothko specifically is something where at first I saw it, and I didn't really understand the appeal. But as I've gone back, you know, I've been like, oh yeah, I guess it actually is playing with light and color in a very interesting way. And the paintings do have, like, something tactile to them. And actually, if you pay attention, the way the colors sort of blend, it almost gives it, like, a 3D effect. I don't really know how to describe it. I don't know anything about art. I don't have the language to explain this sort of thing. But there is actually something aesthetically unique there that that does, for lack of a better word, look cool to me. It does produce some sort of emotional reaction in me now that I quite like. Now, Rothko isn't my favorite. When it comes to abstract art, I like, I, personally, I like the, the, I like very geometric shapes. I like the, I like the Russian, is it, is it called structuralism? No, that's not right. That's, that's, that's literature. That's literary theory. I've, I've forgotten what it's called. Russian abstract art. Let me Google this. This is the sort of shit I'm looking for. What is, what is it called? Yeah, like this shit, this is fucking great. I like the minimalist stuff. I like the geometric stuff. I need to find the name. Yeah, yeah, like like this one. What is what is this genre called? What is this genre called? Uh prolet prolet cult? That's a that's an institution, some sort of art thing. There's a name for this fucking genre. Uh duh, duh, duh. constructivist. That's the word. It's I think I believe it's constructivist. Yes. I like Russian constructivist art. That stuff's cool. The Soviet constructivist art. Yeah. I see some shit like like this and I'm like, fuck yeah. I like I like the shapes. It's very satisfying to me. Uh I also I like the I like the art that's just sort of a hey, here's a square. I'm like, yeah, a square. I can, I get a square. I can totally understand a square. You put a you forget a canvas, you put a square on it. I'm like, fuck yeah, a square. I like, I like a square, you know? But whereas the Mondrian stuff is much more expressive. It's not got the cleanly defined geometric shapes. It's quite uh, floaty. Uh, sorry, did I say Mondrian? I meant Rothko. I'm, I slept weirdly today, okay? My brain isn't all there. The Rothko stuff is a bit... Can I turn... Hold on a minute. I'm seeing this waveform. I'm seeing this waveform and it's looking small to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now now we should be louder. Right. Okay. I've I had the, the, the volume all fucked up. Sorry about that. That was probably fucked up for a while. Anyway, the point that I'm trying to make here is yeah, Rothko might not be my favorite abstract artist, but I gained an appreciation for his stuff. Is this something that just most people don't bother to do? Like do people see some sort of abstract art that they don't immediately feel drawn to? Because even the people who say they hate modern art, like they still have some appreciation for it, right? Like they'll, they'll, they'll like something about modern art. You'll, you'll, fi- you'll always find something that they like, um, and they'll, they'll, they'll give some reason why it doesn't count. But the point being, like when most people see a Rothko or whatever, and they don't immediately connect with it, do they not? Like, what happens then? <laughs> Do they not be like, okay, well, I can sense that there's something going on here that I'm not getting, that, that isn't connecting with me, so I need to spend more time with this. Do they not get that feeling? Do they, do they just... Because, like, I can tell the difference. I don't know how, but I can tell the difference between here's a piece of art that I'm just not going to like versus here's a piece of art that has something going on that I'm just not getting yet, and I need to spend more time with. Like I, I can, I can, I can feel the distinction there. Um, and then with the latter, I actually will come back. Like another example of this would be, uh, if you think that there's a lot of people who freak out about modern art, then like visual art, I got to tell you, you don't even know what it's like being into contemporary classical music. And I'm not that into contemporary classical music, okay? There's a guy called Unim that I know. Now, that guy knows about his contemporary classical music. Me, I don't know much about contemporary classical music. I've listened to to, to a, an, an amount, um, but a lot of it definitely goes over my head. 
um, if, you know, if you, uh, there's stuff that I'm just like, that's cool. Like, when I see, oh yeah, Stockhausen, right, he wrote a fucking, here's a, here's a piece that's just three orchestras playing at the same time. I'm like, that's just cool. Here's a fucking song that you play on a helicopter. That's just, that shit is just cool. I don't know if there's some deeper meaning behind it or whatever. I don't really care. The, the surface, you've already got me at the surface aesthetic qualities of that. But I think a lot of people find it very hard to listen to to Stockhausen or whatever. Like, there are a lot of people who would willingly even listen to some harsher music that isn't classical. Like, there are lots of people who might listen to, I don't know, Death Grips or something, right? <laughs> but, which is, you know, a ha- harsher more more dissonant, more challenging listening experience than like Taylor Swift, right? Uh but then they're not gonna listen to to Milton Babbitt or some shit like that. The thing is, when I listen to Milton Babbitt or Schoenberg, when I listen to Schoenberg, I have a vague understanding of what he's doing. But you if you just put on some Schoenberg to some like here's the thing. Here's the thing. You gotta, you gotta understand a little bit more. Like, you gotta... Schoenberg doesn't really make any sense unless you know what he's doing. Unless you have really astute musical training, which I don't. You're probably gonna need to read what he's doing. I.e. about serial... What is serial music and stuff. Um, and the mathematical components and, and whatever. Uh, but I'm just asking the question. Do people just, like, see stuff and just take their initial reaction as, like, something permanent and unchanging. They don't see it as a personal failure. Like, if they, if I, if I see something, because I can change my opinion on anything, right? I have the power, I have the power over myself. I can, I can, I can force myself to do anything. I guarantee you, okay, this might sound crazy, (laughs) but if I wanted to, I could force myself, I could, I could, (laughs) If I wanted to, I could become gay. I could watch enough gay porn and just make myself gay. I promise you I could do that. I I, I, I guarantee it. I can acquire tastes like no one else, it seems. Anything that you've got a taste for, I can acquire it. I just think that's not how most people work, and that's interesting. But maybe it is how most people work, and I'm just, like, not aware. So Japan, right? Uh, the glorious land of the rising sun. One one well known fact about Japan is that um, there's no litter, right? The streets the streets are very clean. There's a lot of places where the streets are very clean. Here in Estonia, for example, uh, the the streets are exceptionally clean. There is very little litter. It's very different from London. In London, there's litter everywhere. It's one of those places where um, there's this there's this. Uh, I read a, a a very interesting blog post once, which was called "If you don't litter, you're not from here." About how like uh, it was like from an environmental perspective, how like how to tackle the sort of social factors that cause people to litter, which is definitely a thing in London. Like in in London, it's like if you if you don't yeah, it, I mean there's no phrase th- that phrase captures it perfectly. If you don't litter, you're not from here. Like if th- people here. They, they litter as a, a sort of, I don't know, sign that they don't give a fuck. It's kind of like smoking or something. It's like, yeah, I know it's bad for me. I don't care. Kind of situation. Uh, that's kind of how it is in London. Even though there's plenty of garbage bins around, it's not that. Anyway, but uh, here in Estonia, there, there is very, very little litter. But when you see uh, places like that, I believe Madrid is also pretty well known for being very clean like this. It's because there's lots of garbage bins everywhere. There's lots of there's lots of bins everywhere. Here, I mean, you can't walk five seconds without a a bin. Like there's bins fucking everywhere. It's great. Uh, this place is so has so really good like civil design. I I gotta appreciate it. The roads are really nice. Road road design. Lots of trees everywhere. It's it makes walking really great. Although, they're definitely helped by the fact that Estonia is, like, completely flat as a country, so it's just, like, naturally walkable. You don't have to go up hills or anything. It's great. Anyway, um, but Japan, and Tokyo in particular, is different from, from a lot of other places that have quite clean cities because they have 
bins everywhere. In the fact that Japan is famous, or Tokyo is famous for having no bins. There's no bins. You 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 can't put your garbage anywhere.、Uh, and so, like, when it why why are Tokyo streets so clean? It becomes attributed to this, the 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 glorious、uh, Japanese collectivist spirit, where everyone is so nice and collectivist that they just carry their garbage around with them in their bags until they get home. And that is true. Japanese people do,、uh, so you know, often carry their garbage around with them in their bags until they get home and then throw it away there. That is a thing that happens. It's very real. However, this explanation leaves something very important out, which is that what you're not seeing is the fact that the Japanese government just employs a small army of street cleaners. There are just loads of street cleaners in Japan. And it's not just in the public place, like in privately owned public spaces. There are lots of street cleaners. Like, if you go to any of the train stations, you'll see cleaning staff fucking everywhere. They keep it clean because they pay a lot of people <laughs> to keep it clean.、Uh, it's not some magical thing that just happens because of some intangible cultural element of collectivism. It's because perhaps that cultural element of collectivism. You know, makes the government want to put money into cleaning stuff, or makes corporations want to put money into cleaning stuff. But nonetheless, it's the cleaning stuff that keeps shit clean.、Uh, and you could call this smart governance. You could call this the development of a social underclass of cleaning、uh, civil servants. Whatever you want to call it. The point is, what's interesting is that Japanese people really do carry their garbage around. With them until they get home and throw it away. Then that's not just a meme. Be- people do genuinely do that,、uh, and it's very common. It's not like strange or whatever.、Um, but that attitude didn't come out of nowhere. It was developed through. They see that the streets are clean, but when you're looking around, you don't really register the existence of cleaning stuff. Like you just see that the streets are clean. You don't necessarily think. Someone's been paid to clean up the streets constantly. You just think, well, the streets are clean, so if I litter, I'm sort of going against social convention. So, and I, I've heard all the time. You know, you have this social idea put into you that it's it's normal and natural to carry your garbage home with you. But that idea didn't just spring forth from magical Japanese collectivism. It came th- from governance and management and employing.、Uh, A bunch of labor to keep the streets clean, and I think that's probably got implications and meaning somehow. I don't know what the implications or meaning is,、um, and I also don't understand why that's preferable to just having bins. <laughs> like it's it's definitely better to just have bins everywhere.、Uh, it's a fucking annoying to have to carry your your trash around with you. That that just sucks. But anyway. I'm sure there's some implications to this. I don't know what they are. You can draw your own implications, but it seems like something that has a meaning to it. I'm a huge fan of eggs. Okay, I eat eggs almost every day for breakfast. Oh, has my fucking mic reverted back? Has my mic reverted back to being quiet? No, it hasn't. I'm just speaking quietly. Okay, <clears throat> I like eggs. Big egg consumer, and in my opinion. Unless you're doing scrambled eggs, the best p- which is scrambled eggs are great. Well, there's there's infinitely good ways to make an egg. Okay, I'm not trying to t- to say that there's there's any bad ways to make an egg, but particularly what I'm trying to say is if you're gonna make a fried egg, the best part of a fried egg, I would say the entire point of a fried egg is primarily the runny yolk, the runny yolk mixing into whatever carbohydrate or protein that fried egg is on. You know, you have a fried eggs on toast. The runny yolk soaking into the toast is delicious, right? It's just the best part. It's the whole point. And if you wanted, if I wanted to go even further, I could say the peak of an egg is when you get this gap moe, this cooler shove effect between crispy, lacy edges of a hot fried white with the runny, ooey gooey jamminess of the yolk. Okay. We've established this. I'm a huge fan of a runny yolk. Do not t- come at me with a fucking hard-boiled egg, most ever. It is acceptable to have eggs that do not have a runny yolk in specific situations. It is acceptable. 
for example, if you're making an egg salad, makes sense, okay? There are situations where a hard-boiled egg type situation might be optimal, but 99% of times, you know, there's also, let me point out, there's also, okay, scrambled eggs exist and they're good, okay? But that's, and omelets exist and they're good. That's different. In that situation, there's no distinction between the white and the yolk, so it doesn't matter. In an egg format, where there is a distinct white and a distinct yolk, I want to have that yolk be runny. Okay, have I impressed this upon you enough? That being said, if you give me a sandwich and that sandwich has an egg in it with runny yolk, you deserve to die. Don't fucking hand me a sandwich that I'm going to bite into and the yolk is going to go all over my hands. I could have been eating that, you fucking idiot. What are you doing? Do not give me a, I hate, I see these fucking videos of people making burgers and they put a fried egg on the burger, which is stupid, okay, already. There's a thing, if you want to eat a burger patty with a fried egg on it, there's a thing which I believe is called a loco moco, which is a Hawaiian dish, which is basically a burger patty with a fried egg on it on a bed of rice. And it looks delicious. I've never tried it, but it does look really nice. Everyone who eats it says it's good. Um, so if you want that, just eat a loco moco, right? But if you hand me a fucking sandwich, oh my, it's disgusting. It's, it's egregious. I'm not eating this with a knife and fork. I don't have, I'm gonna get egg all over my fucking hands. I'm gonna get egg on my face, literally egg on my face. It's terrible. Do not hand me a sandwich. Do not ever make sandwiches. How do people eat sandwiches that have runny yolk? It's insane. Don't do that. And I want to thank the creator of this restaurant chain called Egg Slut, which I'm sure is a stupid restaurant chain that charges like a, a massive overprice for whatever they make. I'm sure it's it's evil and whoever made it is bad. I don't know anything about it. I, all I know is that I once saw a YouTube video of the guy who owns that chain making eggs for breakfast. And that video introduced me to his breakfast sandwich, which was fried eggs, spam, and probably something else. Uh, but what really matters is his fried eggs. He taught me about something called uh, marbled egg. And what this is, is you fry the egg uh, like you normally would. You crack it in, you wait for the white to set a little bit, and then you break the yolk with a, with a spoon and you stir it around just a little bit, just a little bit so it gets like a marbling texture. And then you flip it. And this is the perfect egg for a sa egg sandwich. Other than egg salad, that's kind of a different thing. But this is, in my opinion, the perfect egg for an egg sandwich because you get the fried texture and there's also going to be heterogeneity between the white and the yolk that you can still feel, but you don't get runny fucking yolk everywhere all over you. So if you want a fried egg, but you also want a sandwich, what you want is a marbled egg sandwich. And that's what I'm trying to tell you. Marbled eggs are the way to go. Okay, thank you. So I'm officially working on a new No Thank You album. I've accumulated tracks in a million different genres and styles over the course of, well, ever since the last No Thank You album, and even before that. And some of these are older than that album. Uh, and eventually I've accumulated enough tracks in a particular style that I feel like I can push it further, and it's actually inspiring me. And now I'm in full album mode, which is like working on music most of the day, every day, until I get the album finished. I have no idea what it's going to be called. I have no idea what the album cover is going to be, which is bad. That's a problem. I need to figure that shit out. But I am in album making mode. I'm in album making mode. Um, that's the... And this album, it will probably be out by the time this podcast is out. I'm pretty sure. Uh, <clears throat> so I can talk about it without, it's not spoilers. Can you even do spoilers for music? I don't know. But, uh, uh, according to Dolt Smite, at least, this album doesn't sound like anything that's ever been made before. And I think that's probably pretty true. I'm, um, and I'm, I'm mostly just experimenting with as many weird, um, sound design techniques as I can think of. <laughs> mostly... I'm experimenting with granular synthesis and just some wavetable stuff, which is not actually that weird. Then some, like, there's some, uh, not granular synthesis, granular sampling. A lot of granular sampling on this album. Um, a lot of spectral, weird, sp like, spectral gates and fucking 
I don't even know, man. I'm just putting, I'm just throwing every sound design trick in the book at this album. But here's the thing about, now that I've been fucking around with like some more advanced sound design and trying to learn some new things, this is the weird thing about sound design, right? Is that actually when it comes to that sort of thing, it's not like, like being good at sound design is kind of different from being good at an instrument. Like you can, whether you're playing on a cheap bow secondhand guitar or a really expensive guitar, you know, it doesn't really matter. Like they're only going to amplify whether or not you are good at guitar. Like if you're really good, then you can make the really expensive guitar sound even better. But if you, if you, you, but you'll still sound good on the cheap guitar. But if you suck, you're going to suck on every guitar possible, right? The thing about, um, like, synths, synth instruments, the, the weird ones, is that, like, a lot of the noises that you hear on, like, records with more interesting sound design, it's just not possible to do in basic synthesis programs. And, like, once you get your hands on Serum or vital or any of the other uh weird fucking ones that people use and once you get your hands on some of the plugins like 90 percent of sounding like a modern electronic album is serum and ott like if you get your hands on serum and ott and you did put them together you sound like you, you you can you can't really fuck it up also there are some people who are like genuinely very good at sound design and very clever and solving sound design problems is a lot like programming, right? Like, I mean, it literally is doing um, maths, right? The way synths work is you're applying, like, I don't fucking know what branch of mathematics this is. It might be like linear algebra. I don't know. Uh, is it, li is it? I have no clue. I don't know anything about maths, but you're doing maths. You're, you're, you have this waveform and you're doing a bunch of mathematical operations to it to manipulate the way the waveform functions, right? Uh, like that's 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 what doing synthesis is. So having being being able to pick up any anything and, and, and manipulate it into the way you want it to is is a lot like programming because it's a series of it's like breaking down a, an abstract problem into a series of mathematical operations, which is the the same thing that programming is basically. Um, so like, I find it gives me a lot of the same feelings as I get when I'm trying to program something. But the difference is that when you're programming and you do something wrong, it just breaks. <laughs> it just it doesn't work. It either, you know, it either crashes or just doesn't work in the way you want it to at all. But when you're doing music, when you're doing sound design, when you're doing synthesis, audio synthesis, and you do something wrong, it can often still sound cool and it's because it's artistic like that like you can't break it too bad i mean you can get stuff that sounds bad but you can also make a mistake do it wrong and it, and accidentally come up with something cool which is which is a, a very fun process and also something important to note right is that, that there are some people there is a very small minority of people who who sit down and they're like I, I have a a sound in my brain I want to make a sound that goes like real or whatever right and they can just sit down open up serum and just make that sound from scratch but no one does that like almost everyone just opens up a preset and then fucks around with the preset until it sounds nice that's what everyone does that's what I do that's what everyone does everyone starts from some sort of preset and then they might not stick with the preset, right? That it's, you know, a preset is just a preset. It, it it might not suit the particular song you're using or whatever, but the majority of people use presets as a starting point. The vast majority of people use a preset as a starting point and then modify it from there. You can't really anyway. This this album is full of weird ass sounds, but I just want. I was just thinking about how different. It is in this fact, in the sense that like, you'll hear some noise in an album. Like I, I remember back in the day when when dubstep was a thing. I heard noises in dubstep albums, and I was like, "How the fuck do you make something like that? How do you make a sound sound like a whop?" Right? I didn't know what wavetable synthesis was at the time. I didn't know what any of this stuff was. 
I don't even think they were used. I don't know. But anyway, I just remember installing Massive for the first time and then being like, oh, this is just the dubstep. This is just what all the dubstep people are using. And then when I installed Serum for the first time, it was the same thing. It was like, oh, this is just how you make all of those wave tabling noises. Like, they just, it's, it's not some magical knowledge that these people have that I don't have that is enabling them to synthesize strange noises. It's literally just a tool. Like, they were using this tool that I didn't have or access to. And this is the tool that makes things sound like that. Um, it's, it's, it's each, it, it, you can't think of like sound design as being like playing guitar. You have to think of each particular synth as being its own instrument. Like serum is the guitar, you know, like you're not, no matter how good you are at piano, you're never going to be able to make it sound like a guitar. You know what I'm trying to say here? Like I, it's a, it's kind of, maybe this is just makes perfect sense to other people, but it feels kind of counterintuitive to me. Um, like, you would imagine that since you're just doing maths to waves, and everything can, you know, even a very basic synthesizer that comes with your DIW is going to be able to do maths to waves, you, you should be able to make anything, but you, you, you actually need specific tools to do specific things. I don't know. Anyway, I'm having a lot of fun making weird fucking music. Extremely weird music. Yeah. So as part of my quest to make weird ass sound design for this album, I'm trying to make music that sounds fucked up and weird. I'm trying to make weird abstract noises, but I don't want it. This is what's fucked up, right? I want to make weird abstract noises, but I don't want it to sound like Orteca, and I don't want it to sound like Sophie, which <laughs> kind of puts you in an odd position. Because no one's ever really made weird, fucked up, abstract music with heavy sound design that doesn't sound like Orteca or Sophie, you know? Either it's Orteca, it's like... You know what I'm saying? That's how Orteca sounds to me. It's kind of like weird time signature stuff. Stuff's just kind of happening. It's great. I love it. Or it's Sophie, or it's like... It's not just Sophie that does this, and it's also not just Ortega that does the other thing. But it's like, I take a weird synth that goes like hyper pop, and then I put it in a region. You know what I'm saying? No, I want to make, I want to make, like, The Body. You know The Body? One of my favorite bands. It's actually really hard. I have to not listen to them because uh, otherwise I just start copying them because it's like exactly the type of music I want to make. Um, so I'm like, but the, the body, like, doom, doom metal industrial stuff, but a lot of it these days is, like, mostly electronic, which is what I want to do, too. <laughs> um, noisy, doom industrial stuff. But I'm like, take the body. They do sound design in a particular way, and I'm just like, well, do the same kind of thing. I'm going to do the same kind of song structure kind of vibe but rather than trying to use sound design inspired by doom metal guitars which i love by the way as you could tell if you've listened to my music before um rather than going down that route too much as a little bit of that but maybe use some sound design that is just weird fucked up shit that i came up with uh Anyway, in my quest to find weird fucked up shit, I've been looking for all sorts of free plugins and, and every, anything I can find that is free and might make something sound weird. And I found this company called Freak Show Industries. It's their tagline, audio effects for the end times. And oh boy, they make some cool ass, f they make some cool ass plugins. They've got the Dick Smasher Distortion, which I don't think is out yet. The dumpster fire, that one's, I don't even, I don't know what any of this stuff does. <laughs> it just fucks shit up. What it does is it fucks shit up. <laughs> they have a bunch of plugins that fuck sounds up. And they look great. Like, they have a great aesthetic. They're great. It's a very cool, cool plugins that sound really weird and fucked up. And then, but what's interesting is on their website, there's a buy button. So you can buy the plugin for $40, uh, $30. But then right next to it is a button that says steal. You can buy it or you can steal it. And when you press steal, it says, you're here to steal plugin name. Consider paying instead. 
and then it gives you the option to underpay. So instead of paying $30, you could pay 20 or 15 or $10, right? Which is, which is very cool. But then if you still want to steal, you have to choose, you have to choose an option. Why do you choose this life of crime? Money is tight. Software should be free. I don't give a fuck. Or I change my mind and I want to buy it. But either money is tight, software should be free, or I don't give a fuck. If you pick money is tight, it's like, hey, bro, just, just fucking, you know, if you really want to, if money's tight, consider underpaying, but we understand it. If you to say, I don't give a fuck, they just give you the plugin. They don't even tell you anything. This is not a matter of principle or affordability. You chose to steal just because. Keep in mind that this software is not free and that the steal button in particular is a vote for our decline. See, that's sad, but uh, it is what it is. And then if you click software should be free, it says it puts up a hacker, like an edgy hacker picture. And it says, this is the edgiest answer. You might instead be interested in supporting us with a tip or buying t-shirts or other physical merch. It'll help us help us make more software for you to steal. If you really won't do that either, then consider making a donation to the EFF in our name or reconsider the I don't give a fuck stealing option instead. And then it links you to some... Uh, so much which i think is fucking based i just want to point out how based this this fucking company is that they put a buy button and they put a steal button and the steal is like yeah go do okay you can pick software should be free and then they tell you to donate to the eff that is incredibly based i had no interest in purchasing these plugins before but after being given the option to steal them and being told to donate told i'm edgy and i should go donate to the eff now I kind of want to give them money. So when I get some money, well, I don't know, when I'm up in the future at some point, I'm definitely going to gonna gonna give some money to Freak Show Industries. They have some merch. Let me check out their merch. It could be interesting. That's pretty cool. Their merch is pretty cool. I don't know if they'd ship to anywhere where I am, but what what is this option? <laughs> it doesn't explain what this option is. There's just a t-shirt. And it gives you options as like small, medium, large, uh, you know. And then there's another drop down where you can either select transcendent flesh or larval space god. What does this mean? <laughs> oh, there's two different ty Okay, I understand. <laughs> those, were, those were just like some abstract thing. No, there's there's two variations of the t-shirt. I see. Um, they both look pretty cool. I think larval space god looks a bit better, in my opinion. Um... That is very cool. I don't know, man. I might have to pick pick something up from these guys or give them a little donation at some point. Because I gotta, I gotta have big respect, enough respect. I gotta have enough respect for these for these plugin makers, especially because their plugins are actually cool. Shouts out here. Yeah, this is my free advertising for Freak Show Industries. Go if you're a maker music, if you're a maker music, go check out some of their weird ass plugins. So, back to talking about Ludwig's Fast 50 event. Wait, you've done another segment I didn't. I did a segment initially where I was like, if Simple Flips isn't there, I'm not watching it. Yeah. And then it turns out, you know, Ludwig announces a poster with everyone attending. No Simple Flips. I'm like, okay, this is going to be garbage. But, oh, there's like Point Quo and Doug Doug and, you know, people, who gives a fuck? Anyway, it turns out that just without advertising it, Simple Flips was there. Like, Ludwig just didn't, even on the poster that was, like, there was an initial announcement poster, which just had the big YouTubers on it. Then there was another secondary announcement poster, which was supposed to be the full lineup. Just didn't include Simple Flips for some reason. And so I was like, well, there's, there's no point in watching this. Anyway, it turns out I found a video uploaded to Cheese's channel, not even on Ludwig VODs or anything. Cheese re-uploaded the VOD of him... Liam, Simply, Simple Flips, Ludwig, and some random fucking guy playing Mario 64. Which would be great if the video was watchable. But I don't know. I I, I feel bad for off-brand because <laughs> they're clearly trying. They're trying to be a company that knows how to do things. And they've made some good streams. They've produced some good streams. They really fight. They made some good streams. Yeah, but they made like five. Yeah, well, no, but but off plan is mostly people from beyond the summit though, so yeah. they were oh. all experienced running events and streams. Yeah, 
Um, but like they made so many just flops too. Which flops did they do? Just a bunch of them. Like which ones? I don't remember because they were forgettable. I just remember Ludwig saying there was an event and then just not remembering it ever. I see. Yeah. Drama Christmas Dream was good. Mm-hmm. Chess boxing was decent. It was well. The stream was well put together. Yeah. Um, streamer awards. Streamer awards. Who fucking cares? Who fucking cares? But you gotta give it to them. You gotta. You got. No, you don't even. It wasn't even that. You gotta hand it to them though. So. I'll hand it. Fine. I'll hand it to him. I'll hand it to him. Fine. If I got her. Mm-hmm. Um. Uh, oh, the lovely game show. Juiced. Or, no, Mogul, Mogul Money. Yeah, yeah. Or the new Ludwig game show. No, Mogul Money. Mogul Money. Yeah, the new Ludwig game show is also really bad. The new Ludwig... How did they fuck it up? I don't know. How did they... They literally took Taskmaster, yeah. which is a good show, yeah. copied it bar for bar, yeah. and fucked it up. Also, Streamer Dodgeball did it that for some reason. Oh, yeah, Streamer Dodgeball, fucking garbage. Yeah, Ludwig has just, he just, just been flopping. I don't know what he's doing. Ludwig's in his flop there. But he had good stuff as well. I mean, Juiced wasn't that long ago. That was an off-brand thing, and that was good. That was an XUC thing, too, I thought. Yeah, but off-brand produced it yeah, for XUC. Yeah, Ludwig. Ludwig is flopping. Uh, wait, are we talking about Ludwig, or are we talking about off-brand? Off-brand has done, like, free non-Ludwig things, too. They've done more. Yeah. I just don't know about them. I see. They did like another game show in what is very obviously the exact same studio as Juiced. I see. For, so, for I think Point Crow. I see. I don't remember. And they they they've done other stuff. I as just well. know the excuse you get is Cinderella and Germa. That's the old. Because I said Germa, but Germa the Germa stream was a Germa stream. That wasn't a Ludwig stream. Yeah, but that was an off-brand thing. Wait, but now you've got me. No, confused. I'm saying I only know three things off-brand has done that isn't Ludwig. Uh, there's got to be something with everything off-brand has done, right? Let's see. Pitch your... G- oh, yeah, they've got started a game studio. Man, I have I have, I have, have zero faith in that. Oh, no, wait, I do have faith because because of... of okay, why am I on the press kit for off-brand? What am I fucking doing? Uh, okay, I, I'm going to stop caring about this now. Anyway, Ludwig, he fell off. He fell off. What else did he do? How did they fuck up unpaid interns so bad? Yeah. Taskmaster is funny. How did they... They. It's just like edited poorly. I don't know. But he said he's going to do it again and they're going to learn from their mistakes, which I believe. Um, well, he should have just retired. He, he, he probably should have retired other than the yard, in my opinion. Yeah. I mean, like every YouTuber retires, like not really retire. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway... Fast 50, the newest Ludwig event that fell off. For some reason, I don't know why they did this. They're running it like a, like a Smash event, right? Where it's like there's a commentary couch and then there's the gamers doing their gaming, right? But they also mic'd up the gamers doing gaming at the same time because they're a bunch of like personalities. They're, it's mostly like YouTubers who are vaguely adjacent to the speedrunning scene, like point crow or whatever so they want them mic'd up otherwise it's like why would they even be there makes sense but then what you actually get (laughs) is just a setup where the commentary desk is talking just at the same time like they're just talking oh it's just unlistenable i wonder what the closed captions of the video are should we find out yeah fast 50 simple flips yeah so this in this situation You've just now you got down if you don't want to hold the mic. like a bunch of people talking over each other, and it's just unwatchable. Oh fucking YouTube's just fucking up for me these days. <sighs> yeah, it's so tight for just kids. So speed run it as to not let his team down. Oh my god. Okay, now now there's only. This is what the whole stream wait, sounds wait, like. Why do I land on the gray thing? Because you're 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 so hot. Oh, okay. It'd be so hot if you went in the lava. Oh, I see. I see. <laughs> without moving, and then just. Oh, thank you. you oh, just, okay. just gotta be an easier star here. Like it's just unlistenable. Yeah. The YouTube subtitles has no idea what to make of it, because five people are talking at the same time. Why did they do it like this? Like, it's just baffling. I need to clarify more. Just how fucked up the audio in the stream is. Okay. So what you have is a setup where you have two groups of players. You have 
Ludwig, Cheese, and Liam, or it's it's two groups with two speedrunners and one noob, right? So Ludwig, Cheese, and Liam. If you don't know about Mario 64 speedrunning, Cheese and Liam are both very high level, have held the world record at, more, at some point, Mario 64 speedrunners, and Ludwig is Ludwig. And on the other team, on a different monitor, you have Simple Flips, Simply, Simple Flips, not a high level speed runner in any particular category but a very experienced more 64 player etc right um and simply who used to have the 120 star world record and is still like top 10 maybe he's even top five by now i don't know and then this guy called coney who i've never heard of before and seems really annoying is their noob and they're racing they're doing a 70 uh, a 120 star race uh right where well, it's a relay so each star they pass the controller to the next person so they are separated from each other like you can see from the cameras that they have that they're on like opposite sides of the set and they're also all mic'd up plus you have a commentary desk and you can just hear just everyone's mic is live all the time so you have a commentary desk talking over two groups of three people who are also trying to talk and have communications about the game and who can't individ none of them can hear each other, but I think both of them can hear the commentary desk, but they can't hear each other. It just makes no fucking sense. It's the it's a it's like three conversations happening at the same time. Why would why would they do it like this? So the the Counter Strike community is also getting mad because they are just like the TF two community being completely ignored by Valve as cheaters ruin their games. Yeah. Um, I'm recording a segment right now. Oh. I'm not talking directly to you, Dold Smite. Okay. I'm talking to my thousands of internet fans. I see. I'm talking to my thousands and thousands of loving, adoring internet fans. <laughs> yeah, you could just let in. I'm talking to all of the people who... <laughs> I'm talking to the 20 people that will watch... The five hours into this podcast okay back to the podcast so um fuck i lost my train of thought god damn it there's something right i remember so the thing is about counter-strike which is it's crazy to me i mean i i i i keep bringing this up because i it's just like unbelievable that like if you don't play counter-strike if you never played csgo they used to have these things called operations which like events that the game would run where you'd get a bunch of new maps, you'd get a bunch of new skins, and oftentimes you would get these like co-op missions where you would load up with a friend and fight against bots, which were really fun on like custom designed maps with like missions and it was a pretty cool thing to do. They had like Easter eggs on them and all of the operations with the Everyone loved these operations, right? Um, and there would be, like, some new maps that would be temporary. So they would, you know, you'd get a bunch of new wingman maps and a bunch of new competitive maps, and then they'd, they'd rotate out for the next operation, right? Which I think is a much better way of doing it than the way TF2 does it, where every map that's ever been made for the game is just perma in the game, or it's, like, Halloween exclusive. That's stupid. But anyway, so aside from the cheating problem... Uh, Counter-Strike 2, hilariously, CSGO didn't have an operation for ages. It had, it had no operations. It, it, it had just cases, skins, like, and a few maps from time to time, but no, like, real operation for, for quite a while. And then Counter-Strike 2 came out, and so the community was like, oh, Valve wasn't working on a new operation for CSGO because they were making CS2. That makes sense. But what is completely baffling to me is that CS2 launched without an operation and missing half the content from CSGO. This is just insane. It's bad shit insane to me. Like, why would you launch CS2 without, like, a cool co-op mission at least? Or I don't know, it doesn't make any sense. But, you know, hey, the game just came out. It was They were fixing bugs. It's whatever. Like, there's still not been anything. That's what's insane. There's just been no new content. All the fans are begging for new maps. And once again, I just have to come back to my whole spiel. It's because they only care about official servers. Like, if 
You know how this used to work back in the day? Before live service garbage? Before live service garbage, you know, there were maps, there were official maps, there were maps that were unofficial maps. You go back to the older Counter-Strike games, right? You go back to, to, to Counter-Strike 1.6. What are some of the most popular maps in 1.6? There are some that were official, like Dust2, uh, like Assault, like Office. These were official maps. But there were also a whole bunch of really popular maps that everyone who's ever played um, Counter-Strike knows about. That, that like, Orb India or... Um, you know, all of the FY maps, FY Pool Day, FY Ice World, super popular. Um, you know, there were others. There are many other. The CS Crack House, one of my personal favorites. Um, and these are just very popular maps, very common to find when you're playing 1.6, that pretty much everyone who plays 1.6 knows about. And they were popular because they were popular. Like, that's all it was. They didn't have to wait for some developer to add something. If you ran a server, you would see, oh, this map is popular and good. I like this map. I'm going to put it on my server. Like, that's just how it works. And then the the it sort of uh, snowballs where the more popular the map is, the more other servers see it and decide to, to, to put them in their rotation. Like, it's just a good way to do it. You you get... It's, of course... Is it... Is, how, how... Let's... Hold on. Hold on a second. Because there is a downside to this. Like, I don't want to just act like... The world is just sunshine and rainbows. Because, like, Counter-Strike 2, making a map for Counter-Strike 2 is a completely different ballgame from making a, a CS 1.6 map, right? Like, the amount of fidelity that is the minimum expected quality for a Counter-Strike 2 map is just, you know, orders of magnitude higher than it would be for a 1.6 map. Like, you could bang out a 1.6 map in an afternoon. You, you know, making a fully up to standard Counter-Strike 2 map is going to take like months of, of work. Modeling, detailing, texturing, designing, playtesting, you know, the standards have, have gone up a lot. And one of the things that's good about Valve including official maps uh, or including community maps in the game officially is that they pay they pay creators. Like they they used to pay the mapper I don't know exactly how it worked, but they used to pay the mapper something, and then they got mad about it for some reason. They had, I I believe, they had some sort of bad experience where there was some map with some problem or something, and they wanted to change it, but they couldn't because the original map designer didn't want to, or something like that, or maybe they weren't they couldn't contact them. Like, something weird happened like that, right? Which scared Valve off of including community maps. So they went to try and design their own maps again, which everyone hated, and I still hate those new maps, which aren't really new anymore, but Vertigo and Ancient fucking suck, and I will never play them. Vertigo is less bad than Ancient. Ancient is a garbage map. I don't know how anyone considers this to be, like, an acceptable level of quality to be in the game. Ancient is, it looks pretty, but it plays like shit. It's such a badly designed map. I, I fucking hate it. It's so boring. It's like, the, it's so impossibly boring. I don't understand. Anyway, sorry. Um, now they just buy the full rights. Like it used to be they'd sort of, they'd sort of rent the map from, they'd, I don't know how it works, but now I know that they didn't used to do this, but now they will fully purchase the rights and the map from whoever made it. And so that they have total control. That's how they do it now. But it doesn't matter because they don't do it at all. Um, but the point is, if you're going to be working very hard to make a modern, high-quality Counter-Strike 2 map, it's probably a good thing that you can get paid for your work. You know, I, 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 I support that, and I, I, yeah, like, there are people who, whose job is Counter-Strike mapper. Like, that's, that's very nice, you know, that's a, that's a cool thing. Um, does that make you effectively a contractor for Valve with, with weird gig economy stuff? I don't know. Is that kind of weird gig economy stuff? I don't know. Is it all up to Valve? To, like, yeah, it has problems. I don't know. I, I can't be mad that people are getting paid for their work when they're working incredibly hard to make the maps, which is a very difficult thing to do, you know. But at the same time, I can't help but think back to how much better the world was when not everything was com a commercial product. When people just did, you know, there was no expectation of getting paid for making a YouTube video. There was no expectation of getting paid for making a Counter-Strike map. It just was, you just made it because you wanted to make it and you wanted to see it. 
But, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of split on that. Tell me your opinions in the comments. Either way, I think for non-mappers, the old system could be said to be better in some ways, in the sense that if there were new maps on the forums that, that seemed cool, it was up to, you know, you could just play them. You didn't, There was no expectation that you'd have to pray and hope that some opa famously opaque mystery box of a company will include it in a game, you know? However, yeah, there's also a bad side to this, which is firstly, people, mappers aren't getting paid. And secondly, um, people don't tend to play the unpopular maps, right? It's the same in Counter-Strike right now. Like, people don't boot up unpopular maps. But, like, if you go to one of the older Counter-Strike games and you ignore the, like, weird game modes and just focus on the, the like, either deathmatch or regular defusal or hostage rescue game modes in the server browser, you're gonna find, like, 90% of the servers for this game run Dust 2 24-7. Uh, you know, like, it's it's kind of a fucked up situation where... The, the although it, in theory you know it's better because you don't have to wait for some company to include a map that may or may not happen and whatever in practice there is a downside where it can be pretty hard to find servers running some of the more obscure maps if you might want to play a, a weird map you know especially these days like no one is fucking running I'm sure people are still mapping for 1.6. Like, it's probably a niche hobby, but I'm sure people are still doing it. But I highly doubt you can find, like, populated servers running modern 1.6 maps. You know what I'm saying? Or modern CS source maps, for that matter. Uh, because I'm pretty sure... About, well, 1.6 was before the Steam Workshop, so... The Steam Workshop is good because it centralizes... I know I'm normally like, oh, my decentralization... But this is a case where centralization is really good, right? Because the Steam Workshop, even if it doesn't mean that Valve is going to add something or whatever, it means that you can always, like, if you're like, hmm, I want to find a new map for this game, you know exactly where to go. Everyone's posting it in the same place, and it, it's very easy to find what you're looking for. Um, and you can see other people's opinions on it. You can see how popular it is. You can very easily give it a try yourself with, like, one button click. It's, it's a really good system. Uh, I don't know where I was going with this. I just hate live service games. That's what I'm noticing. Is that, like, at, at first, this was all, like, um, hmm, Valve has some problems as a company. And as, as time has gone on, I've realized that the truth is, it's the live service game model that has done this to all of us. And we must kill it. Whenever I hear Americans talk about fast food, I feel like I'm going insane. They'll say some shit like, oh, you know, the, this, this, the Wendy's chicken sandwich is, is trash. Oh, Chick-fil-A chicken sandwich, you get a gob. Like, bro, it's fried chicken. You can't, it can't be bad. <laughs> it's impossible. Like, I've never in my life had fried chicken that was bad. I've had fried chicken that was better. And some other fried chicken that was less good than the peak of fried chicken. But I've never had fried chicken that I regretted eating in terms of taste. Sometimes I've regretted eating it in terms of, of, of price to portion ratio. Okay, I can name a couple times that I've regretted eating fried chicken because I've paid too much for not enough chicken. But I've never regretted it. I've never been eating fried chicken and thought, this tastes really bad. <laughs> I've never, it just, you can't fuck it up. You can't make fried chicken taste bad. It's just, like, automatically good. How in the world are you ranking one chicken sandwich as garbage? It's not possible. Like, am I crazy? Do Americans just have some, like, secret underworld of fried food that is so good that it, like, makes all other fried chicken taste, like, terrible? And if so, like, where is it? Because it's none of the popular fast food chains... Are there, like, gourmet... Are there secretly gourmet fried chicken places that I don't know about? Or are they, like, comparing it to Korean fried chicken and, and like, karaage? Because, look, I've had plenty of... I haven't... I've only had Korean fried chicken once, and it was pretty good. Um, I've had karaage a few times when I was in Japan, and that was some of the best fried chicken I've ever had. But 
like none of those experiences have devalued regular ass cheap fried chicken in the form of a chicken sandwich or as we call it in the UK a chicken burger I've heard Americans get mad about this Americans are very passionate about burgers they're like no a burger is only a burger if it's beef in a patty ground beef in a patty a chicken burger is called a chicken sandwich okay that's how it works in American English yes it's almost like we speak different dialects of English <laughs> <laughs> the word burger in American English only we're not using it wrong it's just two different dialects in American English the word burger refers exclusively to a, a beef patty in British English the word burger refers to any anything with the burger form it can be chicken it can be veggie it can be it could be fish you know whatever um, so get it get over yourself Americans that's just how that's just how dialects work. They mean different things in different countries. Same word means a different thing. Okay, um, and then the strange thing is, people will have conversations about fried food burgers, like beef burger, as if any of them are good. Or sorry, what I what I mean by that is like, as if, okay, it, I I kind of misspoke there. What I meant to say is there are two tiers of burger. There is McDonald's and Burger King, which are both like you eat the burger, it tastes like cardboard. Like I know that's a that's a turn of phrase that's used very often, but in this sense I mean it, you know, almost literally. It really tastes like nothing, and uh, at least in the case of McDonald's, every time I eat a McDonald's burger, I I like feel really bad afterwards like something about mcdonald's burgers just does not agree with my stomach i don't know what it is it just always makes me feel terrible it's fine with like any of the other mcdonald's products normally my go-to mcdonald's is a fillet of fish and a mcchicken and slash or depending on how you know what i'm saying only mcdonald's products i care about mcchicken fillet of fish fries and chicken nuggies does anyone really dislike this is what i'm saying what do you mean I don't understand. I don't know. But anyway, like, so that's garbage. And then the Burger King one doesn't do the same poison damage thing to me, but it obviously tastes really bad. And at least at McDonald's, they have good fries. Burger King has terrible chips. Um, and then there's at all of the other fast food places, which all taste good. Like, what are you talking about? I've heard people say, oh, Five Guys burgers, they're not even good. Okay, what's a good burger to you then? Because if, like, like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, Five Guys tastes good. Wendy's tastes good. Shake Shack tastes good. I mean, unless there's some crazy difference. Like, all of the fast food chains besides Burger King and McDonald's. And especially McDonald's. And even in that case, like, at Burger King, it's only the beef burgers that taste bad. Like, I've had a... What do they call it? The Royale or something in Burger King? Royale with cheese? That's not what I'm thinking of. Maybe it is what I'm thinking of. I've had their chicken burger before, and it was fine. Like, it was, it was, yeah, it was a good chicken burger. It tasted very similar to a McChicken. And I've had a McChicken multiple times, and it's, it's good. Like, it's not amazing. I wouldn't go to McDonald's, you know, if there's other things available. But it's fine. But all the other fast food places that cost, like, a tiny bit more, they're, they're all good. <laughs> like, they're all, I've never had... Like, are you telling me... The Americans go to Five Guys, eat the burger, and then they're like, that was fucking gross. Or they're like, eh, you know, that was, like, do they just eat burgers a lot? Do they eat a lot of fuck? Is this like a, like, I've never heard an American authentically praise fast food. It's always couched in some, like, eh, it's mid, you know, it's pretty good. Yeah, right, but, like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, it's good. It's all good. Like, even the bad like, other than the, the terrible McDonald's cheeseburger or whatever, all of the, like, slightly more upscale... Do you know what I'm... Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Like, what's going on with Americans? Like, they'll literally say insane shit about about fast food places as if there's, like... Like, it's all, oh, it's all bad. But then they eat there all the time. Like, that's what's confusing to me. Like, for me, I almost... I, like, try, at least, <laughs> to order fast food, like, maybe once a month, maximum. I've currently not eaten any fast food um, in, in quite a while. I generally try and order fast food like about once a month. And so when I get fast food, burger or, or tacos or whatever, um, 
it's like a special experience to me and it's it's good it, like do you know what I, like am i going crazy like the food is what do you expect like it's it's a it's a i think they are i don't understand do they see fast like like what are they comparing it to or are they just saying like the categories of food burger and fries and chicken wings and chicken sandwiches and uh you know it's all just trash because they never seem to like any of it even though they eat way more of it than than i do i don't understand i it's just hearing americans talk about fast food is very strange that's all i have to say it's just very it's just very confusing they seem to have they seem to live on some alien planet where everything like they seem to class everything in the mcdonald's range you know when it's really not <laughs> like it's they there's there's McDonald's and Burger King and there's everything else like they're just not even really the same class the same category of thing in my mind you know i'm kind of glad i'm not glad i've just reached the stage of acceptance when it comes to like ai ai generative ai images and video cuz right now there's a lot of like video ai stuff going around and it's still in the stage where it's like pretty unrealistic and funny but it's very close to being to the point where we'll just never like it will just be the like we'll just never know what's real ever again right and i started to think about this as being a positive as like maybe we can just all live in dreams like like maybe dream logic can just take over the world and this will be somehow this will be this will be liberating does this make sense am i going insane like maybe when all images are mediated by generative ai which already kind of is 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 dreamlike has dreamlike qualities you know like it has it runs on dream logic like when you watch some of these videos that are clearly like where weird like impossible stuff is happening but it still somehow looks real i don't you, you know what i'm talking about the ai look where it's like impossible but it also looks real in in like in terms of the lighting i it, like do you, do you know what i mean you probably know what i mean um like that's how dreams that's how dreams look as well and i kind of i kind of want the whole world to just be become a dream yeah then we'll all live in dreams and i i can't think of anything more freeing than that i'm watching um <clears throat> aaron signal's newest video showdown is back system shock 2 leads children of doom 1999 which is part of his series children of doom where he is going through the entire history of first person shooters year by year chronologically um which is a great series but frankly i'm disappointed i'm disappointed in his coverage of quake 3 and unreal tournament he clearly doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about <laughs> like he kind of vaguely gets it but he's more i can tell like i don't know how i can tell but i can tell that he is basing his commentary based on like what other people have said rather than his personal experience like when he says stuff like it's a it's a twitchy high impact multi like he's never played the game i i he's i'm pretty sure he just played the game against bots for this video like this guy has never watched competitive or high level quake 3 this guy has never played uh like arena shooters for you know quake quake likes quake shooters for for a long period of time or unreal for enough time to really understand the mechanics and i can tell because anyone who had done that would have been way more specific about what he, what they said does this make sense like not none, none of what he says is wrong it's just all vague in a way that makes me feel like he's never really put time into the game enough time to like really know what he's talking about and and give good commentary and critique like he never mentions the the central core mechanic of like quake and arena shooters which is like rooting right and rooting between like the the armor pickups and the the quad damage and and health pickups and whatever like he he just doesn't mention that because he doesn't know that's a thing because you would have to play the game for some time to understand that that's how you play the game um and i that just got me thinking about how like 
gamer is kind of a stupid category and game reviewer in such a broad sense is 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 a bit silly and and it also it just kind of also made me think about chefs like i don't trust people like like gordon ramsay for numerous reasons but for one reason being that there's no way you're good at all food there's no like i'm sure gordon ramsay is good at like classical french cuisine which just because i have to mention this every time i bring this up is actually not classical it was just invented at some point like fairly recently uh, but anyway like there's and there's a famous clip of gordon ramsay like f- fucking up a pad thai in front of a thai chef and the thai chef is like that's not pad thai what was what did what are you doing right like you can't be a chef and be an expert in every single form of cuisine around the world it's just impossible it's just not it's just not possible you know like you have to specialize there's there's nothing wrong with specializing that's not a failure that is that, that is a good thing you should specialize like imagine if you went to a restaurant and it was like oh what kind of restaurant is it oh it's just a food restaurant they do all kinds of food they do you can get a curry you know you can get a a, a ramen you can get a hamburger you can and they're all kind of shit because you have to specialize whereas you look at like really good restaurants the like uh obviously i've never been there but this guy george motz the burger scholar opened up a burger place in new york called hamburger america and they just serve two hamburgers like that's the menu two hamburgers and they have like a few sandwiches and f- and i think they do fries as well and you know that these like this guy has fucking studied all of the hamburgers in america more than any other human being in history has probably cooked and eaten more hamburgers than anyone else in history and he's narrowed it down to be like nope i'm going to make two hamburgers i'm going to make normal hamburger and i'm going to make oklahoma fried onion burger and that's what you get and you just know for a fact that those are going to be the like they're going to be perfect you know what i mean it's like the whole uh, i don't fear the man who has practiced 1000 kicks once but i fear the man who practiced one kick a thousand times that mean like there's no shame in just accepting that you have limited expertise on a subject <clears throat> like i just want Aaron signal to be like look i never got that into arena fps's so you know something like he could just say that but he doesn't he doesn't say that he he seems to think that like i mean sure this video series is mostly uh I don't know, single player FPSs, but then it's not because he also is like this, that whole video is mostly about an immersive sim, which is not the same genre as like Doom and Quake and, and, and Half-Life. Uh, anyway, the point being, I just find that annoying. I don't think you should, I don't, I don't think you get to, to be like, yeah, here's a, a comprehensive video about every single first person shooter that's come out ever. And then it, uh, you know, it kind of makes me think about there's this there's there's like a tweet there's a tweet about Elon Musk where where this guy's like first he was talking about about making making websites and I didn't know anything about making but then he was talking about making rockets and I didn't know anything about making rockets and he was talking about making cars I don't know anything about making cars but then he started talking about programming I know about programming and he's definitely stupid in programming so that makes me think he was stupid in everything right like there's a tweet that's something along those lines you could call this girl man amnesia uh or like some some from something similar to that well it's like okay well now that i've seen that your commentary on quake 3 and unreal tournament is vague to the point of uselessness like your base he's, he's almost exactly just repeating word for word the 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 most basic descriptions of those games and then saying at the end it's a classic for a reason like what reason <laughs> you, you didn't tell me the reason you, you told me nothing about the reason you you said they made some changes from base quake and quake 2 with terms of the weapon balance to make it more optimized for a, for a multiplayer experience but you didn't tell me anything about that multiplayer experience how it actually feels to play quake 3 i'm singling out quake here because quake is i'm just more familiar with it right like i've played a bit of unreal tournament also quake is just a better game sorry unreal tournament heads but quake 3 is better than unreal tournament 1 or unreal tournament 99 i suppose 
uh, I'm sorry. It looks better. It plays better. It's just better. <clears throat> the Unreal Tournament has a better sound design in every aspect. Unreal Tournament has has better sound. It has it has the announcer, which is which is based. It has it has better music. The Quake, anyway, whatever. I've played more Quake likes than I have Quake Three itself or Quake at all. I mean, I've played Quake One, the single player game, which is a great fucking game, obviously. Uh, but I've never played Quake Two and I've never played Quake Three, but I have played like a lot of games that were inspired by Quake Three, uh, very heavily. Like a lot of other arena FPS games, right? Warfork, TF2, m- maybe. <laughs> you know, very obviously inspired. It's it, a Quake mod, uh, uh, Rats Instagive, stuff like that. Like, I can tell he doesn't know what he's talking about. He doesn't mention like, hey, the rocket launcher, the real gun, and the lightning gun. You know. Basically, what I'm saying is. You can't get the. You can't start talking about the game design of Quake Three when you haven't even. You clearly don't know what you're talking about, Aaron Signal. You're clearly, like, you're not wrong. You didn't lie. You didn't make anything up. You didn't say anything incorrect. You were just vague to the point of uselessness. You were just. You just gave the exact same points that any. Like, if you had never played an arena shooter and you saw footage of Quake Three, you would say the same things as Aaron Signal said. You would say. It's a fast-paced, twitchy arena shooter with, uh, you know, lots of, uh, yeah, it's, you die quick, you kill quick, not even true, has a fairly high time to kill compared to, like, I don't know, Counter-Strike or, or a lot of other FPS games, so he's wrong about that, actually, but, uh, you know, it is, it, you would basically be like, yeah, it's really fast-paced and there's a wide variety of weapons, and those weapons are situational, which is all he said about the actual gameplay of Quake 3. I just don't think that that is an acceptable level of detail. I don't see, or I don't, I don't see why he thinks that that's an acceptable level of detail, given the fact that he went into so much detail about. He goes into so much detail about other games, like Quake versus Unreal Tournament, as he says in the video, was like the biggest thing that happened in in the shooting game in nineteen ninety nine. Like, you you know what I mean? Quake three wasn't some. Like, he describes it as, as Edge doing a victory lap. Like, hey, it doesn't really do anything to further, like, the design of id software games. It doesn't seem to, to really t- to further the, id's mission anyway. So it's either them doing a victory lap or them not knowing what to do next. It's like, brother, you don't... You clearly haven't understood how perfectly designed Quake is. <laughs> like, you, you, this is not, like, some tiny little it, it this is not like hey yeah we basically tweaked a couple things about about uh, quake 2 and made it multiplayer only like this that's not what quake 3 is quake 3 is like we have used all of our design expertise to like very carefully craft a masterful multiplayer experience uh to the point where this will like influence all of the rest of gaming massively much more than system shock 2 did might it might I add, like every other video game since Quake Three has been influenced by Quake Three, as far as I know. Uh, I don't know. I just I just think you gotta you should you, he it, I would be completely fine with this whole segment if he had just said, look, there's no full lobbies in the fucking original Quake multiplayer. Like I can't find anyone to play with. I wasn't around playing this in the 90s at a high level, or even at a, um, I didn't put much time into it. I played against bots to, to get a feel for it for this video, but I'm no expert. Like, why didn't he just say something like that? If he just said that, it would have been fine. And, yeah, this this is why I'm just breaking down the category of gamer, in my mind, is just kind of insane. Because, what do you mean you're a gamer, you know? Like, I have put 2,000 hours into Team Fortress 2, and I feel like I'm barely scratching the surface of understanding that game's mechanics. I have put 3,000 hours into Counter-Strike Global Offensive, and I felt like, even through the entire time that CSGO existed, there was a pro scene, right? And most of the, like, people just don't really appreciate the amount of depth in multiplayer online shooters, right? Like, you have to understand, when CSGO first came out, and there was a pro, like, the competitive scene for CSGO, these were all players who had previously been pros in 
the older Counter-Strike games. So they were all very experienced Counter-Strike players. And yet, like, who had probably played the games, the earlier games, for thousands of hours. And yet you compare, like, pro-level gameplay from the first major to the last major in CSGO. And it's, like, it looks so amateurish. They're, they're, like, they don't know what the fuck they're doing. You can find this video, which is called, like, The History of Banana Control. Which is just analyzing the strategies that teams used on one particular area of one particular map throughout the history of Counter-Strike, right? And you can just, I mean, I highly recommend watching that video. It's a great video. And you can see just how, like, how much depth there is to this game. And then the game switched over to CS2. And I feel like we didn't even, there wasn't even enough time to actually uncover the depths of Counter-Strike in that time of CSGO. Like, CS2 is a, is, it might be a very similar game, but it is a different game. And TF2 is the same way. Like, there was... People still are doing stuff that's never been done before in TF2. And that game is, like, 17 years old, you know? You can put thousands and thousands of hours into the game and still making new discoveries about, about maps and about, about weapons and, and about movement and, you know... The same is true in in Quake and Quake Likes and Unreal Tournament. There's always more depth you can squeeze out of it. It's not like a single player game. It's a it's a different experience. And so, you know, coming into it, like, well, yeah, I'm a gamer. I've played through a lot of single player video games that, that are a lot like Quake. You know, surely that. Do you know what I mean? Am I making sense here? Like, you just can't approach it in the same way. It's just a different thing. It's just a it's just a different kind of thing, and I'm saying this as I said as someone who hasn't really played like any Quake Three at all. I haven't played Quake Three, and as someone who, to be honest, is really fucking bad <laughs> at arena shooters. Like I suck at Warfork, I suck at Unreal Tournament, I suck at Rats Instagib. Um, you know I'm I I I'm I'm not good at these games. Uh, but I have played them for just about long enough to understand, and I've also, I, I'm just interested in them. I, I've watched YouTube videos about them, I, and, and whatever. Look, listen, do you understand what I'm trying to say? Like, I wouldn't feel confident making a video about, about that. That's what I'm trying to say. I wouldn't have the hubes. I wouldn't have the hubes to be like, ah, yes, I am in a position to, to make an authoritative take on this video game. But for some reason, Evan Signal thinks he is, and I don't think he, I don't think he is, and I think he should have made that more clear, because most people don't care about arena FPSs, you know, so they're just gonna, you know, not even they're not even gonna think about it. They're just gonna be like, oh, I guess it's just some sort of primitive, fast-paced, twitchy FPS game that's a classic for a reason. Like, what's the reason? <laughs> so I made this silly video called uh, "We Will All Live in Dreams." Which is just about some vibes I've been getting recently, okay? It's very clearly about some vibes I've been getting recently. And I get this comment from this guy, fucking N9over. You can, fl um, I'm gonna read this in this fucking, <laughs> um, you can flank your emotions and personal experiences, but the thing in itself or reality. Cool video either way though, lots of interesting ideas. Okay, first of all, thing in its... Uh, okay, I'm not gonna get into that, but... You fucking idiot, that's the point of the video, you absolute troglodyte. Holy fuck. Oh my... How can you miss the point this hard? I don't understand. That's the fucking point of the video. That's the point of the video. I can't say it any more clearly. That is the fucking point of the video. I have this thing. Um, so, I made a video... Um on my TF2 channel, Fish TF2. Uh, I pronounce it Fish. Some people pronounce it Fishy, which is funny to me. But anyway, I like, I like, I don't mind how, how you choose to pronounce it in your head. Fish, Fish, Fishy, however you want. Um, but uh, so I, I made this video about, um, right, okay, I initially made this video that was sort of like, hey, let's like talk about how nice community servers are in online video games. Is that relevant to Team Fortress 2? And then I made a follow-up video where I 
accidentally made the thumbnail way too good uh, and sort of kept talking about the pros and cons of community servers, building off of what I had said in the initial video. So anyway, that follow-up video just randomly, for no, well, it's not for no reason, it was, I guess, a clever way to make a video. It was a very well-timed video with a good thumbnail and title, but I, I went way too hard on this because that video is now sitting at four, 44,000 views. 44,000 views, which is more views than anything I've ever made. I e even saw it get, like I've seen this video get brought up in TF2 communities that I'm a part of by people who don't know it's me anyway. Uh, <clears throat> this is a fucking problem. The reason is that that video, just like all the other Fish TF2 videos, and no, this doesn't count as a TF2 segment. We're not doing TF2 segments anymore. This is a video, this is still about me. This is about me, okay? This is, this is, this is still my narcissistic ramblings, not my autistic ramblings, okay? Uh, so, because that video did so fucking well, I just have a feeling, like, I, I have this intuitive feeling that I need to somehow outdo it and make the next video really good. But there's a couple of problems with that. First of all, I have some ideas for videos that, that I could make that would be scripted and edited and so on. Um, they would be big projects. They would, they, would, they would be big projects that would take weeks to make. Um, particularly just with gathering footage of like specific things happening in a real game of TF2 like you just have to kind of try it over it's kind of boring so I kind of don't want to do that but then a bigger deal than that is it's Dode Smite's computer is not as powerful as my desktop and so it doesn't really like OBS recording TF2 at the same time, it lags uh, pretty hard even on, I'm, I'm play, I play, t like, it's insane how poorly optimized TF2 is for a game from 2007, like, you would imagine it would run well on modern hardware, like, this should be more than enough, like, this computer is not bad, like, there, there's this, there's no reason, there's no reasonable way that Dolcemite's PC shouldn't be able to handle running TF2 at fucking 4K ultra settings while recording if the game wasn't just like terribly poorly optimized. But anyway, <clears throat> because of that, that, that just makes it harder, right? That makes it harder because I can't like record gameplay very easily. Add on to that the fact that Dotsmite's PC is at like 97% full, so I can't just record long stretches of gameplay. There isn't enough space on the PC. Uh, there isn't enough uh, enough space to just just press record and go play a game, so I would have to use the replay buffer feature on OBS. But the replay buffer feature is even more; it's very heavy on, I believe, the CPU. I don't know, but yeah, it's just not usable on this computer. Uh, so it's basically impossible for me to make videos like that uh, right now in this situation, or it would be extremely painful. It would be extremely painful for you. Um, <laughs> So, anyway, this idea of I have to outdo myself is kind of fucking me up, because I really don't, um, I don't know, and I'm also, it's just got me fucked up, because I even, I even have a video recorded that I could post to Fish TF2, like, I have this video, yeah, I mean, it's, it's recorded, it's, it's, it needs a little bit of editing, but it's basically done, that I could just upload right now. But I haven't, because I'm like, well, it's not a very good video. It's like, oh, it's very low effort, you know? Just like the other Fish TF2 videos have been. It's it's very low effort. <clears throat> so, I don't know. I'm just kind of lost with what to do with Fish right now. That's, that's, the, that's the thing I'm complaining about. I'm, I've, got, I've got these Fish, and I don't know what to do with them. What's this meme that, that like children learn things easier and when you're an adult it's hard to learn things? This has got to be bullshit, right? I remember being a child and trying to learn like a song on guitar. If it fucking like I was I remember learning Ode to Joy on the guitar. I was going to I was going to play it at a school 
like like talent show at the end of the year. I was going to play Ode to Joy on guitar. And uh, it took me all summer to learn, like, it wasn't even the whole fucking thing. It was just like like a chunk of it. How was I so bad? <laughs> and this wasn't like, oh, I just started learning guitar. This was like five years after I'd started learning guitar. Like now I could learn Ode to Joy in a day easily. And it's not just because I'm better at the instrument. It's just, I don't know, I, I feel like I retain information better. Like I have better strategies for retaining information. Another example is I had Japanese lessons as a kid. I have learned more from like not even trying to learn Japanese and just watching anime than I did in my jet. Like, like I don't fucking remember half of anything. I don't remember half is an overstatement. I don't remember anything I learned in my Japanese lessons from when I was a kid. And I did that for three years. Sure, it was only an hour a week, which is you're never going to learn a language that way. But still, like, I, I, I really feel like I, the, I, this meme that you learn things better when you're a kid is just insane. And lots of people, like lang- language people, have, have pointed this out, right? That, like, this idea that children are good at learning languages is, is, is not true. Like, it takes, if, if, when you're a, a baby, you literally have the best possible environment to learn a language, like, it, you could not be in a more optimal environment to learn a language, right? You have constant, comprehensible native input, and everyone is constantly trying to help you, and it takes you years and years and years to even say a fucking sentence, right? It takes, like, one year. It ta- from when you're born? Yeah. Like you're, 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 you're saying sentences? Like, you're in the hub, you're, you're saying I, sentences. I don't, I don't know how long it takes to, yeah. to learn language, but... Anyway, also like if you're a kid, you can just like watch TV and not understand any of it and just be chewing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but if you're a guy, if you're yeah. a, a real person, you yeah. can also just do that. Yeah, but you won't be entertained doing it the same way you would if you were a child. No, because you can be doing more. You can be watching anime yeah. with Japanese subtitles and mining Anki kanji at the same time. Yeah, but what I'm saying is like if you're like six years old. <laughs> You can watch Dragon Ball Z without your native language subtitles and just be like, yo, that guy is yellow. <laughs> and that's enough to entertain you, so you like, pick it up, you know. Yeah, but I just feel like a, a person, if you were yeah. a, a human being, not a baby, yeah. and you were in an environment like a baby was in... You, you just can't, like, zero time learn languages as an adult. But as a child, you can just, like, completely passively do it. By just watching the cool yellow guy on the television. Yeah, but that's the thing. As you, as a child, you can only passively do anything. Yeah, that's like true. just being an adult, or or even just like not a baby. Yeah. Just gives you the ability to use reason. Yeah. And learn things better. <laughs> like I could, I could, I started learning Tokipona yesterday. I could probably construct a a, a Tokipona sentence. Maybe mm-hmm. I don't know. Let me see. Nope. Um. No, what I'm saying is like, I learned English by just watching a lot of Dragon Ball. I couldn't learn Japanese by doing the same thing, you know, because I'm like too fucking over it. I actually have to like try. When you started speaking English, were you like, Kakarat, what does the Scalder say about his power yeah. level? Yeah. <laughs> You're like, uh, you know the, the, the invented hypothetical meme character that the internet made up of Japanese guy who learned English by watching Spongebob? Yeah. You're like that, but real. Except it was all Japanese anyways, translated to English. Yeah. Yeah. It's all dubbed Naruto and Dragon Ball and Pokemon. That's how I learned English. It worked. It worked. You speak English now. I speak English now. That's pretty good. Yeah. I don't speak shit. Yeah. I'm monolingual. Fucking lame. You speak like a bit of like five languages though. That's not real. Like it's not real. Th- knowing some random French and Spanish <laughs> words does not In mean... Japanese. I, yeah, but I can I just and know. Estonian. I, I know like three words yeah, in Estonian. Yeah, you just know random words in a bunch of Yeah, words. that's not meaningful. Yeah, but it's cool. I'm, one of the mnemonics that I'm using for Togi yeah. Kona, for black, the word is um, Pimeya, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and the way I'm remembering it is uh, Pim, which <laughs> is for the viewers at home, milk in Estonian. I always remember that word. Because I have to buy milk at the store. But also because when I heard it for the first time, I was like, that's a way better word for milk than milk. Every time I look at milk, I just say peem in my head. Because for some reason, I'm, I look at it, I'm like, yeah, that's peem. 
Do you know what I mean? Like sometimes a word just fits fits what it is really well. For me, peem is like the perfect word for that shit. I'm, yeah, that shit is fucking peem, you know? I'm, I, I don't know why, but I, it, it just, I really like the word peem. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know. So yeah, I remember, I remember black peemaya is, is like, milk is, is white, but it, it ain't, it ain't ya. It ain't, it ain't your peem. It's black, it's the different one. <laughs> it's the opposite, in fact. Yeah. Anyway, children are fucking stupid. Premise number one. All plants require nitrogen to live and grow. Premise number two. The air is 78% nitrogen. However, no plants can directly take the nitrogen out of the air. Instead, they need it to be fixed in the soil. There are some plants, like legumes, and one very specific um, strain of maize from Oaxaca, and no one else, who have formed symbiotic relationships with bacteria that can fix nitrogen in the soil, that the plant can then take up. But there are no plants that can just directly take nitrogen out of the air, even though most of the air is nitrogen and they all need nitrogen. Anyway, I consider this pr proof as good as any that you're going to get that God doesn't exist. Because it's just a stupid design system. It's so stupid. No, no, no one would design it that way on purpose. It's just so stupid. You know when you see those uh, videos of like phone companies and they have these like durability labs? But they have these really expensive machines and they do like drop tests and water tests and stuff. You know what that is? That's the planned obsolescence lab. That's where they fine tune it. So it's like, how do we make this break exactly when we want it to break and no earlier and no later, right? Because if your phone broke instantly when you bought it, that would be too bad for the customer, right? It would be too noticeable. People would, would stop buying the phones. So they've dialed in, like, a drop from this height shouldn't break the phone, but a drop from this height should definitely break the phone every single time. Like, I guarantee you, when they're doing these tests, they have a, a fucking quota that they have to meet, where they have to be, they, it, like, it has to break when it drops from this height onto this surface. It has to break when it gets hit with this volume of water, you know? I guarantee Apple and whatever are doing shit like that. They're doing it in secret. They'll never admit to it, obviously, because uh, the EU would be like on their asses about it. Uh, and maybe even the FTC these days. Uh, but I get that's that's why if you're ever curious about what, hey, these companies, they all have these drop test machines that they spend millions of dollars on and they are always bragging about. But my phone breaks the instant I, dro the instant I drop it from two feet. It's because it's, that's on purpose. That's what the drop test machines are for. The drop test machines are to make sure your phone breaks exactly when they want it to. So you have to buy another goddamn phone. So fuck these people. Fuck these motherfuckers. I'm going to kill them, motherfucker. I'm not going to do that. That was, a, that was just a, a, this a little bit of hyperbole for dramatic effect. I would never commit a crime. Never in my life would I ever commit a crime. I have a strange relationship with anime these days. I'm not sure if I even like anime anymore. I know. It's, cr it's kind of insane thing to think, and I'm kind of scared to admit it myself. But I, I, I barely watch anime these days, and when I do, I almost never find shows that, like, grab me in any particular way. Every time I watch a show, it feels like a bit of a slog. Like, it always, every single anime I've watched recently has felt kind of like a slog. Even shows that I would say were, like, decent to good have felt like a slog. That's not entirely true, because I guess I did rewatch Go No Game No Life not too long ago, and that show was great. I've always, I've loved that show, that's like the longest running love I've ever had for an anime. I watched that show really early on getting into anime, and I still fucking love it to this day. It still holds up in my brain. Uh, but, you know, I tried watching a bunch of other stuff. Maybe I'm just picking bad shows to watch, I don't know. But things, things just aren't grabbing me the same way. 
I don't know. And and then, but the thing is, like, it's just anime. Like, visual novels don't, I mean, sometimes they feel like a slog, but that's because they're, like, 40 hours long, right? Like, the first 10 hours of a visual novel, most of them at least, haven't felt like a slog to me. And it's the same with manga. Like, I've read plenty of manga that I don't feel like it was particularly a slog. Now, yeah, I don't generally sit down and just read a manga for four hours like I would with an anime. I'm normally reading it in short bursts, so it's kind of a different thing. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know what it is. And it, it, it's really weird because being a guy who watches anime has been like a part of my personality for a long time. And so uh, it's it's a little strange you know, being like, this thing that I liked for a long time, it's time for me to admit to myself, they kind of ain't doing it for me anymore. I don't really know why. Like, again, I think I'm just like maybe choosing bad shows to watch. I I don't really know. I'm I'm, I'm just not, like, I'm kind of not that interested in anime anymore. Like, none of, like, every time there's a new season of anime, I see the, the, like, popular shows get talked about, and I'm just, like, eh? You know? Like, none of them... A su- none of them grab me none of them seem interesting to me and then sometimes there are shows that do seem interesting to me and then I just don't watch them for some reason I don't know uh, I, 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 maybe I just need to like force myself to get back into anime maybe I need to like go on a grind or catch up with some, some, some recently airing shows because I also have like this is the thing when it comes to anime is I always have these, these compelling forces or uh, competing forces I mean I have, like, on the one hand, um, I have a huge back... I have, like, a gigantic plan to watch list, which I always ignore, right? (laughs) This is, like, the... I have this plan to watch list that is, like, 300 shows, and I ignore them all. I never... I'm never, like, hmm, time to watch something. Let me go over to Mal, because it's too big. There are simply... Because there's three, like... There's, like, so many shows, like, hundreds of, of anime on my plan to watch, it becomes functionally useless. Like, there's no real reason for me to use it because it's so long that I can't narrow down the list into something I actually want to watch. Um, then I have these competing competing elements. On the one hand, there's stuff that I want to watch because I feel like it's important to me. Like it's it's somehow meaningful culturally, aesthetically. So this would be something like early 2000s harem anime, right? That's a, that's a genre that to me looks really good like aesthetically peak of anime i know it's like nostalgia or whatever whatever i just i just like that aesthetic i like the particular thing i like about it is it i like the shows that came about when the transition to digital coloring was still relatively new and a lot of people were using very bold colors and there was a lot of like weird experimentation in terms of the colors of these shows that i really like um yeah but then i also because this is the thing that's not the real nostalgia the nostalgia shows for me is then i also like anime from like 2013 like 2011 ish to like 2014 15 16 i guess we could call the cutoff ish which is the shows that i that i started watching anime at right because when i started watching anime i think was around 2016 people, the conversation was still around the shows from the past few years as well, right? So, like, my introduction to anime, the sh- like, the era where I, I saw this thing that got me interested enough to engage with it, you know, is shows from that era. The discussion was about shows from that era. Um, yeah. Which, are ki- a lot of them are kind of trash, but they're trash in a different... This was the era of, the, um people complaining about visual novel adaptations, but the visual novel adaptation wasn't, sino- oh, sorry, sorry, light novel adaptation. I misspoke. This was the era of people complaining about light novel adaptations, but this was before light novel adaptation was synonymous with isekai. It's that era of like, um, I know this, I'm going to say that, but then these things, are, there's a lot of like magical high school stuff. I think like one of the emblematic shows of that era might be, uh let me see chivalry of a failed knight for example that's that's a show that's very emblematic of that era Edo manga sensei in my opinion a show that's very er- er- emblematic of that kind of thing i'm talking about um that's the actual nostalgia anime to me that's the stuff that's like this is 
what got me into anime in the first place, even though a lot of it is like relatively not very good. Um, and then you've got like, hey, there's shows that have come out recently, at least in my mind, they're recent. They, they might, I don't know how time works. Time might have passed since then. But the shows that I consider to be like semi currently airing or currently airing. Uh, so I'm thinking like Freyren, for example. Uh, which is like, hey, this is like what the discussion is about right now. You you want to watch it and understand what people are talking about, what people are excited about. So those are the those are the three things. And then th- I haven't even mentioned. You'll notice that at no point did I mention like, oh yeah. And there's also like good shows that I have to watch. Like I could also like those are the most powerful forces. Are these three t- temporal zones? T- I could have just said time periods. I didn't have to. I didn't have to get all fancy with it. These these three time periods um that are all equally pulling at me i have very little interest in in like 90s anime especially like uh, you know early to mid 90s anime i have very little i have almost zero interest in 80s anime um you know and anything before that is i consider just to be a curiosity uh i know it's it's sacrilege but i don't care uh so I'm, I'm probably not going to... Although, then there's the fact that I do still want to get into Gundam at some point. So, like, that that is also a thing, I suppose. I Maybe I'm just watching bad shows. I was watching this show called Sky Girls. Because I have this weird attachment to... Like, to me... I guess that's the weird situation I'm in, right? Is that I have a weird attachment to certain series... Um, which I consider to be emblematic of, of otakudom. Sorry, these are my notifications. Um, and which I have, a, I don't know, I, I have a strong relation to. The big ones to me would be Strike Witches and Nanoha, uh, I guess. These are like the, the obvious examples. Um, now, neither Strike Witches nor Nanoha is like anywhere near, none of them are, none of the, the seasons of those shows are anywhere near my, my top favorite anime of all time. Um, but something about it, there's other shows that are similar. I, it, it's it's something about this like mecha musume genre, like, which I think Nanoha kind of speaks to. Obviously, Strike Witches is, is is big. The one that not doesn't really do anything for me is is Girls and Panzer. That one doesn't really doesn't really do it for me as much. But um, Sky Girls is basically proto Strike Witches. It's by it, it was it was. Created by the same guy who made who went on to make Strike Witches, which was much more popular and successful. Um, but Sky Girls has always been interesting to me, and Sky Girls is a lot more mecha musume. Like Strike Witches, you know, they are they aren't really mechs, right? Like in Sky Girls, there are mechs, uh, but I don't know. It's it's kind of long. It's kind of it's kind of meh so far. I don't know, man. I don't know. It's just weird. It's like I kind of want to watch anime, but then I get like four episodes in, and I'm like, I don't really care about this show anymore. You know, <laughs> like that's just how it goes. Uh, it's just been like that for a long. Like that happened to me so many times that it's just hard for me to keep caring about this 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 medium because it keeps happening. Where I'm like, I get four episodes in, and I'm like, eh, right? And I haven't been super lucky with with um eroge either, right? Like, uh marshmallow all the way home i that had a pretty good good many such cases good common route and then the the heroin routes were were disappointing uh right and then um i tried to read riddle joker again good common route really good common route and the first heroin route pretty good but i was really reading riddle joker because it was like oh uh this game has it's it's a fucking uh usersoft game with an emoto route right uh, okay that's gonna be peak but the i'm just i got like halfway through the emoto route and it was very disappointing like the st- literally the the narrative of the emoto route was just just not good like there's no i i i don't know what to tell you it just what like it wasn't cute it that's that's all there was to it there wasn't I didn't get a str- any particularly strong senses of moe appeal from from reading it, which is strange. You would ex- like yeah, I don't know how. I I don't know. I don't really know. I can't really explain to you what it is. 
it's a it's an intangible thing for me i'm sure you know if if i was really paying attention the whole time and taking notes i i could explain it then but i wasn't i was just experiencing it in a in a flow so i can't i can't necessarily relate to you exactly what it was about the storyline and characterization that didn't do it for me and setting but uh it's just something didn't do it for me so i had like a double double whammy disappointments in in visual novels uh manga wise i haven't been reading that much manga recently i don't even remember what the last thing i read was uh whatever who cares but i've been kind i've been here's the thing with manga right is that the next like i want to catch up with most Hidamai Sketch and Gotcha Yusa because I don't think either of them are going to get another season of anime anytime soon so the only way to keep up with them would be to read the manga but also both of those shows I have watched the first season multiple times I- I've watched the first season of Hida Sketch twice I've watched the first season of Gotcha Yusa twice um, and so reading through the first season of both of those anime <laughs> again in manga form is kind of boring to be honest with you it's just kind of a, a it's just boring like i'm i know what happens i remember i remember every joke i i just i read through and i i'm just like yep i i remember this joke jokes aren't that funny when you read them for a third time um and so that makes reading those manga kind of annoying and difficult to to get past that point uh but of course i am i do want to know what happens i want to know what happens in both of those manga like after the anime ends uh so I do need to get around to that at some point. I don't know. And then on top of that, on top of all of that, like TF2 ain't, ain't been hitting for me recently. So I'm just kind of in a bit of, and I'm just in a bit of a haze. I think I'm sick. Like, I think specifically I made some chicken and it was chicken that went off that day, which should be fine. It looked fine. It smelled fine. It tasted fine. Like it wasn't, it wasn't particularly, you know, dodgy or anything. But it was after I ate that chicken that I started feeling weird. So I'm just assuming it had something to do with that chicken. But then again, it was almost immediately after, which seems too soon. Normally it should take a few hours if you have some sort of um, food poisoning. And foodborne illness might not even kick in for another another day um, afterwards. So maybe it was just a strange coincidence that it happened after I ate that chicken. Uh, but either way, I think I have like a very mild stomach flu. Because, like, my my stomach is kind of, like, vaguely upset all the time. Like, not severe at all, but just, like, a little bit of discomfort. And I just feel kind of fluey and, and like, you know, lethargic and, and you know, kind of dehydrated, dry, like, dry mouth kind of thing. And I'm, I don't know, I'm just, like, very mildly sick in a way that's not very pleasant. Uh... A stomach flu is a thing, right? I didn't just... Inv- I, I'm, if, if a stomach flu is a thing... I feel like I would probably be, like, shitting myself if I had that, but I, which I am not. Um, very mild, but just, like, just enough to be consistently annoying and distracting. Uh, <clears throat> I just need to find... So that's why I've been, I've been vlogging a lot, because I just need to find something to do with myself. But, I mean, I have found... I've, I'm, now I'm trying to learn Tokipona. Which is just a, I don't know, I, I don't want to talk about it too much because I feel like if I talk about it, I won't actually do it. Um, and uh, yeah, I've just been on the internet a lot. I've just been browsing the web like we used to back in the good old days. I know I'm browsing the web. Uh, so yeah, I, I mean, now would be a, a pretty good time to get back into anime in a big way. I just don't know which shows to watch. Like, that's the, that's the only problem. Because I also... I guess this is the other thing I haven't mentioned, is I do also have a, a penchant. I have a penchant for terrible isekai anime. I, I also quite like watching terrible, like, cheat cheat power in isekai. I, I like that shit. I, it's very watchable. It, like, that's the thing. I don't actually enjoy it that much. Like, I don't remember it after I finished it. But I like I like the watchability of it, and I sometimes like laughing at the, the, the silliness of it. Uh... But I'm not sure which one to watch, I guess. Let me... Should we go on Mal together right now? Should we see see what... Like, I have no idea what anime has come out recently. Really. Like, I don't have a good idea of... The The only things I know about are... Um, Freyren was, like, two seasons ago. 
and then I think there was there was a show I wanted to. Oh, we're already in summer twenty twenty four. Oh yeah, Connoisseur season three came out. Yeah, I have. I have no interest in watching that, even though I liked, I liked Kono Super seasons one and two back in the day, I, and, I, and that should fit right into my twenty sixteen era nostalgia, but for some reason, I see these characters and I I just can't I don't want to click on it. I just at no point I'm like, do I want to click on it. I don't know. Is it also Slimy Sakai season three, which once again I liked the first two seasons of Slimy Sakai. Um, but, but I just feel no desire to actually watch it. Um, Mahoka is one of the worst anime ever made. Oh yeah, there's a new season of Data Live, but I, 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 yeah, they made a new season, they made a remake of Bartender. Yeah, oh yeah, Eurocamp season three, that's something I actually should watch. I, I will, I will genuinely enjoy, I mean, I love Eurocamp. And this, Shumatsu Torei no Doko e Iku. Shumatsu Toren Dokoiku. The introduction of the 7G network promised miraculous technological advancements. I'm pretty sure I watched the first five minutes of this anime. Uh, but this is probably extremely me pilled. I should probably watch that. What is this one room Hitari Futsu Tenshitsuki? Shintaro. Toku Mitsu leads an ordinary high school life while living in a studio. Is this a harem show? This train is trash with you one morning after we find something strange in his. This seems like a very classic harem setup. It's a it's a living together magical girlfriend harem setup. Honestly, I kind of feel like I'll fuck with this. I feel like I'll probably fuck with that. That seems kind of on my street but then i've just been scrolling past all of these terrible isekai because they don't even register in my brain that's the thing like they they literally they don't register in my brain as real because there's just so many they're just they're just noise to me they're just sludge to me like what is this uh mao gaku oh there's the the misfit at demon academy i kind of wanted to watch the misfit at demon academy it's probably not very good though um yeah, I'm seeing a lot of bad reviews. It's trash. I mean, I I like trash. I like the 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 top recommended review says, uh, it's trash, but like a giant greasy hamburger, and I kind of fuck with that. I I fuck with the fast food, trash style, to some extent. It has to be done right. Mao no ore ga dore erfu wo. Yome ni I see Dore Elf and okay, this is gonna be interesting. How to love your elf bride. I am not sure that's what that says in Japanese. Uh it could be maybe I should just watch some terrible isekai. Should we just pick something and watch it in real time? Is that what we should do? Oh yeah, and girls band cry. That's another thing lots of people like. And it looks good. And Henjin no salad bowl. I actually started watching that show. I completely forgot I started watching that show. Yeah, fuck Sky Girls. Actually, don't... Sky Girls is fine. It's actually pretty good. It's better than fine. I would say... I would say, so far, I'm on, like, episode 6 of Sky Girls. And I can't complain about it. I mean, it's not... Um, it's kind of boring. But it, it's... We're, we're, I still feel like we're in intro territory. But that's, uh... You know... Hey, fuck it. Who cares? I don't know. I don't know what I'm saying. Should I just... I should pick... I should pick one of these, te- like, isekai from last season, I think, and just, just watch it, like, or, or maybe that, that harem show, I don't know, I feel like that harem show is gonna be, I need something very, I need something very easy to watch, there's also Hibiki Euphonium season 3, but I dropped Hibiki Euphonium season 2, when it was like, oh, guys, what if there was, what if there was melodrama and nothing else? I don't, I don't care about that stuff. Uh, what was the thing I was gonna watch? I said, I, I had said it in my head. I just, I had secretly decided. It was one of, it was one of these isekais. Which one was it? Was it Mao, Mao Gakuin? Was it Shumatsu Train? Or was it Level 2 Kara Cheat? Okay, I see Cheat in the title. Chilling in another world with my level 2 super cheap powers, 6, 6.9 out of 10, maybe this is the one for me, but I'm seeing, I'm not, 
super enjoying i don't know i don't know we need a i need one with better better girls I, i'm looking for looking for looking for for better designed girls but i will definitely come back to that if necessary perfectly okay with that um we love a six but we love a 6.9 out of 10 isekai don't we folks is this yuri there's a yuri that's rare yozakura san chi no daisaksen uh is this is this a this is not an isekai this is just a, a some sort of lame ass shonen tensei kizoku kante sukiru de nariagaru as a reincarnated aristocrat i'll use my appraisal skill to rise in the world this could be good i kind of fucks with that well should we just you know what why don't i just watch both of them both of these nuts i got plenty of time i got nothing else to do i'm gonna start off with with um level two kara chito data mote yu sha koho no matari isekai daifu um yeah why they still have long ass titles they never fixed that and that's something i'm surprised about like i kind of thought when when people were first making fun of the fact that light novels have long titles I was always of the mind that this was just like a gimmick that would last a couple of years and go away, but they never got rid of it. Level two, Karachito, Data, Moto Yusha, Koho no Matari, Isekai Daifu. Like, holy fuck! You can't, you can't just the laid-back life in another world of the ex-hero candidate who turned out to be a cheat from level two. Like, they just never, they just never. <laughs> you know what I mean? Okay, well I'm gonna watch this because it looks terrible. Uh, and I, I like that. I like the fact that it looks terrible. Welcome back to the... I saw this tweet section of the podcast. Now I will say, okay, my Twitter addiction has actually been getting better recently. I've been using Twitter less. Not due to any particular uh, skill of my own, but just because the website is getting worse and worse, like the post quality is going downhill... Excuse me. Um, I I noticed that it really just has been worsening for a while, but it was really this past week. Like I don't know what's happened, but something about the vibe. I know this is like a cheesy phrase, but but the the vibe has shifted. No one else seems to have noticed this, but something about Twitter has like like the vibe, even in in posters that I previously liked. There's. Something has become a a bit more mean spirited, and in a way where it seems like people are obviously it's Twitter. People are always judgy. It's it's whatever, but there's this like cool kids club. I, everyone's trying to be cool all the time, kind of vibe. Like it it, I don't know. I can't explain it. I feel like something's changed, and it's just making me want to use the site less. Like it's just less less funny, less entertaining. But I did see this tweet. Just found the most excruciating support request ever. And it's a Discord screenshot. Um, In the screenshot, someone has posted, what is this? And then it's a screenshot of an error message, presumably for whatever program the, this is, you know, this Discord manages. Uh, Blah, blah, blah. Error code 211. Find my iPhone must be disabled before restoring. That's the error pop up, to which the um, presumably dev responds, "Read the freaking error. It literally says what you have to do on the fucking window. Don't play dumb, bro. IDK what I need to do. Reread the error and tell me what it tells you to do. Do a backup of my phone. No, IDK tell me. Shut off my phone. These people are very stupid." Then there's there's a whole there's there's like a whole there's more there's more to this. The conversation kept going to the point where I I kind of think this person might be trolling. I but they're not trolling. This is the thing. They're not trolling. You can tell because they're actually asking for support. I don't know, man. Listen, all I'm saying is if you can't if you literally are incapable of reading, I don't think you should have access to a computer. You know, like if you can't read. The, do people's eyes just glaze over when they see a fucking 
error message. I don't know. The important part that I wanted to make clear here is, unironically, these people should not have access to computers. Like, people like that, their lives aren't improved by having access to the internet. Or, like, the, the, this should never have happened. Something's gone deeply wrong where we're giving these impossibly powerful devices, impossibly powerful, you know, um, made using rare earth minerals that are a miracle of engineering. Like, the more... And I don't even know anything about how hardware is magically created out of out of silicon i have no idea but even with the very little i know i consider it to basically be a miracle that that any of this works at all like the fact that it's even possible to have a computer is a fucking insane feat of human genius um you know let alone the power that computers have these days in your pocket in a in a phone like wasting that on 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 these people who's who don't want or need it they don't want computers like this is not an ass basically what i'm saying is you know you know that guy um oh fuck what's his name mental outlaw you know mental outlaw the youtuber um he has this this video where was it? It's it's like a an edit. It's an it's an edit of a of a Haruhi scene. Yeah, Yuki installs Gen two. It's it's like a Haruhi scene with the subtitles changed to be about about Linux, and uh, it's very funny. It's a classic meme. Uh, but but Yuki goes on the end, goes on a rant at the end, uh, about about how normies shouldn't have access to computers, and it's fucking great. Uh, they're all normies who can barely install browser extensions. They won't be able to get any work done or consume social media. Normies shouldn't use computers in the first place. PCs and Macs were a mistake that dumbed down computers. Just so low IQ mongoloids could use them as well. I'm simply restoring things to their natural order. Could it be that there's variation in you and then the, 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 the fucking guy? I don't... What's his name? I don't remember the guy's name from, from how he... Uh, he's like, could it be that there's variation in human intelligence? It's very funny. It's a classic meme. It's a classic meme. But anyway, the point the point I wanted to make here is that, um, yeah, no, normies shouldn't have access to computers. I, like, I am borderline. I consider myself borderline because I don't I don't really know shit about computer science, right? Like, I'm not a I'm even though I've done some programming, I absolutely do not consider myself a programmer or even close right like i i yeah i am not i i i know my way around a unix file system pretty well you know i i i can use vim fairly effectively like that i have some skills in computing um but but do i actually meet the minimum my own minimum requirements to use a computer i don't know it's it's possible uh, I think if I had to say that the thing that I have that I think would separate me from, from the, the normies I don't want using the computer, it's simply the fact that if I ran into a problem, I, I, that's not something like when I think, I think it's not necessarily about knowledge, right? Cause no one's just born knowing C, <laughs> you know, uh, like the, it's about, how you react to to not knowing something it's about it's about whether you see that like when when you're presented with some technical barrier if you see that as a flaw with the thing or if you see that as an opportunity for you to learn which i try to be the the latter in, in almost all situations in my life i take pride of this in this aspect of myself that i've that i've cultivated over the years when when i when i see something that has some sort of technical barrier I'm like, fuck yeah, I get to learn some shit. I know this sounds like I'm sucking my own dick, but let me have this, okay? I don't have much. Let me have, let me have this. <laughs> um, whereas Normans, they'll see an error message that tells them exactly what to do in very clear language, and they immediately just go running to the Discord server to ask the dev 
to to please handhold and spoon feed. I think that's that's disgusting. I think that's absolutely disgusting. These th- that's the difference. So what I'm trying to say here is is uh this idea of of ease of use of of uh, like removing technical barriers to computing, making everything very user friendly. This this is a bad idea. This was a this was this was a mistake. Um and I I can I th- I think this is a situation here, let me let me just draw a random fucking buck wild connection here. I think I think this is this is one of these rare situations where you can be a left Nietzschean, okay? Because this this gives me like aristocratic socialism vibes, in the sense that like the I think a left Nietzschean critique is appropriate here, where uh, I don't think you can strongly argue. And maybe it's not left knee. Maybe I'm exaggerating here. Okay, the 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 <laughs> I'm 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 pretty sleepy. Uh, I'm kind of drawing connections where there are none. Okay, that was kind of a dumb thing to ignore. That I ever said the phrase left Nietzschean. Ignore that. That never happened. Scrub that from your memory banks. Anyway, damn, I'm fucking muddled. I'm having trouble expressing ideas right now in clean and efficient manner. <laughs> Uh, it's all these viruses in my head that are causing me to be sleepy. Right, what I was trying to say was, the the move to streamline and make user-friendly the experience of computing was not some sort of democratization or egalitarian policy. It was a... It exists to maximize profit for capitalists it it was it was a, a trend and continues to be a trend because uh tech com- companies want to be able to sell their product to as many customers as possible you know which like it is a it is the force of capitalism unbridled capitalism that has done this and and the this is a a good example of how like making something accessible is not always actually a good thing. It's actually often a bad thing. Making something quote-unquote democratized is not actually the same thing as making it good. It's often making it worse for the people that actually actually want to do shit. Um, computers would be better if they didn't have to be designed around normies. That's That's, I think, a fact. I don't think anyone can 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 argue against that. And what's more, I would probably be better as well if, in order to use a computer, I had like like say say computers still operated in a some way analogous to, uh, you know, they did in the eighties with the the sixteen bit machines and whatever, uh, where you were poking around in memory addresses and writing basic to to get stuff done. Like, I would just know. In order to use the, if that was the minimal technical requirement to use the computer, I would have learned how to do that, and that would be good. You know, have it, the, is, there's there's a, a phrase called de-skilling, right? Like when when you gain some sort of technological change, um, people lose the skills that they previously had, right? Like your and my ancestors for thousands, if not tens of thousands of years, knew things about which plants were edible and which plants would kill you because, you know, that was relevant to their day-to-day lives. <clears throat> and, and, and then over the course of just a few generations, that knowledge still exists. There are foragers that, that know this stuff. But, but in general, that's a, that we have been de-skilled. We have lost that skill, you know. Um, and there's 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 many examples of that kind of thing, like before capitalism, where you could just buy whatever you needed. Oftentimes, you had to make the thing you needed, you know. Uh, and so that ability to make various tools, and you know what I'm trying to, you understand what I'm trying to say here, right? You understand de-skilling. It's a it's a pretty simple concept to wrap your head around, and computers. And the development of so-called user-friendly computing 
has resulted in another example of this de-skilling, where because the it's not necessary, people lose that skill. But what that means is they're just reliant on someone else to do it for them. Because in all of these situations, you're just relying on someone else. Like, the skill still has to exist. It's just that you, you now are just delegating that to a corporation, right? Like, you don't know how to check if a plant is safe, but you're assuming that there are regulations and that Monsanto is going to do X, Y, Z to make sure the crops are, you know, you know what I'm saying, right? Like, and and to an extent, that's that's a good thing, you know? Like, you should be, it's not a bad thing to delegate work to, to different people in society. It would be pretty hard to have everyone know everything, right? Uh, but... It it is worth noting that when that is worth noting who who and why you're delegating some knowledge to, some skill to, um, if you if it's actually a good for society at large, that the skill has been turned into a a niche. In the case of like knowing which foods which plants are edible, you know, I don't know, I don't fucking know anything about edible plants, right? I I know fucking nothing about edible plants but i think we can all agree hopefully if you're listening to this that that would probably be pretty useful like if everyone knew about that stuff hey this this plant is medicinal for this purpose this plant is edible in this purpose this this mushroom will kill you if you eat it like that would probably be good things to know like if everyone just had a basic understanding of that sort of thing i think i I think the society on large would would probably be better off I can I can think of many times when that would have been been helpful to me, you know? Like, imagine you're on a walk in the park, and you're just like, oh, that's chicken of the woods mushroom. I'm just going to take that up. That'll be my dinner today. You know, that would be pog if you could. I mean, you can do that if you just pick up a, well, you should probably have a person teach you how to forage in, in, in person, because that's how you're supposed to do it. But anyway, <clears throat> I think we can generally agree that that would be, that would be cool and useful if, if that was a skill that was widely disseminated into society once again. And I think, of course, some people are going to be left out. Some people deserve to be left out. If you can't read, don't be on a computer. We need to do something. There's nothing can be done. Nothing, nothing can be done about these people. It's, it's way too late. But they should never have had access to the computer. They should never have had access to it. That's my, that's my argument. It was a mistake letting normies use computers. Look where it's taken us. Oh, look what the fuck it's done to us. Look what the fuck it's done to society. They let normies use computers, and now the world is, like, collapsing. It's fucked up. There were a few videos on the internet of hunters hunting deer, but then the deer just comes right up to them and, like, sniffs them. And then they, they obviously don't shoot it. There's something weird, like, there's something very powerful about these videos to me. I don't, I don't know what it is. It's not just, like, the beauty of nature type situation. It's more that it's, like, it's kind of, <laughs> how do I explain this? Like, there's literally a video where, like, a, a deer walks up to a hunter and just, like, the hunter is pointing, the like, the gun straight forward and standing perfectly still. And the deer comes up and just sniffs the barrel of the gun in such a way, you know, positioning its head directly in front of the barrel. And it's like, it almost reminds me of that. It's like the the wholesome version. It's like wholesome Lovecraftianism. It's like the opposite of that image of the rat that got electrocuted, where there's like a, a caption that's like, oh, it got killed by, by forces... It couldn't possibly comprehend for no particular reason that it was never, you know, that image. You've probably seen that. Um, But it's the opposite. It's like, here here are these forces, like this, this creature with, with a weapon that you don't, you couldn't even possibly conceive as being a weapon. The ability to just instantly end your life with zero effort, you know, uh, you know, who lives in a, a world, uh, 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 an experience what's the word i'm looking for i don't know uh, a subjectivity very different from your own um 
you know, incomprehensible, and yet it finds you cute. That's the that's the wholesome part. And I hope that's how that's that's how I imagine God exists. If there's such a if if God exists, I know I did a segment earlier about how I proved that God doesn't exist, but <laughs> that's the kind of God I want to exist. I want the type of God to exist who is like oh whatever. I I I want to isn't there some sort of love there's there's a, there's been a lot of especially on Tumblr it's a very Tumblr thing there's, of this sort of wholesome Lovecraftian shit um and I quite like it it might be a bit cheesy but I quite like that vibe it's it's a uh, it's nice there's a there's a a Japanese meme it's pretty outdated now but there used to be a big thing of yami kawaii creepy cute uh <clears throat> which is also kind of similar. I don't know, there's something going on here. There's something going on here, and I think it's 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 those those hunter and deer videos where the deer is is just spared because it's like it makes me also think about about people in the past. Like surely there must have been hunter gatherers who this happened to, like with a bow and arrow back in the day or a spear or something. You know what I mean? Like surely that must have happened. Because there's a theory, right, that we find other animals' babies cute, not just because they remind us of our own babies, but also because if you hunt all of the babies, you don't get any adults, right? And so the idea is that it has an evolutionary advantage where finding the the baby animals cute means you're not going to kill them, and instead you're going to focus on killing the adult animals who are going to give you more meat, and also, if you don't kill all the babies, they can grow up and breed, and so you get continued food supplies. So, cult, you know, people who, there's, there was an evolutionary selective pressure towards uh, people who spared baby animals because they would have been able to survive for longer. That's a theory, right? Uh, I don't know. I just have this, I, I feel like finding animals cute is probably... A pretty universal experience but is it like I don't know like maybe if you go to a hunter-gatherer society that has to kill cute animals every day to eat or every few days to eat do they even have that conception you know or the, like I don't know I have no idea or is it some sort of product of industrial agriculture like maybe I know a lot of people who who raise um animals right for for farming animals right cows sheep even pigs they they love their 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 animals and they find them extremely cute and I mean I also find them really cute you ever seen highland cows those guys are so cute I've 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 hung out with a highland cow before great guys sheep I've never been near a sheep, but I want to be. They seem really nice. Uh, there's a reason that the Bible describes Jesus as a shepherd and people as his flock, right? Because there's this... I think that speaks to this universal experience of, of shepherds as caring for their flock, that you get this particular sense where you want to protect your, your flock or something. I don't fucking know. I'm kind of going on a bit of a tangent here. I don't know. I just wanted to talk about cool video. I'm still watching this guy, this isekai, by the way. Uh, that was that was a, a second of, of that isekai that you just heard. It's, uh, it's a bit silly. I, I'll talk about it more later, I guess. I don't really have... It's very... It's slop. There's not really that much to say about it. There's not much deep commentary. It's so, I know I'm not supposed to talk about Team Fortress 2 in this podcast, but this isn't about the gameplay, okay? Isn't it so, such a weird and almost cool coincidence that TF2 happens to have a game mode about everyone teaming up and fighting robots that the community can use to make a bunch of propaganda about the bot issue? Isn't that such a weird and cool coincidence? I think it is. I think that's it. I think that's very cool. Like, the, the Man vs. Machine trailer, even when I never played, like, even when that trailer first came out, way back in the day and I saw it, 
I didn't even know what man versus machine was or what TF2 was. But that moment when the red team and, the, like, like, I don't remember exactly what happens, but they, like, walk into the other room of the blue team and then hand them a shotgun and they team up. Like, that, it, it's such a good moment. It's so, it's, it's so good. It's so sick. The soundtrack is so awesome. Teaming up to defeat a, a greater foe. I'm a big sucker for that, that um, trope. And um, enemies teaming up to defeat... Uh, yeah, you know what I'm saying. What is that happening? I was... Wait a minute. I feel like I was reading something. Oh, Game of Thrones. That's what I'm thinking of. The the White Walkers in Game of Thrones. Um. Anyway, that was my Discord ping, not yours. Uh, I don't really have anything particularly interesting to say about it. I just think it's a funny coincidence. I know, I'm not, this is like the third time I've tried to skirt around my own no TF2 rule. Um, because this is, this is about the TF2 community, specifically the TF2 subreddit, not, not the game itself. I'm not talking about weapon balance and maps, and, okay. <clears throat> so, as you know by now, TF2 has a bot crisis, lots of bots in the game, and... Uh, one of the biggest bot hosters, if not the biggest bot hoster, is a guy called Omegatronic. All the bots are called Omegatronic. And Omegatronic posts on Twitter and YouTube and stuff, like, taunting TF2 players. Uh, and he's drawn, like, fan art of all his bots, right? Like, like with little computer screens for heads, like Karen from Spongebob. Uh, and for some fucking reason that the tf2 subreddit has decided it would be a it would be a really good idea to start drawing a bunch of gay porn of these of these omegatronic bots that this will somehow get back at at the guy <clears throat> and the excuse they're using is that he's russian and there's something about russians being homophobic but no you're just drawing fan art <laughs> you're just giving him more attention and drawing fan art Exactly what he wants, you fucking idiots. What are you doing? I feel like even talking about this is retarded. So maybe I won't. You know the situation I'm in right now? Dotsmite is not in the house. I'm alone. I've been alone for, for, for like a day and a half. Um, in a strange land full of strange folk. With strange customs. Here I am, playing Team Fortress 2 Classic. Uh... And this is the weird situation I'm in. So, I feel weird and fucked up. And I felt a bit weird and fucked up for a few days. But this is all adding to my brain fog. Which makes it quite hard to do anything. It's making it hard to, to do my Toki Pona Anki deck. It's making it hard to play video games. It's making it hard to focus on anime. This is just what happens to me. Welcome to my life. Sometimes I get brain fog and I can't do anything for a week. Gotta love that shit. Um, so it's hard for me to really do much. So then I end, when, when I'm in that situation, I end up normally doing the worst possible things, which are like scrolling YouTube shorts or scrolling Twitter or scrolling Reddit or scrolling 4chan, um, which is bad. Or doing all of those at once and like tabbing between them. It's not good. You don't want to be that situation. Uh, but it's sometimes the only thing I can. Anyway... But then there's an issue, and this particular issue is the fact that while technically there is food, there isn't really food. Like, there's carbs and egg. <laughs> there's carbs and, like, three eggs in the house. And th that'll be fine for today, but it will not be fine for tomorrow. Really, I should go to the shops. Really, I should go to the shops. But I feel like shit. I feel bad. I feel like shit. And I don't want to go to the shops. And it's also hot outside. Why is it hot in Estonia? I don't fucking know. Isn't this country supposed to be cold? It's not that hot. I'm, com I'm complaining too much. But, and I've got, a, and just to add it, add on to it, my, my hip is hurting for like no reason. I don't know why my, I must have slept in a weird position or something, which I know once I start walking is just going to hurt more. It sucks. Anyway, I'm gonna go to the shops now and stop complaining about it to, to my fans on YouTube. Fans on YouTube, I have to go to the shops. And then you don't want to go to the shops because it's scary outside. There's people. 
Last time I went, if someone tried to fucking talk to me, it's, it was terrible. In Estonian. Like, that would suck in English. It's much worse when you don't even understand what they're saying. I went to scan my shit, and a fucking a big error message popped up in Elvish. And I'm like, what the fuck does this mean? And then the lady comes over to me, and is like, Tere, which is the only word of Estonian I know, which means hello. And I'm like, hi. And then she doesn't react. And she just says, Right. <laughs> right. She, she. What she says to me is this. So she comes up to me and she, she goes you like this. You just walk in and you just go like. Right. And I'm like, what the fuck did you just say? Uh, and then she go just grabs shit out of my fucking bag and starts scanning it. I don't. I don't know. Did I? Did I buy too much stuff? Is it some like random security check? I don't know. I don't know how this how this the che- the self checkouts in Estonia they don't work the same as the self checkouts in the UK. They work in a completely different way. You got to scan. It's it's very. I don't understand it. I don't understand what we're wrong. In the end, it was it was okay. In the end, it was okay. Obviously, because why wouldn't it have been okay? But I did not enjoy that experience. It was not an enjoyable experience. And I also bought too much stuff. They were all very heavy, and it sucked because I had to carry it all back. I'm give, this is very mundane complaints about very normal, ordinary things. It's times like these when sometimes I'm like, maybe these, maybe all of the the Euro pores who are who are laughing at the Amera fats, uh, are, are, you know, like maybe car dependent America is actually fun. Like, you know, it'd be nice. It would be nice if I could get in my fucking car. Get in my pickup and drive to a drive through and get myself a burger and fries. That's what I want to do right now. I want to hop in my pickup. I want to get behind the wheel of my pickup with a beer. Because <laughs> they don't... Drunk driving is not a thing in America. In America, you, yeah, there's drunk driving. You can have a beer, though. I feel like in America, they don't really care about having a, a couple beers, a couple brewskis when you're, when you're driving down to the McDonald's to grab yourself a quarter pounder, you know? They don't give a fuck about that in America. Everyone's, everyone's got to have a little keg in their truck. So I hop in my pickup. Drive me down on my way to, 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 to Bojangles, and I'll pick up some Bojangles, and I'll, I'll, I don't even know what that is, but I'll pick some up, pick up some Popeyes, pick up some, go go to Bucky's, you know, pick up pick up a, a, a two liter, a Diet Coke, and eat that shit in the car, and you know, then I'll drive for another, another hour. <laughs> Drive for an, drive another hour down to the the Walmart, pick up pick up my groceries for the for the week. Total comes to two dollars and eighty eight cents, and then I'll drive back home. Overall, the trip would cost me four hundred dollars in gas for in gas. Um, but at the end of the day, I got my Bojangles. That's the situation I want to be in. Instead. I got no money, so you know what I'm gonna buy when I go to the shop, which I'm gonna do, which I'm now. This is me procrastinating. You're listening to the, to me procrastinating. You're listening to the. You, you could say, <laughs> you could say you're listening to the procrastinators podcast right now. You could say that. It's possible. You could say you're listening to the procrastinators podcast right now. Um, what I'm gonna buy is like a fuckload of carrots, a fuckload of onions, a fuckload of cabbage. Cause those are cheap. Some pork mints and maybe some chicken if I'm feeling fancy. I don't know. And that's probably it. I don't think I'll buy anything else. I think I. I think we have everything else that we could. That we have all the carbs that we need. Oh, I, I might buy some some tomato sauce. So I might buy a couple cans of tomato sauce. Chopped tomatoes, chopped sauce. You know what I'm saying? I might buy. Some tomato sounds. <laughs> uh, right. Yes. I also have other things I want to do. When I get back, I want... Let's do my Toki Pona Anki right now. Should we do that live? It's not even Anki. It's actually it's actually a completely different app. But it's the same basic promise. Um, it's the same basic promise. 
I'm having a very funny conversation with someone right now about how vegetables don't exist. They're lying to you. They're in cahoots. I'm trying to tell. I'm trying to convince someone that vegetables don't exist. Um. <laughs> anyway, let's, let's do my let's do my optimum. Feelings, emotion, heart. That is, pilen. It's pilin. I was wrong. Hold on. This app. The app. The app broke. Got to start it again. Okay. Keen. Keen. That means also. Yes. To play, laugh, game, fun, artistic, entertaining. That is musi. Musi. Alasa. Alasa. That is to hunt, gather, harvest. Hey. That's o. Oh. Lipu. Lipu. That's document. Lawa. Lawa. That's head. Pini. Pini. That is a good question. What is pini? Um. That's end, I believe. That is end. Yes. Person. That is yan. Yan. Ken. Ken. That is can. That's cognate with English. Make, build, create, work. That is pali. Pali. Feelings, emotion, heart. That is a good question. Is that siwen? Pilin. That is pilin. I was completely wrong. Uh... Out, away, absent, missing, empty, void, lost. That, I believe, is weka. Weka. Let's go. Container. That is pocky. Pocky. High, up, above, on top of, divine. Ooh. That is... Oh, I know this one. I definitely know this one. That is sewi. Sewi. Let's fucking go. To want, wish, need, should. To want. That... I don't remember that. Wheelie. Wheelie, right, yeah, fuck. Uh, same. That is seme, I believe. It's. I think it's seme. Sama. Sama, fuck. <laughs> I, knew it's, I knew it was something like some, it's English. I, that is me. Me. Clay. Ko. Ko. Telo. Telo. Liquid. Water. Pan. Pan. That is grain. Picture, that is sitelen. Sitelen. Clothes, that is, um, clothes. That is len. Len. Let's fucking go. Color, that is kule. Kule. Pana. Pana. We just did that, didn't we? That is give. Let's fucking go. Hard, solid, that is kiwen. Kiwen. Yo. Yo, that is is your fuck what is your what is your um i don't remember i don't know this one have that is have okay he she it they that is sina honor fuck that is honor melly melly i don't know this one that is woman of course how did i forget that bug that is very funny pee pee Number, that is Nampa. Nampa. Good, that is Toki. No, that is Pona. Pona. Uh, surface, that is Super. No, no, no. Yes, Super, I believe. Super. Yes. Looking. Looking, that means look. That's funny. Ma. Ma. Is that Earth? Yeah, land, Earth, country. Weka. Weka, that means away, gone, disappeared, vanished. Buy, trade, store, market. That is esun. Esun. This. Oh, that's a good question. What is this? Uh, I don't remember. Ni. Ni. Okay. Sigelo. Sigelo. That's a body. Language. That is toki. Toki. Loye. Loye. That means red. Walo. That means white. Anu. That means or. Circles, wheel, okay, this one I, I remember forgetting it. I remember not remembering it earlier today. It's, 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 ah, uh, it's something. That was my Discord. I'm going to mute my computer. Um, uh, uh, circle. I don't remember. Sike. Sike, fuck. Seme. Seme. We did this one earlier. What was it? Seme. Seme. 
I don't remember. That's what. Okay, I gotta remember that. Feelings, emotion, heart. I've forgotten this one as well. Is it peeling? Peeling. Let's fucking go! Winged animal, that is a bird, first of all. And secondly, that's called waso. Waso. Thing, object, uh, I believe that's... No, is it? Is it iyo? Iyo. Let's go! Kipisi. Kipisi, that's cut, I believe. Yes. Kulupu. Kulupu, that means... Cult, uh, group, that means group or culture, community, society, okay, culture is wrong, it doesn't actually mean culture, but I got the picture, feelings, okay, we did this before, is that, that's something like, is that peeling? Peeling. Let's go. Eh. Eh, that means, that is the direct object marker, yes. Lape. Sleep. Pini. 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 Bing. I don't, I don't know what pini is. And oh yeah, actually I should remember that. I that is oko. Oko. Ampa. Ampa means under, I believe. Below. Yes. To want, wish, need. That is wile. Wile. Pini. Pini. We just did this. We just did it two seconds ago. That is end. Yes. I did it. I did all of them. Thank you for listening. Okay. Well, I've also been informed that. Dotsmite is going to be home in about 30 minutes, so I think I'm going to wait for them to get back before I go to the store. Uh, so my procrastination is actually okay. I just watched an extremely bad YouTube video. One of the worst YouTube videos I've ever seen. And I got to talk about it. I can't let this stand. I almost, I want to make, I almost hated it enough. I, I kind of, I don't know, I'm stuck. I need to do something about this. It can't be allowed to stand because this video is going to end up with a million views and everyone's just going to believe everything he says in it because he has an authoritative tone of voice and it's a multi-hour long video essay and he kind of has the tone of voice like he knows what he's talking about. I mean, he doesn't know what he's talking about. He doesn't know anything. He's an idiot. The video is nonsensical from the start. It doesn't even know what it's trying to say and then it is bad, it's very bad. This video is called Kawaii, okay? <laughs> this video is called Kawaii uh, Anime Propaganda and Soft Power Politics by someone called Moon Channel. This is a very bad video. This is an extremely bad video. And there are some parts of the video that are fine. He goes through some stuff about the history of Orientalism. That stuff's fine, okay? Whatever. I don't really give a fuck about the first half of the video. It's not my area of expertise. Um, he's talking about Japan in World War One and World War Two. You know, I, what do I know about that? Not very much. Then he's like, the anime industry was massively bolstered by the government hiring them to make propaganda cartoons, which is true, as much as it was also true in America. Um, but th that's just what about us? Like, yes, that is true. He is going to call back to that as if it's really important when in fact it's just a thing that governments were doing at the time. Uh, but he's going to keep calling back to the fact that uh, the, 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 the anime industry uh, was propped up heavily by the Japanese government to make wartime propaganda. He's going to keep calling back to that, as if that's super important, as if, like, you could say the same thing about the American animation industry, right? You could say the same thing about them, and then you wouldn't then go to make the argument that, like, Teen Titans Go is somehow American propaganda, but I, get, I digress. Not really my point. He then goes on to say some slanderous stuff about Tezuka, Osama Tezuka, who um, once said that he liked a scene in a propaganda cartoon. He once said that he liked a scene in a propaganda cartoon. And to that, to this Moon Channel person, that quote overshadows all of the rest of Tezuka's famous pacifism and anti-war activism uh, and, uh, and ANPO protests and so on. Uh, uh, it's insane. This guy, he loves Miyazaki. He thinks Miyazaki is based and unproblematic. We stand an unproblematic king. That's what he thinks. He says, so there's a famous thing. If you're, if you're an otaku, you know this that when Miyazaki was young, he would keep going back to see this anime. There was this, this one anime, and he would keep going, going back because he fell in love with one of the female characters. One of the first men to have a waifu, 
Okay, Miyazaki is one of the first men to have a waifu. Uh, Moon Channel is like, no, no, that would mean he's an otaku, and otaku are evil. So actually, uh, he just liked the anime a lot, I swear. He definitely didn't have a waifu. Bro had a fucking waifu, okay? Also, uh, your, your unproblematic king, Miyazaki, also, let's not forget that he does somehow manage to put a lolly in every single movie and a panty shot of that lolly in every single movie that he makes. Can we just, like, not... I'm just not... Hey, I'm not trying to get the guy cancelled. What I'm saying is the guy might be more of an otaku, more of a dirty, degenerate otaku than you're willing to accept. Uh, just because he won an Oscar doesn't mean he's not a dirty, degenerate otaku, okay? We're all, we're all dirty, degenerate otaku here. Right. But this is all about... Then he goes to be like, have you guys ever heard of this thing called soft power? And and he makes some very strange conclusions here about like Japanese media. Like he talks about city pop being an export of Japanese soft power, which is very strange because city pop is an import of American soft power to Japan, not the other way around. I don't really understand what he's talking about there. Um, like, like, City Pop is not traditional Japanese music. It is American pop music with Japanese lyrics. It's, like, that didn't come out of nowhere. That is an importation of, of American soft power. Also, he mentioned at the beginning of the video, he says Japan is the number one soft power in the world, which is fucking insane, because America is obviously the number one soft power in the world. Um... I'm not even halfway done with this rant, by the way. He says so much stupid shit. This is just the beginning. Uh, and also, you know, City Pop was obviously never exported to the West. I don't know where he gets this idea. City Pop only got popular in the West because of YouTube. Uh, no one in the fucking 60s and 70s in the US was listening to Japanese City Pop. Or, like, yeah, it just wasn't happening. Um, there was popular Japanese music in the West, at least for people who liked a lot of... You people who are deep into music, they might have been listening to some Japanese funk, some some uh, maybe Yellow Magic Orchestra, if you were a nerd, or um, Casa Opia, you know. Anyway, then he talks about modern anime. He talks about how Hayao Miyazaki is, like, impossibly based, which is just, you know, because that's the only anime director he's ever heard of. Um, and then... This is where things start to get confusing because he seems to not really... I don't really understand what he's talking about here. Like, he, he doesn't really draw a distinction throughout the whole, like, first half of the video and maybe first two-thirds of the video. He just doesn't really draw any distinction between the, the Japanese private sector and the Japanese public sector. And I can't tell to what extent this is on purpose, right? Because, of course, Japanese did... Uh, or Jap the Japanese economy was heavily um, like centralized and, and, and governed in a top top down sort of pseudo Soviet style. That's not actually true, but they did have a, a, a lot of uh, planned planned economy type beats, uh, but they were still a capitalist nation. They can obviously continue to be a capitalist nation and companies make decisions without government approval that often go, con you know what I mean? It really seems like just the fundamental issue with this video is that he's come in with this idea that anime is, is Japanese government propaganda and he's just going to do whatever it takes to prove that point. Like, he's done a bunch of research, but he's only interested in things that agree with him. Like, he doesn't really bring up any counterpoints throughout the whole video, for example. Um, so, yeah, that's the bit about Miyazaki. He's talking about... Projecting soft power post World War II in the seventies and eighties, I think, in order to soften Japan's image relating to its neighbors who it had committed war crimes against. Yep, fair enough. That's all very real. And one of the things he brings up is this um, soap opera. This very popular Japanese soap opera at the time. Um, and I don't, I don't really know anything about the soap opera. I don't really care about it, but as far as I, I'd never heard of this before, and as far as, uh, you know, this video goes, which I believe, the video is, it, I mean, that soap opera is propaganda, yeah, it's it's definitely government propaganda, it is, it explicitly uh, was funded by the government, it explicitly uh, promotes a revisionist um, story of, of Japan in World War II, 
to make J- Japan seem like sympathetic victims and Japanese people seem like resilient, you know, underdogs or whatever. Um, and it was, d- you know, deliberately distributed to foreign Asian markets uh, for free. You know, I-, I-, I basically agree with all of that. I think it's it's very much fair to say that that particular soap opera was definitely Japanese government propaganda. Uh, one question, just a little quick question. Um, is that kawaii anime? No, 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 I don't think it is. Why did you call the, the video kawaii anime propaganda and so- soft power politics? It's actually kawaii colon, an- which doesn't make any sense. Like the title of the video is kawaii. Nothing about the video has anything to do with kawaii or moe, like at all, until right at the end when he briefly mentions it this like yeah it's true the japanese government made a propaganda soap opera correct i agree what does that have to do with anime what does that have to do with kawaii it has nothing if you you should have titled the video the Jap- that time the japanese government made a propaganda soap opera you should have titled the video that but instead you're trying to clickbait motherfuckers like me you're trying to abuse the otaku in the audience fuck you one of the other really funny things he does is he's like Guys, Space Battleship Yamato is a real World War II ship that like, killed people. Oh my god, it's Ebo. It was like killed people. And then he talks about how that was like propaganda, which doesn't really make any sense. Because earlier, he was saying that the anime industry was... So early, his, his entire narrative is nonsense, right? So his narrative is, is this. The anime industry was propped up by propaganda that was pro-US military presence in Japan. Because there were ANPO protests that, that they hit, that there was a lot of Japanese people continue to this day to hate US military presence in Japan. But as you can imagine, in the 50s, it was even bigger. A lot of people, and 60s as well, a lot of people really hated US military presence in Japan. You know, fair enough. And so the Japanese government was like, here's some anime about why US military is actually based. And then he insinuates that Tezuka supported this, which is slanderous because Tezuka famously did not support this. But anyway, uh, so so in this situation, he's talking about how anime was set up from the beginning to be pro-US hegemony, US global military hegemony propaganda. And then five minutes later, he says, um, you know, the, the Yamato is Leibol who killed Lay Americans and now Americans were buying it. So I'm sorry, which one is it? Is anime pro-US hegemony or is anime pro-Japanese imperialist propaganda? Like, I don't know. He doesn't seem to understand either. Uh, Like, why would the Japanese government have an incentive? I don't know. It doesn't make any sense. It it really doesn't make any sense. (sighs) So that's very silly because he seems like extremely shocked. Oh, yeah. And then he talks about um, something very funny he mentions is he's like, and if this art style looks familiar to you, this guy also made Galaxy Express 999. And then he says, which I'm pretty sure was an influence on Honkai Star Rail. It's like, yeah, bro, it was. But it was also an influence on fucking everything. Like, do you know how many anime and manga and Japanese media have references to Galaxy Express in it? It's, it's a million billion of them. It's a million billion of them. Every Japanese TV show has a fucking train in the space. <laughs> like, 90% of Japanese culture is about trains in space. Like, it's only, like, the most influential anime of all time. It, and you, the only cultural touchstone you have is Honkai Star Rail, because you have no fucking clue what you're talking about, because you've never seen an anime in your life. And that's the central problem here, is that this guy, while he might know some things about the history of, of uh, Japan around World War II, that I don't. He definitely doesn't know anything about anime or otaku culture, and he definitely doesn't know anything about uh, leftism, because this is a leftist video essay, if you hadn't noticed from the fact that it's like two and a half hours long. Uh, This is a leftist video essay about how anime is fascist. Uh, The problem is, the guy who's making this video essay doesn't know anything about fascism and doesn't know anything about anime, and so it's a complete fucking mess. And now we can get into the meat of things, because we're getting into the modern era when, you know, the anime actually became real. We're talking... Oh, so here's a funny thing. He completely just skips over the 80s. The 80s never happened. What do you mean, the 80s? No anime came out in the 80s. Uh, and so... And then he just lies. So here's the lie he's, he says. I'm, 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 I'm looking forward to telling you this one, because this one's just a straight, bald-faced 
lie, like it's just incorrect, is he says, uh, so there was this economic bubble in Japan, and then uh, no one really cared about anime in the 80s, and then when the economic bubble popped, the rest of the Japanese economy went down the shitter, but it was the anime industry and the entertainment industry that was the only thing that wasn't hit hard. Okay, so that is just a fucking lie. Anyone who knows anything about anime knows that that is simply bullshit. That the anime industry was hit crazy hard by the economic bubble popping. Of course it was. Because it's not just, it doesn't just stand alone. The reason that Moon Channel thinks this is because he's never heard of OVAs, which is extremely funny. This guy who's made a whole two and a half hour long video about anime and claims, by the way, on multiple occasions to be like like a big a big Japan guy. He's made multiple videos about Japanese culture. Um, you know, he made he made a video about Bridget and uh, and a lot of Japanese video games. Bo is clearly a video games guy. Doesn't know anything about anime. This is his first anime video. But he just doesn't know what an OVA is. So it's really funny because obviously, if you know anything about anime, you know that all of the good anime in the eighties came from OVAs. That TV anime in the 80s was not particularly good, uh, right? I mean, it wasn't bad, but it was of average quality. But the special, well-liked anime from the 80s and the, the, the real standout quality stuff is in the form of OVAs, right? Video, video releases, straight to video releases. Um, uh, you know, all of, all of the famous stuff that you've heard of from the 80s was either a movie or an OVA. Um, and uh, OVAs were able to be so popular in Japan in the 80s because specifically of the economic bubble, that people were able to buy expensive um, VHS players and DVRs, which could record and play back VHSs, and they were able to afford expensive VHS tapes, which at the time cost like $80 a pop in Japan. And that was $80 in, in I don't know. It was a lot of money. It was it 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 was it was much more than most people would be willing to pay for an OVA. And so the industry, having figured out this funding mechanism, that people would be willing to pay insane money to buy OVAs because everyone was rich, um, could afford to spend a lot more time and money animating OVAs, right? And so they made some of the most famous, you know, eighties anime in the world or of all time. What am I talking about? 80s anime of all time. It's not of all time, it's of the 80s. Uh, they made they made very very good anime at the time because they had a lot of money. <laughs> That's the point I'm trying to make. And you, all it takes is looking to see that the quality of OVAs declined in the 90s, noticeably, because there was no longer money. And everyone knows this. Anyone who knows anything about anime knows this because it's obvious if you watch any anime, this just becomes intuitively true. Like, even if you don't know anything about Japan's economic situation, you would know that something clearly happened between the 70s and 80s that made the animation quality increase and the invention of the OVA, and something clearly happened between the 80s and the 90s that caused the quality in OVAs to dip. Uh, like, you, would, you don't have to be... A, or you don't have need any external context to see this. You would just know it from watching anime. Um, but, but he doesn't know about any of that. So what he does is he's like, well... Pokemon, guys, in the 90s, Pokemon happened. And I want to show you, I'm just going to play it out loud, maybe the funniest and most incorrect thing anyone has ever said. Um, I'm going to need to find it first. Japanese music and Japanese video games. Modern Japanese pop music as we know it today, J-pop, has its roots in the 90s. It was in the 90s that J-pop came to refer to all Japanese pop music. I think it's about The 90s here. saw a massive leap forward in the quality and proliferation of Japanese animation. Animes that to this day are considered some of the greatest ever made. Okay, so, okay. This is... I don't even know where to begin. So he's just, once again, he's, uh, he, uh, he's not just wrong, he's lying. Um, but I want you to listen to the list he's about to say. So just to be very clear, what he said were animes that are to this day considered to be some of the greatest ever made. I'm going to go back. To leap forward in the quality and proliferation of Japanese animation. Animes that to this day are considered some of the greatest ever made. So let, let me just point out one thing real quick. Is that this guy who claims to be an expert on Japan uh, called them animes. Also, earlier in the video, you know the anime, the most famous anime studio of all time, Toei? He called it Toei. Uh, so that's about the knowledge this guy has of anime. Um, so these are, according to him, some of the most... What did he say again? ...of leap forward in the quality and proliferation of Japanese animation. Animes that to this day are considered some of the greatest ever made. Okay, so these are some of the greatest animes ever made, according to Moon Channel. Cowboy Bebop. 
only popular in the West. Not that, not very well regarded in, in Japan. No one really remembers it. Dragon Ball Z. Dragon Ball Z. Uh, I guess it's popular. Most people don't think it's that. Like it's not that critically acclaimed, but it is popular. Detective Conan. Okay. Detective Conan. If you ask anyone in Japan to talk about Detective Conan. They won't think of the anime. They will think of the manga. Detective Conanism is considered a manga first thing in Japan. It is Dragon Ball also to some extent, or even no, to a large extent. Like th this guy just doesn't know manga exists. He never talks about manga the entire video. But manga is much more popular in Japan than anime is. Um, even for shows like Conan and uh, Dragon Ball Z. Uh, but yeah, no Co Conan especially. It like. The anime is really secondary material. Uh, it also wouldn't necessarily... I don't know why you'd say the anime is like one of the best of all time. Like the manga, I could see people saying like, yeah, the manga is a very popular, long-running manga. The anime, though, no, it's just a really strange thing to pick. Hey, man, Evangelion. Uh, then he, wait, 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 wait. That to this day are considered some of the greatest ever made. Cowboy Bebop, Dragon Ball Z, Detective Conan, Pokemon. E so Pokemon. <laughs> he thinks Pokemon... The anime, season one of the Pokemon anime, is considered one of the greatest anime ever made. Bro is stupid. <laughs> Bro knows nothing. This guy, th 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 he doesn't know, like, that's an insane statement. No, it's terrible. The Pokemon anime is popular with children because Pokemon is popular with children. But no, zero people think the anime is, like, one of the greatest of all time. It, obviously, because it's a tie-in show for a kid's toy. Like, no. It, it just factually no. Evangelion. Then he says Evangelion, which he's right about. That is true. Um, initial D and Initial D, he's also right about. Initial D and Evangelion, he is right. Those are two of the uh, you know very critically acclaimed anime that came out in the nineties. His reasoning doesn't really make any sense, especially when you consider that both Initial D and Evangelion had production issues, uh, especially Evangelion famously had production issues saying evangelion is the product of an economy that's doing well or, or or an economic sector that's doing well is a bit strange when anyone who knows anything about ava knows that it was a massive outlier at the time ava was an original tv anime of which there were very 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 few at the time if not zero almost all anime were manga adaptations um so it was an original tv anime uh, and it also aired super late at night and no one watched it and then it had massive production issues because of the um, the, the Tokyo gas attacks right the, setting the production timeline uh, You know fucked up. They had an episode almost ready to air then they couldn't air it because of the gas attacks So they were they were like a week behind schedule for the rest of production and they had to like massively rework the rest of the show Everyone knows this by now. I hope um, it wasn't a budget issue, but it was a production issue Um uh, where was I going with this? So yeah, so saying Ava is emblematic of the industry at the time is a bit strange because yeah, it was really very much an outlier. It was a trendsetter, but it was an outlier. And then when it first aired, no one watched it. What you have to remember is Ava became successful on reruns. Its initial run was, I believe at like 11 at night and some people watched it and it did have like some sort of cult status, but it wasn't massively popular. It was later when they aired reruns in the evening um, but not or in like the afternoon, I mean, but not like super late at night. That's when Ava actually became really popular. Um, and it was kind of a fluke. Like, I mean, obviously Ava is a masterpiece and deserves the popularity, uh, in my opinion, at least. Uh, but it, it very much was not emblematic of the anime industry at the time. Uh, and then Initial D is a different situation where Initial D had a popular manga and then the anime was even more popular. It, not like Conan, right? Conan, the manga, infinitely more popular than the, the anime. Uh, Initial D was a like semi-popular manga with with a following that got an adaptation that skyrocketed its popularity. And that's the only one out of all of these that I can see you saying was actually emblematic of a typical uh, show at the time. Even One Piece. And One Piece, yeah, the One Piece anime, uh, pretty important. I'll give you that as well. Fun fact, the first episode of One Piece, which aired in 1999, is closer in time to the end of the Vietnam... Okay, who cares? Um, the point being, this guy doesn't know anything about anime. He, he's, his ideas of the, the best anime of all time that came out in the 90s, he, he, he thinks like it's, it's, it's Pokemon and Detective Conan. 
Like, this guy doesn't know anything about anime. He just doesn't. And he's decided that he is qualified to make a two and a half hour long video about how anime is fascist propaganda. Um, he's, he's not qualified. He's not qualified to do that. He shouldn't. It's hubris to think that he can do this. Uh, so instead, because he doesn't have any knowledge, what he's going to do is he's just going to cherry pick. Uh, one second. Like, lumping in Pokemon with Ava in that um, analogy... If you don't watch anime, if you don't know anything about anime, like that's kind of like saying the the TV industry in America in 2013 was uh, amazing with some of the most acclaimed shows of all time, like Breaking Bad, House of Cards, and Teen Titans Go. It's kind of like doing that. <laughs> like, yeah, Teen Titans Go is popular, but it's not critically acclaimed at all. You know. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, back to this video. Well, this guy is going to continue to, to lie um, and make shit up and cherry pick. He then talks about uh, the Britpop movement for a while, which kind of seems like a weird tangent. Um, I'm trying to remember some of the more insane stuff he says. Uh, the, he, he starts actually schizoposting at a certain point. Um, he starts schizoposting about like the Japanese government influencing anime. Um, but the problem is that he doesn't really have any examples of this, which is really funny because it leads him to do some really funny stuff. So he identifies that Japan has something called the Japan Cool Fund, and it had other names before this, but Japan has, has arts funds that it uses to fund the arts. And because this guy's American, he doesn't realize that that's extremely normal, that every country has an arts fund uh, to fund, fund the arts. Like, he thinks that because the government funds it, that means it's propaganda because in America that's how it works. Like, not clearly, this guy has never watched like a European movie, <laughs> you know. Like, um, you can watch the most insane communist movie of all time, and then at the end, it pops up and is like funded by the German Arts Fund. You know, everyone knows this who's watched a movie before. Like, yeah, J Japan has arts funds that fund arts. Um, I don't really know, I don't really know why he thinks that's, that's like extremely crazy because they have like one sentence on their website that says that they have like policy aims, right? But they're not, they don't tell you what those policy aims are. And then if you actually look at the companies they fund, it's, it's like 10 gaming companies and Sony. It's Nintendo, Sega, Bandai Namco. Uh, it's like a bunch of, of, of gaming companies. Um, but... Uh, this guy, for some reason, just like desperately wanted to make this video about anime instead of gaming, even though he clearly knows more about Japanese games than he does. Like, why couldn't you just make this video about Japanese games? Is it because you know about Japanese games and you know it's, it wouldn't make any sense to call uh, Nintendo a Japanese nationalist country, uh, a company? Like Mario, Sonic, you know, Yakuza finding it kind of hard to draw na Japanese nationalist sentiments from this. But there's this whole other medium, anime, which I don't know anything about. Maybe I can cherry pick something. And you know what he cherry picks? It's extremely funny. So when he actually starts trying to desperately find something, when he's trying so hard to desperately find something to back up that, uh, th like, anime is doing conservative Japanese nationalist propaganda, these are his examples. Firstly, he keeps showing images of Love Live, but he never mentions Love Live, so I'm assuming he just, like, googled anime and, and Love Live popped up. I don't think it's, it's relevant, but these are what he brings up. So he has one Hatsune Miku song um, in which she is wearing an imperial, an imperial Japanese uniform. Um, and his argument is that uh, cosplayers might dress up as Hatsune Miku from this song's music video where she's wearing the uniform of the Imperial Japanese Army and that that and then he doesn't really know he doesn't really seem to know what that means like that might happen and 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 then and then and then what that's good and then Japan's gonna get its standing army back like he seems to make that implication like he's the one thing he really hates the idea of is Japan having an army uh Moon Channel really does not want Japan to have a military. He, he, he hates this concept. Every other country, you're allowed to have a military. Japan, don't even think about it because you did bad things in Korea in World War II. Uh, unlike any other, no other country did bad things in World War II. 
but Japan, uniquely evil, not allowed to have a standing military. Of course, this is not me excusing Japanese war crimes in World War II. What I am saying is, no one fucking gives a shit. No one outside of Japan cares if anyone, if they are allowed to have an army or not. It's a weird thing to make a big deal out of. Who gives a shit? Literally, who gives a shit? I don't. You shouldn't. Um, but he somehow thinks that if, if a cosplayer in America wears a Hatsune Miku cosplay with an armband with the Imperial Japanese flag on it, that this is going to manifest a standing army back in Japan. Joe Biden is going to see this and be like, give them an army back. I don't really understand what his point is. Like, he seems, he mentions that exact scenario. He says that, that like, what if a cosplayer dresses up with this, not knowing what it is? Okay, what if, what if? Like, tell me, tell me what consequences that's going to have. Because as far as I can tell, there were none. There were no consequences. What are you talking about? Um, so that's the first thing, is, is this one Hatsune Miku song, which obviously Hatsune Miku has a bunch of songs. Then he has this sequence which is a video of Japanese naval officers playing the um, Evangelion opening. Um, and then he flashes up a bunch of stuff. He flashes up a bunch of images in this montage. Um, and, and most of these images are just recruitment, uh, recruitment ads, internal, like, like Japanese recruitment ads. So that is not soft power, right? That is, that is just using anime to, to recruit Japanese people to the Japanese self-defense forces. That is just not what your video is about. You're just showing these things because they seem aesthetically related to what you're talking about. Like, hey, look, it's anime and military in the same picture. But, like, in reality, it's just not what the... Like, this is not soft power. That is simply not soft propaganda. It's not propaganda. I mean, maybe it is propaganda, but it's internal propaganda. It's not projecting soft power. It's just trying to get Japanese people to join the SDF. Um, and then he also... Let me see. Let me, let me keep scrolling. So... Now, when I say the Japanese... Oops, I scrolled too far. Uh, sorry. In other words, be ja this is This is bad podcasting. Um, he has a, a, another recruitment poster. Um, I believe this is it. Yes, I'm going to mute the video. But th this, is, this is the video of the Japanese Navy playing um, A Cruel Angel's Thesis. Right, okay, so he flashes up these images. The first one is a recruitment poster in Japanese. Then the second image is a poster for the anime Gate. Now, pay attention to that because Gate is going to come back again. Um, and then the third picture is another recruitment poster for the JSDF, but this time using characters from Shirobako. Um, again, that's just a recruitment poster for the Japanese um, self-defense forces. It's not anime as um, soft power propaganda promoting Japanese militarism uh, to, to the West. Like, the poster is in Japanese. I don't know what you want me to tell you. It's a recruitment poster. They're not sending these posters to America to recruit Americans to the Japanese self-defense forces. Like, what is your point here, buddy? It doesn't make any fucking sense. Then, he's going to go on for, for, a, for, for a while about gate. He, he really wants to talk about gate for some reason. He really, he's, he's desperate to talk about gate. Now, if you don't know, gate is an anime that literally no one gives a fuck about. But this is his logic. He says, Gate is a show in which a gate opens up to a fantasy world in the middle of Tokyo and a bunch of fantasy monsters come pouring through and attacking people. So the Japanese self-defense forces fight the monsters off, but then they follow the monsters back in through the gate and fight a war against the fantasy monsters. And in this anime, the Japanese self-defense forces are considered to be the good guy. Therefore... This is Japanese propaganda. How do we know this? Well, here's how. You just follow the money. Guys, Gate was an anime. And that anime ended up on Crunchyroll. And you know who owns Crunchyroll? So, so just to get this straight. Gate is a, there was a TV anime. And then, among many different distributors, one of them was Crunchyroll. And Crunchyroll is owned by Sony, and Sony has received a subsidy from the Japanese Arts Fund in the past. Therefore, the Japanese government definitely had direct authorial editorial control over the production of Gate. That is his argument. Can you understand how fucking absurd that is? It's insane. It's also, even if it was true, it wouldn't matter, because 
uh, no one gives a fuck about gate. There's the only thing anyone knows about gate is that once one guy made a video about how the first episode wasn't very good and it has like a million views. That is literally the only thing anyone cares about with regards to gate. Gate is not a popular anime. It was never a popular anime and it's completely forgotten by the anime watching public. No one remembers gate or gives a fuck about gate because it was shit. <laughs> Like, I don't know what you want me to tell you. He thinks Gate is extremely sinister, when in reality, it's just um, a fucking show set in Japan with military action. So, of course, it's going to involve the Japanese military. If the US makes a, makes an action show about the military, it's going to involve the US military. Like, I don't, know what he, I don't know what his point is. I really don't understand. What's his fucking point? So that's the only anime he has, by the way. He doesn't know any other anime that involved the, the, the Japanese military. Which is really funny, because coincidentally, what he doesn't know is that there is an anime that is exactly about what this video is about. And that anime is called Outbreak Company. And if you don't know what Outbreak Company is about, it's very similar to Gate. It's about um, a, a, a portal to a fantasy world being discovered in Japan. And the Japanese military deciding to project soft power to the fantasy world by hiring a bunch of otaku to spread anime, manga, and visual novels and otaku media to the fantasy world so that they'll become infatuated with Japan. He doesn't know this anime exists, but I think it would maybe give him a psychotic break if he did know because it's so perfect as an example for what his video is about, but he doesn't know it exists, which is so funny. And Outbreak Company is a better show than Gate. It's still not amazing, but it is better. Um, because it is actually, if you actually watch the show, it's a little bit self-critical of otaku, of the Japanese self-defense forces. There's even a really funny joke in the show where one of the, ca the characters are talking about the anime Minami K, and then one of them's like, eh, you know, I just thought season three kind of was a bit of a letdown and then looks exact directly in the camera. And that's very funny because the director of Minami K Season 3 was also the director of Outbreak Company. Um, <laughs> anyway. Uh, and then after that, he starts talking about how there are leftists online who are sympathetic to Japanese nationalist causes. And that this must be because they're weebs. I don't know what he's talking about. I think he's just making stuff up. Maybe he's talking about me not giving a fuck if Japan has an army or not. I think that he, like, is... It's, it's very strange. Like, I've not seen... I've just not seen this. I've just, I've just not ever seen any, like, leftist otaku be like, uh, comfort women never existed, Nanking didn't happen, um, glory to Imperial Japan. Like, I've seen people say that, but they tend to be right-wing. Uh, it's... It, yeah. Oh, by the way, did you notice? Those are all the examples he has. So it's literally just... A few military recruitment posters that have anime images on them. Um, one Hatsune Miku music video and one anime. Like, that's the only examples he has. The whole video is two and a half hours long. And the only examples he has are one Hatsune, Mi <laughs> Hatsune Miku music video and one anime that no one gives a fuck about. That is, that is garbage. Uh, then he talks about some stuff with statues remembering comfort women you know blah 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 some kind of irrelevant stuff and then finally he's like well i like um i i like uh fucking little witch academia so that's something i don't know really why he brought that up it kind of comes out of nowhere and at the end he's like look i'm not saying if you like anime you're you're consuming japanese military propaganda uh you know uh, it doesn't seem like most anime has anything to do with the Japanese military. Uh, so really what he's saying is, yeah, no, unless you really, really try to cherry pick examples, <laughs> everything I'm saying is bullshit. But I tried to cherry pick examples and then failed because I could only really find two. <sighs> it's a terrible fucking video. It's just such a bad video. I, I, I had, there's, there's even more issues with it that I haven't even gone through. Like this is just a, a, a quick summary. I don't know. I don't know. I think this guy should be, should have a James, like, this is a Summerton level event to me. Like, I think this guy deserves a long ass fucking call out video for just making shit up. Anyway, that's the end of this rant because I'm starting to lose my voice.
it's like been hours and I'm still obsessively thinking about that bad anime video. I left a comment. I saw that this guy had been replying to other comments, so I left a comment. My comment may be worded quite aggressively. I think that nothing I say in this comment is wrong. I said, it's so weird that you tried to make this video about the anime industry rather than the games industry, when you clearly don't know anything about anime, but are experienced with Japanese games. And you showed multiple times in the video that the games industry received most of the funding from these government councils. Is it because you couldn't cherry pick a Mario game with the JSTF in it? Like, if your whole point is that anime is militarization propaganda, how come you could only find one show, Gate, a terrible show no one cares about, and one Hatsune Miku music video to support your claims? I don't know why you thought you were qualified to talk on this subject when you can't even pronounce Toei correctly, and seem to think that the original Pokemon anime is critically acclaimed to the same degree as Ava and Initial D. To which, Moon Channel responded, saying, This comment, and the ones like it, are missing the point. The fact that outright pro-militarization, aesthetically anime stuff exists isn't the propaganda I speak of, though it is a part of it. The point is that the Japanese government purposefully utilizes anime, including but not limited to the political stuff, to shape its image abroad for the purposes of soft power, to create the appearance of a monolithic but magical Japan, which it can leverage for its policy purposes. Every country does it, and I fear many anime fans may be missing the forest for the trees. A problem in my own communication here that I hope I can improve for future videos. Yes, that is a problem in your own communication, because that was, like, two sentences. And you made a two and a half hour long video essay, in which you didn't fucking say that. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I then responded back, that's the thing, I'm not criticizing the overall message of the video, I mostly agree with it, which is true. I think it should be patently obvious that uh, Japan uses its cultural exports like anime video games and music as a form of soft power, obviously. Um, that is not the same thing as saying that's a bad thing though. Like, as it is brought up in the video, uh, you know who else is very successful at soft power is Thailand with their so-called gastro diplomacy or culinary diplomacy, right? You've probably all heard about this by now. The Thai government funds Thai restaurants in other countries. Um, like, that is explicitly a government propaganda soft power campaign and yet you know, there's, what's the negative, of, like, there's, we get Thai, we get tasty food, it may not be super authentic traditional Thai food, like, that. you can say that there are problems with that, because it gives people a false idea of what authentic Thai cuisine is actually like, but, like, really, that's a, that's not a serious issue on the global stage, enough to really complain about, right? Like, just saying, hey, this thing is used to project soft power, is not real, like really a very interesting thing to say because, like, yeah, okay, and you know, I responded, yeah. So I'm not criticizing the overall message, which I agree with. What I have a problem with is your research and fact checking methodology. The YouTube comments is maybe not the best place to have a nuanced conversation about this, but since you mentioned that other anime fans have brought up similar criticisms. I think it's clear to see that there are some concerns here. That's all I said, because I was like, I don't want to get into listing mistakes in the video in the comment section, to which he didn't respond. But, uh, you know, so that's that's an additional thing to add to the story. This guy, I mean, I kind of, I kind of respect still responding to comments on a video that has 200,000 views, but I also might consider it molding, because he is getting defensive in the comments, and not just to me. To other people as well. Getting defensive when you made a poorly researched video about a subject you know nothing about? Very strange. Very strange and unusual. Anyway, the reason I'm recording this segment in addition to the previous segment was partially to talk about that, res that comment response, but also to expand upon that in a particular way, which is that I, I very much dislike this video, and the main thing that I dislike about this video 
is the fact that it currently has 200,000 views and it's probably going to end up getting like a million views because it has a very provocative title and thumbnail and it's a long ass YouTube video essay with a guy with an authoritative voice acting like he knows what he's talking about to an audience of people who have no idea of what the fuck any of this is, right? And so I'm, I'm pretty sure that like a million people are going to watch this video and just eat that slop up. And personally, I don't like that. That's disinformation or misinformation, never attribute to malice what can be attributed to incompetence. You know, I'm sure the guy has just, just uh, accidentally made a bad YouTube video. I'm sure this is not supposed to be anti-otaku propaganda, um, which is the weird thing. Clearly he's hostile towards otaku, but not on purpose. I'm, I'm very confused. There's so many confusing things in this video. Like, when he brings up anime that are directly militarization propa- or like related to military propaganda, like Gate or High, High School Fleet, like High School Fleet especially, but Gate as well, are not super popular mainstream anime. Like, those are not your, your spy families, your, your, you know, whatever. Those, those, those are not that, <laughs> you know, those are, those are comparatively niche otaku works, especially Haifuri, right? Like, those aren't, Jap- they simply are not, if they are Japanese government propaganda, they are extremely ineffective Japanese government propaganda because no one fucking cares about Haifuri outside of Japan, other than me. Uh, yeah, no one gives a fuck, because it's a niche otaku work. It's, it's clearly not the super popular anime that he's talking about in terms of mi- being military propaganda. I mean, one of the biggest, one of the biggest Japanese cultural exports is One Piece, which, I mean, I don't know that much about the politics of One Piece, but I know enough to know that it's not exactly pro-nationalist military propaganda. Anyway, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. I just simply don't know. There's so much stuff to talk about that's wrong with this video. He like he he doesn't understand how the anime industry works. He thinks I, I don't know what he thinks. Does he think anime falls out of the sky? Does he not realize it's it's almost all adapted? Like does he think that production committees like I don't know what he I don't he probably doesn't know that production committees exist. But what does he think they do? How much editorial control do, does he think they have? Because like if most anime con- is either adapted from a manga or a light novel, right? And when it comes to manga, famously, mangaka have an unprecedented level of authorial control com- compared to like the Western adaptations of stuff. Um, there was a lot of talk about that surrounding Attack on Titan and how it was bad because the mangaka is bad, right? Now, Attack on Titan is definitely nationalistic, militarist propaganda. I'll I'll give you that one for free. No question. Uh, It's also fucking garbage. Uh, I I don't think any of the anime I like are really really that. I feel like Hidemari Sketch? I don't know. But he's saying that it's trying to present an image of Japan as sort of a mystical land where everything's good and chill. Which I think is just a bit silly, because, like... If, if I think if anyone if anyone believes that they're kind of retarded, right? Surely, surely they're kind of stupid. But also, secondly to that, there are a lot of like it's it's this this strange cycle where where some people have this image of of like so called weeaboos who think Japan is exactly like anime, right? These are generally people who haven't watched any anime who have invented this character of the weeaboo who thinks Japan is just like anime. No one actually thinks that. However, it's worth noting, there are a lot of, like, autobiographical manga and anime that do present a pretty grounded, realistic view of Japan. Famously, k is based on Yamada Naoko's, like, or not based on, but she didn't write the manga, but she used, she referred to her own experiences of being a high school girl in Japan directing k like, pretty infamously. Uh... I mean, there are a lot of anime like this, especially anime that are about the anime community. It's like, like Otaku no Video, for example, which is like borderline a documentary. 
or Genshi Ken or um, I don't know, Dojin work or um, you know, any of those 2000s anime about being an otaku like uh, I, I don't fucking know, even Lucky Star for example, like going to Comic Cat and that's another thing, I'll talk about that in a second uh, but there's there's a lot of anime that are just fairly realistic depictions of the anime fandom uh, or, or ta- otaku community uh, obviously stylized and exaggerated for the purposes of entertainment but nonetheless even like Oraimo is kind of that right I mean maybe there aren't that many cute girls and that are super into uh, immortal gay but <laughs> anyway uh, so something else I was about to say I was gonna say something else if you if you watch like I don't know Go and Lagan and Dragon Ball and you think that's what Japan is like like what do you mean of course that's the those are fantasies in fact, most anime that gets produced these days is the fantasy genre. I don't really, I just don't understand what he's talking about. Like, what do you mean presenting an, a, a view of Japan? Like, one of the famous things about the anime industry is how terrible animators are treated. Everyone knows this. Also, there are so many anime about how much life sucks, right? <laughs> like, uh, fucking NHK, which is pretty popular about how much it sucks to be... Japanese kind like kind of NHK is a little bit about that you gotta admit you gotta admit it's got a little bit of that in it I mean obviously it's about a lot of things but like there's a there's a it, it doesn't exactly present a super idealized view of Japan even going back like Akira it's not you know you know like I don't know what to tell you I don't know what to tell you initial D Kaiji I don't know I could go on there are so many anime that are about bad people doing bad things and there are video games about the same like no simply factually no there is no homogenous idea in anime of an idealized japanese life it just does not exist it can, there are some times when similar things happen but on a, statistically i would just say no that is not the case i don't know where you got that idea from and then there's another example of so how this guy just doesn't know how the anime industry works, right, or, or, or anything, which is it's just confusing, right, because I, I personally consider there to be sort of two concurrent spheres. There is sort of the, if we talk about anime, you can separate it into daytime anime and nighttime anime or late night anime. So there are going to be shows uh, like the popular children's shows which air in the morning, popular family shows which air around dinner time, and uh, some shows in the evening, you know. And then there are the otaku-oriented shows which are going to air at like 3 a.m., right? Like, you really can't lump those in as the same sort of thing. Oh, another, ex- hold on a minute, a, a perfect example of really popular anime that is about how much Japanese culture sucks, Oshinoko, that just, that came out recently, okay, I don't fucking know, bro just doesn't know what he's talking about, anyway, uh, yeah, where was I going with this, not to mention, by the way, that there was a high degree of otaku who have moved on from anime almost completely, and mainly interface with otaku works via gacha gay, gacha games, and VTubers, and I, I really don't think you can argue that the Japanese government has a strong say over what Hololive is doing, but maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Uh, so the video is like outdated in the fact that it doesn't even mention Gacha and VTubers, two of the, you know, biggest modern or ta- anyway. There's so many problems with the video, and then yeah, the fact that he doesn't seem to know like. Where where does anime come from? Who makes anime? Of course, it's a bunch of really hardworking, underpaid, overworked um, animators. But prior to that, where does the story come from? Well, these days, it's almost always from either a manga or a light novel. In the case of a manga, like mangaka don't spring up out of nowhere like mushrooms. They don't just grow when the when the rain falls. They cut their teeth normally in the doujin scene, which is a grassroots community, uh, you know, with, with no corporate ties, with very few corporate ties. 
that's that's very commonplace for mangaka to come from from the fan work scene uh you know and 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 where where do the light novels come from did they generally come from shosets kaninaro a website where anyone can post a light novel you know like these are not corporate this is not some corporate thing it's very much at the center this community driven you know uh how do i explain this like like the the boundary between creator and fan is is less strictly delineated than you would you would imagine if you didn't know anything about about how this community works right like the the way that comicat works like it it's not a convention like a western convention is it's a, it's a it's a dojin thing you know it's mostly porn first of all and secondly it's all fan i don't know it's just it's it, like that's the big thing it's comicat it's a bunch of independent uh, non corporate mostly there are some corporate stuff at comicat but mostly independent circles uh, of of fans making fan works and that is the center of otaku culture is is like is comicat uh, that is the single unite, uniting cultural moment. Like, I don't know what to tell you, man. It's not complicated. I mean, I guess it is a little complicated, but it's not that complicated. Like, simply, it is not propaganda created by the Japanese government. Like, it just isn't. The, and the Japanese government is not even a big fan of it because most anime is fucking degenerate. Like, it's not something that anyone would be proud of. It's, like, kind of gross and... Also, most of it sucks. <laughs> like, you're you're not gonna find the Japanese government endorsing, you know, uh, reincarnated as my little sister's pantsu. <laughs> you're not gonna like, you know what show? You know what? You know what was a show that did okay? Reincarnated as a vending machine in another world. Like that was a show that I watched. I really somehow doubt that the Japanese government had a hand in the in the production and distribution of that show. I just really doubt it. It seems like a weird thing for them to spend any money on. I'm just going to be honest. And if they if they did, I don't think that they're doing a good job of succeeding in in soft power cuz that show is fucking bizarre. Uh but surprisingly good. <laughs> anyway, I think I've gotten all of that off my chest, but this is the thing I wanted to talk about. Is what do I do about this? Cuz yeah, I can rant about it you know, a good few hours into a 12-hour podcast to the point where, you know, maybe maybe 20 people will, will see it. And sure, to you, to you 20 people, you get to listen to me rant incoherently like you would expect from this 12-hour long podcast. But what I don't like about the video is the fact that it's going to get a million views and that no one is going to challenge it and he's not going to issue any corrections because he hasn't done that yet. So why would he do that in the future? And I think this is the this is an appropriate time to engage in in a little bit of call out culture, a little bit of cancel culture. I think someone needs to make a call out post, and no one else is qualified and willing. Like no one else is gonna do it. The people who are gonna do it are gonna be idiots who are like, no, actually Japan is based. Like no, Japan is not that based. Japan is not based. It's the otaku community that is based. Japan as a country is not based, right? It's it, it's 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 got lots of problems, and no one no one reasonable denies that. Um, someone needs to come and be like, look, I don't fucking I I just want to point out every factual error and add additional context. And so it would be easy to just make a video about it if this wasn't two and a half hours long. Like, what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to make a response video to this? You know? Like, that's... I just don't know what format that video should take. That's the problem. How do I respond to this? It's it's actually impossible. It's just... You made something that is just too long and labyrinthine for me to, to have any reasonable recourse to, to make a response. You know what I mean? So I don't know what... I don't know what the fuck... I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I got I got to think about something. I don't know. Okay, so it's been the next day 
um, now, and I've, I've, I've stopped caring about this anime video. I've decided that this is actually a good thing, because I've now watched the whole video and thought about it for like a day, and so I know all the arguments in the video, which means when I inevitably hear someone parrot an argument from that video, I will know immediately, oh, this person is an idiot, I should stop talking to them. Because they just they just heard a YouTube video essay with an authoritative tone of voice say something and immediately integrated it into their worldview without any skepticism or anything. Um, so I know that person is an idiot, which is a good thing. It's good. It's it's so this has provided me with tools to identify idiots. Um, so I will not be making some sort of call out post video. Um, uh, I, I will not be doing any of that. You guys are the only ones that will hear about my complaints with this video. And uh, we're going to leave it there. We're going to leave it there with Moon Channel. Um, I am going to hope I never see another one of his videos in my life. Uh, as for me, I, I'm in a bit of a predicament. I'm in a bit of a predicament. Because I am hungry... And there is food in the house. And that might not sound like a predicament. But the predicament is... <laughs> I don't want any of the food in the house. I want different food. I want a different food entirely. Um, but primarily what I actually mean is... There, there is food, but there are only ingredients. There's not just food, there's only ingredients. So if I want to make something, I'm going to have to make something. And it will probably have to be a stew of some kind. I mean, it will, it will definitely have to be a stew of some kind. And uh, I don't know if I want a stew of some kind right now. It will also definitely be, be on rice, which is fine. It's just that I've, be, I've been eating a lot of rice. I've been eating nothing but rice, and I'm getting a little, a little bored of rice. Um, eh, I'm overreacting, probably. I just don't want to chop up a bunch of vegetables. That's the main key here. I don't, I don't, I can't be bothered to do that. I don't want to chop up a bunch of vegetables. That's too many vegetables. What I could do, I could, eh, no, I can't really do that because I only have rice. If I had bread, I would, I, I could make like a chicken soup. That would be nice. A chicken soup, dip some bread in it. I have, I have chicken and I have water and, and vegetables. That's chicken soup, baby. But... Not really much point in eating chicken soup without bread to dip in it, is there now? No, there is not. So, I have to either go to the shops. Oh yeah, but this is a, there's a problem with that. See, I would want to go to the shops, but the problem is I'm too stinky to go to the shops. I'm too stinky. I've been wearing this, this set of clothes for like two days now, and it's not good. And the reason is because I don't have any other clean clothes. Because all the other clothes are in the laundry, and they haven't been washed. Because washing the clothes is dot smites chore, uh, because I don't know how to operate the washing machine here, so I don't have any other clean clothes, which means there's no point in taking a shower. Because even though I take a shower, I'll just be getting back into stinky clothes, and it won't have reduced my stinkiness. So I'm too stinky to go to the shop, but I can't reduce my stinkiness because I'd have to wash clothes. And even if I did figure out how to operate the washing machine through trial and error. Uh, which I'm worried I might break something, but if I did manage to do that, then what? Then I'll have a bunch of wet clothes instead that I can't wear. Like, yeah. Also, it will take like an hour and a half or however long you know washing machine takes. So going outside not very viable. Other options, I could order groceries to be delivered to the house, or I could even just order food to be delivered to the house in general. Now, last time I came here, I did do that. So I know it's possible, and I know I know I can do it. Like, I know the app I would have to install. I know the address and everything. Of course, it costs money. It costs a lot of money for what you get, and I'm trying not to waste money. So um, I'm trying to really avoid that situation, even though it's very tempting. It's also kind of scary. Like, what if the guy tries to speak to me in uh, Simlish, you know? Then what am I going to do? I don't know Simlish. So it looks like the best option is to bite the bullet and make some sort of stew. Um, what meat will this stew contain? I have some chicken and I have some pork, but I don't have that much chicken and I don't have that much pork. 
Can you put chicken and pork together? Will that kill me? Will it kill me if I put both chicken and pork into a stew? I don't know. I have no idea. Somehow I doubt that it will kill me. I have a strange feeling that I'll be okay even if I do that. Um, so I'll have to think about that. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, it's just kind of an awkward, awkward situation with food. It's kind of awkward. Just a little bit awkward sort of a situation. Uh, but it was fine. Oh yeah, I completely forgot. I do have one other actual, actual reason besides laziness why I didn't want to make a stew. Which is that I have a bunch of dried beans. I have a bunch of dried beans that I wanted to make into a, a stew. But they're soaking in the fridge. They're not ready to cook yet. They're still soaking in the in in the water. I, I I just put them in to eat tomorrow. So if I use them now, then I've used them up. <laughs> or, or what I mean is, if I if I make a stew now, I don't have those ingredients to make a stew tomorrow with the beans in it. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? And that's a, that that then I don't know what to do with all the beans that I just soaked overnight. You know, so that's a problem. So now I'm just kind of like I don't know what to do. I, okay, well, we're nine hours into this podcast now. You know what that means. It's time for Marxism. Uh, so, good, good. welcome to the Marxism segment of the podcast. Uh, I've been watching these videos by this guy called What is Politics? This guy makes very long videos about um, leftist political theory. And I got interested in his videos because he made a series... Critiquing the Dawn of Everything by David Graeber and David Wengrow. And I liked these, from what I watched, I only watched two of these videos. It's like a five-part series. Um, but I, I agreed with his critiques of the book, which is that it uses certain... It, it twists certain facts in order to support an anti-materialist reading of history, which I disagree with. Like David Graeber's uh, famous quote, which is something along the lines of the, the truth of the world is that it is what we make it, um, it is not something I agree with at all. <clears throat> I think Marx has some sort of quote where he, he said something like, uh, like m- m- men have ideas, but those ideas don't come from nowhere. I think that that's not what he said, but it's something along those lines, uh, uh, talking about how like material conditions influence what sort of ideas can flourish in any particular time in history. Uh, which is much closer to, to what I believe, although I would go even more anti-humanist than that. Uh, but then I became interested in what is politics's uh, videos on... Uh, part one is called Why Every Communist Country is a One-Party Dictatorship, which is his most popular video. And then part two is called Why the Russian Revolution Failed, colon, When Rich Kids Do All the Socialism. And uh, although I thought the first part of the video was generally pretty good, um, the second half of this video, or the, or the second video, I thought had some issues. And it's starting to... The, the strange thing is that I'm having trouble figuring out this, this guy's uh, politics. He seems to have a fairly muddled, incoherent uh, political viewpoint that I'm struggling to comprehend. Because first of all, He's strangely, he seems to be like vaguely anti-woke. I'm confused. He kind of makes allusions to that. It's a bit strange. Another thing, I'm I'm almost 100% certain that he's some sort of ANCOM because he, he keeps bigging up Bakunin and Kropotkin and calling them geniuses and whatever. Uh, and he's, he's, he's very critical he also bigs up Proudhorn. I don't. That's not how you pronounce his name. Proudhorn or whatever. I don't fucking know. Uh, he, I'm pretty sure this guy's an anarchist. He's definitely not like a Marxist Leninist uh, or anything in that tendency. I'm pretty sure this guy's an anarchist. But then weird, and he's also big into anthropology. Uh, he, so he's that kind of anarchist, which I can relate to. But then weirdly. He seems to hate postmodernism, specifically Foucault, and he doesn't have any coherent reasons as to why he hates postmodernists. Um, he just hates them for for no real. Re- he doesn't seem to have ever like really made an attempt to read any of their work. He doesn't. His arguments are just very incoherent and 
it, they boil down to putting on a funny voice and saying some some stuff that vaguely sounds like an argument. Do you know what I mean? Uh, but but he doesn't seem to have any coherent arguments against like Foucault, and that's the only one he's ever brought up. But he he's now used three different videos where he's had a, a short intersection where he just randomly insults Foucault for no reason. Like he just shoehorns it in there, and uh, it's very I have no I have no real idea why he's doing that. Um, which is very confusing, because you'd imagine if you're the type of anarchist who is like, uh, oh, you know, uh, anarchism doesn't just mean reproducing the exact same society, but factories are communally owned or whatever. Uh, it means a complete transformation of society, and in particular, we can look towards indigenous ways of life to get some ideas of how a, a, an egalitarian society organized without the same the hierarchies of, of capitalism and whatever may operate you would imagine that you'd love Foucault because Foucault is like hey you know there were, capitalism isn't the only power dynamic in our society there is also coercive power in the school system in the mental health system in the the healthcare the hospital system you know etc which is exactly the sort of things you want to be criti i don't know guy makes really that's the first thing that tipped me off that this guy might be an idiot um but the but then i've been this is why i'm recording this section is that i i in this video about why the russian revolution failed there was some really interesting stuff don't get me wrong and this guy's clearly well read um I, he's brought up a lot of historical information that I wasn't previously aware of about the build-up to the Russian Revolution. Um, that is that is fascinating. But he's clearly trying to spin a particular narrative. And part of this narrative is this idea. So, prior to the Russian Revolution, there were peasant communes in Russia. And when socialists, Russian socialists saw this, they were like, well, a lot of our society is peasants. In fact, like most of our society is peasants. So if we're going to do a revolution to overthrow the monarchy, we're going to need the peasants on our side. And hey, they're already organized into communes. Let's go talk to them and try and convince them to become Marxists or, or socialists or whatever. And then the peasants, this is his narrative. The peasants were like, who are these weird outsiders? And sort of ignored them. And so the rich kid Russians, like... Oh, Engels was bad because he was he was rich. They got so mad at the peasants that they were like, "Fuck the peasants! We need to industrialize so we can get rid of the peasants." Which is uh, seems like a very strange narrative to me. But in particular, he talks about this debate between a Russian socialist who I've forgotten the name of and Engels, where according to this, according to what is politics. Um, Engels was 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 saying, nope, you're you you're you're not allowed to do socialism until you go through capitalism, and the Russian guy was like, so you just want us to to sit here and and suffer through brutal capitalism, like fuck you, I'm gonna do socialism anyway, um, and and then, you know, there's definitely room for critique of Engels there. There's there's a hundred percent room. This is where you'd say, yeah, that is a kind of a strange argument to make. Like, let's talk about how you might successfully have a, a better mode of economic organization uh, without having to go through capitalism. But no, he doesn't do that. Instead, what is politics goes on a rant about how Engels was the son of a businessman and he was a rich kid who hated the peasants for some reason, which is not true. Like, I don't know specifically of this debate between Engels and a Russian peasant supporting populist uh, Narotnik or whatever they were called. Um, but I do know a little bit about Marxism, and I can give you a pretty clear argument of what Engels probably would have said, and that would be this. So, so let me just clarify that what is politics literally calls the peasants' communes communi communism, which I understand it is technically communism, but uh, he says he said it at one point in the video. There were already a bunch of communists and he was referring to the peasants' communes. Um, so this is why Engels would have, would have been against that idea. He, so what is politics hasn't understood 
the Marxist conception of freedom um, via the development of human powers, that that's what freedom is. Uh, so according to, to Marx, uh, according to what is politics, freedom is, is, is purely freedom to make your own decisions. Just, he calls it decision-making power. And I think that's a reasonable idea of what freedom is. Um, but let's take a look at how, okay, what would Marx's response to this be? What would Mar Engels' response to this be? He might say, yeah, sure, um, a sort of peasant communism, they might be free from, from coercive authority. True. Like, they might not have anyone barking down their throats telling them what to do. But to what extent are they actually capable of making their own decisions when their productive capacities are so undeveloped? In other words, uh, you know, they have to spend because they 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 are simply technologically under the uh, undeveloped they just have to spend most of their time working the land in order to feed themselves right like they don't have enough they don't have a, a choice in that matter like they might need to or they might be able to organize how that grain is distributed amongst them and etc but at the end of the day the amount of socially necessary labor time in that society is extremely high and therefore you know they they aren't really very free at all and that a, a free society ought to have highly developed productive capacities to the point where the socially necessary labor time is extremely low as low as possible that way when people aren't being coerced by some human authority they also just have truly free time where they don't have to work they're able to do whatever they want because the amount of productive capacity of one person is so high that the human needs can easily be met, right? And that's why Marx, to, that's the fundamental reason why um, Marx thought that communism would happen in rich countries, countries where the, the, the um, productive powers are highly developed. Because in order to, to, uh, to abolish uh, wage labor, you, you need to have highly developed productive capacities, right? So the people who don't have to work all the time. So that's the argument that Engels would have made. Engels would have said, like, right, you might be, okay, there, there, there are two kinds of unfreedom here. There is, there is freedom from human authority, but there's also the matter of free time that isn't uh, completely used on, on socially necessary labor. And that while capitalism might seem... Uh, you know, brutal compared to these peasants' communes. In reality, with a little bit of push from organized labor, very quickly these people would have more actually free time than they did prior to the introduction of capitalism. Now, do I actually agree with that? I'm not so sure. I think there are a number of counter arguments you could make to Engels there. You could take an ecological perspective. You could say, well, those capitalist industrial developments don't come for free. They come at a high, steep ecological price, which is not, uh, you know, not something to be dismissed easily. Uh, you know, at a certain point, everyone's lives are going to be made worse by the destruction of, of the, the, the environment, right? Uh, and, and I think that's, that's something that Engels obviously wouldn't have considered because they didn't know about climate change and stuff back then. There are other arguments about uh, social relations between people. You could make an argument that, like, uh, wage labor is is much is even though the socially necessary labor time would be lower in a, a factory, especially a highly developed technologically uh, factory, than it is in a uh, on a, a peasant's commune. Um, the actual work being done communally. Is, is an entirely different beast, right? It's not this, like factory work is some of the worst kinds of thing a human can do, right? The, the highly, div the division of labor being, being uh, extremified to the point where people are effectively turned into machines who just do one repetitive, boring job over and over and over again versus communal uh, f agricultural work where people are chatting, you know, the work is it's a leisurely pace and it's diverse and involves problem solving to account for your environment. And because you're not coerced by a manager, you can solve those problems yourself. People, it, it's worked into social rituals and ways of life. You know, for example, 
if the grain needs milling into flour, that might be something that happens communally. Everyone gets together and mills the grain together, with, you know, and, and that forms a strong basis for a communal society to, to get along together. It's some sort of social event where people share news and sing and, and, and share gossip and whatever. Like, that's, like there's, there's arguments like that where the nature of work under capitalism is worse than the nature of work in a, in, in a that communal peasants would be doing. So they're not directly comparable. That's a counter argument you could make. And finally, you could make an argument that free time under capitalism isn't actually free either uh, because of all sorts of various reasons, right? Like you're, you're actually spending that time just recovering from labor. Uh, your boss can call you into the factory or the, the job at any time. So you're sort of just waiting on your boss. And then even if you're talking about a highly developed like economy, like like modern Western economies, like what are you actually doing in your free time? You might be scrolling a social media site and therefore generating profit for a capitalist, you know, who's harvesting your data and your eyeballs through ads. You might be watching some sort of uh, product produced by the culture industry, which is programming you, uh, pacifying you against uh, radical activity. If you want to, that's my, my very minimal understanding of Adorno there. Um, you know, all, all sorts of other uh, arguments that, that ca- free time under capitalism isn't actually free. Like there are, there are various, you know, there, there are a few things that you could, you could snap back at angles and say there. But what is politics doesn't do any of that because he hasn't read any of those people. He doesn't believe, he doesn't really understand Marx, so he doesn't know about Marx's conception of freedom. He should watch the Raymond Gauss lectures on Marx in order to understand that. Um, so he doesn't know why why Engels he like to him, Engels arguing that capitalism is a necessary step and and preferable to feudal communal peasant life is just nonsense because he doesn't he doesn't understand Engels' conception of freedom right, uh, you know. So he needs to do he needs to do a lot of stuff. He needs to do a lot of stuff that he ha- he needs to do work that he hasn't done and he's not willing to do. And he's much more willing to just say, well, Engels was rich and that's why he was he was laid bad. And he should have just let the peasants do everything. Like he 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 does the thing that a lot of anarchists in this vein do, and which I am also guilty of at some points, and I think a lot of people are, where you call out everyone for for thinking that indigenous people or peasants are some sort of a magical unicorn whatever who are who are too pure and you know noble savage type stuff but then you still kind of do it anyway you still kind of say well they are better than us though like i don't know I, maybe that's not that important the point being he can't get into any of the interesting arguments about whether Engels was right or wrong like i can do all of the counter arguments to Engels i provided I can then provide a Marxist counter argument back to them, at least some of them, like their ecological argument. You could provide a Marxist counter argument that, like in a in a, a well managed economy, something something uh, clean energy. I don't know. It's kind of hard to argue against that. Actually, I kind of owned myself there. I kind of owned Engels there. I kind of owned straw man ang- straw Engels and straw Marx. You kind of got owned straw Marx. How do you feel? Anyway, I just I just needed to respond to this video because because he's never gonna listen to me. What is politics is never gonna hear me hear me give give the 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 Marxist answer. So so now you do. Now you you get to hear me talk respond to a video like a, a four hour long video that you haven't seen in the middle of a twelve hour long podcast. That's what you get to have. In fact, what is politics does does just generally misunderstand Marx's like whole deal with the development of productive capacities like he doesn't he doesn't seem to think it's a big like a big deal or an important part of Marx which is very different from how I conceive of Marx like he he thinks that when when he he's brought that up before he's just called it like high-tech communism he hasn't he doesn't seem to have realized that it's actually an extremely important core tenant of how uh, Marx conceived of communism Right. Like he's he when he tried to he tried to explain why Marx thought that ca- like the contradictions in capitalism would lead to, to communism. Right. And uh, one of those what he said was that like compared to like, w- w- sorry, let me let me go back. He tried to explain why Marx thought that 
peasants uh, couldn't couldn't do communism properly. Did I get the mosquito? I don't know. It might have dodged me at the last second. No, is that it? Yeah, I did get it. Fuck you, mosquito. Anyway, he's trying to explain that, and he's like, "Well, peasants, they're all very, they're all doing their own little thing on their own little farms. Um, they're all very, di- they, you know, they they're not." In interacting in, in a series of social relations every day. They're not working communally together like people in a factory do in an ur- urban environment where you have large groups of people who are seeing each other every day and are already highly organized into laborers. So they have like the conditions to very easily organize it against, you know, against their, their uh, bourgeois overseers or whatever, uh, which is something Marx does talk about. But he then also sort of skims over the idea of 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 technology or or the development of productive capacities to use marxist language like he says he does say something about high tech communism but to me uh this is the whole idea right is that uh capitalists want to minimize if you if you agree with the labor theory of value as marx does right that that capitalists want to minimize socially necessary labor time because profit is surplus labor time. The quicker that your worker does enough work to pay her wages, the more time is left over in the day that she is performing surplus labor, which you can collect as profits, right? And therefore, there's an incentive for capitalists to develop technologies which um, enhance the productive capacities, right? It make each worker more efficient and more effective because the more productive each worker is, the faster they meet the minimum requirements to pay their own wages, and therefore the more time each day is spent working essentially for free where the capitalist is taking uh, that, that money as, that, as profit, right? Or, or, or is, is using that, that value produced to, 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 to extract as profit, right? Um, and and that's the problem, which is that un- unfortunately for the capitalists, uh, they they're totally self-serving um, development of of productive capacities is what will eventually allow for uh, the abolition of wage labor, right? Because or at least the diminishing of of the 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 extreme diminishment of of uh, wage labor, because. If, if the productive capacities are highly developed, the amount of time that someone needs to spend working in order to meet uh, you know, the minimal social requirements of production for society is extremely low. And so the capitalists produce the engine of their own defeat, right? They, they, they produce all of the technology which makes workers extremely efficient, but now workers are extremely efficient and so they don't need to work as much and they will eventually uh, you know, according to Marxists, come to see this, and once they seize control of the means of production, um, they can quite easily, rapidly diminish the amount of of labor that each person does, which will make society much freer because people can make decisions about their own lives. They they have extremely developed productive capacities. They can produce a lot with very little time meaning that they have lots of other time to do whatever the hell they want to do with their life, which is the entire point. Uh, so to me, that's the core, that's core to Marxism, at least the way I see it. And that's also the way a lot of other people see it. But what is politics doesn't seem to have gotten that memo. Okay, bro is actually cooked. I'm, I'm, I've, I've, I, I've seen the subtle le woke is le bad undercurrent in his videos. And it's finally bubbled to the surface in the form of being transphobic for no reason. Uh, he, he first he says about he's talking about states, the development of states, and peasants' relation to that. And I think he's mostly right, although he misses something that he should have read um, James C. Scott for. He's he's talking about the way that uh, roaming nomadic uh, raiders and sedentary pastoralists interact which is very james c scott pill but there are also nomads who aren't raiders which is something he doesn't talk about and he does the big thing that he doesn't talk about is how 
uh, he's right that pastor sedentary pastoralists had a had a bad end of the stick, right? Because they were often ruled over by an oppressive state who took a bunch of taxes from them, and in the meantime, they were constantly getting raided by nomadic tribes. But he doesn't. He neglects to mention that they. Uh, wanted to get the fuck out and join the nomadic tribes all of the time because they just had it better. That the state not only had to had to uh, collect taxes from them, but the state also it wasn't simply a protection racket, right? The idea is that it's a protection racket, right? The uh, like, you you pay us taxes, we protect you from the nomadic raiders. But that's that's a little overly simplistic. In fact. Um, that is part of the story, but also the peasants were, were not allowed to leave. Like, they were, it, it wasn't just some sort of social contract like that. It was more so like, and uh, you, you were not allowed to leave. If you leave, we will hunt you down and force you to come back. You are tied to this land uh, in order to pay us taxes. So that's a minor thing he he misunderstands, or he doesn't misunderstand it, he just leaves it out, which I think is an important, I think it's a pretty important distinction, because otherwise you kind of start thinking of pastoralists as just being stupid, when in reality they were at least initially trapped, um, but uh, then he just does this, he's just, he just says, hold on, I'm just gonna, just gonna play the clip for Loaded you, by ruling classes. let me put it not in 1.5 speed, to control and unite larger territories under their rule. Today we're plugged into mass media all day long, which expands our social horizons in real and fictional ways. Okay, we're plugged into mass media all day long. Now, right now, on screen, is a picture of a man with a pixelated face. I believe a man of Asian descent, it looks like, wearing an Oculus Rift, lying down on the floor, face upwards, with some sort of blow-up anime doll simulating a sexual act. This is to talk about how uh, uh, perverts are sexually degenerate, and this is bad for some unknown reason. But then, he says this. And we get our identities from media and... Okay, we get our identities from media, and now he has thrown up on screen an image of various uh, genderqueer identities. You know the one that people use that are like real real genders, and then the other ones are circled and it says mental illness. It's that, that image. He's thrown up that image on screen. And that, that very much makes me think that he doesn't necessarily think so kindly of the transgenders. Because there's no real reason to just randomly throw that out there, right? I don't see the, I don't, I don't, I don't see the reason to just randomly be like, by the way, uh, your fake genders aren't real, they're just, it's social contagion. Like, there's, like, why, why would you do that unless you were transphobic? So, this guy's not very smart. Hello, dog, you don't have to whine. I'm here, I'm here, and I'm taking care of you, dog. I was thinking about AI slop content. Um, I stumbled, I don't know how, I, you don't need to really know the context, but... I'll just say the words Elon Musk x AOC AI animation. Okay, that's all you need to hear. <coughs> so this sort of AI slop exists, right? No one really watches it because it's really bad, but it does exist. And there's other examples like Quarrel Cop on YouTube, who's a Minecraft YouTuber who pivoted hard to AI. There's other similar things. Um, but what I see happening with AI slop is it's going to go through the same process as clickbait thumbnails and titles on YouTube. Um, it used to be that YouTube had... The, the version of clickbait that used to exist on YouTube was boobs in the thumbnail. And boobs in the thumbnail was considered like normal and okay because that had been the case since like the beginning of YouTube. Bo videos with boobs in the thumbnail always got a lot of views just because it's got boobs in the thumbnail. That wasn't considered necessarily to be the same level of clickbait. It was still considered clickbait, but... It was very normalized in the very beginning. But the type of clickbait we see now with like red arrows and, and uh, stuff like that, the way that got started um, was was like this. Like first, there were shitty uh, prank channels that used to clickbait super hard, right? And then uh, people, people like H3H3 
uh, started making fun of those prank channels, right? It, it, there was there was these prank channels that were clickbait super hard, and then there was a, a a counter movement of like, look at these guys getting millions of views, clickbaiting super hard. Like, isn't that stupid? And then the people making fun of it would start putting clickbait in their titles, but ironically, like they would say gone wrong gone sexual right but then what happened is it started to actually work and so they kept doing it and eventually the irony just went away because the audience became so desensitized to it and now every single video like they used to be that using a red a big red arrow with a big red circle in your thumbnail was considered like ironic like an ironic joke poking fun at like terrible clickbait thumbnails but now it's just normal even i would do it right um this is just how these processes work uh the youtube thought like i've seen lots of people pe people use irony to get away with stuff that they should like another example is smash that like button like everyone says that smash that like button they maybe it's a little bit of an outdated meme right now but lots of people have said smash but you have to remember that, that was the same thing it was originally a joke poking fun at people who did over-the-top calls to action on their YouTube videos. But the problem is that over-the-top calls to action and clickbait actually work. And so people just started doing them earnestly. But, like, the veneer of irony just slipped away. Like, you used to say, Oh, and go ahead and just nuke that nut, like, smash that like button, right, as a joke. But it stopped being a joke when it actually started working. And I think that's how it's going to happen with AI slop. Like, I think people are going to start putting putting out AI slop content, ironically. Like, there's going to be... A, you're going to find... Obviously, the YouTube landscape is different. They don't necessarily have... You don't have H3H3s making reaction videos anymore. Instead, it's going to be five times longer. And it's going to be uh, by, like... I don't know, Jenny Nicholson, no, it'll be like folding ideas, or, or it'll be, no, not quite folding ideas, it'll be on the, like, the tier one level below fold, folding ideas of, of YouTube video essay slot, um, I'm trying to, I don't watch any of these guys, so I don't really remember their names, like, like, fucking, what's that guy, I have his face in my head, but I have no idea what his name is, um, it's not Ted Niverson, but I feel like it's the same kind of guy as Ted Niverson. <laughs> Does that make sense? Uh, I think they're friends. I think they're friends. I think they've made videos before together. Let me see if I can find them. Maybe they haven't. Maybe I'm just making that up. I bet someone like Ted Niverson is going to make a video like this. Which is just going to be... It's going to be called, like, the, the worst AI... The worst AI slob. That's what it's going to be called. And he's gonna have him in the thumbnail, doing doing a YouTube thumbnail face, right? And he's gonna be going through it, right? And then at the end of the video, he's gonna make his own ones. That's the thing. That's the bit that's gonna change. Is people are gonna start making their own parody AI slop videos. And then before you know it, putting some, like for example, I don't think it's gonna to be to the point where full videos are just AI slop, but there'll there'll be stuff like cutaway gags, like AI cutaway gags look funny. Like, I guarantee you, this I this is actually a strong prediction I'm going to make right now. I think AI cutaway gags are going to be a thing. Like, a lot of YouTube videos, um, they're like, the YouTuber will be saying something, and then it will cut to a Photoshop of the thing they were saying, right? But I think what's going to happen is that's just going to become full, like, people are going to start making it look terrible with AI, like, on purpose, because that's funny. But then over time... It's not going to be a joke anymore. Like, the terrible AI-ness of it is going to stop being a joke. Um, so, good luck with that, guys. That's going to be great. I'm really looking forward to that. Okay, I would like to apologize for the previous segment. I didn't realize that my mic was directly in front of the fan at the end there, so you got a bunch of really loud fan noises. But that's about the level of quality control that you could expect here in the Slice of Life podcast. You know what I don't understand about Americans? Basketball. It's just the worst sport ever. It's the worst popular sport by far, in my opinion. Like, all the, what are the other popular, what are the most, you know what, I'm going to look it up. What are the most popular sports? Most popular, obviously football's the, 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 
the biggest. How many soccer's? That's football, yeah. Yeah, football is obviously the biggest. Oh, you mean talking to many people who say football? Well, Amer- they know. They, I think Americans know I'm British from the fact that I'm yeah. very clearly British. Yeah, but what I'm saying is, you're talking about sports football in America. Right. Okay. I don't mean American football. Okay. Top ten popular sports in the world. Football number one, as in real football. I think. Look, this is. I, I gotta say one thing. Reddit got right is I like calling it hand egg. I think that's funny. I think calling American football hand... I know it's millennial-pilled, but I think calling American football hand egg is pretty funny to me. Anyway. Football number one. Football is an okay game. It's not my favorite game, by any means. But having is, having been to many football games as a kid that my dad took me, took me to, it, it can be kind of boring, but also it can be extremely hype. It can be incredibly, like, incredibly hype. Um... I think it has the problems of every other mainstream sport where it's just dominated by money. Like, it's very hard to get invested in a team, at least for me, when it's like Ship of theseus itself into a completely different team every year, you know? It's kind of annoying. Like, you follow a player, but that player's just going to move to a different team. If they're, like, if they're good, they get brought up by a better team. And if they're bad, they get sold to a worse team. Like, you can't really care about individual players. You can't really care about individual teams because it's just about who has the most money. And, like, that was proven around my lifetime, right? But if, if you don't know anything about English Premier League football, which, to be honest, I don't know anything about English Premier League football, but I remember this happening when I was a kid, is that there's... Everyone knows about Manchester United, right? Man U, very, very big football team from, from the city of Manchester in uh, England. But there's another football team from Manchester called Man City, right? Manchester City. They're rival football teams, but Man U were, were much better forever. Until when I was like eight years old, Man City got bought by a billionaire, some sort of like Russian oligarch or something, I don't know. And he just poured billions <laughs> into this team and they just, I think he's Saudi, I don't know, but some sort of very rich. The, what I'm saying is, no one, Man City was never a very big team, and they just bought everyone. Like, the Man City just, just became good by buying good players. Like, I don't know how you can support a team, you know what I mean? Like, that's just how football works. It's just, it's just boring, because there's, like, there's no, the point of, of that sort of sport is to you have, like, pseudo-nationalism, right? Like... Getting to watch, you know what I like. One of my my favorite sports is a uh, hurling, which is an Irish sport, Irish traditional sport. And what's interesting about hurling is that no one outside of Ireland even know it exists or knows it exists, right? And the people who play on hurling teams, they play for their like local region, and you can't change. Like you just play for the team you were, you were, of where you were born or where you know whatever. I don't know what happens if you move. <laughs> But <laughs> I haven't really considered that. But the point is, there's no, there's no money in it. Like, these motherfuckers are, like, in, insane athletes. Like, you watch these games, these guys are insane athletes. And they're not like, getting paid shit. Like, they, they're fucking milkmen and, and plumbers and whatever, right? Like, they're... they're, they're and it's, it's sick. I like that. That's a real sport to me. It's just about playing the game, representing where you come from. As type of like nationalism I can get behind. It's not really nationalism. It's better. It's better. It's it's good. It's all the good parts without any of the bad parts, in my opinion. But whatever. So it's, football's too big. But then let's. The, I kind of got distracted there about talking about like the 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 politics of it. But if we're talking about the sport itself, like not judging that, there's too many big problems. Massive problem with football that all the Americans love to rag on is. Uh, diving, like the fact that, that faking an injury is so powerful, is is really dumb. Like that is not a tactic that should exist. I 100% agree with that. And then the other big problem with football, according to Americans, is that it's extremely low scoring. Like lots of people, talk, Americans and people who hate football, talk about like, oh, it's a thrilling nil nil draw, <laughs> and that does happen a lot. Uh, I think football is very low scoring. What that means is, I, I think it might be a little too low scoring, but personally, I'm, I'm just much more into that. 
Like, that's why I think basketball is the worst popular sport. Because, like, I, I have no context for, if, like, if something was even cool. It doesn't matter. Like, it literally doesn't matter if you score. Because it's meaningless. The games are, like, 500 to, to 1,200. Like, you know, <laughs> it doesn't fucking... Each individual basket just means nothing. And the pitch is so fucking small. Court, I guess. The court is so small. There's no, there's no midfield. Like, most of football takes place in the midfield, right? It's, it's almost a, a little bit like, like a game of chess, right? Trying to, trying to create openings to, to, to run for a scoring opportunity, right? But basketball, it's just one team has the ball, they hang out near one basket, they score, and then everyone runs to the other side, and they hang out near the other basket, and they score, or they get blocked. Like, you know what I mean? Like, there's no, there's nothing interesting about it at all to me. It's just meaningless. Like, if you compa- if you look at football, like, yeah, most of the game, nothing much is happening. But when team does score, everyone goes fucking crazy. <laughs> and that's better. Anyway, so I think football is okay. I don't think it's the best sport, but I think it's okay. The next most popular sport is cricket. That's because of, of India. That's why it's the most, the, the next most popular sport. Because India has a lot of people in it. And the IPA is fucking massive now anyone who's been a long time listener of this podcast knows that i'm a big fan of cricket i'm a big fan of cricket i generally like cricket and 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 baseball uh like i think that i I like sports like that where someone throws a ball and another guy hits it and you try and catch it because because catching catching out someone is is really cool and it feels very base human to me like football and basketball it's like very gimmicky Right, it's very like, oh, you you have to only use your feet and other parts of your body, but no hands and no touching. It's very gimmicky. Or basketball, it's like, oh, you have to bounce the ball on the floor. Very gimmicky. Football, I mean, sorry, cricket and baseball. It's like catching a ball that's flying in the air and you win. Like that's such a that feels so human to me. <laughs> I don't know. That feels great. I feel like you should having a sport where there's a big reward for catching a ball is great. I like that a lot. But cricket. Um, it might seem like a very high-scoring game, especially test cricket, because the number of runs that get scored is, is, is a lot, right? You, you might see people with hundreds of runs. But the thing is that runs aren't special in cricket. Like, your, it, your sport, it's like an incremental game. It's like they made cookie clicker into a sport. It's like you, know, like you just slowly build up runs for as long as possible. The, the hype rare moments are when someone gets out. That's that's when it gets hyped, bowling someone out, catching someone out, whatever. And yeah, cricket has all these arcane rules, but I kind of like that. I like all of the arcane rules because it's just so old. Cricket definitely going in a, a high high tier sport in my opinion. Hitting a hitting something with a bat so it goes far away, and that's impressive. Fuck yeah, that is impressive. When I see a baseball player hit a, hit a home run, hell yeah, good. That was sick. When I see a, uh, impre- you know, I can just be impressed by that at any point. Uh, next is tennis. The next most popular sport is tennis. <clears throat> I think tennis is okay. Um, honestly, what, watching a full tennis game is, is kind of boring, in my opinion. But tennis is quite fun to play. That's my opinion. Tennis is great to play because it's 1v1. It's very easy to arrange a tennis game. Right? You just you just 1v1 someone. It's a very easy to understand sport. You hit the ball into the other place and if it if they don't hit it back you win. Like that's that's the type of shit I'm into, you know. Easy to understand, hard to master. And then I, I like I'm a, I'm a big fan of of giving balls spin. I like the way that balls interact with spin. That's very cool. That's why I like cricket and baseball a lot. But that also exists in cricket in uh, in tennis and that's cool. I like that. Um the the thing about tennis that's kind of strange is just that it, it can be kind of repetitive to watch a full tennis match. Um, it can be pretty repetitive, but I I mean obviously the athleticism is pretty insane. Like the the stamina required to play that much tennis is insane, but that's not I don't know that <clears throat> that's not I'm not necessarily saying that that's a good or bad thing. Uh, well, tennis. I, I I put it, I put it maybe in a in a B tier. It it doesn't really have any hype moments. That's the thing about tennis. That's the real problem. It's very. It in terms of 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 
feelings, it's uh, emotion. It's it's very one. It's it's kind of got gentle curves. It doesn't. Sorry, I feel like maybe the computer mic was in the fan again. It it's too fucking hot to turn the fan off though. So you're just gonna have to deal with that. Uh, yeah, tennis is okay. B tier. Golf. That's fucking sucks. <laughs> I'm sorry. Golf sucks. Mini golf is fun to play. Golf is a fucking terrible sport. It's boring as shit. Uh, it fucking sucks. And then um, it, they fucking destroy the environment to make golf courses for no reason. It's just a bunch of rich assholes. I know tennis is also kind of a bunch of rich assholes. But no, golf fucking sucks. Anyone who likes golf is an idiot. Obviously, there are hype like hole in ones. That's cool. But but no, I'm 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 heavily against golf. Uh, it's a terrible spectator sport. It's probably fun to play. I've never played proper golf. I've only ever played mini golf. I'm sure that or like going to a driving range is probably really fun. Playing golf is probably fun. But to watch, it's fucking garbage. It's more definitely one of the worst spectator sports. And basketball, I've already explained, garbage, because scoring doesn't mean anything. They made a sport. Where scoring doesn't mean anything. Like, it's just a no The way the basketball works annoys me on every fucking level. Everything about it annoys me. The the squeaky noises annoy me. <laughs> the bouncing a ball is so stupid. It, so, it looks so goofy. It doesn't look cool. Even all of the the tricks. Oh, I, I can bounce the ball between my legs. Oh, didn't expect that. It's just fucking goofy. Like, when people in foot, when they're doing that, like the skill, skill type stuff in the... Uh, in, in football, it's it also looks kind of goofy, but to me it's just way more impressive. The basketball bouncing between your legs stuff, it just looks so goofy to me. Running along a court bounce, like it's just so bad. It just looks goofy, it just looks awkward. And then the fact that basketball has, like, of any sport, the most, like, genetic determinism. Like, you just can't, like, if you're below absurdly tall, you just have no, like, it's just over. And if you are absurdly tall, yeah, you, like, and I'm talking like like medically problematic level of absurdly tall. You might not be able to make it into the NBA, but it's just going to give you a huge advantage against anyone else. Because half the point of basketball is that it's supposed to be hard to score a basket, right? That scoring a basket is supposed to be like, you have to fit this ball into a hole that's barely bigger than the ball. And it's vertical and you have to throw it like it. I don't know, man. It's just completely countered by the fact that you can jump and be tall. And then it's just like fucking makes it mathematically much easier. I don't know. I, I hate everything about it, man. You've got to play it on a tiny little court with no, no mid game. And then the and scoring doesn't mean anything. I know I've said that a bunch, but it's, <laughs> I hate that. Like you can't even cheer or be high. Like when I see a hype play, you can see a hype play in basketball. It doesn't fucking matter. Like, if someone pulls off an insane bicycle kick shot in football, like, that is really insane, because that means something, right? That That's going to win or lose the game, whether they make that, right? In basketball, someone could pull off the most insane half-court shot, someone could pull off the most insane dunk, like, and it just doesn't fucking, like, two seconds later, it stopped mattering. It's just completely stopped mattering. So, I, I don't know, it just, it, 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 everything about, it's F tier. It's, it's got to be the worst popular sport. Baseball is based, baseball is the real working class sport of America. I love baseball. It's great. I love the commentary. I love the culture. I love, I love the Mets. Love the Mets, baby. Uh, I, I, it's not as good as cricket because they're, they're pussies and they, they need a glove to catch a ball. Cricket balls are harder than baseballs. And yeah, the cricket motherfuckers catch that shit bare hand, okay? Baseball players, pussy ass bitches need a leather glove to catch a hard ball. Okay, grow some grow some cojones, okay? Pick up the catch the ball with your bare hands like a man. Um, <laughs> uh, but still, yeah, I, there's there's stuff that makes baseball worse than cricket to me, and it's mostly uh, the 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 bat, right? Like the the fact that you're using a round bat means that you don't get that much control over where it goes compared to cricket and then half of the pitch is cut off like the if you hit the ball behind you it's a foul right you're not allowed to do that in baseball in cricket you're playing in the middle of a giant oval and so you can hit the ball and you're playing with a flat paddle so you have much more precision about where you can decide to hit the ball 
and that just makes it way more interesting and strategic to me. Um, I also, and, and then again, cricket has the advantage over baseball because you bounce the ball in cricket, which means you have much more strategic options for spin. Like spin affects the ball a lot more. And you have all sorts of really interesting stuff because test cricket goes on for so long, right? Like the condition of the pitch, like you, you the, the best cricket bowlers, which is the what you call a pitcher in cricket, right? Uh, the best bowlers, like they they pay attention to the state of the ground that they're bouncing the ball off and they'll like they'll like notice little little bumps and they're like purposefully aim to bounce the ball in a, on a particular bump so it'll bounce in an unpredictable way or uh, one thing that's very common in cricket is that you will you'll take the cricket ball and you'll rub it on your shirt right but you'll only rub it on one side and everyone who throughout the whole day they use the same ball and they rub the ball on the same side on their shirt so that one side becomes sh like shiny and the other side is rough, which causes it to like drift in the air. Like there's all those weird little things that can happen. And then uh, when you're a batsman, you know, you can you can do all sorts of interesting techniques. Like in, in, in baseball, you can't do reverse sweep. Like in cricket, reverse sweep is when the, when they throw the ball at you, you literally switch sides. Like you, you move so that you're hitting it from the other side and then you hit it like a backhand over your shoulder. Like, you can't do that in baseball, right? You have to hit it from the same side every time. You basically uh, have to just, just hit it hard, right, in baseball, which is still cool. And home runs are still cool. But st cricket is a lot more st uh, strategic, which I, which I like a lot more, personally. Uh, but I still think baseball is, is, is more like baseball. I like, I like the... The running between the mounds. I like the, the the tagging people out with the ball. I like a lot of stuff about baseball. Definitely, I, I definitely put it in A tier. I think it's not quite as good as cricket, but I, in my opinion, that's definitely an A tier sport. Uh, rugby. Honestly, I know fuck all about rugby. I don't even know what to say about it. It's just better American football. It's more entertaining to watch than American football. Um, but I still don't. I, I've never just. I've never gone into it. That's the thing. Um, so I, I've never really watched a rugby game. I, I've played a little bit of rugby just in school, but no one knew what they were doing, and it, it sucked. Uh, so yeah, I, I can't really comment that much on rugby, to be honest with you. It seems okay. Hockey? I'm assuming they mean ice hockey. Ice hockey is a, is a base sport. Ice hockey is a base sport. It's a, it's, a much, it's a good sport because they took all the bullshit out. They were like, yeah, you can fucking slam into each other. You, it's just a fight. It's a, it's a fight <laughs> with, a, with, a ball, with a puck involved. And that's great. We love that. Um, it's very fast-paced. The, the puck physically moves very fast. Um, skating is just a cool mechanic. Like, that's just, that's just cool to watch. It's cool to watch people be really good at skating because it's not normal. Like, they're not just running around. They're doing something weird. And that's cool. Uh... Yeah, I'd say I like ice hockey. It's not S tier, uh, but I'd probably put it in, in, like, I don't know. I've never really watched that much ice hockey. Uh, I just like movement mechanics in games, and ice hockey has good movement tech. So I'd probably put it in, like, maybe A tier, maybe low A tier, high B tier. Snooker? That's not a fucking sport. That's that's not real. Uh, volleyball? Volleyball's pretty cool. I don't know enough about volleyball to really talk about it, though. Uh, so those are, that's my sports tier list. Um, yeah, fucking, and then there's, there's like, there's other sports that exist, I don't know if you know about this, but they made some others, like, uh, you, you got, you got boxing and MMA, those, those are guys that punch each other, I guess they do punch each other, that is something that happens, I don't know, after they invented MMA, I feel like boxing just became pointless. Like, why pretend to be beating each other up when you could be actually beating each other up? What's the point of boxing when MMA was invented? I don't understand. Um, but MMA is, is fine. I, I don't know. It, it's, it's, it's cool. It's very pure. I appreciate that. It's very pure. Just two guys fighting. That's what all other sports is trying to pretend to be. MMA is just two guys actually fighting. I respect that. Uh, what else is there? Swimming? All of that kind of shit, track and field, that's all the same bullshit, it doesn't count. 
that's not a real sport. That's a that's a that's an Olympic sport. That's a different thing. I mean, that's cool and whatever, but no one watches it. Um, auto racing. I've given my takes on this before. The only good auto racing sport is rally. All the other ones are gay and retarded. <laughs> Fucking NASCAR sucks. F1 sucks. F1 has cool cars, but it sucks to watch. NASCAR doesn't even have that. NASCAR is really fun to watch. NASCAR is more fun to watch because they're getting crashes. The crashes are cool. I mean, like, I'm sure like, I see. Okay, NASCAR is probably okay. F1 has great cars. F1 cars are cool. I wish they didn't have all these limits on it. They should have less limits. They should just let people do whatever the fuck they can do. But whatever. Um, the thing about motorsports, like particularly F1 and NASCAR that sucks, is that it's kind of like the... It's kind of like the, 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 the sport equivalent of a deck building game. Right, like a trading card game, where it's like it's it's often just about who can construct the best deck, right? Not always. F one is most most like that of all of these. But rally is based because they're driving on real roads, and those cars they go fucking sideways. And I like it when the car goes sideways because I like movement tech, and that's why rally is the best one because the cars go sideways and they go in the air. Like cars don't normally go in the air. But rally cars go in the air and they jump, and that's fucking awesome. When the cars jump, that's cool. It's like Hot Wheels. It's like Hot Wheels in real life, and that's sick. And the rally drivers are insane, and the crashes are fucking insane, but somehow no one ever dies. Like, you'll just watch rally, and, like, this guy will just dive his car right off a cliff, flip 23 times and explode, and he'll just... Then you see the inside of the car perspective, and he's just... Completely straight faced, unbothered, no one gives a fuck. He gets out and he's fucking, you know, Swedish or whatever, so he's just like, I, I'm a little disappointed with the way I did that race. <laughs> like, you're just completely fine. Like, that's what rally cars, people, rally drivers are just built different, man. You watch the perspective of an F1 driver or a NASCAR driver, and it's like, yeah, it's, they're going fast. They're definitely driving fast, and that's scary, and it's cool. But it's very mechanical, right? It's very like, like, you know when you play like a realistic racing sim game and they have those like lines on the ground that tell you where to, like what the best line is and where you should break in the easy mode? Like that's what F1 feels like. It's just like, it's like track mania but lame because you can't just drive the track. You can't just insta respawn and you have to, there's like collision between the cards so it sucks. Track mania is uh, the best racing game. If you're interested, the, the best racing thing that humans have come up with is track mania. The second best one is the World Rally Championships. <laughs> Race, rally simulation games aren't that good. Uh, but rally in real life is awesome. Because you watch the perspective of, of a rally driver. And it just looks like they're about to die. Like they're fucking insane. Like watch first, like find first person perspective rally footage. It's just fucking wild. Like they're just, they're just insane. They're just batshit fucking insane. How are they driving like that? But they're doing it. And even though they're not going as fast as, as NASCAR drivers are, they're not going anywhere near as fast as F1 car, F1 drivers are, they're just on a road. They're just on a regular-ass road, and they, there's, there's ice sometimes. Like, they're just driving on straight ice half the time. It's insane. Rally is the best motorsport by far. Anything with motorbikes, eh, who gives a fuck? Table tennis? Table tennis is cool. I like table tennis. Um, but yeah, those are my those are my sports takes. Now for esports, um, there are, no one's invented a good esport yet, but they've come pretty close. Uh, actually, someone did. Tim Rogers invented a good esport, but no one played it. Uh, <clears throat> I think um, I think Counter Strike is the best esport, personally. Uh, high level Counter Strike is really fun to watch. And you can actually get invested in the teams. And the crowds are good. So I think Counter-Strike is the best eSport. Valorant sucks to watch as a spectator. Even though it's like 
fundamentally the same as Counter Strike. It sucks to watch. Uh, uh, fucking Rocket League is a great esport. Love Rocket League. Fighting games are a different thing, but pretty much every fighting game is pretty fun to watch. Uh, and, and as an esport, although I would probably say Melee is the best fighting game as a sport. That's just my opinion. Maybe other fighting game players are gonna get a, get mad at me for that. I as, as a spectator who has no interest in playing these games and has never played any of them, Melee is the most fun to watch because of the, it's so much more fast paced. That's why I like it, and uh, the the percentage mechanics and stuff. It, I don't know. I I think Melee is the best from a spectator pers perspective. Um, maybe maybe Counter Strike esports isn't that fun to watch if you haven't played a lot of Counter Strike, uh, but I've played a lot of Counter Strike, so it's fun. Uh, I, I don't personally find Rainbow Six very fun to watch. Um, I, I think Overwatch is a terrible esport. I don't know why they tried to make Overwatch into an esport. Like, it's terrible from a spectator point of view. O Overwatch fucking sucks as an esport. Um, and then you have Team Fortress 2, which is the only other one I'm really familiar with. Oh, I guess, uh, like, League and Dota are obviously terrible. No one should ever pay attention to them. Because if you want to watch a game like that, you should just watch StarCraft. Or like Age of Empires, or something like some sort of RTS. It's just like a similar thing, but better. Professional level StarCraft is just insane. Professional level Age of Age of Empires is the one I'm thinking of, right? Wait, Age Age of Empires is the uh, AOE two is the one I'm thinking of, right? Uh, I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Watch watching that. I mean, that shit's insane. Anyway. Yeah, that shit's cool. TF2 6 is... Okay, so Highlander sucks to watch, and it sucks to play. So let's ignore Highlander. 6 is... <clears throat> I know I'm talking about TF2 in the podcast where I said I wouldn't talk about TF2. This is like the first time this has happened, but I'm just thinking about esports, okay? Uh, I think TF2 is a pretty good esport. I think there are a lot of hype moments, um, and it, it has a lot of back and forth that's, that's pretty fun. Um, but it's not as good as Counter-Strike to, to watch. To play, I think Sixes is probably more fun. Um, but to watch, I think if you're not familiar with TF2, Sixes is probably not that interesting to watch. A lot of it is like building Uber and not really doing much. And uh, it's probably kind of confusing to watch as a spectator, like a full a full Sixes game. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm going to not put it that high. I don't think it's that great. Uh, what else exists in the eSports? What are the... Let me look up the top eSports. It, it, I'm sure League is like... League and Dota are the top, right? Top eSports. Uh, this is just League of Legends. Hold on. It's all League of Legends. It's all just the top League of Legends players. Hold on. Oh, I guess there's a Chinese esports league uh, uh, org called called esports called Top Esports League, Dota, Rocket League, PUBG. Obviously not. PUBG and Fortnite are terrible esports. <laughs> you should not be playing looter shooters and fucking uh, battle royales as an esport. That's that's a terrible idea. Not a good esport. Valo, but I've already said not that good. Rainbow Six. I'm sure if I understood what was going on, it'd be more entertaining, but a lot of it is just a guy staring at a hallway, even more than Counter-Strike is. Apex is okay as an eSport, but it kind of runs into the same problems as PUBG and, and uh, Fortnite. I've never heard of Arena of Valor. Never heard of that in my life. Um, StarCraft 2 is cool to watch, even though I don't really understand what's going on. Minecraft is not fucking eSport. Google is just lying to me right now. <laughs> Uh, Overwatch, garbage. Teamfight Tactics and Hearthstone, garbage, garbage. Uh, <clears throat> Call of Duty, garbage. That's actually one of the worst esports ever. COD is like a really badly designed game for an esport. Uh, Smash is good. Street Fighter 6 is good. Heroes of the Storm, garbage. FIFA, that is not an esport. That's, that's just retarded. Most popular esports games. League of Legends, number one. Mobile Legends Bang Bang. What the fuck is Mobile Legends Bang Bang? I've never heard of Mobile Legends Bang Bang before. 
and then Counter Strike, and then Valorant. Damn, Counter Strike has a bigger prize pool than League. That's crazy to me. I've never heard of Arena of Val. Oh, it's a mobile game as well. Mobile game esports are fucking bullshit, obviously. Um, oh, this is by peak viewers. Yeah, I think Counter Strike is the best. I'm just gonna be honest. And it's not just just because I'm a I'm a Counter Strike player. I just think it's the purest. I mean, if if Quake, if like Quake Live was popular, it would be it would be sick to watch, but it's not popular. Yeah, uh, and and Trackmania is fucking great. Trackmania tournaments, like high level, top level t- Trackmania tournaments, are amazing to watch. Highly recommend watching Trackmania tournaments if you have the uh, opportunity to do that. They they're great. I think Trackmania is a really good esport. Um, <clears throat> what else is there? What else is less popular esports? Farming Simulator esports is, is okay. I know people make games, made a video about it. It was it was. I I went after that video and and tried to watch some. It wasn't that hype. I I didn't really get the appeal that much. I mean, it's cool, but it's not that cool. Uh, what else is there? Less less popular esports. Um, I don't really know any others to be honest with you. Well, I'm gonna call that segment there. Hey, uh, I'm oh, sorry, I'm recording a segment. Hey, uh, Willow, dreary, at Dreary Willow, are you listening to this? At Dreary Willow, I just want to thank you. I just want to shout you out. I remember ages ago in, a, in one of these Slice of Life podcasts, you corrected me somewhat on my, on my Marxist literacy. And I have been going through a reading, actually reading Marx phase for the past, like, three days. I just want to say I was on some Lasallian bullshit. And uh, I want to thank you for correcting me. Because I'm much closer to, I'm, I have a much better understanding. Um, it was definitely Raymond Gorse's, I don't know if that's how you pronounce his name. Gorse, Gus, I don't know. But his lectures were really good for helping me understand it. But I've just been, I've been reading through basically all of the shorter texts by Marx today, including rereading Gotha Critic, and yeah, I'm starting to think, I'm starting to think that, and this is, this might sound crazy, I'm, I'm trying, I try not to do too much Marxist politics in these, these podcasts, because I feel like it gets boring to people, I also want to make it clear that I don't necessarily agree with everything Marx. I might, I might be correcting people on stuff, but that's not an, as an expression of what I necessarily believe. I'm just correcting people or hypothetical people on what Marx believes, right? Not necessarily what I believe. So, like, but I do agree with Marx on this. And here's, there's a few things. There's a few things I want to talk about. Firstly, about lab- the, the labor theory of value, which has always been a sticking point of Marxism for me and a lot of other people, where I'm like, this doesn't really, this doesn't really work. But rereading Gotha Critic and, uh, and other stuff, it becomes clear to me that the way most people understand the labor theory of value it seems seems not to be in line with what Marx thinks. In fact, I think it's just because he talks about it in like the first chapter of the first volume of Capital that people think this is what he thinks. But everywhere else, he talks about it very differently. Right? He's talking about it in terms of human labor power, the proletariat only having access to labor power. Right? They they can't. The bourgeois, like if if value, and or if 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 wealth, comes from, from nature, right? That's what he talks about. He says like everything comes from nature, because even even human labor power is just a force of nature, right? He's he's trying to do some Darwinian shit right there, right? Um, but there's a certain class in society, which has claimed ownership over. These. Uh, productive elements of nature, right, or or whatever you might—that's maybe bad phrasing, but you know what I mean. Valu- valuable, I guess, would be a good way to put it. 
like the 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 land and the raw materials and so on right that everything else you need to create uh, wealth has been has been owned by one particular class and then there's another class who don't have access they don't own any of that stuff so all they have is their labor power which they're then forced to sell uh, because they don't have any other choice and it makes much more sense the rest of the Marxism stuff follows on from that much more easily right like the collective ownership stuff follows on from that it's very it becomes very obvious right if you think of it if you think of it via the process of alienation the the working class has been alienated from from their powers over nature other than their labor power um yeah so i was definitely on some cringe lasallian shit i'm not necess- i'm still this might be a hot take But when Marx talks about value in terms of labor theory of value type value, value that comes from labor time or labor labor power, right? Um, Because he's only he makes a distinction between value and price. But what I'm interested in is is this because I haven't found an answer. When he talks about value, he's constructing something, right? He's because uh, I've heard like unlearning economics and has has criticized this in a video, but then lots of Marxists seem to defend this. Like I've seen a lot of Marxists talk about how value is great because it's so quantifiable and and whatever, like lab- labor labor time as a measure of value. But m- my question is is Marx claiming to have discovered some truth about the universe? I think possibly not. I think possibly Marx is proposing a new thing, right? Like in the same way that price is not some innate fact of the universe, it was invented. Is, is this, I don't know if I'm wrong to something here, but this is my new theory, that that he's he's proposing a new way of organizing society. Hmm. Who would have expected Marx to propose a new way of organizing society? <laughs> Honestly, re- the more I read Marx, the more that I realize the saddest truth of all: left comes of kind of right. <laughs> Like the left comms, I mean, I'm not saying they're right as incorrect, but they do seem to be the only people who have actually read Marx, which is strange to me. It, but it's, it's, I don't know. Like, <clears throat> it's not just left comms, right? Because I was reading, I was, I, I've read, so, doing so much reading. I was, I was reading, what was it fucking called? Um, fucking th- his response to Bakunin right, Bakunin if you're, not, if you're not engaged with this kind of stuff and I really don't blame you Bakunin was an anarchist and Marx and Bakunin had, had a bit of a feud right and Bakunin right, wrote this thing called Statism and Anarchy where he oh one second uh, right where was I okay so Bakunin he writes this thing called Statism and Anarchy, and there's a chapter in it called Critique of the Marxist Theory of the State. And what's interesting about this is that um, Marx wrote a response to this. So Bakunin is basically going to pose a, a bunch of questions to Marx and Marxists, even though he never mentions Marx by name, but Marxists. He's, he's going to say, like, hey, how do, do, do you really think this? That seems a bit absurd. But Marx wrote a response. The response is called Conspectus of Bakunin's Statism and Anarchy. So Bakunin says, What does it mean? The proletariat will be organized as a ruling class. 
Will the entire proletariat perhaps stand at the head of government? The Germans number around 40 million. Will, for example, all 40 million be members of the government? Right? Like, that sounds kind of absurd. But Marx responds, certainly, since the whole thing begins with the self-government of the commune. And that's very interesting, because Marx sounds kind of like an anarchist there, right? <laughs> like, or at least, when I read that, I was immediately thinking that that sounds like the way Rojava is organized, that or was organized, I don't know to what extent Rojava even still exists, but the way Rojava, it's quote-unquote democratic confederalist organizational structure, was that the closer you get to the local communes, or syndicates, or whatever they called them, uh, councils, I don't know, lots of people have different names for these things, but the, the closer you got to, the, the, to those, the more power they had, and that the there there still existed some, uh, they still existed a central government, but that the central government had basically no internal power. Like it exists to uh, have like diplomatic relations with other existing governments, and to enforce uh, women's rights. Like that's the only power that it has. Is that the central government can be authoritarian only when it comes to making sure women's rights are respected. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, it can coordinate the communes, but it doesn't have the power to coordinate the communes, right? It, it, does, it can't... The, anyone with a gun is beholden to the, the local groups, the, the, the lowest form, right? The, the lowest part. The highest part, no one with a gun is, is, is beholden to that, so it has no or very little coercive power, right? The, that anyone with a gun listens to the local communes. And that sounds a lot more like what Marx is talking about, right? He's not just talking about workplaces being democratized. He's talking about local communes running entire areas. So I read part of Marx's writings on the Paris Commune, where he says, I'm not, I don't want to read the entire quote because it's very long, it's multiple paragraphs, but he says basically this, that what I was just saying. He says, like, the Paris Commune, if it serves as a, a model, you know, that's a, that's a good model. That, like, everything should be dictated by local communes like that, you know, from from the great industrial centers of France to the, uh, the, the, the smallest country hamlet, uh, blah, blah, blah. There's no, there's no standing army. There's just local militias with extremely short terms of service. Um, the rural communities of every district were to administer their common affairs by an assembly of delegates in the central town. And these district assemblies were again to send deputies to the national delegation in Paris each delegate to be said at any time, revocable and bound by the mandate, mandat, sorry, mandat, imper, mandat imperatif um, of his constituents. The few but important functions would still remain for a central government were not to be suppressed, as had been intentionally misstated, but were to be discharged by communal and therefore responsible agents. Right? What he's saying there is exactly what I just said. That, like, all of the duties of what currently a central government does should be delegated to local communes, which is not what you generally think when you think communism, right? Like, do you know what I mean? Do you know what I mean by this? Like, this is, this is what my, this doesn't sound like, like, like a vanguard party to me. That's what I'm saying. That doesn't sound very much like a vanguard party to me. So then after reading all of that and some other stuff, I was like, this Marx guy, he's really not, like, big on, on the government doing, doing centralized power. He's very big on, like, it sounds a lot like he wants not that at all. So then I was like, what the fuck are all the, like, Marxist-Leninists talking about? And I was thinking, they always tell you to go read on authority. So then I went and read on authority. And... By my reading of On Authority, it has absolutely nothing to do 
with there should be some sort of vanguard party and and some proletarian state that is headed by a few groups of bureaucrats like like what i don't understand that doesn't seem like what on authority was about at all on authority was engels basically saying like quote-unquote anti-authoritarianism is not a robust idea to base a movement off of because authority is expressed all the time and by authority what he really means is just like coercive power i.e like when when a revolution happens the the book the, the proletariat will be using their authority against the bourgeois right or um <clears throat> if if there's some democratic process some democratic vote the majority is exercising their authority over the the minority right or uh, he gives a whole bunch of examples as to where, like, there is some authority being exercised, but it would be antithetical to oppose that. And sometimes it's like, it's generally speaking stuff that the no, I don't really know who he's responding to. I don't know who these so-called anti-authoritarians that Mark that Engels is responding to. I don't know. I don't know who they are or what they thought. Maybe he's just talking about Bakunin again. Uh, he might be talking about Sterner, I'm not sure, but uh, you know I think that's pretty. His point is 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 pretty fair. Like you you need to have some sort of positive uh, self definition. You can't just say we're anti authority, anti authoritarian. Like that's 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 not a good way. You need to present some sort of positive uh, goal for the future, right? You need to say we want to construct a society that looks like this, this, and this, not just where yeah right like and that seems pretty reasonable that doesn't seem in any way at odds with with what i was just talking about um so i'm not saying marx was an anarchist (laughs) he definitely wasn't like but i am saying this doesn't sound this does none of this sounds very much like the marx you hear about he doesn't believe in the labor theory of value he doesn't believe in the centralized authority of the state. I don't know. What else have, what else have, have I been wrong about? I was just listening to the Radio Lab podcast while I walked the dog. This is something I regularly do. And the Radio Lab podcast is a good podcast as long as you're aware of what it is. It's, a, it's like a PBS science type podcast. It, it's very much going to be edutainment of what... So it's very much a PBS um, edutainment science thing, right? Like, you're not coming here necessarily to find anything crazy robust, uh, but it can be, it's still interesting. It's more, it's very well presented. That's the main thing. Um, and they turn it into, into news stories, you know? It has all of the problems that science journalism generally has. Uh, but as long as you're aware of that while you're listening to it, it's fine. Um, and it's often very entertaining, and it's it's very broad. They cover a lot of different topics. It's not just like it's it's science is the the general vibe, but that's such a broad thing. They cover they cover everything. They cover everything um, from abstract maths to um, you know biology, evolutionary biology to um i don't know uh astrophysics chemistry there's not that much chemistry to be honest it's the most boring science but they cover all sorts of things uh psychology lots of psychology which is kind of cringe but as long as you take it with a grain of salt it's fine so i like the radio lab podcast it's also it's just very well put together um and it's also it's it's interesting to do when you're walking a dog so I just listened to this episode of the Radio Lab podcast, which was about dividing by zero. Um, it it is called. Hold on, I'm going to get the exact episode up. Uh, it is called Zero World. Um, you can find it on YouTube on the Radio Lab YouTube channel if you want to listen to it. It's called Zero World, um, and uh, this is the basic idea of the. This is the basic idea. Um, the basic premise of this episode is there's this guy, there's this guy who's like a math educator. He's not a, 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 
a, a, like a university abstract mathematician guy. He's, he teaches math, he runs math programs um, for like practical mathematics. But he's come across this idea about dividing by zero, right? And he's, he's become obsessed with the idea of dividing by zero. But the problem is that you can't divide by zero. And you probably know about this, right? The idea being, um, the closer, the smaller the number you divide something by, the bigger the output you get, right? If you, if you take some, some number and you divide it by, by one, it's going to be as big as the number you start with, right? You, get, you know what I mean, and negative numbers and so on. So the implication is that if you divide, if you follow the lines, if you divide by zero, you should get you should be left with an infinitely large number, right? You, or you should basically be left with Im infinity as a number. And the other problem is that <clears throat> um, if you divide by zero, that you can't you can't turn it back, right? Like if if I take ten divided by five, I'm left with two, but then I can always go two times five and end up with ten back where I started. Whereas zero, whatever you multiply zero by is always zero, right? So if I go 10 divided by 0, I can't just go take whatever number I'm left with and go take that divided by 0 and end up back at 10. It doesn't work like that. So it breaks, it breaks the rules of division in, in that way and it breaks the rules of mathematics in that it results in the, the number infinity. But the problem is that infinity can't be a number. Right? You might have heard that, oh, you divide by 0, it becomes infinity. And so you should call it infinity, but the problem is then you're treating infinity as a number, which you're not supposed to do. And the reason is because infinity doesn't work like any other number, right? It doesn't work like a number. You can't do math to it. You take infinity plus one, it's still infinity. If you take infinity plus two, it's still infinity. And the implication of that is then one is equal to two, is equal to three, is equal to four, right? And that, that all, all numbers become equivalent to each other. And so that's the thing that this guy has become stuck on. With this guy who sounds like he's developing schizophrenia, <laughs> he's become stuck on this idea that what if all numbers are actually equivalent to all other numbers, and this has been staring us in the face, but no one is willing to take the step to divide by infinity. I need to quit my job and go live in the desert in a tent so that I can figure out how to divide by, divide by zero and, and create a new bunch of mathematics, um, which just sounds like something an insane person would do to me. But the real issue here is that when he actually talks about this, he starts talking in very abstract terms, right? About about the continuity of of everything, the 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 idea that this discreteness of numbers might be some sort of illusion, and it's like holy shit! I wish these guys would read some philosophy. <laughs> like if if this guy if this guy would just read the book I'm reading right now, Marx in Motion, he would. He would have. He would wouldn't have so many problems. Like this guy, I don't remember this guy's name. Let me see if it says it in the uh, Karim Ani. If Karim would just fucking pick up uh, some 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 new materialist text. If he would if he would read Deleuze, okay. If he would read Deleuze, he would be he would be his problems would be solved. Cause he's getting all fucked up. Like, well, if everything's equal to zero, we just have a universe in which nothing is possible because everything is, is, is no longer discrete, it's just continuous. So in one way it's good because it, there's no difference, but in another way it's bad because the blah, blah, blah. But Bo doesn't understand motion. He doesn't understand flows. Like a universe can be discrete without being unflowing, without being static. That's not how, that's, it, Bo needs to fucking read some philosophy. Like he doesn't need to go into the desert he, did, he doesn't need to go into the desert and develop a new branch of mathematics. He needs to open up a philosophy textbook. He needs to read, he just needs to read any Deleuze and Guattari book in which they talk about the rhizome. He just, that's all he needs to do. He just needs to read about machinic assemblages and rhizomes. And then he'll be like, oh, that's what I was talking about the whole time. I just, I only had mathematical language to explain it. What I meant was, the, the, that the, you know, these are all a series of flows and movements and intensities, but they're not described, they're not, they're not ultimately discrete, right? Which is, which is at least my, my take on whatever you want to call it, metaphysics or ontology or whatever. Um, or, or this guy should just read Marx in Motion by Thomas Nail, which is, uh, which is also talking about a similar thing. 
and is also obviously somewhat Deleuze inspired, somewhat Spinoza inspired, but obviously Marx inspired as well. But the point is, it's very interesting that I accidentally watched this random episode of of Radio Lab that happens to be very, very much about the exact same type of philosophy that I'm reading about right now, right? Like, this this Marx in Motion book is entirely proposing a metaphysics that deals with exactly this problem, the the issue of a disc, like a discrete versus a continuous universe. Um, the idea of uh, flows and, and movement being the basis of reality rather than particles, discrete particles and atoms, uh, you know, this kind of materialism. Kinetic, so-called, what this guy calls kinetic materialism. It's interesting that I, uh, I'm reading that at the same time as, as I'm, I'm watching this, and it's just making me realize how much mathematicians don't know anything about philosophy. <laughs> They haven't thought about any of this before. Remember when I was watching that anime, uh, Chilling in Another World with my level 2 super cheap powers, aka Level 2 kara chito datta motto yusha koho no matari isekai raifu. Remember when I was watching that anime? Let me tell you about the problem with this anime. Obviously, no one expected it to be good. When I started watching, I didn't expect it to be good because of because it's what it is. But let me let me explain this show. This is the real problem with the, with this anime. Is that it entirely relies on you finding the wolf girl. When the wolf girl says the word Danna Sama, you're supposed to think that that's cute enough to carry the entire anime. And uh, if you don't find that particular wolf girl particularly cute. There's not, like, really a harem. Like, normally, in a show like this, you would have a harem where they they can hedge their bets, right? They have they have many different girls. So even if you don't find one girl particularly cute, there are lots of other girls that you, in the harem, and one of them is going to be good enough that you want to watch the show. And in this case, there's there, there are other girls in the show, uh, but they, they, they are, like, sidelined in favor of this one main wolf girl who says Danna Sama a lot and while I don't hate her I don't think she's annoying or a bad character or anything I also don't particularly find her particularly appealing and there's nothing particularly special about this character to me uh, right like she's very generic it's very like generic which isn't necessarily a problem it's just nothing special and so I don't really get a flush of moe when I hear her say Danna Sama and the show doesn't really have anything else going for it. Like, pretty much that nothing else exists in the show other than that. Everything, like, you might imagine it's like a power fantasy. But the thing is, these kinds of shows often aren't really power fantasies. Like, their power fantasies exist, and some of them are good, right? Some of them are bad. Like, Sword Art Online is a power fantasy. There's a lot of power fantasy anime, the Isekai shows, right? Um, but this, these types generally aren't. Because although the main character has... There's, there's never going to be any stakes in this show, right? Because the main character is just impossibly strong. Like, he literally is infinitely strong. That's the whole gimmick. Um, like, when he checks his stats, they're all set to infinity. So you're not going to get, like, interesting battles or anything. Because he can, he can always defeat any enemy with ease. There's the, you know, So there's no tension in any of the fights or, or anything. But the thing is... If that was a power fantasy, you would see that, you know, but it, you don't you don't get to see him really be the strongest guy, and when he is the strongest guy, it's not very interesting. Specifically because he doesn't want he doesn't care he's not there to get to get power. This isn't one of these like, a born as the son of a nobleman, and I work my way to the top of the hierarchy type things. This isn't reborn as the, the the prince who is in charge of the country. This like this is a slow life type isekai. This is a like yeah, I might be the strongest guy ever, but I just want to be left alone. I don't want to fight anyone, etc. So the fighting and politics of the world and whatever is basically meaningless. Um the main character is obviously just just an empty signifier. Um, so it all kind of comes down, and there, there's not really any other fleshed out characters other than 
the main girl, the wolf girl. So if you don't find, if you, if you watched this show and thought that she was fucking amazing and somehow you were really into the character design or something like that, um, <clears throat> you know, this would be the best show ever. But for, for me who just finds it like, meh, it's kind of a bit much. I wanted to bring up an interesting guy, an interesting case. You see, there's this YouTuber called Winter Garden, who's been around for a long time. And about 10 years ago, he went mega viral because he built a machine that plays music by dropping marbles onto a glockenspiel type thing and a bass guitar and some drums. And it's all hand cranked, no electricity. And it's a very, very impressive bit of engineering. And the song's pretty catchy too. And so this marble machine, you've almost certainly seen it. It has like 200 million views. Uh, so then he decided to make another one, the Marble Machine X. And I watched him spend years <laughs> faffing about, somehow doing loads of stuff and getting nothing done until eventually he just scrapped the idea entirely. But not because he wanted to stop making marble machines. I don't really understand why. He doesn't seem to really understand why. Um, and he's still at it. <laughs> Except now he's got a completely new idea which looks even more insane and unachievable. Like there's just, it just looks like something that's never gonna happen. It just looks like an impossible feat event. Like, I mean, it, it, it just seems ridiculously difficult to build the thing that he's he's trying to make now. The, the Marble Machine 3.0 type thing, which requires two people to operate it. I mean, I don't even know, I don't even know what to say just just an insane <laughs> version of the marvel machine but what's interesting is he he skirts this line between like single-mindedly motivated uh you know in a in a in a in a positive way and like obsessive in a in an unhealthy way and it's very strange to watch because he has just been doing basically the same thing, trying to make this perfect idea of a marble machine for like a decade now. And the strange thing about it is that his marble machine is like the, the marble machine X, which he fully built. It's a working thing and is massive and technically complex. And it works. You can find a bunch of videos of it just working. But it doesn't work 100% flawlessly 100% of the time. Sometimes it will drop a marble. And we're talking 99 point something percent accurate. But that last point whatever is too much for him. And so he gave up on the entire idea and, and decided to start from scratch entirely. Which, which is very strange. I don't, I don't really understand what that was about. Um, but yeah, very strange. This is a very strange person because I can also, you can tell he is like, at some point he got really big into like self-help stuff. Like he'd, he'd, he will spit like 50 different self-help things that you vaguely heard about at you. Like, just in the middle of it, you know what I mean? Which I feel kind of bad. That's the bit I do feel bad about. Because, like, I think he d people deserve better than self-help airport books, okay? People deserve better than these, like, flimsy pseudo-philosophies. I, 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 I don't like that stuff at all. <clears throat> um, and it, I wish he hadn't gone into that stuff. But then again, maybe he wouldn't be making this interesting thing but then again maybe he would have put the interesting thing out and actually finished it instead of just endlessly keeping going because it's not quite perfect it needs to be perfect that's how i imagine him 
It needs to be perfect. It's not perfect. It's not quite, but it's not that perfect. It needs to be perfect. You know? <laughs> but then, is that admirable? Or what? And also, like, if he is a bit, old, a little bit nuts about it, if he is a little bit crazy, like, okay, cool. You know, that's what weird artists are kind of supposed to be. I wish the music was weirder, personally. Music is, is, is like, catchy, but, but uninteresting. It sounds like YouTube video background music. Um... The the engineering's definitely I don't know I gotta I gotta I gotta put a little bit of respect on his name, cause he has been he's been, he's doing something, he's definitely doing something, but he's always seems to be looking for little tricks. This is the thing, like he's always looking for little tricks. You look through his videos, and a lot of them were about finding, like, engineering solutions to problems, and that's cool. But then a lot of them are about like, hey. A, a little trick that's gonna change everything with this one simple trick, and then it obviously doesn't change everything. Like, I don't know. He's done this so many times. I'm gonna prototype with Lego. Oh my god. I'm gonna prototype in CAD. Wow. I learned how to weld. This is gonna change everything. Never mind. I wanna make it out of wood actually. Uh, like, oh, this this particular technique for for dividing up marbles into equal groups, and then like two weeks later. It's gonna be like, oh, this actually has a this actually has a problem. Um, oh, this this random machine has a solution. Um, oh, Marie Kondo. Oh, fucking uh, Pixar planning. Yo, actually, I'm gonna model stuff in cardboard because CAD is too slow. Actually, I'm gonna make a text document with all my design philosophy on it first. Like, it, it's just, you know what I mean. Like, every time, he just seems obsessed with these, like, tricks. And maybe that, maybe it works. I don't know. Look, if his new Marble Machine 3.0, it's not called that. It doesn't have an official name, but it's the, the big one, the biggest possible one. If his new one actually gets completed and he goes on tour with it, as he's planning to do, then I'm going to be very impressed. And listen, I've I got to hand it to him. But it seems to me like his attitude is just preventing him from ever getting anything actually done because he is making perfect the enemy of good, uh, which is something I dislike. I think there's um, the person who runs cybergrunge.net, Ali Void, she has a blog post where she's talking about the hu- this heuristic, no X is better than bad X. But I personally disagree with this heuristic. And t- to be fair, in her blog post, she says that it's it's just an interesting heuristic apply. It's not supposed to be some rule of the universe. It's just a little a little interesting thing. But anyway, like I would much rather have like a cool marble machine that is 99% accurate than nothing. Like I think that's kind of lame. But at the same time, maybe this guy is like come to the some sort of zen nirvana where he's purely like the only thing that matters is that I learn and grow while I'm making the machine. The, the, who gives a fuck about the final product? It, it, like, you know those people who make, make like, the Buddhists who make complex sand mandalas and then they destroy them because, because all that matters is the process, you know, and everything's transient. Like, maybe if he's on that Zen shit, then I got, then I got to definitely put some respect on his name. But, but he doesn't seem to be on that Zen shit. He seems to be on... I don't know what he's on. <laughs> he's he's on something. Uh, he's definitely a little bit insane, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. There's nothing wrong with being. A, I'm also a little bit insane. Look, all the best people are a little bit insane. So uh, you know, shouts out to Winter Garden. That's all I got to say about that. I just watched this video. Um, I just watched this video that has like 200 views on a channel with 26 subscribers, um, <laughs> which technically makes this punching down, which is very rare. Very rare, the very rare no thank you punching down. There's not many people I'm above, so I don't often get the opportunity to punch down. Um, but I just randomly, uh, well, Dula sent me this video, and it's called TF2 Community Rage Ranting. And, uh, The basic idea of the video, it's four minutes of this guy uh, shouting about 
how the TF2 community is is lay Reddit and lay bad, right? Uh, and of course he's right. Uh, I don't really. I'm just kind of confused about it. I'm kind of. He seems very muddled. He's his. I mean, of course the point is just to be a, a shouty rat. It's it's probably not supposed to be very well thought through. It's a channel with twenty subscribers. I doubt that this guy thought this video would even get two hundred views or whatever, right? Uh, but it seems to have made its way into the algorithm. Um, and this is something I knew would happen when I saw Fix TF2, is that, like, <coughs> I have been seeing a steady increase of people who find the TF2 community to be really obnoxious and annoying. And uh, I think that's for good reason, which is that the TF2 community is really obnoxious and annoying. This is not the case for Team Fortress 2 Classic, which is most of what I play these days anyway. The TF2 Classic community is amazing, because it's a small insular community of people who all generally know each other and are super passionate about a very niche thing. It's small enough and gatekept enough, gatekept enough for it to still remain a quality community. Team Fortress 2 is one of the most popular video games of all time. Of course it doesn't have a good community. What are you talking about? Even calling the TF2 community a thing is kind of insane. We're talking about tens of thousands of people here, even lowballing it, right? We're still tens of thousands of people. And even people who don't actively play the game, whatever. The point is, what the fuck are you expecting? Uh, to quote the scout from TF2, if you were from where I was from, you'd be dead, okay? Because I'm, I'm a fucking anime fan. At least historically I have been. And if you want to talk about a community with a uh, gigantic, extremely cringe Reddit contingent, it's the anime community. Like, it's if if someone says, if, if you play, the guy who made this video definitely plays TF2, right? If they go to someone and say, oh, I play TF2, and the other guy says, oh, I also like playing TF2, the chances are they're going to get along. Even if there's a possibility that the other guy is a cringe Redditor, they can at least get along and agree on most things in the game and so on, right? The anime community is much worse. Because, it's it, you know, I remember getting into anime and being excited to be a member of the community until I very quickly found out that everyone has the worst opinions ever. <laughs> and that there's only really a small, tiny subset of the anime community that is even worth listening to or even, you know, reasonable. Like, when it comes to the anime community, as in people who watch and talk about anime beyond just, like, the mo like the, the Pokemon when they were kids, right? The, when it comes to that, if I were to divide it up, I would say it's about, it's about 80% people who just watch popular shonen, right? Or maybe even higher. 80 to 90% of the anime community are people who are only interested in... You know, the Jujutsu Kaisens, the My Hero Academias, the Dragon Balls, the One Pieces, etc. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, I did just lump all of those shows together, but a lot of these are very bad, right? Like, these are the people who are big into Jujutsu Kaisen and, um, and uh, fucking, what's the other one I'm thinking of? Kimetsu no Yaiba, you know, these people. They're, they're effectively like subhumans, right? And then you've got the, so that's about, let's say, 80 to, let's say 80 to 90%. Let's, let's keep it, let's say it's just 80, even though it's almost certainly higher, right? Then another like 15% of the anime community are the people who actually keep up and watch. See the, 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 these are the people who watch like seasonal shows. Uh, every season, they might watch the top few seasonal shows that are most popular. So, you know, the people who were watching Freyren, the people who were watching, um, I don't even know what's popular these days. What's, what's popular? Let's find out. Let's find out what's popular. Seasonal anime. Oshino, Oshino Ko. The people who are watching Kimetsu no Yaiba season whatever, I don't even know what that is. The people who are watching, what the fuck is Ore Dake Devaru Up Naken? I don't even, I've never even heard of this show, and it's the most popular show of winter 2024. You know what I'm saying? People who are really, in, like Mashal, like Mashal has a, has a big thing. Dungeon Meshi has a big thing. Dungeon Meshi's probably good. I don't want to necessarily rub that in. But it's not necessarily that they just like bad shows. 
right? Like, hey, the most popular show of last season was Konosuba Season 3. And I liked the first two seasons of Konosuba. I haven't seen Season 3 yet, but I liked that. So, like, it's not necessarily that the shows are bad. It's just that, like, these people are... are they don't... Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know what I'm trying to tell you? Like, they don't really have much depth to them. They're only interested in what's most popular, the broadest appeal possible shows. And then within that last 5% of the anime community, so everyone other than that, this is a Giga Redditor. So we've, we've got Redditors, we, like Puri Aju, and then like Giga Redditors, failed normie types, right, you know. And then in the last 5%, you've got people who are actually, you, the only people who are actually know anything and watch anything and have any opinions worth listening to. And then most of those people... <clears throat> The majority of that 5%, let's say like, uh, I don't know, 4% the, the four, four of that remaining 5%, they, they are like the people who are like, oh, anime is, is some sort of art form. Anime is an art form and a medium. And they're probably like, Bo hasn't seen anything from before the year 2000, cringe. You know, they're probably that kind of person. They probably you look at their their like favorites list on Mal and it's they've got some like some shit from the eighties that you've never heard of and they the thing is they don't even like it that much but they just think it makes them look cool. Then the sort of people who like never give they're like oh yeah I've watched five thousand anime but my average like I have to make sure my average score is really low so everyone knows that I hate everything. I don't know. There's a type of person that exists. Um, <clears throat> like they're probably gonna tell you to watch the irresponsible Captain Tyler. They're probably this kind of person. But they might not be. Like, they might not necessarily be an old head enjoyer type guy. Like, they might be uh, an, a, the new head version of that. Like, they might be really into Land of the Lustrous. They might be really into Dunmesh. They might be, you know, that kind of... <clears throat> well, these people exist. Then there's a quantity of people, and I somewhat fit into this, who are... I think I've fucked up the percentages here, okay? Can we ignore any of the percentages? I think I've got a twisted and fucked up view of the anime community. The point I'm trying to make is that the is that the, the quantity of people who actually have anything reasonable to say is really, really small. The majority of people are, like, either just interested in popular shonen, just interested in the seasonal, uh, the most popular seasonal anime. Below that, the this is the group I forgot about teenage boys who just want to watch boobs and that's fine you can be that i'm not against that but the anime community itself is just so bad it's like the, there's no such that like the these are the people that i disparagingly refer to it's not just me other people say this as well the people that we disparagingly refer to as anime fans or the anime fandom right like that's that's what we're dealing with here, because you have to set up, like, that's how cringe it is. If you were from where I was from, you'd be fucking dead, right? Because if you think the TF2 community is cringe, and you, but you're getting to that by going on Reddit, like, bro, I dare you, should we go on reddit.com slash r slash animemes right now? Did I spell that right? Yeah. Nope, I did not spell that right. r slash animemes. I put an extra anime memes. Okay. <clears throat> uh, yeah, immediately. Just immediately, it's so bad. It's just, I don't, I'm not even going to describe what I'm saying. You can go on r slash anime memes yourself and you can see how bad it is. You can see how bad it is for yourself. But, I mean, if you want to get blackpilled about these people, it's just not good. It's just not a good situation that we're in. Okay? So... So that's what I'm dealing with. And then somehow I got to live this. And it's not even, you might be thinking like, oh, that, like, I, that I'm trying to make some distinction between noobs, noobs, and exp but it's not that. Because you look at like, the most popular anime podcast is Trash Taste, right? And like, a clip has been floating around of Trash, like all the people on Trash Taste, you, who, who is it? It's Giguk, it's Connor, voice actor, and it's, um, and it's the anime man, right? And out of all of those people, the anime man, surprisingly, being like the most normie of them. Actually, that's not true. Sea Dog's the most normie of them. The, what I'm trying to say is, I I have a memory when the anime man was the biggest anime YouTube channel, so I see him as like the most broad appeal anime 
culture, like anime fandom, you know, whatever. But he actually has good taste. Like, you wouldn't expect him to have good taste, but he does have pretty good taste. Um, Sea Dog VA doesn't even watch anime. Like, he's he's very open about the fact that he doesn't even watch anime. And then Giguk is just a weird fucking guy. Like, <laughs> I don't even know what to say about him. But, <clears throat> like, there's been a clip floating around in, in uh, visual novel communities... Uh, where 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 uh, the Giguk was was on the, on the fucking Trash Taste podcast, and he was like, "Bro, all of these visual novels they're just too damn long. You got to sit through so much." And then you look at the context of what he's talking about, and he's talking about the slice of life section at the beginning of Doki Doki Literature Club, which is like an hour at, if at most if you're reading slowly. It's like an hour, and it's fucking Doki Doki Literature Club, which is like eight hours long like the entire thing like these people they're not people of good moral substance and Gaguk is not some noob fake anime fan he's been watching anime for longer than me he's watched more shows than me like you know these people aren't you can't call them posers they're not posers they just they just I don't understand it it's just a bunch of people who hate anime who for some reason find themselves continually watching anime. And that's how I feel about the guy who made this video about Team Fortress 2. See? I managed to make a I managed to say I managed to take this which is originally supposed to be the podcast where I don't talk about Team Fortress 2. And once again, I managed to almost I managed to almost bring up TF2 and twist it into not being about TF2 is the point I'm trying to make is a broader point about online communities. Online communities are terrible, especially the the ones centered around Reddit. This should be known. And if you let that affect you, then then you're just weak. You're just weak as a person. Like I I know I'm talking about Team Fortress 2 again, but I'm trying not to talk about specifics or weapon balance or anything because you guys don't want to hear about that. Um, I don't even I haven't even been playing TF2 recently. Um, I've just been like reading books and shit uh, and watching YouTube shorts. Uh, but when I play TF2, I play on Uncle Topia servers. And Uncle Topia servers are pretty famous for having a really bad chat. Everyone is incredibly cringe in these servers. If you don't have the ability to just tune that out, you're an idiot. Like, just either turn the chat off, which you can do in, in a, with a console command, or just ignore it. Like, it's not that hard. It's really not that hard at all. You can just do that. <laughs> it's not that hard. Like, it. I don't understand. Every, this is the thing, is that every gaming community thinks it has the best community. I remember being back in Counter-Strike, right? And the Counter-Strike community is constantly making posts about how much better the Counter-Strike community is than the Valorant community. Like, bro, and they, they, they've just, they're just trying to force this meme. Everyone has just been trying to force this meme The Valorant is full of, like, cringe e-daters. The thing is, like, I've never played Valorant, but that's just not the case. The people who play Valorant are just normal-ass people. Like, they're just completely normal-ass people. They're mostly, like, teenagers, because that's most of who plays video games. Because they have a lot of free time. Like, Valorant is not full of cringe e-daters. It's just full of normal fucking people. This idea that Counter-Strike has some unique community... Like, it does, but the CSGO community was super proud of being full of, like, really toxic Russians. And, yeah, I agree. Like, I played Counter-Strike a lot and met about a million really toxic... Actually, to be honest, the Russians... The toxicity of Russians in Counter-Strike has been vastly overstated. I often found that if you can get good rapport with the Russian teammates, if if they hit you with some bullshit... And you spit back with the you, with with a little bit of Russian, if you can say uh you know, spasiba yene pravaru teruski suka blad idi na koi pizdek you know if you can say that, vodka yes 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 da, I drink vodka, everyone's having fun everyone's having fun and then you go rushbi suka blad and then everyone gets involved and it's all good no one's mad about it it's not the Russians that are the worst it's often the Germans that's the worst. 
Germans fucking mold in video games for some reason. I don't know. Germany is just a terrible country. I think if I had to pick my least favorite country in the world, it would be Germany. Something needs to be done about Germans. They're terrible. They just never... I don't know if you guys are history buffs, but first of all... <laughs> but I don't know what the fuck is going on in Germany, man. What a terrible country full of terrible people. I hate Germans. They make good techno, though. I gotta give them that. I gotta, get, I gotta hand it to Kraftwerk. And I gotta hand it to, 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 to German techno. But outside of that, garbage fucking country. It's gay Germans who are okay. We're okay with gay Germans. We're not okay with any other kind of Germans. That's, that's where I'm at right now. But anyway, sorry for my xenophobic rant about how much I hate Germany. Uh, they, they do it to themselves. Where was I? Right, so the Counter-Strike community is famous for being very toxic. The thing is, like, the Counter-Strike community isn't more toxic than any other competitive online video game. Like, you know what other com- communities are famous for being very toxic? The Valorant community is pretty famous for being toxic. The League of Legends community is famous for being toxic. And even to some extent, like, the TF2 community, you can, although, like, on the one hand, I don't even understand, there's a lot of memes about about Putus and friendlies and whatever. There were also so many memes about how toxic the, the TF2 community is because it's, like, completely unmoderated on official servers, right? Like, th- this is a very common thing. You, you know, I've seen conscientious objectors with Nazi imagery on them a million times. Like, that's just how TF2 is. And the reason is, because it's a fucking video game. It's not a real community. There's not a real fucking community. Like, what do you expect that, like, video games don't have communities. They just have player bases. Like, I don't know what you want. What are you expecting? What is this good, what is this game with a good community that you're imagining in your head? Like, I know what, like, a game with a good community is. TF2 Classic. That's a game with a good community. Because it's small enough that it's actually a community. It's like a thousand people. You know, like it's small enough that that everyone and and there's there's like a specific enough focused on a specific thing, niche enough, small enough, whatever, that uh you know it it counts as a good community, but but nothing like like a a popular mainstream AAA video game is gonna have a like what are you expecting? I don't I don't fucking know. I don't understand. If you don't have the ability to just tune it out, then then you're an idiot. You know. You hate them and then you move on. That's what you do. That's what I've done with the with the anime fans my whole life. You hate them, you call them normies, and you move on with your life. Can I ask you a question? How is Duolingo still in business? Like, you'd think at a certain point, people would have realized that no one's ever learned a language using Duolingo, and they would have failed because no one's ever learned a language using the app that tells you it's going to help you learn a language, you know? Like, you would imagine that people would have figured out by now that you can't learn a language by just doing Duolingo, right? But, but it seems like that hasn't, that hasn't happened. Like, don't get me wrong, you can learn some, some bits of a language, you can learn some vocab, you can learn some basic phrases that are fully helpful, but you can't actually learn a language using Duol- Duolingo. Like, doesn't everyone know? Like, everyone knows this, right? I, I, I hope. Like you know how to learn a language, right? It's one of those situations where the the online weeb community in trying to learn Japanese has, like, figured out optimal language learning strategies. Like, we know. If you're, if you're a weeb, you, if you're an otaku, even if you haven't learned Japanese, like I haven't, you know how what it takes to learn a language. You know what the best method is, right? You do Anki decks to memorize kanji and vocab and you do that for like two hours a day and then you also just do maximum immersion all time as much as possible and there's no shortcut there's no cheap little shortcut fun little funny app that you can do to to learn to learn japanese you just have to fucking mine kanji from 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 anime all day you just have to do maximum immersion all the time you just have to be doing like shit loads of input for like a year along with Anki's for like a year like you know there's at least and that's quick like there's and then you there's no there's no shortcuts right there simply aren't any shortcuts you need comprehensible input and study 
for a long time. You don't, when I say study, what I, I don't mean trying to memorize grammar rules. I mean doing immersion, which is not easy. Like people will try and sell you this method by saying like, hey, you can learn Japanese by just watching anime. But just watching anime actually involves watching an episode uh, in English or like with English subtitles, then going back and watching it back with Japanese subtitles. In the meantime, um, you know, mining those subtitles for kanji, which you can then input into your Anki deck and then doing at least two hours of Anki per day, you know, and doing this for like four hours a day of immersion at least. And then uh, two hours of like, you know, it's a full time job, basically. It's not you can't half ass it. And that's the you can. The other thing about language learning is that like it's, it's not something you can do by just spreading it out in shorter bursts over a longer period of time. Like the more intensive you do it, the better it works. Um, <clears throat> so there's there's no shortcut, even like that old Japanese all the time or whatever you want to call it. Uh, where you get to watch anime you're not just watching anime though like really it turns watching anime into a job it's a grind it's the sort of thing that would appeal to people who are really into mmos but it's not you know it's not easy <laughs> it, it might be fun like for people who enjoy and i, I look i did I never imagined that i would be someone who enjoyed doing ankis until i learned toki pona and hey actually it is pretty fun to progress while you're memorizing something. Learning Toki Bona has given me that, you know, the idea that actually, hey, le you know, the thing that's always put me off of Japanese learning was having to memorize thousands of kanji. But if it's anything like, I mean, if it's just a, a an embiggened version of learning the, the, you know, 125 Toki Pona words, I could imagine getting into the habit of, of grinding that. I could imagine it, it's actually pretty fun when you, when you see yourself, you get to watch yourself get better and improve. That's that's a that's a pretty fun grind. But so it's it might be fun for some people in some parts, but it's not easy, and it's not it's definitely hard work. And I'm still not sitting here and saying I could do that because honestly I don't know if I have the dedication to do that in an effective way. Right? You can't half-ass language learning. You're definitely no matter what you do. You will never learn a language by doing a few hours a week in school of Spanish lessons or whatever, right? That's just not how you need maximum immersion. You need to be fully immersed in the language with as much native comprehensible input as possible throughout the day, right? That's how you learn a language because that's how, that's how babies learn languages. That's how your brain is programmed to learn a language. The optimal way has been figured out, like little tweaks here and there about certain techniques or whatever. Can there, there are lots of different programs that will tell you to do different things, but the general vibe is you do as much immersion as possible all the time and you do Ankis for vocab. It doesn't, you know, obviously in Japanese you're doing Ankis for kanji. I'm sure learning Chinese or, or Mandarin is, is uh, well, the writing system is just Chinese, but the, right? Like, if I remember correct, yeah, anyway. Uh, people say there's no such thing as Chinese language, but there is, a, like, the writing system is Chinese. The diet that, you know what I mean? Am I crazy here? Maybe I'm wrong about that, but I'm pretty sure that's how it is. Anyway, the point being, uh, how is Duolingo successful? You can't learn a language on Duolingo. I did, I've done a tiny, tiny bit of Duolingo French, um, just sort of to fuck around. I just wanted to try it out like, a, like three years ago or something. I, I just downloaded it and fucked around with it for an afternoon. Like it's, that's not how you learn a language. <laughs> like it's simply not, uh, you know? If you wanted to learn French, you'd have to gather a fuckload of French media with French subtitles, ideally, um, and just grind. You just have to grind like fucking crazy. You just have to get Anki deck with French vocab words and a whole bunch of French TV shows and movies and stuff. And ideally with French subtitles. And you'd have to just fucking grind. Like, you'd have to be constantly grinding of trying to figure out every single line of dialogue in every single thing, you know what I mean, right? Like, or just move to France and do that. Like, that's the optimal way. The really optimal way to learn a language is to do everything I just said, but also move to the country where they speak the language. And that way, even when you're not doing immersion, you're doing immersion, right? Uh, like, that's the super hyper optimal way, but obviously that's a bit, bit much. Point being... 
we know how you learn a language. Like it's there's, it's uncontroversial. There are extra things you can do, like sometimes, you know, intensive lessons, like four hours. Like there are some people who the CIA, right? They do like these super intensive full day language learning and like things where you go to school, you like like you go to special classes and you're actually learning the grammar rules, like not just intuitively through immersion, but intentionally and and they do all this stuff and stuff right like and lots of people will debate how effective that is and whatever but the the point being language learning is just one of these things where it kind of doesn't work unless you do it extremely intensively it's not something where it's like if you if you, if you spend the same amount of hours spread over a longer period of time it, it results in the same thing like that's not how your brain learns languages you have to do it just to, as intensively as you possibly can. So the point, and I'm not a language learning expert, this is just what I've heard, right? So the point being, the point, the ultimate point being, like, why is anyone still fucking around on Duolingo? Man, I wish I could find a way to stop my computer from just automatically lowering the input volume. Oh, well, that's what I get for using an Apple Macintosh. Uh... I'm I'm definitely I would have brought my ThinkPad with me if I could fit it in my bag, but it it wouldn't fit in my bag, so I couldn't bring it. Anyway, oh look, we're actually pretty deep into the podcast. I want to talk about Minecraft. You guys ever heard of this game? Uh, Minecraft. Uh, I've been watching some Minecraft videos recently on YouTube. Uh, and I've been thinking, I've been thinking about the game. Because I've always had these, I've I've had this theory about Minecraft for like a few years, that like, it's all the thing about Minecraft is it's not really like any other game, right? It's it's very, it's very unique and it's hard to judge. Like I keep thinking to myself, like is Minecraft a, a bad game? Is Minecraft a good game? What does the game like? What const- constitutes the game of Minecraft even, right? Like, these days. What's weird about the design of Minecraft is that at the start of Minecraft, right, in the earlier days, it was basically unplayable unless you already knew how to play it, which was fine because everyone who played Minecraft played it because they'd seen YouTubers play Minecraft, right? Um, And so it was fine. Like, you didn't need some tutorial about how to build a nether portal. You didn't need crafting recipes, like, next to your crafting table or whatever that would automatically show up because you already knew how to do all that stuff because you'd been watching the Yogg's cast all day, right? And then as Minecraft has gotten more ubiquitous and more popular, they've taken out <laughs> all of the stuff that relies on external um, knowledge on the on the internet, which I, I don't like this. I'm definitely in full agreement with the Cruelty Squad developer that, like, game devs for some reason think that having to consult a wiki is like some sort of cardinal sin no consulting a wiki is fun gameplay and i refuse to i refuse to uh to to bow to people who are like no you can't have to look up a guide online to know how to complete something it's fun to look up a guide online i just i find it fun lots of people find it fun lots of the best games ever are like unplayable without a guide or at least much better with some wiki or guidance material out there it's it feels fun to to dig through a wiki and do your own research and then come to a deeper understanding of the game's mechanics like that's fun that's a fun human activity it feels like you're learning something because you're actually learning something that's my take on the yellow paint discourse but minecraft is a good example of that that like what happened was there was there was no way in the game to know how the fuck to build a nether portal you could see in the achievements tab that a nether portal was a thing that existed and that it that it was made using obsidian but you couldn't know anything beyond that there was no information in the game beyond that which didn't matter because everyone who played minecraft already knew what a nether portal was but then one guy one japanese guy called piro pito made a Minecraft Let's Play where he specifically challenged himself to go in completely blind knowing nothing about Minecraft um, and he got stuck because he couldn't figure out how to build a nether portal. So they added, and Minecraft devs had been watching his, his playthrough and uh, like 
explicitly like they tweeted about multiple minecraft devs had tweeted about it and commented on his videos and by the way it's a great playthrough and pito pito is a cool guy he he like made a bunch of interesting horror youtube videos in the early days of youtube like i watched all of his gameplay i've still watched his videos um the videos are good but uh, the minecraft devs you know uh having this opportunity to see someone play through their game with no external resources suddenly realized wait we did forget to put any information about how to like build an other portal in the game and so they they did right they they added ruined portals to indicate how to do that and that's not a bad thing like it's fine that ruined portals are in the game i'm not against that what i'm saying is i i don't care about the d design philosophy of like catering to the one guy who's doing a challenge run to go in completely blind and 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 not read any comments and not read any wikis and and whatever like you shouldn't cater to that one guy that's not that that doesn't seem like a good idea to me anyway uh but i've ever since i thought about that how like minecraft without minecraft youtube would have sucked no one would have played it minecraft is only good because of wikis and youtube and stuff like that and ever since i started thinking about that some time ago i've kept kind of how trying to have a thesis about like what what's going on with this fucking game you know um and i think i finally come to come to the conclusion about what minecraft is which is the minecraft isn't a game minecraft there's no there's minecraft doesn't exist like beca because the thing about minecraft is that that no nothing about it is particularly good right i hope i hope we can all agree on this like None of the individual mechanics that constitute Minecraft are very good, and they never really have been. Um, it's not very well programmed or well optimized to begin with. It doesn't look great, although it looks like iconic. Uh, you know, it looks like itself, which is, I guess, in a way, looking great. It does have a strong aesthetic. Um, anyway, it has good music. I'll say that. That's the that's the one thing Minecraft definitely has going for it that you can't criticize. Great, great soundtrack. Um, but anyway. Uh, so I figured it out. I figured out what's going on here, which is that Minecraft is not a video game. Minecraft, there's no, there's no singular video game called Minecraft. Instead, there are like five different media, or rather Minecraft is not a good game. It's like five mediocre games stuck together, right? The, the game, game number one, Minecraft is a survival RPG, um, where you, you try and, and run away from mobs and progress through through the the character progression now this is how minecraft used to be especially before the adventure update i think that's like beta 1.8 or whatever um but these days minecraft is definitely not this although it still has a bunch of these mechanics as sort of hangovers from when it was trying to be this um the thing is that minecraft as a survival rpg just sucks right it's not it's not very good as a survival rpg because the progression is trivially easy <laughs> you can get full diamond armor in like five minutes if you know what you're doing and getting that full diamond armor is not engaging gameplay it generally just consists of like strip mining um or trading with villagers you know it's it's not particularly engaging gameplay to progress through the the character upgrade skill tree and the other problem is that ever since sprinting was introduced survival has not been very difficult at all and in fact they keep making it easier because they know that the survival mechanics aren't what makes the game popular. You know, uh, it, it used to be that there was no sprint button. And you might think that that's just like an annoying thing. But having no sprint button was very important because it meant the mobs were faster than you. Like, you know how fighting baby zombies is, is fucking terrifying because they're faster than you? Like, that's how it, all mobs used to be. All mobs used to be faster than you. And so surviving the night was genuinely really difficult and scary and took a lot of preparation, even if you were like mid game, right? Uh, survival in Minecraft just used to be harder. But of course, the problem is that Minecraft sucks as this type of game, right? The combat sucks, the mob variety isn't very interesting, and most importantly, it's way too easy to progress through the, through the, the skill tree effectively, right? Like, it's too, it's very easy to trivialize pretty much every mob if you know what you're doing, right? Like, you can just, like, creepers, oh no, they're super scary when you're, like, 12 and have never played Minecraft before. But if you've played Minecraft before, you know that you can just build a too high pillar in front of you, and then the creeper will do, like, one heart of damage, you know? 
if you like put the, the blocks between you and it right and like every other mob except skeletons is just trivially easy to kill uh everything can be very trivialized it's 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 not it doesn't work very well as a survival rpg and it's moved away from being a survival game in general like there's the the rpg mechanics like no one fucking cares about them you know uh getting getting better gear and whatever like that just that's just the early game effectively most for, for most people who play minecraft that is what you do that's the like slog you have to do at the beginning of each each uh world in order to get to the real game right uh and once you're in the real game those mechanics just become kind of a pain that you have to deal with right like oh i, I guess i have to get some xp to heal my mending armor type stuff right oh i guess i have to ma manufacture fireworks to get my my elytra whatever um, so Minecraft is, is, is a survival RPG and some people really like that. And so the people who actually like that aspect of the game, they'll generally either play older pre-adventure update versions or they will, um, play, uh, mod packs like Better Than Adventure or Better Than Wolves, uh, because it is poorly implemented into the game as it exists right now. It's just too easy to trivialize, right? There was a sense of satisfaction in like carving out a little zone of safety for yourself in this harsh and difficult world but now the world is not harsh and difficult and it's just trivially easy to carve out a zone of safety for yourself okay so that's the first game minecraft is a not very good survival rpg the second game is minecraft is digital lego it's a it's a building simulator um now the problem with minecraft as a building simulator is that it fucking sucks <laughs> as 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 this right it's just not very good uh, the building mechanics are the most basic they could possibly be, you know, you just place one block at a time and that's it, which is why anyone who actually cares about building, they generally use mods, yeah, they generally use mods like world edit, or these days there's a better one called Axiom, uh, in order to build better, because Minecraft build default building is just extremely slow and arduous. You can't place more than one block at a time, and you can't place blocks like more than a tiny distance in front of you. So if you want to do any serious building, you kind of have to use either you know some sort of mod that expands the building capabilities. Especially because there are a whole bunch of arbitrary limits about what blocks you can place where, um, you know. So as Minecraft is sort of virtual Lego. Uh, and when it comes to that, there's two, there's then two more options. Like you can play in creative mode to go full virtual Lego, you know, situation, or you can play in survival, in which case every, all of your building is going to be constantly interrupted by the fact that you're running out of resources. So maybe in that situation, it's either two, two sub genres, either it's a pure digital Lego building game, or it's a resource gathering and building game. Um, but the resource gathering, as everyone knows, sucks and is boring. It's just strip mining. Like, there's no... There's, it's, it's, it's not very entertaining, uh, engaging gameplay. It just becomes really grindy very quickly. So, uh, yeah. Minecraft is not very good as a digital Lego set. Uh, the next game that Minecraft is, is it's a technical um, uh, automation game. It's, a, it's an automation uh idle game type thing kind of like uh not idle game but it's a game like like a factorio or uh maybe infinifactory it's a game about automating resources so that you can use those resources to automate new resources and so on and in my opinion this is the best part of minecraft but the problem with it is that it is all completely unintentional emergent design none of it was actually designed by a human being to be used the way it was it is. And so it's all extremely unintuitive and just takes, like, reading a wiki. And that's fine, as I just went on a whole rant about. I said this is the strongest part of Minecraft, in my opinion, because I love reading wikis, right? Uh, but it also means that a lot of the mechanics are very nonsensical and require exploiting glitches or exploits in the game. You know, glitches like TNT duping or exploits like getting onto the nether roof or, you know, deleting bedrock or there's all sorts of little bugs in the game or, or exploits or emergent features that you need to take advantage of in order to make efficient farms and what constitutes an efficient farm again it's completely emergent it doesn't make any intuitive sense that like hey if you build low to the bottom of the, the world you get better rates in your farms or 
if uh, you know you should clear out a perimeter or exploit the render distance by standing in a particular space so that so that you don't fill up the mob cap like all of these features like the mob cap which are extremely important to getting efficient farms are completely hidden from the player like you you know there's no way to access this information that is essential to building an efficient farm uh and so the game is clearly not designed around this mechanic even though i think it's pretty good uh there's also the fact that uh the same problem uh, occurs that you had with the digital lego set which is the m building in minecraft sucks minecraft is not a very good building game because the, the building mechanics are so basic and limited that people who are building complex technical machines, you're pretty much required to use Lightmatica these days if you're building anything super complex because it's just too, the building mechanics are too basic and too easy to fuck up. Um, so Minecraft is a accidental uh, automation type puzzle programming game, puzzle solving, whatever where you have this set of mechanics and you need to understand those mechanics and abuse them in order to maximize your productive efficiency, which you can use those resources to build new farms, right? Uh, but of course, because the game isn't designed around that, uh, you're always running into a whole bunch of problems where the other aspects of the game are just like bumping into you, uh, which are very annoying. And also, the game is poorly optimized, uh, and so doing that stuff on a server means that you can't just build the farm, you also have to take into account minimizing the lag of the farm and stuff like that, which is a fun technical challenge for those who are interested in that, but it just goes on to exemplify how none of this is intended play. All of this is just an emergent mechanic, which might be fun, but also means that in a lot of ways, it's like, if you wanted to play that kind of game, you know, it's, it's not exactly factorial. Uh, okay, next... What else is Minecraft? Minecraft is <clears throat> uh, a PvP and movement focused multiplayer game. Uh, this is how a lot of Zoomers play Minecraft. And in this aspect, the PvP obviously fucking sucks. Minecraft PvP is so basic and boring that I don't understand how anyone could possibly care about it. There's two versions of Minecraft PvP. There's the old mechanics and the new mechanics. The old mechanics consist entirely of spam clicking. <laughs> there is nothing else to it. You you just spam click as fast as you can. Like, I'm sure some people find that entertaining, but to me, just spam clicking is just not an interesting mechanic. I'm sorry. It's just not. Like, hey, if you don't have the correct type of mouse that allows you to butterfly click properly, and you don't, you don't have the correct type of fingers, like, sorry, you're not going to be that good at Minecraft PvP. Like, my old, old Mechanics Minecraft PvP is, is extremely basic. Uh, it's about as basic as you can get. It just consists of two people clicking at each other as fast as possible, with nothing, nothing else. And then you have modern Minecraft PvP, which is, uh, in trying to make it more interesting, it actually just makes it way more boring. Because now you have shields, and full netherite prop, prop armor, and, you know, health pots and strength pots and, uh, you know, axe is the, the meta weapon because it just does more damage than the sword, which I don't know why they put that in the game. Uh, and pearls, and uh, you can't just spam click, so it's, it's extremely slow. There's not really strategic or tactical. There's not really that many tactics you can use because the shield is, is just absurdly overpowered. I don't know why they put the shield in the game, man. It just trivial. Like, remember when I was talking about the survival elements of the game being trivialized? Like, the fact that you can get a shield super early game is just stupid. And then, on top of all of that, I didn't go in hard enough about how Minecraft has just, like, decimated any idea that it was once a survival game. Like, you can get a shield early game, and then there's also this item called a Totem of Undying, where you just can't die. <laughs> <laughs> and you would think, oh, well, they must have made that really hard to get then, right? Nope, you can make a farm for them. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> what were they thinking designing the game like this? I mean, maybe they they just really want to get away from any idea that this was once a survival game, and, and sure, fine. But that stuff makes PvP really fucking suck, because it's just about, like, 
you, you just hold up your shield and hold the totem in your offhand and you can't die. You literally, it's impossible to kill you. The only option they have is to just... It, it sucks. It's The Minecraft PvP fucking sucks and I don't understand why anyone thinks it's, it's like, good. However, Minecraft movement mechanics are much more interesting because... Uh, uh, you know, placing blocks is 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 a cool gimmick for for a movement based game, and so you get stuff like trip like tally bridging, god bridging, crazy shit, and uh, triple extender jumps and 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 neos and whatever. Like you guys know me, I'm always a sucker for movement mechanics in video games. Now I don't think Minecraft's movement system is that great, like compared to Source, obviously, because nothing will ever be better than Source. But the block placing stuff does add a lot of interest to it. However, it's also obviously not intended play. Like, you are definitely not supposed to be... Like, if you Google or, or, or go on YouTube and look up, like, Tally Bridge or, or, like, Advanced Minecraft Bridging or whatever, it's very clear that no one at Mojang knows how to do this, <laughs> you know? Because it takes, like, a thousand hours of practice to get good at it, and it requires clicking at fucking hyperspeed in order to place blocks fast enough on every tick so that you can c catch up to yourself and catch it. It's very cool to watch. It's extremely cool to watch, but it's also something that, like, 99% of the player base will just never be able to do technically. Um, however, the combination of these movement mechanics with the mediocre PvP makes the PvP a lot less shit, but still... Uh, so, you know, a lot of people are going to play the game in this way, like Bed Wars, for example, being very popular. <clears throat> a lot of YouTube content these days is about this side of the game as well. Um, and I think, to some extent, this is what Minecraft devs kind of want the game to be. Which is weird, because if you think about... My like, I don't know about you, but when I think about Minecraft, I'm not generally thinking, ah yes, Minecraft, the competitive PvP game. You know? <laughs> like, it just doesn't really gel with what I see as the soul of Minecraft. And because of that... It fucking sucks in a number of different ways, right? It's very easy to cheat and hack if you actually want to get competitive. Uh, you know, you're not loading up a game of Minecraft yourself. You're going on a server like Hypixel or whatever. Um, you you know, all of this stuff only makes sense if you ignore all of the, like, mechanics of the game. The progression tree of the game and whatever. And you just are given kits with, with stuff on it. It also requires abusing... Oh, abusing a bunch of mechanics that were put in as, like, jokes, like, uh, beds blowing up in the nether, for example, um, and, uh, yeah, you get to the point where the progression, the, 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 the skill creep, whatever you, power creep is what it's called, the power creep in Minecraft of, of like, uh, is just insane, and so PvP becomes really boring with, with high-level kits, I don't know, there's so many, there's, there's many aspects by which I don't think... I think this is for some reason what Minecraft devs are, are really focusing on, and it's clearly what a lot of people like about the game, but it's never done anything for me. It's always seemed pretty pretty damn boring to me. Like, it's just obvious. Like, Minecraft is not a not a good PvP game. It's not a first-person shooter. It's, you know, it just doesn't make any sense. Uh, then there's obviously subcategories of, of all of the things that I just mentioned. Like, Minecraft, for a lot of people, is a speedrunning game. And uh, Minecraft speedrunning, random seed, glitchless, used to be fucking terrible until they added bastions and, and uh, pearl trading and, and some of the stuff like that. And then suddenly it became, like, really entertaining. Although it is entirely RNG-based, that makes it, like, well, not entirely, but it is it is a lot of RNG, uh, which would make me fucking want to kill myself. I, I could never speedrun Minecraft. Uh, but, you know... And it also depends on abusing a joke mechanic, which is blowing up beds in the end to kill the Ender Dragon. Um, uh, but Minecraft is fun to watch as a speed game, even though I'd never play it personally. <clears throat> in large part because your character is actually weak, so survival is actually an important thing. Uh, yeah, Minecraft is fun as a speed game. Or to watch, at least, it's cool. But that's obviously not an intended, any sort of intended play. Um, and again, it's something that 99% of the play, player base will never be good enough to really experience, even though it's fun to watch. So, that's my basic point that I'm trying to make here. You can subdivide these categories, you know, further down into 
whatever each one can be subdivided obviously um but uh oh i I didn't talk about how technical automation minecraft if you get really into that you might end up playing you know a mod like terraformer craft or, or, or something which is this has been a something that's been in the game for a long time uh like i remember the tech tech pack back in the day um like mod packs that focus on industry and automation have been in the game for a long time because that that idea has been around for a long time but they've i've never been particularly into the mod packs but uh anyway you see what i'm saying like without mods each of these individual aspects of minecraft um aren't that fun right they they aren't that good without some external thing without hypixel setting up bed wars and pvp old school mods without uh, Axiom mod to help building without Lightmatica or Terraforma craft to make the automation more interesting without uh, Better Than Wolves or an old version of Minecraft to make survival more interesting etc etc there's you know and each of these games by itself is just not very good like it's not bad none of them are terrible but they're nothing special like none, none of these aspects of Minecraft are are that good on their own uh unless you're like super super into them uh but minecraft is successful because you you can establish a sort of hybrid play style where you do a little bit of all of these things you start by going through the rpg survival mechanic progression you go through the the linear story mode of the game you kill the ender dragon you get the elytra you kill the wither you know etc etc which then that progression leads into the automation side of the game, right? Like, upgrading your armor leads to making a villager farm. Making a villager farm means you now have villagers for an iron farm. Making an iron farm means you can build a bunch of hoppers to make, I don't know, a gold farm or something. Making a gold farm gives you a bunch of XP to enchant items, and then you can go fight the wither, and then you can get a beacon, and then getting a beacon means you can... Uh, put haste on your you know haste and then go mining much more efficiently uh and then you get a bunch of resources to build your next farm you know and and so on and so on right like hey maybe i need a slime farm in order to get slime blocks to to move move around items in the nether for my my uh my piglin farm my gold farm right uh like that's that's the general situation. You make an iron farm first, which iron farms are way too easy to make, uh, right? Uh, and then, then you you want to make a gold farm because you want a bunch of XP. It's a it's a good way to get a bunch of XP, and having a bunch of gold is very useful uh, for trading and stuff, uh, or for for bartering, I guess. <coughs> but in order to to have an efficient gold farm you need to move around blocks but you can't use water streams in the nether so you need to get slime blocks but slime blocks are hard to get a hold of unless you have enough slime farm so you're going to be setting up a slime farm then once you've got a gold farm you know maybe you want to set up an enderman farm uh an endo ender in the in the end so that you can get infinite xp and so on and so on maybe you want to set up a witch farm because you need redstone to build all of this stuff um, and so you're going to be digging out a big perimeter, which requires a fuckload of slime blocks and TNT. Well, you're going to be using TNT reapers, but, you know, there's all sorts of etc. etc. type situation, right? And then maybe you want to, you know, build a house, but your design for a house requires a bunch of prismarine. So then you're going to go ahead and set up a, a guardian farm, right? And now you have access to infinite prismarine. So you're going to do a bunch of complex building. And now you're in the building side of the game. You know, and then you build your base, you build it uh, like structures around all your different farms. And so now you're doing the building side of things. Uh, it said, you know what I mean, right? Like these things all interconnect. And then the whole time while you're playing, you're going to be fighting mobs and moving around the maps. And the better you are at movement mechanics, uh, you know, the less you're going to die, the more fun you're going to have. So uh, all of these play styles do slot together into a, a hybrid playstyle that, that I imagine is how most people play. But the hybrid playstyle is is kind of focused on automation, at least when it comes to the way I play. Uh, <clears throat> um, which is not something that the Minecraft devs are de designing around, uh, right? Which, I, I don't know, it's kind of puts the whole game in a weird, weird place. 
But the hybrid playstyle means that, yeah, each of the individual games isn't that fun, but you're not playing each of them for that long. And so overall, it evens out into a game that where the, the experience is like generally pretty good. Because you you know what I mean? Like, if if you it's it's better to play a mediocre game for a shorter amount of time rather than be forced to play that same mediocre game for a really long time. And so that sort of gets people to I don't know. What, I, I was gonna say believe they're having more fun than they actually are, uh, which I think is kind of true. But that's not really what I'm trying to say. I just mean like it circumvents the problem of having to make a good game. <laughs> <laughs> because because you just have five mediocre games uh and you're never spending enough time with each individual game to to care uh also of course you might be doing all of this on a server with other people which makes the game much much more fun um and then you're going to be introducing pvp stuff perhaps but uh right that's minecraft that's my take on minecraft right well i've truncated silences so uh didn't actually achieve that much. We only got an extra hour out of it, so enjoy this this 12-hour long podcast, which will come out soon, I guess. I want to make a response to Sensor Terminal Autism's Terminal Autism under my video about the Daylight Tablet. Now, in that video, uh, just to provide some context here... Hold on a fucking second. They better not have reset my audio again, but I wasn't looking. They didn't. Okay, we're fine. We're safe. We're safe. We live another day. Anyway, um, <clears throat> Sense of Terminal Autism is responding to something in my video. If you haven't seen that video, you know, I've been enjoying these videos that I've been making recently. I've been enjoying going going back to a very simple, stripped-back form of YouTube video where I just point a camera at a thing and ramble about it. That's pretty nice. I pretty, I pretty, pretty much like that. Just little, little random shit, you know? Little random little shit, and that's fun. We like doing little random little shit. Okay, that's enough of this side tangent. So, uh, just to really quick summarize, the Daylight Tablet is something that exists, and one of its marketing angles is that it's, like, distraction-free and simple and not addictive. And when I was proposing an alternative to the... 700 pound tablet and I was like you could buy a second hand laptop for like really cheap on eBay and just install minim- a really minimalist setup on there to get a distraction free stripped back experience that that isn't addictive right although to be fair uh, maybe that is kind of addictive <laughs> but anyway uh, you might be sitting around in config files a lot uh, sense of terminal autism, if I was going to be uncharitable, I would say purposefully decontextualized what I was talking about. But if I'm going to be charitable, I'm going to say sense of terminal autism took this as a point to leap off from into their own opinions about software minimalism, which we'll now read for the class. <clears throat> software minimalism is a bad meme. Brackets. Memeimalism. And a psyop. <laughs> Who who's a psyop? Who's who's the, really? You think the United States government is involved? <laughs> you think they establish suckless? Come on. It's really just laziness. Making good programs is requires being competent. So let's just not try. Let's just use bad programs with no features (parentheses) in bad languages that aren't extensible to (close parentheses) and let the corporate bloat maxes take over the desktop. What could possibly go wrong? Software min-maxing is where it's at. As much functionality as you can get for as little as possible. Also, extensibility, which almost nothing has. Really, everything should be like Emacs, except written in an efficient implementation of Lisp, like SPCL. Never gonna happen, though. Free software is dead. To which I responded, let me guess, you need more. Okay, so here's why sense of terminal autism is a, is, a, is a little bit of a dum-dum here. Sense of terminal autism is a dum-dum here. Let's propose um, you... There, there are some people, like me, who prefer it when software is, is as, as basic as is reasonable. As basic as is reasonable. 
um, for a variety of reasons that I'll get into in a minute. And I, we call ourselves software minimalists. We don't like over overly complex software. Um, and then there are another group of people uh, who want to, if, if for a charitable definition, let's use let's use a sensor terminal autism self description min min maxing. Right? They they want to uh, do as much as possible with as little as possible. We could call them electronic maximalist users or maybe for short uh emax users perhaps we could we could shorten that to emax users and these people love when a text editor takes like uh over five seconds to to launch and then runs slow as fuck on an old laptop like why i don't understand why they like this emax users they're a very strange group of people they're a very strange group of people who, who just they just love when software has 50 million useless features that you'll never need to use. Um, and I don't know why. I don't know why they like that. But personally, if you want to use Emacs and if you want to be like, well, look, buddy, I'm on my gaming PC, so it doesn't matter if the software is bloated and slow. In fact, I was watching a video where a guy was literally talking about Emacs and he said, yeah, I bought a new, a new gaming PC so that Emacs would run more responsibly. Motherfucker. VI runs super snappily and responsibly on like a Raspberry Pi Zero W. I don't want to hear. I don't want to hear shit from the Emacs users, man. And look, I don't have a horse in this race. Okay, I'm not a. This is the difference, right? I'm not a programmer. I'm not a software developer. I've done some programming and I've done a little bit of software development. But not in any you know significant way. It's not something I do regularly. I've just done a little bit. When I'm using a text editor, and yes, this is the text editor wars. But but listen, the point I'm uh, this is not supposed to be a Vim versus Emacs because Vim also suffers from this problem, uh, you know. And you're not even using Emacs anyway. You're probably using Doom Emacs or, or something like that, right? Or Space Max. Uh, the Space Max is probably outdated by now. You're probably using Doom Emacs, and and Vim people are probably using Neo Vim. Right, so like it's no longer EX, Emacs v versus VI, it's it's Doom Emacs versus NeoVim, uh, both of which are bloated pieces of shit. Uh, if you like, this is the problem with with the fucking the Vim users, and this is why I agree with the Emacs users, right? Because so many like so many Vim users are like, oh look, it's very extensible. You could just add plugins for whatever you want. Look at my fifty plugins, like. Vim, there's no good Vim plugin manager. They just don't exist. Like, Emacs does plugins way better than Vim. Like, a million times better. And I will concede this immediately as a Vim user. And all of these fucking Vim users who are going around with their 50 different plugins, like, bro, stop doing that. <laughs> like, I, st I stopped using Vim because it had too many features that I don't use. I switched back to VI, right? Because... Cause because I, 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 don't, I don't need all that shit. But the point being, I mean, that's it. This is not an Emacs versus a VI debate, right? I don't really care what you use. Different people have different use cases. If you want to, for some reason, use EWWW as your main web browser, who am I to tell you not to, right? You, you can do whatever you want inside Emacs. It's your, that's, the, that's the great thing about free software, uh, which is supposedly dead even though it's obviously not, is that you can do whatever the fuck you want with your computer. And that's great. And you think you should keep doing that. Um, <clears throat> the, there's something you haven't considered since the terminal autism, which is that different people have different use cases, you know? And for me, I, I don't... I, this is my, my personal opinion, okay? The, the, nothing pre Everything previously said in this entire 11 hours has been pure objective fact. But now... This is my personal opinion, okay? <laughs> and that is that complex systems break and they break harder. Every system breaks. If you have a system with uh, where each component has a 1% chance of breaking and has 100 components, you now have a system that has a 100% chance of breaking, right? Like everything breaks at some point. And so running a very simple, minimal system... Uh, means that it's easy to fix when things break. That's all it is. That's all it is. I want to come as close to po as possible to fully understanding my system. And I will fully admit 
I'm just not that smart. <laughs> like, I can't learn all of this complicated shit, right? I just want to... I'm not a fucking God-tier C programmer, you know, from the... From, from fucking 1979 IBM, you know? Like, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. I'm, I just want a system that works and does the basic shit that I want it to do. And if I ever want it to do shit that's less basic than that, I'll install a program that can do that. But right now, what you know, same reason... I use all of this minimalist software is because like I don't I don't fucking need anything else like it that's literally all there is to it you know like nothing it, people spend their whole lifetime looking for shit that's gonna like maximize their productivity like, I don't want to fucking maximize my productivity I'm I, I'm you know like <laughs> what do you mean you know does this make sense like I'm not I'm not doing shit that requires that and if I was I would just, I don't know, probably install VS Code or something. Right? With a, with a Vim Keybinds plugin. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't fucking need half the, the, the shit that's built into Vim. You think I need even more of the bullshit that's built into Emacs? No thank you. Hey, he said the thing. Uh, that's the basic premise here. Extensible. Let's talk about extensible. Can we talk about extensible? I'd love to talk about extensible. Extensibility is a fucking meme, right? And I'm actually very surprised that you fell for this meme, sense of terminal autism, because extensibility is how you end up with the modern web. Every part of the modern web was built to be, or every part of the web, every part of the hypertext transfer protocol and, and whatever, has been built to be extensible. And so now you have HTTP, you have CSS, you have JavaScript, you have WebAssembly, you got all the 50 different, you got HTMX, I don't even know what that one does, I don't know what half of this shit does, you got all of these fucking JavaScript libraries built on JavaScript libraries, but like, that's how, that's what you get when your shit's extensible, okay, I don't fucking give a shit if things are extensible, if I need to just build, build a program that does it instead, <laughs> you know, like, that's what that's what I'd fucking rather have. It's just a program that works, not not a bunch of of, of extensions that add a bunch of stupid shit, right? Stupid shit, because then you end up with the extended version of the program becoming the default version of the program, and everyone's designing stuff that only works with the extended version of the program. I'm saying this as if this is a real thing, but like you can see this. With the fact that you're not using Emacs and and ninety nine percent of people aren't using VI, right? You're using NeoVim, like NeoVim is the default, you know. Doom Emacs is the default, but I, or or some other variation of, of of that. You know what I'm saying? Do you know what the fuck I'm saying? No, you don't know. You know, but you'd think I'm just being retarded, and you, maybe you're right. Maybe you're right. <clears throat> the point is. Um, something, something, the point is something. Well, let me get back to this comment. Uh, it's something about let the corporate bloat maxes take over the desktop. Look, I don't, I don't give a fuck what the fuck happens to the desktop. My, my like, what are you talking about? My desktop works fine. <laughs> like, it's bit, it always happens. People just freak out about stuff that isn't real. Uh, like, it happens, it happens all the time. Oh, oh, they're gonna take over your desktop. Are they gonna come to my house? Is the UN... Are UN forces gonna come into my fucking living room and force me at gunpoint to install Windows? I I fucking doubt it. Okay, I'm fine. Things are okay. There's there's not an issue. You can install whatever software you like. That's the whole point. You know, like like I I do I give a fuck if 99% of people aren't gonna use Linux or or some other free OS? No, I I, I at this point no. I used to care when, uh, before Proton existed, but now that Proton exists, I really don't give a fuck. Oh, but there's no good video editing software on Linux. Uh, there's decent, it's, it's okay, we're getting there, guys. Slowly but surely, you know? Like, one day Olive will be usable. Caden Live is better than people give it credit for. Maybe not. Maybe I'm a, okay. Maybe I'm copium. Maybe yeah, I'm. It's better than people give credit for. It is better than people give it credit for. Yeah, I wouldn't say it's good, but it's better than people give it credit for. Um, copium, huffing a little bit, but you gotta have a little bit, okay? And what else? 
Oh, uh, fucking audio editing. Yeah, that's fucking garbage on Linux. Uh, but that's because you shouldn't be doing music on computers anyway. This was a mistake. Grab a fucking guitar. Grab a, grab a fucking zither. Okay, if you want to make music, you have to go out, kill a deer, kill a, skin a fucking animal, and make a goddamn drum. Um, okay, so there was an election in the UK. We're not going to talk about that. Instead, I'm going to keep talking about Censored Terminal Autism and his band of merry men. In my fucking comment section, just, just fundamentally ignoring the point of my video for no reason, just to get mad. Just to get mad for no reason. Um... Hold on, I gotta, I'm gonna read through this comment thread again so I can respond more precisely. Okay, no one unironically thinks that you should use ED instead of Vim. If you, if you actually believe that, you have, you have simply fallen for the most obvious meme of all time. I don't know how you could possibly believe that. No one thinks this. Zero people actually think this. No, I can guarantee you there are no people who are actually editing text files with ED. Other than, like, as a, as a joke, as a gimmick. No, no one who actually has to edit text files regularly is using ED. Look, I agree with you. I agree with... I, this is the thing, censored terminal autism. You don't seem to understand my position. So maybe I should... Maybe I shouldn't... You know what? I'm just going to not do this here. I'm going to make a video about this. And, and clarify my position here. Because you seem to be arguing against straw men. I've been doing some research into Lao food. And, uh as in food from Laos, the Southeast Asian country. And I found some very amusing features of the Lao language, <laughs> which is that their culinary terms happen to be extremely sexual in English. For example, Lao food makes heavy use of mortar and pestle, right? Uh, and, and that in... <laughs> In Lao, it's called it's called the it's called the, it's called a suck and a cock. It's called a a pestle. It's it's called a suck, and a mortar. It's called a cock. <laughs> and then the Lao word for chop is fuck. <laughs> the Lao word for chop is is fuck is fuck, and the and and it say so you fuck the papaya, and then you put it in the sucking cock. Like what are they doing over in Laos, man? They're getting up to some freaky ass shit. What the fuck? I've just had a very strange experience. It's not that strange. Um, I was trying to... I, I heard about this guy. I heard about this guy called Jacques Camate, I believe. Camate? I don't, I don't know how you pronounce his name. But whatever the case may be. Um... I don't know, he's some sort of French guy <laughs> who wrote books about fucking, you know, stuff I'm interested in, theory books. And as I understand it, as I understand it, what happened was he was a left com and then he was like, actually, I'm so communist that I'm given up on com I'm so left wing that I've given up on communism. Uh and he became some sort of primitivist guy. And I was like, that sounds interesting. I like, you know, I've heard of a lot of primitivist arguments from a from a anthropological anarchisty perspective, from an ecological perspective most of the time. Um but I've never heard one from a Marxist perspective. Like, I wonder what that's about. That sounds kind of interesting. So I went to, like, read some of his stuff. And bro is fucking... Like, 
his he he writes in a way that is just insane, and that is he just says stuff, like he just says something, and then doesn't exp- like he just state makes statements. He just makes statements with no attempt towards justification or explanation. He'll just say something, like I don't know. I could I could I could get a quote up. I could find a quote for you. It's probably not that interesting. But he'll just say some some bullshit. I mean, whether or not it's bullshit, I don't even know. Cause he just There's no sources, there's no citations. There's there's like a couple and they're all just nothing. I don't it's very strange. Never read a book like that before. He just he just said he literally just makes confident statements and makes zero attempt to justify them at all he'll just say something like well the the society has morphed from from a you know i I don't really understand what he's trying to say because his his he's not very clear with uh you know let me let me get you a let me get you an actual quote like when capital achieves domination over society it becomes a material community Overcoming value and the law of value, which survive only as something overcome. Like, okay, like how? Like what? Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, I promise you, he does not, he does not talk, he does not expand upon this. Like, he, that the entire book is written like this. Like, he just makes statements like that, where he just sort of says something, and you're like, I'm not quite sure what that means. Um, and even if, to the extent that I do understand what that means, like, can you give me an example? (laughs) Can you show how that's true in any way? Can you show the mechanism by which that takes place? He just doesn't do it, which is baffling. I've never read anything like that before. Which is all to say, I cannot, I cannot recommend Jack Camarte. I cannot recommend his, his, his works. They seem... Uh, a bit silly, which is a shame because I was interested in how how the fucker left com ends up being a primitivist guy. We're coming to the end of this podcast right about now. Um, I haven't been recording that many segments. Actually, maybe I kind of have. I don't know what I'm talking about, but I've been desperately trying to get away from my present hyperfixation if you want to call it that which is my my fourth modality which doesn't come into operation that frequently you know i've said that i cycle between team fortress 2 anime um uh, linux and like politics slash philosophy as my my various hyperfixations and that was all subsumed by TF2 for a long time. But I've kind of not been playing TF2 recently. And what's taken over is... That was my Discord ping, if you even heard that. What's taken over is reading reading theory stuff. Which I just don't talk about that much on this channel because I feel like it's boring. I feel like it's very boring, first of all. And secondly, I'm much less confident than I used to be. In fact, I look back at my old super confident self and I find it kind of cringe. Um, What I mean by that is I look back at some of my old videos and just my old opinions and I'm like, damn, how were you so sure about it? Like you, I was very just resistant to criticism. Like I wasn't really doing any self-criticism. It was very aesthetics based. Um, and mostly driven by only reading stuff that I already agreed with. That's basically where I'm coming at. Like, I didn't read Marx because I thought I knew that Marx was this statist, you know, whatever. And I thought I knew, knew what he meant. And so I was like, well, there's not even any point in bothering, right? I didn't read Bookchin because I thought, oh, Bookchin's just some condescending guy who calls everyone lifestylists or whatever. I didn't read, etc., etc., right? And I just read the very few um, sort of post-Civ anarchist 
stuff without even but the problem is without even knowing the the prerequisites right like i i read the coming insurrection without having any basis to understand uh like like what's his name Gilles Dove or something the communization guy that that created that that phrase or like tikkun or like i didn't really have any concept of the distinctions between nihilist anarchism and uh communization like i don't know it was just very i just only read things and took out of them a very base aesthetic appeal which is not necessarily bad on its own right but it was it's better than ideological shopping right it's it's i think it's better than it's better to do that to be like okay i'm i i will i want to be a cool post left anarchist guy and i'm just going to read whatever interests me right like why bother starting with the greeks when that shit's boring and i want to read nick land right now and then half hours of reading of nick land that i don't really understand and then you know from there I'd be like, okay, well, I need to understand this, so I need to go back to read Deleuze and Guattari, and then I need to understand Deleuze, so I need to go back and and, and so and so on, right? Uh, which, by the way, has not been very successful. I would not say I have like a, a solid grasp on Deleuze. Um, I have not read Spinoza. Uh, you know, I'm definitely lacking in that uh, area. I have a ba- I would say I have like a very basic beginner level understanding of Deleuze. Um, anyway. Uh, you know, just sort of reading random shit that grabbed my attention, mostly just being aesthetically drawn to the idea of post, post-left post anarchism, whatever that even means, where I was just sort of like seeing memes about Max Stirner, which these days I am much more opposed to Stirner than I ever have been in the past. Like, I, I actually think Stirner is kind of an idiot. <laughs> um, I, I, I won't necessarily get into that here, but I, I, I have a lot of a lot of very big problems with Stoner and the whole individualist anarchist um, framing. I, I I think it's like really obvious problems that I was clearly avoiding back when I used to relate to that. Like I was very much avoiding thinking about any of that because it was boring to think about that. And I don't necessarily think this is like, again, I think this is a better approach than the the normal internet politic meme where you go ideology shopping you know you start off you just go on wikipedia you look at the different names of things and you're like on tuesday i was a marxist leninist but today i'm a revolutionary upholder of gonzalo thought and then tomorrow i'm gonna become uh uh you know i'm gonna be like oh those marxist leninists are just liberals i've been reading bordega you know what i mean like that kind of ideology shopping where your name ends up you have a twitter bio that says you're an an anarcho narco blah 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 like that's the worst kind of thing and i'm glad that I, I i skirted kind of close to it but i've never really succumbed to that which is something that i'm somewhat i'm very glad that i never succumbed to that but my hyper confidence in a very particular strain of politics um was just caused by the fact that i never read anything outside of that I just never read any other accounts of the world. Um, And I've always had a bad case of last thing I readism. Um, It's just how I'm how I'm built. I I tend to have that sort of recency bias. Whatever the thing I read last is I'm always like, that's really cool. But these days I'm getting over that a little, which is not the same as ideological supermarket shopping. It's not the same thing because I'm not saying like the, the problem with that is, is the, the identity element of it. Like, they're going around saying, I'm a this, instead of, like, uh, distancing yourself as an, as an agent, as, a, as an identity from it. Like, 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 there's a difference between saying, uh, Marx was right, and I'm a Marxist. Like, those are two different things, you know? Uh, which, in that situation, doesn't really matter that much, but it matters a lot when you get into the really autistic shit. Like, if you go around saying... Uh, I'm a uh, 
blah, 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 anarcho, monarcho, florarcho, blah, 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 right, that's stupid. But if you start, like, thinking, you know, hey, so-and-so has some good ideas, but they have some flaws, and I also think so-and-so has some good ideas, but they have some flaws, and I know those two things are not mutually, uh, like, those two people can't coexist, but I think they both have good ideas. Um, and that's the kind of situation I'm in right now, where I'm, I'm very much sort of all over the place, where I'm like, lots of people have good ideas, lots of people have, have everyone's flawed, no, none of these theorists have ever written a perfect theory, as far as I can tell. There's very few, at least. The, the only person that, that I've read, which, who's really, like, written something so profound that I really think it has to underpin anything going forwards, is Bataille. Like, that's the only... I just said I wouldn't go on a big roundabout theory, and I've ended up doing it anyway, so I guess fuck it. But, but Georges Bataille is the only... Uh, like, the Accursed Chair in particular is the only time when I've read something, and it's been like, okay, th- like, any anything else that comes after this has to also find a way to fit into Bataille's general economy, because if it doesn't, it's just wrong. Like, I have to find some way to relate it back or to, to infuse it somehow. Because otherwise, like, I I just can't find any... I can't find any obvious flaws in that way of thinking. Um, that's not to say that Bataille's never made any mistakes. Like, Bataille wrote a little bit on, on Marxism, right? But his he's pretty much only acknowledging it in terms of, like, Soviet-style socialism. Like, he doesn't... He doesn't really talk much about Marx in particular, so you gotta, like, lots of people have had different takes on trying to fuse Bataille and Marx, like, I've read a few people who seem to think that they're very compatible, and then uh, other people who think that they are completely incompatible, um, like, Baudrillard thinks that, that Bataille and Marx are completely incompatible, um, whereas I've read a few different articles by no-name people on the internet who have, like, synthesized Bataille and Marx and said, like, that that they're really talking about the same kind of thing. Uh, it depends on your interpretation of Marx more than your interpretation of Bataille. I'm much closer to Baudrillard on this. I think that Bataille sort of supersedes Marx. Uh, anyway, this is where we get into just autism, and, and I like the autism, but you guys are probably just don't... I just feel like this isn't very entertaining. I just end up, like, name-dropping, which is something I... I really need to figure out a way to talk about politics without name dropping, right? Like I'm very when I'm thinking about this stuff, I'm thinking about books, you know? I I'm I'm relating books to other books, but I I should be trying to sort it out into more abstract ideas that aren't necessarily just books or isms. Um like I I I I it, uh whatever. I I just I I had something very cringe where I almost typed out a sentence that included the words communism, communalization, and communal, uh, communalism. <laughs> yeah, I, I typed out a sentence with the words communism, communization, and communalism, which all mean different things. Uh, and I was like, this is too much. I can't be doing this. This is too, too fucking stupid. Uh, so, yeah. Anyway, my point being, I don't understand how I was ever... Well, I, I understand how I was so confident in my ideas at some point, which was just that I had a very restricted reading. I, I, I restricted myself to only reading a very, very thin line of, of, of works, which was really stupid, because I was specifically reading post-left anarchist critique, which is obviously a direct response to left-wing anarchist critique, right? Like, if I don't have a... If I didn't have a strong basis of the developments in left-wing thought that led to the development of the post-left, I I couldn't possibly hope to understand it properly, which I never did. Um, because if I had, I would have realized that it was retarded. <laughs> That's not strictly true. Okay, there's some, there's some post-left stuff that I still kind of... I don't know. I'm, I'm, again, I don't, I just, I'm not gonna sit here and be like, it's all wrong, it's all stupid, for, for certain. Like, that's, that's the, that's the big change, is that now I'm, I'm in the opposite camp, where I, I, I am actually way too vague on things. 
I'm just like, everyone has some good ideas and everyone has flaws. So I don't know what to do, you know, uh, and that kind of that that's maybe better. But but I don't know how to go from that to being like able to actually make qualitative judgments about different ideas and and form some sort of coherent worldview, <laughs> which I think is actually it's possible that this is a good thing, right? It's possible that this is the best way to live to to have lots of a very broad theoretical underpinning, and then you can draw from anything you want to you know to deal with particular whatever you're dealing with in particular right like even if even if you're drawing at different times on different things that contradict each other does that actually matter i don't know i'll leave that up to the viewers to decide um like maybe the best option is to have as broad a, a theoretical base as possible so that you can draw on lots of different ideas depending on when they're they're necessary and dismiss things when they're not necessary even if in another set of circumstances you would be leaning on them heavily um that's the base i'm working with right now uh it's kind of unhelpful because it does mean i'm stuck in a world of like having not very much certainty about things uh which makes it kind of hard to like answer questions if someone puts to me a, a particular question, you know, I could say, I will end up being like, well, it depends, you know, it depends. You could do it like this, you could do it like that, you could do it like this. And I think all of them have, have their strengths and weaknesses, right? Which which sounds like lay smart and lay nuanced take, but, but that's actually just like a way of avoid. ultimately it's a way of avoiding the question ultimately it means that like have I really understood these things if I can't actually make a qualitative assessment where I can say no 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 this idea is just better than this other idea you know can I really say I, I'm working on it I'm working on it and I'm starting with Marx to work on it to make qualitative assessments about which parts of Marx to keep and which parts of Marx to, to throw away and, and so on um you know, right now my reading list consists of, uh, I want to understand both whatever the fuck uh, Bookchin was talking about, because I've always avoided Bookchin for no real reason. But ever since I re-went re through Marx and Gotha Critic and, and all of that stuff and realized and, and thought in my mind about the comparisons between how I think post-Paris Commune Marx saw communism as being organized with the way like Auckland and the Den democratic confederalism in Rojava is organized like I, I I thought these things actually seem fairly similar that was the thing that made me think okay I maybe should go back to Bookchin then but Bookchin it turns out is very critical of Marx so now I don't know what to think <laughs> because now I'm reading Bookchin who's going fucking in on Marx and honestly he's making some good points uh, and the other thing is, uh, I've seen this idea, which is called communalization going around, or sorry, communization going around for a long time, and I don't really know what it means. I have a vague idea of what it means, um, but I have not read any of the theoretical underpinnings of that idea. Uh, so that's my other thing. So basically... Uh, that's where I'm at. And then I also, on top of all of that, want to become a lot more familiar with Baudrillard. Um, you know, and then maybe even further than that, we can we can we can get some some systems theory stuff going. Because uh, I've still I've still got a vague interest in systems theory, even though I think it's like weirdly technocratic a lot of the time, which is not something I like. At the same time. There are so many good ideas in systems theory that I just can't ignore, uh, you know, and that generally means reading Stafford Beer, although I think Nicholas Lerman would be more relevant to my particular interests. The problem with that is Nicholas Lerman is completely fucking impenetrable um, and even less popular than Stafford Beer, so there's like no secondary writing on Lerman. 
and that makes it just imp- i just have no idea what he's talking about like i it is literally incomprehensible and uh, famously it is incomprehensible he is just the worst writer i've ever seen like i think a lot of these people are really bad writers you know i think marx was a bad writer i think wittgenstein was a really bad writer I think you know a lot. A lot of these, some of these, some of them are really good writers. You know, I think Baudrillard is a really good writer. I think Deleuze and Guattari were both really good writers. Um, you know, I think etc. I, th- I I mean, it doesn't really matter who I think is a good or bad writer, but specifically Nicholas Luhmann is famously like incomprehensible. Uh, so I need to like figure out what the fuck he was talking about. Because, and, and then I've also got some stuff about, like, Bernard Stiegler. He seems kind of interesting. But this is, like, that's not really on my soon upcoming reading list. That's distant future, because I'd, I'd have to get into some Heidegger to understand what he's talking about. And honestly, Heidegger has never been very interesting to me. So we'll have to see if something about me changes that I become interested in Heidegger. Uh... So Heidegger's also a Nazi, so that's a that adds on to my my disinterest. Um, so yeah, that's where we're at right now. I'm just literally name dropping, which is so cringe. I hate name dropping. I don't want to. I don't want to be a guy who name drops. So the only way for me to solve this pro, the answer is that the, the only way to solve any of these problems, as far as I can see, is to read more. There's this old, like, ancient, and I mean ancient, ancient computer science meme. It was written by, like, a computer science student in the 70s or something like that, which is, it's, it's like, uh, something like, I hate this machine because it does exactly what I tell it to do, not what I want it to do, right? And it's a very good computer science meme. Uh, we all love it. It uh, is a very, very accurate description of, of what's going on. With, with these fucking, fucking weird fucking things called computer. What the fuck is this? I don't, I don't know. It's fucked. Okay. We don't, I don't like to think about it too much because it's just, it's just fucked. But I've realized a lot of, a lot of the problems with, with modern computing is it, it come from people realizing that, that, that fundamental issue that computers do what you tell them to do, not what you want them to do, and then try and fix it. It's an unfixable problem. The more you try and fix it, the more you're just going to fuck things up. And the worst aspect of this is that we, people who have been using computers for a long time, understand this aspect. Like, this 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 is not something that's confusing. Anyone who's used a computer for a, for a reasonable amount of time knows that computers do what you tell them to do, not what you want them to do. In the very particular, like, you all understand exactly what I mean when I say that. You don't have to be programming to understand that. You don't have to go too super in-depth. It's just something you intuit. So when I go on Google and I search for something, and then Google says, did you mean this? That's really helpful because I might have misspelled it, right? That's great. Uh, so, and then I can click that button and be like, yes, I did mean that. But when I go on Google and I search for something and then Google says, we think you might have meant this, showing me the results for a completely different thing. But just in case, like you can go click this button to go back, like, fuck you, buddy. You don't know better than me. You're not smarter than me. You're a fucking computer. Okay, you stupid bitch. You do not know better than me. You are a computer. You are inanimate. You don't know what I want. You only know what I've told you. And I haven't told you shit, so you can't fucking guess. So don't get, get you can give me a suggestion, and I'm, I'm okay with that, as long as I'm making the decision. But don't fucking make the decision for me, you piece of shit. You fucking piece of shit. Don't make the decision for me when you're designing a system like Google. Never fucking do this. It's evil. And this is what most, of, like, you look at, at the algorithm, like, something very strange, right? About, about algorithmic feeds, and one of the reasons why they fucking suck is, is this, this assumption by the people who, who make the algorithms, the Googles, the byte dances of the world, right? That the people using these platforms, interacting with these platforms, are somehow outside of the system, right? That there's this system 
of, um, uh, you know, al algorithm, right, the, the recommendation algorithm, and that the user only constitutes the environment of the system, which is just not true. The user is also a part of the system. And so you get a situation where people do stuff intentionally because they, they, are true, they have understand some, understood some fundamental underlying uh, you know, weight that the system uses to, 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 to modify itself, right? So like uh, when you press, you know, it used to be back in the day that when you pressed like on a video, you were doing that because you, were, you, you wanted to tell the creator of that video that you liked it, that you were supporting it, right? Hey, hey, creator of this video. What, great job, great job on, on your Minecraft Let's Play. Thumbs up, right? But now, when you press like on a video, you're, you don't give a fuck about the, the creator most of the time. What you're doing is saying to the algorithm, uh, show me more things like this, right? And, and the people like Google and ByteDance, they don't, they f uh, think we're stupid and don't realize this. This is what's crazy. And so they don't design, like, they don't design, like, they've, they've hidden all of these, these recommendations algorithms, being a black box, being hidden behind this layer of obscurity. It becomes, you know, they, they always, you'll notice every single app like this, every single sort of algorithmic recommendation feed like this has some button hidden away behind a hamburger menu where you can press and say, don't recommend me this, right? And you may have noticed that shit never fucking works. You may have noticed that, that, that nowhere ever has that worked. Like, why doesn't YouTube have a block button? You can click don't recommend this channel. And it like has a 50-50 chance of actually not recommending you that channel in the future. But YouTube doesn't you, like it's insane to me that I can't just block channels. I don't like why every other social media platform lets me block people. YouTube, why can't I block people? Insane. But like you look at these feeds, and you know the 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 the, the tech companies, the programmers, they act as if users are going to somehow be be innocently chugging along, not understanding that their actions are changing which videos are served to them, which content is served to them. That's obviously not how it works, right? People know that their actions influence the recommendations they get served, and so even if it's doing nothing, they're going to try to manipulate. The, the the recommendation algorithm to give them stuff they actually want to watch or, or, or want to read or, or, or want to see whatever right um and the thing is there's no clear feedback mechanism it's not as simple as you click like on a video and it shows you more things like this right there's a whole number of weighted cybernetic feedback mechanisms watch time click through where you know all of these other i don't know all of them i'm not I, no one knows everything that the youtube's tracking but you know it could be tracking any any number of things maybe it's taking gyroscope information from your phone and like somehow you know seeing where the screen is pointed and you know it could be doing any number of things taking how loud the volume is you know it, there's there's so many different cybernetic um uh feedback mechanisms that YouTube is weighing and it's all completely obfuscated from the end user and so it becomes this sort of uh, superstition you, you get a sort of superstition where you are trying to get the algorithm to serve you things that you want not serve you what it thinks you it thinks you think you want right um, and, and and there's something beyond that which is that sometimes what you'll what, like let's say on youtube right what you will watch is not the same thing as what you want to watch does this make sense like maybe you will watch some slop but you don't want to watch that slop so you would rather if youtube didn't recommend you like i would rather if youtube recommended me some lecture on some in-depth topic, right? Rather than some Minecraft Let's Play slot that I'm, I don't care about, you know. But like, if I'm served Minecraft Let's Play, but YouTube has no way of differentiating these two things. So it would be much better for for society if users had more control over what they see, 
right? They would have a better time using uh, this this website. But having a better time using that website obviously might mean using that website less because because sometimes you know uh, going outside is, is 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 a good thing for some people or, or using other websites that aren't TikTok, uh, you know whatever so the, the, so there's this stupid incentive structure that just makes me want to fucking kill myself and it but it's not just the incentive structure like i think it's reductive to just boil this completely down to like they're maximizing profit i also think that it's a set of badly designed um cybernetic systems like i think that they're i don't have the language in, in cybernetic theory to, to to really explain what i'm talking about here but i i don't think the um the choices of what sort of feedback to 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 to, to use and how to weight it is is just poor. Um, it leads to a poor user experience on most of these these uh, platforms. Um, like there's a lot of times when I mean I'm very into a particular genre of video, and then all of a sudden I find you know I've been watching some particular genre of video for for years, and then uh, I'll give you an, a good example here. There's a lot of crossover between the fan bases of Germa, Northern Lion, Simple Flips, and Greyfruit, right? And these are all channels with, a, you know, quite a few subscribers. Um, and I've been a big fan of Simple Flips for a long time, and I've been tangentially aware of Germa for a long time. I, I'm not a massive fan of Germa, but I think he's pretty cool. Um, and yet... I had never, I've never in my life been served a grapefruit video until someone told me about him, right? Even though their humor style, you know, the humor styles of all these people are very, they have a lot of crossover, their fan bases have a lot of crossover. For some reason, whatever it may be, the YouTube algorithm decided that, that I, that in my world, in my reality, uh, or in the, in the reality of the me that exists within YouTube's memory banks, <laughs> Uh, you know, grapefruit doesn't exist and shouldn't exist. Uh, and, the, you know, there should just be the, the, the systems which govern, like, I can, you know, they make some excuses about how they don't want these features to be abused, right, uh, by by YouTubers. Like, they don't, they, the, the systems have to be obscure because otherwise people, if people knew how it worked, they'd be able to game the system. But people already game the system, right? People game the system to a very extreme degree. Uh, and they game the system right in front of YouTube's eyes, and YouTube doesn't care, because why would they? It doesn't really matter what videos are getting views, as long as those ads are getting views for YouTube, and the data is being collected for YouTube to sell. Like, it doesn't really matter, you know, if people are, are lying in their thumbnail. Like, every single Mr. Beast video is breaking YouTube TOS, right? Because every single YouTube Mr. Beast video has a misleading uh, thumbnail. Right, like you, you can look at the thumbnail of a Mr. Beast video, and it contains images of events which do not take place in the video. They might be representational exaggerations of something that takes place in the video, but they they are misleading. Like there's there's just no doubt about it. Maybe not every single one, but the vast vast majority of them are to some degree or another uh, misleading. Um, right, and obviously YouTube doesn't care because Mr. Beast is a good play face for the platform, and ultimately. His videos getting viewed like it's it's a win win for 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 both Mr Beast and for YouTube and and that's good for everyone involved. Um, so they they don't really actually care about people gaming the system. Um, I think it's just an excuse. In reality, uh, you know, maybe this is a is a poor analysis because it doesn't have an economic basis. But I I think that there are just people within the 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 departments that design out these the, the recommendation algorithms that have have poor practices. Like I think that there, there's there, there's obviously some underlying material basis. Like there's, it's not that these ideas just came out of nowhere. Like someone is teaching them these practices, and that they're, they're they're being taught for a reason. There is some structure. There there exists some some structure which is generating a type of knowledge that's wrong. Um, and I I don't I'm not involved in this area. I don't know what that structure is. But whatever it is, it needs to it needs to it needs to die. As we approach the end of this absurdly long podcast and as usual I wonder why the fuck I even bother to make these things I am um, struck with with a a particular thought I've begun to see the sentiment spread particularly in a, a post chat GPT world that the internet is functionally dead now 
what's interesting is, <clears throat> as someone who's been on the internet for a while, people have been saying this for, for a long time. In fact, people have been saying this since <clears throat> before I was born, uh, with the eternal September. If you don't know what that is, then <clears throat> do your damn research. Uh, but people have been saying, oh, well, that's it, the internet's fucked now, pretty much since the birth of the internet. <clears throat> I remember, you know, people were saying it when it came to, there's something in my throat. People were saying it when it came to Facebook and MySpace. People, people have been saying this shit, people were saying it with smartphones. People have just been saying this shit for a long time. That the internet is dead. <clears throat> and now, uh, with AI st stuff and the death of search engines, I think that's really been like kind of a last straw for a lot of people in the slow death of the internet, right? They're like, <clears throat> you can't even Google something effectively anymore. Um, and, and AI... Pseudo intelligent stuff is is everywhere. It's very annoying, right? <clears throat> and I think this is like sort of hammering home this point. But I just want to make make it clear that this is nothing new. It's just a bit an intensification of something that already existed. Um, <clears throat> but the reason I wanted to bring this up is. Because what do they mean? They mean the, the sort of internet as it was supposed to be doesn't exist. Everyone's just on these centralized platforms. And the thing is, you're just wrong. <laughs> like, the internet does exist. I, I use it every single day of my life, and I have done for years. Um, it hasn't gone anywhere. It's changed. It, some sites have been born. Some sites have died. Things have changed. But it sounds kind of more like a skill issue. It sounds more like if you're given the easy out of an Instagram, a Facebook, a Twitter, you, you just won't bother to, like, look beyond the surface web. That's what it sounds like to me. Sounds like a bit of a skill issue. Sounds like an issue of, of you just not, but not you just, you, you don't care. You're probably imagining, well, all the cool people are here. But you don't know that because you're only in one place, you fucking idiot. I don't, I just don't like this idea. There's this, the, the idea is, there used to be this internet that was like independent websites, then it all became centralized on these platforms. If only we could move back to the, the original, we don't have to move back, they never fucking went anywhere. People have always been making like personal websites and little forums and all of that shit. You know, you could be listening to this podcast on, on, on no thank you .org. It's just a weird, like people act as if there's just, you, you can't just do the thing that you want to... You can. You very much can, and it's easy. It's, like, the easiest thing ever. It's so easy. Anyway. Now I just got to talk for a few more seconds until we hit the mark of, of, like, roughly get as close as I can without going over, you know, prices, right, rules, or whatever. Um, <clears throat> just for the aesthetics of the, the timestamp on the YouTube video, really. Uh, yeah, that's right. I can still pump these out. While making other videos. It's true. Okay, well, we are approaching... Boom.